Hello and welcome to LN Audiobooks. Please subscribe and leave your suggestions and favorite novels on this channel. Thank you so much, and please enjoy the light novel. Volume 2 of The Wrong Way to Use Healing Magic Save my mother. That's what the beast girl said. Strong emotions were concealed within her expressionless eyes. She mentioned something about a price. It was likely that she was referring to the vision she showed me that allowed me to save Inyakumai Senpai and Kazuki. I have to admit that if it weren't for that foreknowledge, I might have not been able to save those two. We could have also lost the war as a result. Understanding that, I took Inyakumai Senpai and Blurin along with me to the rescue squad's lodgings. We couldn't talk out here in the open since other people might hear our conversation. People rarely come here to be treated and I trust everyone in this squad. There was no better place to hold a private conversation. Blurin returned to his shed and I led the beast girl to the dining hall. Inyakumai Senpai and I sat down, facing the beast girl who was seated on the other side. Well then, why don't you tell me the rest of your story? Hey, you sad kun I have no idea where this conversation is going but before that. Who is this little beast girl? She's cute, can I pet her? I chose you because I only have you to rely on. Only me. You guys are ignoring me hey. You sad kun is it that enjoyable to tease me? If it that's what excites you then I don't mind being teased. We're having an important discussion right now. Just wait a bit you little attention seeker. Actually, why is it that she could only rely on me? If she just needed someone who could use healing magic, she could have just asked Olga-san or Elura-san. My name is Amako. As you can see, I'm a beast girl. I already know who you are. You're Yusato who uses healing magic in a strange way. I'm well aware that I'm using it in a weird way but... Well, it's fine. I have a lot to ask you. Why did you, show that to me? Of course I was referring to the vision she showed me of Inyakumai Senpai and Kazuki being killed by the Black Knight. Everything began with that vision. Amako paused at my words. She then looked at Inyakumai Senpai and hesitantly started talking. If I didn't do so, this kingdom would have been gone. The heroes would die, the kingdom would lose the war, and eventually the country would collapse. Everything would be gone. What do you think, Senpai? That is a very likely scenario. If Yusato kun didn't come at that time, Kazuki and I would have died for sure. I don't want to sound too conceited but if we died there, the kingdom's morale would have drastically fallen and would have lost right then and there. In other words, we were walking on a thin rope. It seems like my actions at the time changed fate itself. I was just thinking about saving my friends but looking back at the heavy responsibility I had, my body couldn't help but shiver. I did so because someone has been taking care of me here. But more importantly, I couldn't afford to lose you now that I've finally found you. So I can assume that your magic is unique and something that only the beast can possess, right? Yes. It was probably something like fortune telling or seeing the future. Even so, it seemed to be really accurate. I also knew that the kingdom would lose against the Mu army one year ago. That's why before the fighting began, I was searching. For a healing magician who would could heal any illness or injury. If you knew that the kingdom was going to lose, why didn't you leave? I know you saved my life and all but... Wouldn't it have been safer to run away to a different country if you knew this country was going to lose? Senpai, the other countries discriminate against the beast kin. She probably couldn't go even if she wanted to. Other countries wouldn't work hey. To think that the beast kin are oppressed to this extent. Amako silently nodded to my words. She probably experienced something frightening before arriving here. I don't know where she came from but the other countries bought and sold beast kin as slaves. Even if she had the power to tell the future, she was still just a powerless child. Instead, it's amazing that she's come this far. I came here from the country where the beast can inhabit. It's quite far from here. I didn't feel like it was too difficult or harsh. After all, it's for the sake of saving my mother. Does your mother have some kind of sickness? Yes, I've been told that it can't be cured under normal circumstances. She's been in a coma all this time. So that's why she needed someone with healing magic. The beast kin can't give birth to a child with healing magic. It's magic that only humans can possess. However, I couldn't find a future where my mother would be cured by a human no matter which country I went to. Discrimination it seems. Humans excluding other groups isn't anything new. Healing. Magicians aren't held in a very high regard after all. Senpai nodded as she said so. However, I was thinking about something else. Amako probably went to countless countries and used her power to overcome any dangerous situations. If she could use her power this well, I have my doubts. The figures of authority in the Beastkin country wouldn't let her go that easily, right? As I was pondering, Amako continued to talk. But I was able to find three healers. I was even able to see a future where two of the healers would journey with me back to my country to save my mother. Olga-san, Oluru-san, leader. These three. Yes, but it was hopeless even if they came along. 
hopeless. The people from the clinic can't fight. As for the scary people in the rescue squad. They listened to my story but didn't agree to come along. Ah. I could more or less imagine that being the case. Olga-san and Uluru-san wouldn't be able to withstand a long journey. Rose was the leader and she couldn't just leave her post. It was more likely she would just respond with a I don't believe you and refuse. And so, I was selected among these people. If it's you, you'll come along with me. And with just one look at you, I knew that you would be able to prevent the downfall of this kingdom and change its fate. Since you would be the one to save my mother. I showed that vision to you. Is it something that you can just easily show? It gave me a really painful headache though. I need an enormous amount of magic power to show visions to someone else. After showing you that vision, I was in bed for three days and three nights so we're equal. So that's why I couldn't find Amako afterwards. Thinking about it now, this person saved both Inyakami Senpai and Kazuki's lives. You could even say she saved the kingdom. I want to give my consent to her but this was a much bigger problem than I imagined. As far as I know, the Beast King country was exclusive to their own race. I don't know what kind of position Amako held in her country but I couldn't be careless about this. For the time being, I would like to discuss with the king. I probably can't decide on my own. Will you come along with me as I explain the situation to Lloyd? Of course I'll go. All right, first I should find Rose. For now, just sit here and wait. Senpai 2. Leader should be in her room at this time. After lifting myself off the chair, I started to walk while gathering my thoughts. Now then, how should I explain this? Yusato-kun had a worn-out expression as he left the dining hall. The ones that remained were me and Amako who sat courteously across from me. So cute, she's just like a little doll. I can't believe it, it's a real fox girl. I wonder if it's okay to touch her. No, I must touch her oops, I almost couldn't control myself. That was close. First of all, I should piece together everything we just talked about. She must have faced a lot of hardships to make it all the way here from her home country. This beast girl came all the way here to request Yusato to cure her bedridden mother. As a result, she showed Yusato the future of me dying and prevented this kingdom from being destroyed. History was changed from this action. The price in exchange for this was for Yusato's cooperation. Don't you think that you could have gotten Yusato to help without saying anything? If it was my past self, I probably would have done that. But after arriving here, I didn't want the people in this kingdom to be affected. I see. Due to how kind King Lloyd was, this kingdom was strangely peaceful. Everyone was kind and didn't discriminate against others. When Amako first arrived here, she must have thought of everyone as her enemy. I feel that this country is kinder to me than my own country. There's no discrimination, everyone treats me like an equal. But my mother is suffering back at home. I can't just abandon her, I need to take Yusato along with me. Her monologue was in bits and pieces. It wasn't like Yusato-kun's monologue that was clear. It felt like she was afraid of me as she talked. It seemed that she didn't like me all that much. When I found Yusato, I doubted my own eyes. I didn't think a method like this would be able to prevent the kingdom's ruin. Just how does your magic work? What kind of limits does it have? She was able to see the defeat of the kingdom one year ago. I can assume her range was quite vast. It's very uncertain. I can't always see the immediate future. But when I sleep, I sometimes see the future half a year or one year from now at irregular intervals. I am also able to see two different futures for someone who has the possibility of changing it. I can also only show that person my visions, they are people who can choose between two futures. I see. So you showed you Sadokun that vision and he was able to prevent the kingdom from falling. But do they beast can normally possess this kind of magic? From what I've seen, it's quite amazing. It's related to my bloodline. Bloodline. My family specializes in prophecies. My mother is also able to use this ability but she said out of everyone in the family, I was the best. It was possible that the beast kin from Amako's country were frantically searching for her right now. This seems to be a lot more troublesome than I thought. I suspect that Rose rejected Amako's offer in the future because she suspected Amako held some important position in her country. We were still at war right now, she would of course refuse. Well, the one deciding is Yusato-kun. Even though he said he'd discuss it, he's probably not someone to refuse someone needing his help. So a beast girl came from her home country to request for your help to cure her mother by journeying back with her, is that right? Basically, that's the gist of it. I was inside the leader's tidy office. I sat down on a wooden chair and in front of me was a beautiful woman with green hair. Rose sighed as she seemed to find the matter regarding Amako to be bothersome. Good grief, you've really gone and gotten yourself into something troublesome. To begin with, it's really hard to distinguish between the beast kin. It looks like the rumors about the Princess of Prophecies weren't completely off. Princess of Prophecies. It seemed like a really troubling title. Within the circle of the beast kin, 
there exists a rare few who possess the magic to prop his eyes. They play an important role in their society to foresee any calamities. Since this beast girl came here to Lingle Kingdom, there's a possibility that the beast kin country will treat us as enemies. After all, they have an abnormal amount of hostility towards humans. Even though we're fighting a war with the Mu army, to the beast kin, they find humans more of an eyesore. I didn't expect Amako to hold such an important status. While feeling glad that I discussed this with Rose first, I was also thinking about how dangerous it would be if I was found outside the kingdom with Amako. Could I hear leaders' opinions on this matter? No way. Is what I'd like to say but we should first discuss it with Lloyd before making a final decision. It's already too late to have an audience with him. Or rather, it'll be impossible for a few days. Lloyd Sama is about to discuss with other countries about cooperating right now. It seems like I won't be able to get an audience anytime soon. I should listen more to what Amako has to say. Or should I prepare myself by doing some training? In the meantime, you'll be training. In case King Lloyd allows you to go on the journey, you should be preparing yourself. Just protecting yourself is the best you can do right now. You'll be training under me again. At any rate, no one will be coming by to get treated here. I don't particularly mind but... I can say I'm already very accustomed to this since training doesn't feel that bad anymore. Still, I had to hold make myself back from making an unpleasant face in front of Rose. I didn't want her to get mad at me over something like this. Can I make a stop at the Lingle Forest? Hmm, why? I was just thinking of making a grave for Bluren's parents. A grave? You have my permission. Eh? You're not refusing me? I thought Leader would reject it instantly seeing as you're a cold-hearted and savage woman. In reality, I was imagining her response to be hey? A grave? Just make one over here. It'd be a waste of time to go all the way there. But now I'm curious about the sudden turn of events. Were my words somehow strange? Rose showed a rare smile as she quickly moved to grab my head with one hand and lifted me up in the air. Yusato, I'm happy that I don't have to hold back against you anymore. You know. I if you're happy then, stop this iron claw ow chow ow 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 ow. I writhed in agony as I was being crushed by one hand. Just what are you trying to do to me? I just told you my honest thoughts. After a few dozen seconds of hell, I was finally released. Rose was looking down on me from above like I was filth as I fell down. If you still have any more words like that to say, speak up. Hey. I've already received plenty of punishment. The injuries are at the level where my healing magic can't immediately heal them either. Just how much raw power does this woman have? She's just like an Amazonas. While I thought that on the inside, I sat down on the chair in front of Rose again. If you want to go to the forest, you should head there as soon as you can. Don't you become some monster's lunch now, got it? I'll be fine. Probably. I can just run away if it's anything I can't handle. Not to put on airs or anything but I did run away from a grand grizzly. I can also heal any poison or injuries with healing magic. I can also survive to some extent without a source of fire if I bring some food along with me. I'm also used to that water now. Well, I still need to report to Senpai and Amako who are waiting downstairs. Yet. Yeah. Giving my thanks to Leader, I headed out the room and descended down the stairs. While holding down my face due to the effects of Rose's iron claw, I could see that Inyakami Senpai was eagerly talking to Amako in the dining hall. Amako had a distinctly different aura as her blonde hair gave off a sense of brilliance. Comparing her to Inyakami Senpai, she had a smaller physique as well. Her age. She appeared to be around 13 or 14 years old. She did really well to make it this far by herself. I see, it looks like it'll take some time. Amako said so after staring at my face for a bit. Did she foresee this conversation as well? If so, it saves me the trouble from having to explain. On the other hand, Inyakami Senpai was extremely bewildered. You guys just communicated by looking at each other's eyes. To think that you would even go after an innocent girl like this. It's just going to take some time before we get an audience with Lloyd Sama. I'm absolutely not committing a crime like that. Did Senpai want to portray me as a criminal? Well, assuming that this world's sense of values recognizes a Lilikon as something bad. Senpai trembled at my words and after looking at me with a sad expression, she turned away. Recently, haven't you been treating me in a very crude manner? I'll cry soon, you know. Since you can still say something like that, you're fine. Besides, isn't treating you crudely like this proof that we're getting along really well? Somehow I feel like my perception of getting along well is different from Yusato Kun's. That's because Senpai is thinking of getting along like playmates while I'm thinking of getting along like true friends. Compared to our previous relationship where she was an unattainable flower, I preferred our relationship now where we didn't need to hesitate to speak our thoughts. As for you, what will you do? I didn't think I'd be able to immediately head out anyways. I'll head back further today. That reminds me, where are you living? 
I'm freeloading at Auntie's. She runs a fruit store. That place hey. I remember a store selling fruit just before I was thrown into the forest by Rose. It seems she's been freeloading there. Quite a bit of time has passed since then, she's been watching me for a while now. What should I do? I could head out to the streets or I could just go do some training. However, Inyakumai Senpai was staring at me with eyes of expectation. I was thinking of heading out too. I'll escort you back home. Okay. Inyakumai Senpai, you're going too, right? Of course. I took off my uniform as I didn't want to stand out and wore some normal looking civilian clothing. I'll just let Blurin stay, he'll get his exercise when we head to the forest. When that happens, the little fellow's wild instincts will awaken. Yusato. Yes. While plotting my grand scheme of awakening Blurin's wild instincts, Amako who was walking ahead of me was now staring into my eyes. Seeing her blue eyes, I couldn't help but think worthless thoughts like people in a different world sure have pretty. Eyes. Thank you. It was faint but she showed a slight smile as she said those words. I didn't know where that thank you was being directed at. It could be that I would be saving her mother. It could be that I would be coming along with her. It could be that I saved the kingdom. It could be even be related to that fact that I'm escorting her back home right now. But no matter which it was, I had already decided what to say. Me too, thank you. I didn't have to part with Senpai and Kazuki because of this girl in front of me. From there. We continued walking towards the street as Inyakumai Senpai kept showing a strange expression. Amako's face was expressionless but her steps felt a bit lighter. As we arrived at the entrance to enter the streets, Amako seemed to remember something and turned towards me and Inyakumai Senpai. As if she were trying to warn us about something. I almost forgot to say this but... Yusato and Inyakumai, you are both surrounded by everyone here. At... After saying so, Amako suddenly turned around and ran away. With her nimble beastkin movements, she quickly disappeared from the town's streets. Inyakumai Senpai tapped onto my shoulder as I was still spaced out. As expected, a hastily made disguise like this wasn't any good. I could see the townspeople showing expressions of joy as they spotted us. The people who were selling goods also stopped at what they were doing as they started enclosing us. Amako, that's something you should tell us sooner. Yusato-kun, how do you think we look like to the surrounding people? Maybe we look like a pair of lovers. More like a master and their attendant. Rather than that, can't you be a little more nervous? It's not like I could just run around the entire town now that they've seen me. They could always just exchange information about my whereabouts too. It was at this time I was made to be painfully aware of how powerful a union between people could be. While giving a big sigh, I resolved myself to face the oncoming trial. The future I see is uncertain. Normally, one can only see ten minutes in the future. Unless a stronger magical power is possessed, it would be impossible to surpass that. Even I'm unsure as to why I'm able to see as far as one year ahead. I could also see two futures for people who were special and could alter their futures. But that wasn't very useful. Although the magic was unstable, it was quite useful for my everyday life. However, I don't feel that thankful to be born with this magic. It was when I became seven years old that I really started to understand what my own magic really was. I knew what would occur in the next moment. When I slept, I would see my dreams being played out in reality. I realized that this wasn't normal. Of course, I was delighted. I was proud and thought of how amazing this power was. However, my mother. She warned me to never tell anyone else about my power. My power surpassed my mother's and that was dangerous. She warned me since someone might target me for my power. Since I was still a child, I didn't really understand and could only ask why. I can still vividly remember my mother's response, it's a gift from God, which is why you should use it for yourself. My mother was an amazing person. She could see all her futures clearly and she was never wrong. The king of the beastkins held my mother in high regard and gave status to our family. As a child, I didn't find this bad at all but my mother didn't look that happy. It was a life without any discomfort. People around us would always gaze at us in envy. I was happy to live together with my mother that I love very much. This was exactly the reason why I wanted to help my mother. With this power of mine. I thought that I would be able to help my mother. When I was ten years old. I asked my mother if it was alright to use my magic. My mother said. I don't want you to become like me. To this day, I can't forget my mother's expression as she said that to me. It was like a final farewell that was full of sorrow as she tightly held me. The embrace was strong as my brows furrowed due to the pain I was in. Afterwards, a few days passed. And my mother. Amako-chan. Hey. I lifted my face up when I heard a familiar husky voice. In front of me, countless people were walking by. I could also see Lingal Kingdom's local specialty called Apako which were thorny fruits within my field of view. Right, I was tending the store at the moment. Are you okay? Amako-chan. Salrasan, sorry. 
I was spacing out. I was actually sleeping but I didn't want them to worry too much and kept quiet about it. Salrasan was the one to pick me up when I first came to this country. My benefactor. Honestly speaking, I was worn out and in tatters when I first came here. I was lucky enough to find a carriage to jump onto but I already used up all my strength and fell. Asleep when I got on. When I woke up, I was in a bed that Salrasan put me in. Afterwards I learned that Salrasan was a merchant who was stocking up on a paco and I was in that cart full of them. I didn't know this at that time and with my distrust of humans, I directed a lot of hostility towards Salrasan. However. Are you really alright? Maybe you should take the day off. Ah, uh, no. I'm fine. I was saved by this person and the townspeople. I always hid myself, running and running and running away, but this place was different. I've gone to many countries but. This was the first country was that was so different. That's why after her staying here. I didn't want to go back. The country which was home to my mother. It was also the place that wanted to just use my power. But I still wanted to save my mother. After all, that was my original purpose for coming here, to search for someone with healing magic. But to able to enter the country that used and threw away my mother. Oh, isn't that you Sado-sama? Eh. I naturally glanced towards the main street due to Salrasan's words. There was something like a big pouch. That was on a blue grizzly's back. Blurin? Walking beside was Yusato who seemed to be heading towards the gate. No matter how I look at him, he seems like just a normal boy but... It seems like he was the one to save my nephew from what I heard. I don't think he's normal at all. Ha 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 ha. When he ran around town carrying that big monster, I didn't know what to think. However, it's normal considering that Rosama was the one who took him in. Just what did the rescue squad do before I came here? During my one year here of watching the store... I haven't seen anyone else doing training like Yusato's. Come to think of it, I only knew the Yusato from my prophecies. I don't know anything about the Yusato that ran through the streets here. It was only recently that we talked face to face. He could use healing magic, had a great physical ability and was quite rough. I didn't know anything else about him. I understood that he was a kind person just like Salrasan but somewhere in my heart I couldn't trust Yusato. I can't help but think of the possibility of him one day betraying me and putting me into a cage. I would then be sold like an object. It couldn't be helped since there was fear wedged in deep inside my mind but I should try to trust Yusato. Salrasan, could I accompany Yusato, um, Sama, for a bit? I felt that things couldn't stay like this. Yusato should be aware of how dangerous it was to travel to my country to cure my mother. Despite this, I wasn't placing any trust into him at all even though he's the one saving me. Just like how the Salrasan and the townspeople stepped up to help me. It was my turn to walk up and believe. Yusato Sama? Ah, I remember now. We had a discussion yesterday. Amako-chan requested Yusato-sama to help cure your mother, right? Sure thing, go along. You'll definitely be fine if you're with Yusato-sama. Yeah. But don't push yourself too much. It was a good thing that there weren't a lot of people coming in today. I hurried to my room and got myself ready to go out. I then headed towards the gate. As I walked out, I didn't forget to call out to Salrasan that I was heading out. I didn't have to hide my ears and tails while walking in front of humans. I probably would have never imagined that a day like this would come before I came here. Nowadays I could just normally run through the streets. I wonder what my friends back at home would think if I told them. But in doing so, I realized I was unqualified to meet with them and breathed a sigh in dejection. While feeling down, I lightly jogged towards the gates. Before long, I could see the backs of Yusato and Blurin. Wait. Hum? Oh, it's Amako. What's wrong? Guo. Yusato came to a halt and despite carrying the large article on his back, he was still able to normally respond and incline his head to the side. While feeling somewhat reserved in front of Yusato, I drew closer to him and stopped next to him. I was displaying my intention to go along with him. Eh, you want to come along? You can't, it's dangerous. Where are you going? Are you going to the forest with, monsters? I could see a vision of Yusato and it showed me where he was headed. It was a forest full of monsters called Darklingle. Yusato and Blurin were both going there. As expected, it seems like having foresight is really convenient. Yusato then proceeded to talk about what he intended to do in the forest. Yusato wasn't carrying anything valuable on his back, it was actually a grave for Blurin's parents. It appeared that Blurin had a grand grizzly and blue grizzly as parents that passed away. When a monster dies, their magic power will return to its origin in the soil. The origin of this power will then mold a new shape of a monster and the cycle repeats itself. This was how the ecosystem worked here for different species. If you thought about it, death for a monster wasn't exactly death in a way. However, that line of thinking would be disrespectful to Yusato and Blurin who were putting up graves. Even so, I want to go. 
It might be a while before we get back, you know? I'm sure the owner of that store would be worried about you. If I go along with you, you won't be attacked by any monsters. I'll know when they're coming and I do possess some combat capability. Auntie said I'll be fine if I'm with you Sato too. Even if you say you'll be fine, it's really dangerous. Right, Blurin. My gaze fell upon Blurin as his name was mentioned. I could hear Yusato speaking in a barely audible voice to Blurin. It seemed like Yusato was asking Blurin if he was okay with protecting me. The Blurin in question responded with a howl that appeared to indicate his approval. As Yusato stood after his talk, I walked towards Blurin and lightly petted him on the head. You're kidding right? Blurin. For some reason, Yusato showed an expression of shock like never before. I continued to pet Blurin as he closed his eyes partly to indicate that it felt good. We beast can still have a few traces of a beast's instincts. We can roughly read the emotions of monsters and animals. However, Blurin was very obedient, he must trust Yusato a lot. I see, you respond to wicked thoughts don't you, Blurin? Gwa. Inyakumai-senpai and Aluru-san are definitely an out. Not including you, only leader has been able to pet Blurin like this. Although I think it was because he was too intimidated by her and just quietly let her pet him. Yusato was satisfied with his own answers and nodded. Yusato then seemed to have thought of something and said excuse me for a bit as he lifted me up. I was then mounted on Blurin's back. If it's like this, it probably won't be dangerous. Was Yusato unexpectedly simple-minded? But I wouldn't say that out loud. If I tried to tell him that I could run very fast, he might still be worried about me. I don't want give Yusato any more unnecessary worry. Instead of sitting on Blurin, I was lying down instead. It was unexpectedly stable and as I held down on his back with my hands. His fur was really soft and firm. Actually, it was really strange that Blurin would be accompanying a human like Yusato. Blurin was a boy born from a grand grizzly who could be called the king of the bears. Why was he following Yusato? While having this line of thought, Blurin gave a soft howl as I gently caressed his head. Well then, let's go. If possible, I want to return by today. Yusato easily lifted his luggage and started to lightly walk towards the gate. Blurin started to walk as well, matching Yusato's pace. It was a bit shaky on Blurin's back it was slowly swaying from his movements. It didn't feel all that bad, it was similar to riding a horse. In other words, it was quite comfortable. Hello, it's Yusato. Ah, Yusato-sama. What do you need today? Actually, I'm planning on going outside. I have leader's permission. Yusato gave something like a letter to the guard. After the guard saw it, he smiled and signaled the other guard to open the gate. Okay, it's valid. It's probably fine since it's Yusato-sama but do be careful. ERM, Thomas-san was it. Thank you very much. After Yusato gave his thanks to the guard called Thomas, he beckoned me to come over. While riding on Blurin, we both headed through the gates. When the gates closed behind us, it was like we entered a different world as it suddenly became very quiet. From there, Yusato was stretching his arms and legs for some reason while looking into the distance. Why was he warming up? Is what I would like to ask but there's plenty of other stuff I want to ask Yusato. I might just be worrying too much but I want make sure of something. I want to be able to place my trust in him in the truest sense. Yusato. Yeah. What's wrong? About Blurin's story. Could you tell me about it? About me and Blurin? I don't really mind but, why? It seems he trusts you a lot. I could see Blurin's happy expression as he looked at Yusato. I didn't sense any ill emotions from Blurin's eyes. The pure Blurin was just simply happy. Yusato seemed to be in a slightly good mood and started to stretch his entire body like a bowstring while taking a deep breath. Afterwards, Yusato did a few small hops and pointed at a direction using his finger. We were probably heading in that direction. Blurin and I naturally followed where Yusato was pointing. Well then, Amako. Make sure to hold on to Blurin tightly. At any rate, I'll be toning down to match Blurin's pace but no matter what. Don't let go, okay. Eh? Yusato, what are you saying? Do you intend to run from here? It was like he was implying that we would run all the way there. That was just unreasonable though it would take many hours to run from all the way here to reach our destination. We might even run into danger along the way, it would be odd to purposely drain your stamina. Don't tell me. He wasn't joking when he said he wanted to return by today. He was serious. Eh? Yeah, that's what I said. Even the beastkin who excel at running would be tired if they ran something this long. But this guy was serious about running it. For the time being, I'll secretly look at the future. However I was stunned at the scene that would happen several seconds from now. Well, let's go, Blurin. Run. Hey. Gia. Kia. I tightly grabbed onto the fur of the confused Blurin. Yusato suddenly told Blurin to run in a loud voice. After a few moments, 
I could already see the gate getting further and further away. Yusato's speed was comparable to a blue grizzly's running speed. What's more was that a blue grizzly uses four limbs to run while humans only use two. Just what was his body made of? At this pace, I think we should reach there in about an hour. As Yusato was running, his face was the same as when he was standing a moment ago. In town, I heard that the rescue squad focused their training on running. Now that I'm seeing it for myself, I can't believe it. There's no doubt that the healing magic being used in this country was different from all the other countries I've seen. No matter which country I went to, healing magicians would be discriminated against. The healing magicians too, very few of them had decent personalities. Additionally, they were disgusted with themselves because they possessed healing magic. And the moment they see me, they would think of capturing me and selling me off to a slave trader. Thinking along those lines, there was no one better than Yusato. Whether it be his personality or strong body to withstand the long journey, he was the most suitable. Are you all right, Blurin? Gurua. It appeared that it's been a while since Blurin had ran like this surrounded by nature. I could tell he was somewhat happy as he kicked the dirt away with a bit of a spring in his steps. During this time, I did my best to endure the shaking. All right then, let's maintain this speed. Why are you able to run, normally, like this? While I desperately held on to Blurin, I did my best to voice my doubts towards Yusato. Yusato tilted his head to the side as if my question was odd and looked towards me. Since you're part of the beast kin, isn't something like this very simple? It might not be that strange for one of the beast kin to run like this but I'm surprised that there's a human who can run this fast. There are plenty of humans who run faster than me. Right now I don't think I'm running that fast, I'm matching Blurin's pace because he's out of shape. Seeing that I was really surprised, Yusato couldn't help but be astonished too. Just exactly how did you perceive the beastkin inside your head? That was beside the point though, it's evident we've already surpassed the limits of a normal human's running speed. I feel like my definition of humans needs to be re-evaluated. As I was taking that into consideration, a sudden gust of wind came and I buried myself into Blurin's fur to defend myself. I would be staying here till we reached the forest. That reminds me, you wanted to hear about how Blurin and I met. Sorry, not now. Yusato was different from the other healing magicians. However, I really wished that his common sense wouldn't differ so much. We've finally arrived. I wiped off the sweat from my forehead as I gazed at the pitch black forest in front of me. Next to me was Amako who was on Blurin's back. I was a little curious since she seemed exhausted. Amako was a beast girl, she shouldn't be this worn out. Or at least that should be the case. While looking at this forest, I couldn't help but think I've come back. It was a forest that held various meanings for me. I was thrown into this forest by Rose the first time. I was launched in the sky by the fallbores the second time and was washed away by the river here. Well come to think it, those aren't very good memories. Actually, there was nothing but unpleasant ones. I really thought I would die to that gigantic snake. But when I had that stomachache for the first time, I really felt like I wanted to die. Still, this was the place where Blurin and I first met. There weren't a lot of good memories here but there were some that were worth experiencing. Which reminds me. Blurin, I just realized something very important. You you. I don't know the location of the cave that you lived in. Didn't you come here because you knew where you were headed? To put it bluntly, I still didn't know the exactly where everything was in this forest. I felt a little embarrassed as I asked Blurin. He looked at me with eyes that seemed to be looking at an idiot. After a few seconds, he gave a strong bear punch to my foot without holding back. Why you little, that really hurts. While reluctant, Amako got off Blurin's back. Guff ya. Ha, Blurin. My bad, I'll be counting on you. Blurin displayed a it can't be helped look while raising his head high with arrogance. Afterwards, Blurin started to use his nose and sniffed around. Blurin was a blue grizzly that originally lived in this forest, this place was probably like a playground to him. I followed after Blurin as he started to begin moving at a steady pace. This place, it really hasn't changed. It's my first time coming here but it's quite the ominous place. Once you get used to it, it's not that bad. From the outside, you might only see nothing but trees everywhere. But once you're inside, you'll see that it's unexpectedly bright since the sun does shine through. That's not really what I meant though. Amako replied as she stared at me with narrowed eyes. Did I say something strange? This forest has a dense amount of monster spirits. Humans might not be able to sense it but a beast girl like me feels tingly just by being here. Really now? There were also demerits for a beastkin's sharp senses. We should quickly make Blurin's grave and get out of here. I might be a rough person but she was still just a child. I didn't want her to push herself too much. Yusato, how long did you stay here when you met Blurin? Eh? About ten days. I don't remember exactly but I felt it should be around that long. To begin with, my objective was to take down a grand grizzly. Even if I wanted to go back, I couldn't. 
And later on I learned from Rose that she intended for me to be beaten down by the Grand Grizzly. Kukiku. Yu Yu Sato? What's wrong? Oops. I let out a dark laugh unintentionally when I remembered that unreasonable situation back then. I immediately smiled and Amako's face cramped up from seeing the sudden change. I've done it now. I was used to acting like this around Senpai but Amako was just a normal child. Right, act normal. I really feel like good now that we've finally arrived in this forest. In fact, I suddenly want to blow away that blue grizzly over there to the skies. This time, Amako moved away from Blurin. Even if it's me, there's no way I could easily blow away a blue grizzly like that. I guess they didn't get the joke. But even if I said that now, they might not believe me. I guess this was going to happen since I wasn't used to it. Maybe once I get a bit smarter, I'll try thinking of other ways to get along better with children. After walking inside the forest for a bit, I found a familiar marking on a tree. It was nostalgic to see the sharp lines engraved on the tree. I came here for the first time around one month ago. Then I got busy with the war and it feels like a lot of time has passed. This mark was something that I left during my time here so I wouldn't lose sight of my surroundings. If I recall correctly, I made this particular marking when the Grand Grizzly was nearby. Well, let's go. Gua. Blurin gave a cry lower than usual. You feel uneasy. I stroked Blurin's head as he stared at the cave he originally lived in. After bringing down that snake, I carried his parents over to this cave and left with Blurin. He probably didn't want to look at them with his own eyes. It was extremely sudden and Blurin probably couldn't keep up with what was happening. He simply directed his resent at that snake and went straight towards it. He was fighting to die. They're your parents, right? That's why you have to give a proper farewell, you fool. You're my partner, you'll be going on a journey with me to save Amako's mother. Therefore, you should settle this matter so time starts moving for you again. I learned a bit from seeing the funeral for the fallen soldiers in the battle we recently had. I was thinking various things like how I lacked power to protect people but... I thought that I should first save the people who need my help. I could probably help those scary fellows back at the rescue squad but somehow I felt unpleasant at the thought of it. As for Rose? I would die. Thinking along those lines, I was thinking of helping Blurin to get over the death of his parents. It might be a bit late to start thinking like this now but I'm not complaining because I had high potential for this. Guru. Blurin took a step forward while howling out. Without hesitation, Blurin continued forward with reassurance as I followed after him. But it seemed that Amako was staring at me like she had something to say to me. You, really will save my mother. Eh. She didn't believe in me. While feeling a little hurt from her words, I turned to face Amako who was in the opposite direction from where Blurin was walking. Sorry. It's not like I don't believe in you or anything. I just felt that things were going too well that I couldn't believe it was really happening. Ah. That's what you meant. She hasn't met a healer like me until now. I only knew types like Rose and Olga San so I didn't know a whole lot. Given this chance to talk, I might as well ask. What are the other healers like? I don't think it'd be very interesting to hear about though. Please tell me about them. Amako hesitated but I really did want to hear. I didn't know what a normal healing magician was like. That reminds me, Tong talked about them for a bit when I first came into the rescue squad. The healers didn't have a very good reputation in this world. There is one healer in the country next to Lingal Kingdom, the Magic City, Luquis. Magic City. It's an academy that cultivates magic. It's like Lingal Kingdom where everyone is from the same place. Different people from each nation come to this academy. I guess it's something like exchange students. Amako, you're enrolled there. I snuck in. It was quite easy. I used my foresight to find a hole in the guards' patrols. This was quite the aggressive child. While the courage needed to jump out alone to save her mother is amazing. Her ability to take action when needed isn't normal. Coupling this with her special power, she might be invincible as a spy. The human that I met was harassed and bullied. Even though being in the magic city meant that their abilities were evaluated quite highly along with it being a scarce magic attribute. To the humans, it was something just slightly unusual. Even though this magic can cure poison and heal wounds, it was just something slightly unusual. The magic was still useful for healing wounds. However, most magicians don't fight against enemies with poison. I'm guessing that it wasn't something necessary. Also from what I remember, no matter what attribute you had you would be able to use magic to heal yourself. This was why the healing magic attribute seemed useless as they were only slightly better at healing. Well, aren't they aware that healing magic can also be used to cure diseases to a certain extent? There aren't many healers who can do that. It seems that even without relying on magic, there are doctors to cure illnesses. That's why this isn't regarded as something highly important. There are even doctors in this world. I haven't tried curing an illness myself but I remembered the scene I witnessed when I visited Olga San's clinic. He applied a high concentration of magical power and coated the entire patient's body. 
The healing magic penetrated and restored the patient's health. It was different from healing a wound or poison. These types of injuries came from an external source while an illness came from the body itself. There's also a place where demi-humans and beast can commute. I hear that it was quite dangerous unless you had some considerable ability. One of the beast can helped me out once while I was there. However, they immediately left afterwards. I see. So what about the person who can use healing magic? They're not someone who would listen to you at all. I used my foresight and they wouldn't even look at me, let alone help me. Ha, huh, that's quite something. No matter which world it was, there would always be people that were being bullied. They were thinking that there was no value in their only strength of healing magic. It might be better to let them see Rose so she can deliver a punch to them. That person would only need one month to transform a bullied kid into a different healer. While I was going through the nostalgic training I went through with Rose in my head, Bluren stopped walking. Something rustled in the bush in front of Bluren. In response, Bluren barked. Guru uh, What's wrong? Looking closely, wasn't this the bush I used to observe the Grand Grizzly? Without time to confirm my question, Bluren jumped into the bush. Amako and I followed along, leading us to a spacious area. It was the cave where Bluren was born and raised. It was also where his parents laid dead. It should have been a cave without an owner but Bluren was glaring within the depths of the cave. I didn't understand the situation until the creatures inside showed themselves. Guru. Guru uh. It was two blue grizzlies, were they a couple? They came out from Bluren's home. For the moment, I stood in front of Amako as I applied a healing coating onto her. I prepared myself to run at any time as well. They seemed to be a bigger species than Bluren. If we couldn't run away, I would have no choice but to be their opponent. Bluren, calm down. I tried calling out to Bluren but he showed no signs of backing down. The blue grizzlies on the other side were cautious and treated me as a threat. I wasn't scared but it would be bad if they attacked Amako. Although I wasn't sure of what would happen since I couldn't see the future. After another moment of staring down at each other from opposite sides the two big blue grizzlies seemed to be frightened as they looked at me and slowly retreated backwards. Nnn? Yusato, those blue grizzlies are afraid. Afraid? Did I do something that would make them afraid? I didn't have a face like Tongs, my face was just ordinary and nothing special. Don't tell me. I've obtained an aura like roses that oppresses everything around me. To think I would be able to scare something like a blue grizzly away. I thought I would die from the two times I've met a blue grizzly. The first time was Bluren's mother and the second time was with Inyakumai Senpai when we got washed away. Maybe. They were the blue grizzlies we injured. Come to think of it, one of the blue grizzlies looks like the one I tackled. The size and form is similar too. If this is the case, it makes sense that they're scared. For now, I slightly swung my hand to see what would happen. They backed up even further. Just how scared were they? Stop it, Yusato. They're very frightened. Was she mad at me just now? While I felt it was a little unreasonable, I looked as Bluren and the two blue grizzlies started talking with each other with cries. After this exchange went by many times, I stood up since I had no idea what they were talking about. They continued conversing for about a few more minutes. Afterwards, the two blue grizzlies stopped talking and seemed to lower their guards towards Bluren. I wonder if they reached a resolution. It seems like it's over. Bluren isn't angry anymore. I envy you. You can understand his feelings as a beastkin. It was a skill that Inyakumai Senpai would want for sure. The two blue grizzlies came closer but were still vigilant. Was Bluren introducing me? Bluren was still the boss of this forest in a sense, with him being the son of the Grand Grizzly. Maybe that's why he was able to persuade these two blue grizzlies. But I wonder what Bluren would explain to these two that were afraid of me. I got the feeling that they were even more afraid of me than before. Yusato, just what did you do? What I did was normal. I tackled one of them and they lost conscious. A normal human wouldn't be able to ram a blue grizzly and cause them to faint, you know. Once again, Amako drew away further from me even though Inyakumai Senpai didn't react to this. If I told her that I only made the blue grizzly unconscious and it wasn't that amazing, she might pull away again. I felt like my common sense with this world was different. In a world with sword and magic, shouldn't there be plenty of people who could do this much? Ha! Huh. At any rate, let's make the grave. Gura. I took down the rucksack on my back as I said that and Bluren responded with a nod. All right. Erecting the grave was a lot easier than I thought. Since I was just a high school student, there was no way I could make a real grave. I just made a simple one. I took two plank boards and formed a cross with them. I took the grave and stuck it on the hill near the cave along with a large number of fruits. Leaving these as an offering, I kneeled before the grave. Grand Grizzly, I was told by Rose to defeat you but in the end I wasn't able to. I was only able to run around the forest until it got dark. I really wanted to beat you down. Just what are you saying? Guru uh, You guys, 
aren't you getting along a little too well? Blurin was staring at the grave until now, he must have already bid farewell. Even though this cross was a substitute, Blurin understood it was his parents' graves. For this reason. Qua. And then. A mysterious paw appeared at my feet. A blue grizzly that was a lot younger than Blurin was playfully gnawing at my leg while lightly scratching at my feet with their paws. What's with this child? So cute. It's not like I had a weakness for cute things but I couldn't help but have my heart be stolen by this small masket-like blue bear. I lifted the little cub up as gently as possible. However, one of the blue grizzlies returned from the cave and started crying out. I suspect that this cub was the child of the two blue grizzlies from before. I didn't want any unnecessary arguments so I let down the little blue cub and urged it to go back to its parents. All right, there. Qua. Good grief, it would have been really bad if I was Inyakami Senpai. Although, Inyakami Senpai was already really bad alone. Silently thinking so, I saw the blue grizzly parent urging their child to come back. The cub started to slowly walk back. There's another blue grizzly cub here too. Amako's voice came from inside the cave and walked out. The other blue grizzly parent followed behind her along with another blue grizzly cub that seemed to be slightly bigger. They returned to the earth and resurrected again as a new life. Rather than resurrected, it should be that they were born. Certainly, you're right. Blurin's parents were born again but they were two different existences. There were a number of lines from books I've read to describe this scene but one thing I could say for sure was that I felt I've made the right choice. While I felt deeply moved, Blurin was sitting there and watching the small blue bears with sad eyes. Let's go back, Blurin. Gawr. We stood up and after giving one last glance back at the cave, we walked away. With this, Blurin should have no more regrets. Probably. I wasn't confident but maybe Blurin wanted to live there with the other blue grizzlies in that cave. It probably wasn't a fun journey for Amako who tagged along. We basically came and made a grave for Blurin's parents. We also met two blue grizzlies along with their cubs. Amako, it wasn't all that interesting, right? Nope, I'm glad I came. I know what kind of person you are now, Yusato. Me, hey. Maybe she doubted me. Well, the problem now was how to get back. I remember the way but whether I wasn't sure if we could get back before it got dark. The sun was close to setting, we had to hurry. Yusato, am I riding on Blurin on the way back? Eh? Would that be too much? She was unexpectedly silent as we came here, I didn't think Blurin's back was that uncomfortable. If that's the case, what should I do? Should I carry you instead? That's... I don't want that. She immediately turned away as she said that. I might have been able to accept it if an adult turned me away at the offer but a girl who seemed to be 14 years old rejected me. If it was Inyakamai Senpai, she would have taken a lot of damage. That person really doesn't hold back. Although I think that's also one of her good points. I was the one who said I would tag along, I'll get on Blurin. Then let's get back before it gets too late. It'll be fine even if I get back a bit late. I'll just be yelled at a bit. Amako felt a bit reserved as she rode on Blurin's back. She seemed to be spacing out as she stared into the sky. I didn't notice it until now but she was probably looking into the future right now. She was probably seeing if it was dangerous to get on Blurin right now. Looking at her, various feelings sprung up. Other countries. Amako went to various countries. Places that were different from Lingal Kingdom. What would I do and how would I face these countries? Should I hide the fact that I was a healing magician? Do I hide the fact that I'm a person from a different world? Or do I conceal nothing at all and head straight in? What'll happen will happen I guess. The people who look down on healing magic, I'll just tell them otherwise. I won't lose sight of my goal as I had a duty. Amako who saved Senpai and Kazuki. She asked me to cure her mother. I definitely can't betray that. Which was why I'll save your mother as repayment for saving my friends. Well, I was thinking of all this but... In the end, that decision would be left to King Lloyd. We were able to come back safely yesterday before it got dark after making the grave for Blurin's parents. I roughly explained what we were doing in the forest to Sal Raisin who was looking after Amako. However in doing so, I ended up receiving these spiky fruits called Apako. More than I could carry with my two arms. It'd be rude to refuse so I accepted it and passed along the fruits to Alek when I got back. Alek then used the fruits to make today's dessert after dinner. As expected of the person in charge of the rescue squad's meals, his cooking actually tasted the most normal. Compared to the hazardous substance I had before. It was the difference between heaven and earth. As for today, I would be training with Rose. I wore my white uniform and went to the usual training spot. Rose was there in deep thought as she silently stared at me with folded arms. I was only thinking of doing training with you since it's been so long but the matter you brought up yesterday. I don't have much say in it. Eh? But the illness is probably complicated, I don't think I'll be able to cure it. You'll naturally become more experienced and will be able to do so. 
Either way, it's impossible for you right now. When you say it so bluntly like that, I already feel like giving up. Then I wonder what should I do? Should I just continue strengthening my body? After running yesterday, my body is more or less back to its top condition. I have quite a bit of stamina and strength now. You receive passing marks for your physical and mental strength but... I stand corrected. In front of Rose, I still had much more to improve on. I just wonder how far she wants me to go. Then, just what should I do? After saying so, Rose distanced herself from me a bit. She then started winding up an arm as if warming up. I have a really bad feeling about this. I'm going to hit you right now. Ah ha ha, good joke. I'll be punching at a speed that you can't react to. You won't be able to dodge or defend. You really hate me that much? More importantly, I'll blow up if I receive one of your punches. I remembered the scene of Rose who smashed that snake's head. Even with my amount of strength, I couldn't do anything against that snake's scales. Understanding that, I knew Rose's strength was abnormal. I would surely meet my dead end here if I received her punch. You rely on healing magic too much. Well, that's how I trained you to use it but... It's time for you to proceed to the next step. What's with this ridiculous step up? You think I'll just take it? With lightning speed, I started running away. Only to be caught by my hood. I I don't want to. I I I'll be killed. Did Amako not foresee this future? If you were to head outside right now, you would still be too defenseless. Until now, you've got through each situation one way or another but you won't be able to cure wounds caused by curses. Learn to evade. I haven't been confident in my evasion before but why would it be at a level I can't react to? Didn't speed equals power? This person probably had her reasons that were related to healing magic. Well, it's not like I'm a demon. I'll start off easy. No, I mean. Isn't it bad in the first place to hit your own subordinate? Is that head of yours empty inside? Ah. I'm sorry. I see. You want me to be serious. I'm really happy. You're so enthusiastic about your training. Just why does my mouth unintentionally say things like that? Rose was already ready to start. While giving a lifeless laugh, I used all my healing magic and coated myself. There were thoughts floating inside my head. Like if I would be blown 10 meters away before hitting the ground, and barely being able to stand. Like I said, you'll be avoiding, not blocking. Don't ask for the impossible. In that instant, I felt the strongest impact in my life as I was assaulted by a force that went through the opening of my arm. While feeling the intense pain of a fist drilling into my body, I felt my vision rotating round and round. I would probably be able to understand what happened later on. I never received an impact like this before. Ha. Huh. I woke up under a tree in the training area. This felt nice. I was wrapped in the shade of the tree. That's right, I didn't start training with Rose. Did I do too much training before? What a nightmare I had. My impression of Rose was deteriorating lately. No, I can't think like that. Aluru-san said that Rose was someone who was hurt easily. I can't always be scared of her like this. Oh, you're awake? Then let's do it again. I was a little too quick to escape from the truth. What happened before was real and Aluru-san's remark about Rose feels very far away now. I guess I have no choice but to face reality. Yes. Yet. Yeah. Just because there was nothing unusual with my body, I shouldn't just assume what happened was just a dream. As expected of Rose, she really was a good role model for a master. Really, a master like her was too good for someone like me. In fact, it's such a waste to have her as my master. Someone else should take my place instead. Don't worry, I used just the right amount of strength when I punched you. Your body is fine, right? Thank you very much. I've always had this at the back of mind but, you're really a monster. In the end, I continued to receive Rose's fists. I felt that I had dodged a punch on several occasions but Rose would increase the speed of her punch when that happened. I would be blown away every time. I couldn't help but feel scared since I knew she was holding back. But my endurance did go up. Well obviously it would go up. Even if I didn't want it to, I've been doing this for two or three days now. I had the feeling that I could withstand any ordinary attack now. It felt like I could calmly receive a missile heading towards me. I was around 170 centimeters tall. I had a fair bit of weight too. I would be blown away easily even with that but I was getting used to it. The thing was though. Every time I felt I would dodge a punch, I would receive a critical hit. Don't tell me, that person already forgot what kind of training we were doing. Four days had passed since I started this kind of training with Rose. I was letting my body rest for now. Rose gave me permission to take a breather and she also seemed to have some minor business to attend to. In other words, my day was open today. Since that was the case, I headed for the castle. There was no reason in particular. I was just a little curious about someone and my feet ended up taking me here. So like I was saying, 
leader is really horrible. She kept punching and blowing me away. Why are you here? No, even if you ask me. I don't really know myself. I was inside the cells and the person who complained was the Black Knight as she scowled at me. The Black Knight was sitting down inside of the cell and she didn't wear her helmet to cover her face. She seemed to be behaving herself after we talked last time. But the kingdom didn't really know what to do with her after getting their answers. There were extreme opinions such as getting rid of her because she was dangerous. But since it was Lloyd Sama, he obstinately refused to give permission for it. I don't know if Lloyd Sama's judgment is good but I personally agree. I don't want. Something like the death penalty in a peaceful country like this. The Black Knight also had to bear the responsibility for the people she had hurt in the war. However, the scary fellows back at the squad seemed to have taken care of most of them. It might have been fortunate that Inyakumai Senpai and Kazuki fought a long battle against the Black Knight in this scenario. What will you do now? Nothing really. I'll just be here. Are you fine with that? That's not something I can decide, right? That's up to you guys. She has a point but I really didn't know what would happen. Well, I did capture her after all. I felt a sense of responsibility here. I also wouldn't like to see her go through the death penalty. You are. And then. It's nothing. Hurry up and leave. Ha, I understand. Doing as she said, I left the cell. But maybe Rose was settling the Black Knight's matters right now. I might not even have to do anything. Should I consult Rose about this? While I thought about what to do with the Black Knight, I noticed a figure of a person swinging their sword outside. It was probably Kazuki. I decided to go out of the castle to see. As soon as I got closer, I could make out that it was indeed Kazuki. Fun. Kazuki was trying his best. I didn't want to get in way but as I started moving away, Siriyasama appeared from behind a nearby tree while chuckling. Era, you said Osama. Hello, Siriyasama. When did Kazuki start training? He just started a few minutes ago. I'm a bit worried about his stamina, he's been pushing himself ever since his last encounter with the Mu army. I feel a little strange. Is Kazuki really doing training right now? Compared to what I have to endure in my training. UMM, are you okay? Your eyes are scary. Eyes? What's wrong with my eyes? I wonder why Siriyasama had a pale face right now. At any rate, I turned back to look at Kazuki. He was swinging his iron sword with all his might. He did seem to be doing everything he could. Hey? Yusato. Kazuki noticed that I was next to Siriyasama. He returned the sword back to his scabbard and walked closer to us while wiping off his sweat. It's been a while. I've been a bit busy with my training recently. Although I don't know if you could call what I've been doing to be training. I heard from Inyakumai Senpai, you'll be going to the Beastkin's country to help a beast child from here. Well, it's not been decided yet. That's still up to Lloyd Sama. But if possible, I do want to help her. About that. Siria Sama seemed to have something to say and she looked towards me and Kazuki. Since she was Lloyd Sama's daughter, she might know something. Yusato Sama's wish to go to the Beastkin country will probably be granted. W wait a minute. So easily. Shouldn't you normally think about it a bit more? It hasn't even been one week. Did they already reach a decision? No, it was too fast. There must be something else. Father will send you to other countries with letters that ask for the cooperation to defeat the Mu army. It was unfortunate but we couldn't obtain their help last time we sent letters. But the circumstances are now also different. Different circumstances. We were able to successfully repel the Mu army. It was a narrow victory that made use of Kazuki-sama and Inyakumai-sama's powers but not everyone knows that. Additionally, there should have been much more casualties. If Yusato didn't save me there, I would have been. But Kazuki didn't continue. Did Kazuki not want Siriyasama to hear that he could have died? Well, leaving that aside. I'm more concerned about the letter from Lloyd Sama. If what Amako said was true, it might not necessarily been a bad thing for this country to have lost the recent fight. It would let the other countries know that the Mu army was a threat and they might be more willing to lend a hand. But it would probably be difficult to get the Beastkin's country cooperation. They're hostile towards humans and all. It would be good if I could save Amako's mother. Nothing has been set in stone yet. But it won't change the fact that the letters will be sent to each nation. This might even bring more troubles to Yusato. I've received a lot of help from this country, don't worry about it. This is nothing. Compared to training with Rose, this was exceptionally more comforting. Hey, why do I keep comparing everything to Rose's training now? This wasn't really the most normal standard for comparison. Well, I'll ask for the specifics when I get an audience with Lloyd Sama. I'll be training until then. Then, I should return soon. Eh, you're already going back. Fu fu fu, Kazuki Sama, Yusato Sama is probably very busy. It's not like I was really busy but after seeing Kazuki's training, 
I felt like I had to be doing something too. I was only going to another country to heal Amako's mother in the beginning. But I didn't think that I would now go to each nation to obtain their cooperation as well. However, it was an important task that was necessary for opposing the threat in front of us. This country could be referring to as the front lines, since it was the closest to the Mu territory. Therefore, other countries would most likely offer their help to defend this area but... It was just a thought but... The other nations might not be completely aware of the threat yet. It appears that a lot of time has passed since the Mu's previous reign. People will forget and not remember the fear that their reign brought. If it wasn't for Amako, Inyakumai Senpai and Kazuki would have been. But if we had lost the previous fight, it could have also served as something like a smoke signal to the neighboring countries. Well then, Kazuki-sama. Would you care to go into more detail about what you were saying before? H ha ha ha. Sorry. I gave a wry smile as I heard the two of them talking from behind and headed for the lodgings. Today, that healer called Yusato came by. After he kept on giving his complaints to me, he quickly left. Why did he come here? Was he making sure that I wouldn't escape? Well, even if I ran away. I would be chased down by this kingdom and the Mu army. That would be a pain so I don't plan on running away. But the story changes if I get the death penalty. I was restricted with bindings that sealed my power but it wouldn't interfere with my ability to escape and kill anyone who gets in my way. After escaping, I would probably distract myself by talking with the king before that healing magician comes and kills me I guess. Well that's what I had in mind before but... Just what's with these people? They didn't torture me and their security is really lax. Did they just like to keep people locked up? I was getting a little irritated. Do they want to keep me locked or do they want to let me go? Decide already, damn it. If I think about it, the strangest one was Yusato. He healed my injuries and he specifically came to see me. There was definitely something wrong inside of his human head. What should I do now? I unfastened my helmet and exposed myself to the open air. I felt a comfortable sensation from the warm jail cell as I leaned my back on the wall to think. If I returned to the Mu's side, I would just go back to my everyday normal boring life. But if I remained here, I would just be stuck in this jail. I didn't really mind that much, I didn't find it disagreeable for Yusato to come and visit me. I wasn't used to being approached like that so I didn't really know how to respond today. I could hear someone descending down from the stairs. Was it the guard? No, I usually hear a metallic clanking sound when they come. I could only hear footsteps this time. I wore my helmet again and focused my eyes on the staircase. I could see a woman with green hair that wore a white uniform through the darkness. I was wondering who it was but then I remembered Yusato's complaints from today. It was probably the leader he kept talking about. It was someone who the third commander was cautious of and another healing user apart from Yusato. You. The leader of the rescue squad, Rose. I came here on the request of Lloyd but, you're quite the, reserved fellow. What did you come here for? Nearby, there was a stool that the guard usually uses. Rose sat on it like an outlaw and the corners of her mouth distorted into a smile while she looked at me with her eyes. It was very clear that she was genuinely the superior of Yusato. You have two choices, yet. The first is to spend your whole life here. But Lloyd Sama has offered another alternative. Rose used two fingers to display her intentions. Just what does she want to say? If I'll be killed then I'll. If you're going to kill me, then just kill me already. Hey hey, you're really a hasty fellow, aren't you? The carefree Rose stood up from her seat and retrieved a key from her bosom to open the cell's door. She briskly walked in and sat again while looking over me. The alternative that Lloyd Sama gave is really troublesome but... I'm to beat you until you've turned into a new person and crush your previous character. You'll become a... Good citizen. Huh? Are you some kind of idiot Gaha? At that moment, I felt a tremendous impact on my head as my helmet vanished in an instant. I was unconsciously welled up with tears from the sensation as Rose seemed to be looking at me in admiration. I see. It looks like healing magic really is effective. But well, it's a hindrance right now. The pain wasn't a problem but my head felt like woozy and I felt unstable. What's with this woman? She was bad news, there wasn't anyone this wild and violent when I lived with the demons. My plate body started to disappear as well. It might have been due to the fact that Rose had even stronger healing magic than Yusato. Rose who had lost her grip due to my armor disappearing, grabbed me by the neck with my clothes instead and raised me up. She then started to continuously punch me. While feeling a strange sensation from my neck, the magical power flowed through my entire body and my armor completely disappeared. W wait a minute. My armor could absorb and counter magic. It was a rare tool and I always relied on it so when it disappeared so easily, I couldn't help but panic. I was frightened as I looked at the woman in front of me. To be honest, you have no right to refuse. We don't have the time to mind people like you in this country right now. Even so, I'll take you away because I want to. Ah, why you relying? Starting from today, 
you will be an underling for the rescue squad. I'll beat everything into you so prepare yourself. Everything was happening so fast that I couldn't keep up. I was wrong, this country wasn't that soft. Rose easily lifted me and carried me over her shoulder. I harbored a terror that I had never felt before. Blur in. Just one more lap. Guru a a a a a. After returning back to the training grounds, Blurin and I did nothing but run. I always used healing magic to run but this time around, I tried to run without using any. There wasn't any special reason behind it but I've recently learned the pleasure of trying various different things while training. My fatigue kept building up as I didn't use any healing magic while running. I feel like I understand what Rose meant when she said I only received a passing mark. And the fact that I rely on healing magic too much. I had to be able to fight without using healing magic. If a monster from something like an RPG appeared that could seal my magic, I would be nothing but a body of flesh. I see now, Leader wanted me to notice this which is why she kept on sending me flying. Healing magic was important. But the origins of the rescue squad was based on building the physical body. I felt like I've finally been enlightened and reached the truth behind this training. You've got it wrong, idiot. Gay hat. I was running but before I knew it, Rose appeared and kicked me hard from my sides. I rotated three times before landing. After getting up, I gave a sigh as Rose called me an idiot. I told you to rest today. No, well. I just naturally ended up moving here. And then. Rose was carrying something over her shoulder. It wasn't moving but it did seem to. Be breathing. It looks like it wasn't this evening's dinner. No, if it really was to become our dinner. That would be scary. Nevertheless, I seem to recognize this silver hair. How should I say it? It seemed to awfully resemble that black knight who was confined in the basement. The brute in front of me seemed to notice me inclining my head to the side and casually dropped off the silver-haired girl onto the grass. The girl who had been dropped off had a pale face as she looked bewildered at her surroundings. When she noticed me, she became speechless. I was also at a loss for words. W.Y. Did you take someone like her along with you? Isn't this the girl that's inside the Black Knight's armor? Someone like a demon, aren't they interesting? This one is quite durable, they should be worth forging. No no no, that's not the point. Their magic is sealed so it's not like they can do much. Well just in case, I'll be the one to watch over her. If that's so then. I'm not too worried. What they? You should hurry up and say so if it was like that. I was needlessly surprised for nothing. The girl was dumbfounded as she looked at the exchange between me and Rose. What will I do from now on? What will happen to me? For the time being, why don't you write a diary today? You'll probably want to escape reality by writing in that diary after a few days. Day 1. Yusato kept on pushing me to write this but I really have no idea what the point of this was. But for the time being, I thought I would write about today's events. It's been many years since I've written something but surprisingly, I still remembered how to write. I was forcefully taken out of the cell by that woman today. I got taken to some place called the rescue squad. I had something fastened onto my neck which sealed my magic. I couldn't get it off no matter what I did. During the moment I realized I couldn't take this off, I witnessed the scene of Yusato being sent flying. It was amusing to see his silly face. That's all that happened today. It seemed that I would be training with Rose tomorrow. Since I was a demon, I probably didn't have to prepare much for training meant for humans. It'll be easy. Day 2. I thought I would die today. I misunderstood the situation. I thought it would be easy because it was training for humans. I ran along with the ogre like Tong and Alak along with the goblin like Mil, Gomal, and Gold. Their running was just way too excessive, it severely pushed my limits. I asked if they were some kind of monsters but they replied that they were just humans. I suspect they were some kind of special monsters that have been tamed by Rose. I feel sorry for them. They actually think they're humans. Although I had superhuman physical ability, I wasn't all that impressive compared to other demons. Around the time that the sun had risen right above my head, I felt like falling down from fatigue. I'm not sure if it was intentional but Rose came at this timing and placed her palm on my leg, forcing me to run again. The physical pain was gone but a different type of pain assaulted me. I could hear something like just like you said Doha from the guys in front of me but I didn't pay much attention to it. I didn't have the leisure to worry about other things right now. This was hell. I want to return back to my cell. Day 3. Since yesterday, I haven't been able to move. Day 4. That woman is not human. There's something wrong with her. She kicked me out of bed and told me to start running even though I couldn't move. Why was you said to laughing? Did he adapt to it already? Was this an everyday occurrence? Day 5. I was running along with Yusato today. But it was strange. We were still running along with those ogres and goblins but he wasn't running out of breath at all. Even though I was suffering so much. Was Yusato not human? There's no way a human could beat me so easily like this. 
That's what I tried to convince myself but then I realized that only humans could use healing magic. Yusato was a human but at the same time, also not a human. That was the only way I could explain it. Day 6 Which reminds me, I heard a crashing sound deep in the forest when I first started training. Every time I heard it, birds would simultaneously fly away as well. It seemed like something was being thrown at a tree. Tomorrow, I'll check it out by pretending to be tired. Skipping classes is one of my talents. Day 7 Day 8. I'm very sorry for trying to sneak out of training. Day 9. It might be hard to believe but the training that Yusato was doing. He was simply being punched with an unbelievable amount of power by Rose. Yusato would be hit by a punch and spin several times in the air before crashing into a tree with tremendous force. After a few seconds, his body would fall to the ground. I thought he might have died. Even if the strength of that punch surpassed an ogre's, it shouldn't make a sound like that. It was just one punch and one impact to the body. However, Yusato got up normally and then started applying healing magic towards his stomach. It looked painful but that was it. I couldn't believe what was taking place in front of me. Something like this. Without writing it down, I wouldn't be able to preserve my own thoughts. Was this the territory of the Mu? No, what was happening right now far exceeded anything like what I've seen before. I felt like I was going insane. Day 10. For some reason, they thought I had taken an interest in Yusato's training. During dinner, Rose told me that I could accompany Yusato along with his training. Honestly, I couldn't give a reply because I was exhausted from training with those ogres and goblins. But perhaps this might be a chance. I'm reluctant to go along with it but I still didn't know the purpose for Yusato's training. For some reason, Yusato was strongly against it. I suspect there was something he didn't want me to know. It felt great seeing I was holding some advantage over him. I was already tired today but I felt like I would get some good sleep today. I checked the diary as I felt something was wrong. After I checked the contents again, I closed it once more. It looks like I was still dreaming. Someone, please wake me up. This wasn't training. This was torture. That's why I told you already, dodge. How many times do I have to tell you before you get it? When I do dodge your damn fist, you change the trajectory anyways. Unless you're telling me to dodge all these questions of yours. If you looked carefully, you would be able to dodge something like that. Rose was far away from Yusato who had been sent flying. Yusato stood up as if nothing happened and started to speak sharply to Rose with a frightening expression. During these days, I've been engraved with a sense of fear towards that woman. But Yusato was now displaying this kind of attitude towards her without holding back. I couldn't comprehend his mysterious actions. Damn, we're doing it again. What the hell is up with that? That's what I should be saying. Yusato spoke first while glaring at Rose. The two of them got closer to each other again. Their distance was about 10 meters. Yusato's eyes didn't resemble a human's eyes at all. To face that monster with such straightforward eyes like those. He might just be stronger than everyone else except for the third commander. Even if they had a close relationship, I definitely had no confidence in winning against her. While I was still trying to grip onto reality, Rose's figure disappeared. This time, I couldn't see her movement at all. At first, it was at a level I could somewhat see. I immediately looked at Yusato. Buna. Eh, did he dodge it? In just that one instant, Yusato had turned his body to avoid Rose's fist. I couldn't believe it. Dodging something like Rose's fist that is. Did he use his eyes? Even so, it wasn't a reaction that a human should have been capable of. H he did it, with this. Don't let your guard down. Gaho. E. I was glad to see Yusato finally dodge Rose's fist but. Rose mercilessly used a roundhouse kick on Yusato's abdomen during this moment. While hearing the intense impact from Yusato's body. He started flying away and didn't stop even when he touched the ground. He bounced four times on the ground before coming to a halt. It was truly the deed of a brute. A are you okay, Yusato? It was out of character for me to worry like this. Yusato got up and sat down while suppressing his abdomen with his hand. It seemed he received quite a bit of damage as he was swaying from side to side. For the time being, I ran over to confirm his condition. But at the moment I got close to Yusato, he clenched his fist and shouted. I did it. I dodged it. Yes, that's what he shouted. Oh wah. It was so unexpected that I couldn't help but be startled. I couldn't even give a proper response. Ha. Huh. Well done, now I don't need to punch you anymore. You can go back to doing your usual training. Rose said so with a smile and folded her arms while looking down on the bowing Yusato. I witnessed the dangerous chemistry between the two just a while ago. I couldn't stop the perspiration of my cold sweat. I wonder if Rose had something to attend to. Rose left for the lodgings just like that. It would be good if Yusato did as he was told and just focused on training but... Really, 
to think she could change her trajectory in the middle of her punches. As expected, Rose is a monster. You were fine after being kicked by that monster. Realize it already. And then? Did you say something? I could only sigh at those words and we moved towards the usual training grounds. Yusato retrieved his coat from something like a pouch and put it on. Well then, let's do some light running today for your training. Ah, that reminds me, it's a bit late but I still haven't heard it. Heard what? Your name. That's very late. I mean. We usually only have time to talk during dinner time but there's not much time and we sleep immediately afterwards so. That was certainly the case. However, during these ten days he hasn't felt any discomfort or inconvenience from not knowing my name. It was kind of mortifying. Name, hey. Everyone back at the army pretty much called me the Black Knight so there was never really a need for people to ask for my name. I've probably only told that fellow who was leading the second army. But here, I should have already told Rose along with Tong and the others. Come to think of it, I don't recall those guys calling my name in front of Yusato. It might have been a while since another person asked for my name. Effie. Felm. But my parents usually call me Fel. I was somewhat nervous as I said so but Yusato nodded and said. Felm is it? Then, we'll be running now. Get ready. Hey. And then. That's it. What is it? His reaction was so indifferent. I don't like it. I really don't like it, it really ticks me off. For the time being, I kicked Yusato's toes and started doing warm UPS. I used a lot of power in that kick but, it seemed like it didn't hurt at all as Yusato started warming up as well. This damn guy. What do you want to do? You would prefer to do some light running instead right? Don't mock me. Even I could keep up with those monsters. Only being able to keep up isn't good enough. Ha. Huh. Was he underestimating me? Yusato was smiling as he started to lightly run. I wasn't someone who would keep silent if someone made a fool out of me. The corners of my mouth naturally distorted as I chased after Yusato. To begin with, I never liked someone such as you. Ha ha ha, that's because we haven't gotten to know each other enough yet. I raised my speed to try to overtake Yusato. I was irritated at his smile that he could maintain while running at this pace. I've been here for ten days so I'm already well aware of it but still. This guy was a monster. Damn it. Ah, wait a moment. Leave the pacing to me. Shut up. I'll pull ahead of you no matter what. I'll teach you the difference between a demon and a human, you conceited healing magician. Hey you Sato. Yes. What happened to that good for nothing that I left you in charge of? After training, it was dinner time at the rescue squad's lodgings but the vacant seat next to me caused Rose to question me. It was film seat. I had a wry smile and scratched my cheek as I answered Rose. No, you see. They sort of collapsed. Collapsed. I properly applied healing magic on them so they're resting in their room, don't worry. Ha. Huh. It'd be a pain if they collapsed tomorrow as well. Afterwards, take their meal to them. Seeing Rose trying to pin down her forehead with her hand, I said in a small voice as she being Sundara, while looking at the seat next to me. Felm I more or less learned her name today but she was more of a child than I thought. Although I didn't understand why she seemed to dislike me but. She collapsed today because she kept. Trying to overtake me and eventually fainted. Ha ha ha, that little girl collapsed hey. It's because Yusato doesn't know how to hold back. But I just ran normally. Your normal is already at an abnormal level. At the very least, you're not a human. Shut up. Compared to leader, I'm still human. You think I'll be quiet when I'm being treated like a monster? I glared at Gomel who kept spouting impolite words and vigorously stood up. At that moment. Something scraped across my cheek, causing it to bleed. I looked behind and I saw the object that was pierced into the wall. It was a wooden spoon. I looked forward and could see Rose glaring at me while smiling. After a period of silence and exchanging eye contact, I obediently sat down. Was a smile supposed to make someone so scared? Rather than that, maybe I should question how a wooden spoon could pierce through the wall? From the ten days she's been here, I can only guess that she's a demon without much stamina. But that's a different issue. Big sis, how do you think we should proceed in training her from now on? Alak made an unexpected appearance with his polite manners as he carried the dishes out. A little girl who just relies completely on their own magic like that. I just have to crush their confidence a little and they'll be obedient. Isn't that right, Tong? Please spare me. T.O.N.G. had an uncomfortable expression as he looked at Rose. I hear that he's been in the rescue squad for the longest. I'm sure a lot has happened. Tong, what happened with leader? Shut up damn it, it doesn't concern someone like you. I asked just to see but I was flat out rejected. He must have had quite an embarrassing past. I'll ask Alak or someone else later on so I can tease him about it. I ate the last of my bread and gulped down the soup. 
I let out a sigh as I drank some water. Phew. You sat oh. Yes? What's it this time? Rose called out to me again. What was it this time? Was it a new training? No. I don't think she'll go any further than that. At least I hope not. Go to the castle tomorrow early in the morning. Lloyd Sama has something to talk with you and the two heroes. Eh? Meaning? Yet. Yeah. It seems that they've finally reached a decision about what to do. Then I guess it'll be about those letters that will be sent to other countries. I'm glad I was able to finish my training with Rose first. My endurance and reflexes have grown considerably. At least I know I won't die unless the enemy uses an unbelievably strong attack. Is it okay for me to take Amako along? Yet. Yeah. I'll go and visit Salrasan's shop tomorrow first thing in the morning. While tidying up my own plates, I thought about what would happen after this. I'm curious about the neighboring country's city but I should be cautious. There were other things along the way such as villages and settlements as well as rugged mountains. I'm not familiar with the terrain around here. I should visit Welsi tomorrow and look at a map while taking into consideration the route from Lingal Kingdom to the Beast Country. I probably didn't have to worry since Amako would be the guide but there was no harm in knowing more about the terrain myself. Well then. I'll head towards the castle tomorrow. Thanks for the food. While taking along the food and tableware, I left the dining room. I had to wake up early tomorrow, I should sleep as soon as possible. But before that, I needed to bring food to Felm who hasn't eaten dinner yet. I should knock first. There should be nothing wrong with her body. Besides, healing magic should be effective on anything with the exception of curses and mental fatigue. It hasn't been long since I started learning healing magic so I could only do simple healing but Rose had said your type is the same as mine for healing magic which meant that Felm was simply just indulging in her current circumstances. Since I wasn't a brute like Rose who would forcefully wake someone up, I'll just leave the food beside her bed but then I thought about what would happen to her tomorrow. I should probably wake her up now. Before heading into her room, I knocked. The room she was using used to be the storage room but I heard that Uluru-san and Olga-san used it before. The room was clean the day after Felm arrived and it was clean enough to sleep in but... Hopefully things weren't scattered everywhere, right? She's still asleep hey? Ha. Huh. There was no reaction so she was probably still asleep. I opened the door and let out a big sigh. The room didn't feel like somewhere a person should sleep in. There was a lit candle and the figure of a silver-haired girl writing something. She seemed to be frantically scribbling something but I really wished she had said something if she was already up. Even now, she didn't notice I had entered the room. I shook my head while walking closer and called out to her. Hey. Felm. Oh ah. Felm fell down from her seat. Various things fell down from the desk as well and made all sorts of noises. While giving a wry smile at the former Black Knight, I picked up the notebook at my feet and looked at the cover. It was the notebook I gave her. She was still using it. I think I might be a little happy. Are you alright? W whose fault do you think it is? When I offered a hand to her and it was splendidly brushed off as she got up herself. As she did so, she noticed the notebook that was in my other hand. Her mouth kept on flapping like as it opened and closed. You're making use of this it seems, thank you. G give it back. Even though you refused it so much in the beginning. Also wasn't it originally mine? To think you would faithfully write in the diary, you have quite the honest side to you, don't you? Maybe she originally wasn't a bad child to begin with. She was just a child you could find anywhere. You didn't look inside right? If you did, I'll kill you. Excluding the part where she can easily say I'll kill you. Either way, her magic was sealed so it was impossible for her. My affinity also seemed to oppose hers. Even if she tried to run away, there's no way she could escape from me. You still haven't eaten dinner yet, right? If you don't eat, you won't be able to vomit properly tomorrow. Don't say vomit. I'll eat, okay. What was she displeased with? After showing me a sour look, she turned away and walked away from me. In doing so, she also put the diary into her pocket like it was important. I couldn't help but laugh a little. Well it's good to know you're getting the best out of your environment. From what I've seen, Tong and the others have accepted her as a fellow non-human. I didn't have to worry about her getting into any fights. In regards to training, she can keep up with me. Unlike Olga San, she had a healthy body. She's still got a little habit of skipping out but that'll be fixed soon with Rose's great technique. All that's left is whether or not Kazuki and Inyakumai Senpai could forgive her. It's in the past but I doubt they'll easily forgive someone who once tried to kill them. Rather than that, how long are you going to stay in my room? H hurry and get out. Yes yes. I'm more worried about how Inyakumai Senpai will react. It's my first time entering inside the castle. The beast girl, Amako, was beside me as she looked around the castle in admiration. Just like I planned yesterday, I woke up early in the morning and went to pick up Amako. After greeting the guards as usual, we headed inside the castle. 
As soon as we entered, two maids politely bowed and led us in further. You said Osama. A and your esteemed companion. We shall take you to King Lloyd. Yusato is an amazing person, hey. Please don't say it's unexpected. Even I know that it doesn't suit me. Since I still wasn't used to having Asama added to my name, I could only smile stiffly. From there, we walked on a pathway I wasn't familiar with. This probably led to the king's room. Once we reached a door, the maids opened it and prompted us to enter. Upon entering the room I saw Lloyd Sama but there was also Sergio, Welsi San and Sagris with a great number of knights near him. Inyakami Senpai and Kazuki were also here. Oh you've come, you said Odono. Hello, it has been a while. She's the rumored Amako. Lloyd Sama said so as he gazed at Amako with gentle eyes. It was barely noticeable but I could see she was a bit frightened at his glance. Lloyd Sama gave a small nod and said. I see. Well then, it seems everyone is now here. I will now start talking about why I've gathered you all here. You said Odono, I want you and your companion to stand next. To Kazuki Dano's group before I begin talking. Yes. Let's go, Amako. Why yet? I lightly patted her on the shoulder and her tail stood straight up while freezing in place. Was she that nervous? Maybe it was expected since she was meeting a king from another country. As for me, I didn't seem to have much tension to anything I encounter these days. Along with Amako, we moved towards where Inyakami Senpai and Kazuki were standing. He, Yusato kun. Yo, Yusato. It's been a while. I'm glad to see the two of you are still looking energetic. I wonder what it was. Somehow I felt that these two have changed a little in the ten days I haven't seen them. It was probably trivial but perhaps they had some kind of extreme training. As expected I should say, they probably thought it was necessary for this journey. The reason for gathering everyone here. It's about sending letters to the other countries for their cooperation. We didn't succeed last time but we'll try again. This is the conclusion I reached after discussing with my advisor Sergio and the commander Sigris. If we were to fight with the Mu army again, we'll have a much more difficult fight compared to the previous. I put the heroes in danger even though they saved us. If it weren't for the rescue squad, we would have had countless casualties as well. Lloyd Sama calmly said these words as he observed the people around him. I only looked around for a bit but I didn't see anyone whose expressions seemed to object the king's words. Rather, I saw that they were holding on to their resolve like they were ready for anything. Lloyd Sama was truly loved. With his straightforward personality, he was able to gather people like this to follow him. The country itself seemed to have been shaped into the ruler's personality. We have to take action. We can't be afraid of the short-term losses, we have to think about the long-term goals. Even if we're rejected harshly and even isolated by the others, we must inform the other countries of this threat known as the Mu. In doing so, we should also try to unify the other countries to combat this threat. The letters should start sending to majority of the countries after 15 days. The majority of the countries. Even so, one letter wouldn't be enough to move a nation. Additionally, the other countries refused cooperation before. With that being the case, it would be reasonable to assume that just sending a letter wouldn't be effective. In other words, Inyakami Dono, Kazuki Dono. There needs to be people with special positions. Namely, the heroes. And Yusato Dono. Yes as for me, I was just. Wait, hey. As I stood like a fool and reacted to my name being called, Lloyd Sama nodded in affirmation. Inyakami Senpai, Kazuki and even Sagri San nodded too for some reason. It seemed no one was objecting it. No, I mean I know that I would be sending out letters but in my case there was no reason to call me out since I wouldn't have much influence over the other countries. While ignoring Amako who was next to me and also standing there foolishly while saying Yusato is amazing after all. The king started to speak a few brief words. I apologize, I keep putting our troubles onto you guys. No need, we also feel that the people of this country are important. We'll gladly accept this responsibility. Fu fu fu, we'll get to travel to various countries. It sounds tough but also fun. You're also thinking the same right, Yusato kun. Yes, I guess so. I don't have any objections in going but I felt a lot of pressure from receiving such an important task. I gave a small sigh while making sure that the surrounding people didn't notice. Lloyd Sama might have been aware of my thoughts as he delightfully opened his mouth while looking at me and Amako. Yusato Dono, I'm sorry to trouble you. However, the place you'll be sending a letter to is somewhat special. Special. That will be explained in detail later, for the time being. I've said everything I had to say to everyone present here. With this, the meeting is now over. But the heroes along with Yusato Dono's group, Welsi, and Sagris will remain here. With that, Lloyd Sama had brought a close to this assembly. The other knights left out the door in a line while the ones that were called out remained. The ones that remained naturally turned their gazes to Lloyd Sama. And then... There were also three people I wasn't familiar with that state. I wonder who they are. 
I tilted my head in wonder and looked at the three unfamiliar people. One of them winked at me when our eyes met. They were quite the friendly person. While I thought so, I waited for the king's next words. First of all, Amako. I thank you for predicting the future and saving this country from its downfall. At. Eh. After the amount of people had decreased, Lloyd Sama suddenly lowered his head before Amako and said those words. In response to Lloyd Sama's sudden action, Sergio Sama and Welsi San became flustered. However, the one is the most panic right now was none other than Amako. I can't cause such a big commotion in front of everyone else but I thought it wouldn't do if I didn't properly give my thanks for saving this country. Well. Then, you sad Dodono. The last place you will be sending your letter to will be the country of water, Mialark. That place is. When you cross the continent, you will eventually encounter a large river. In the center of that resides a city of water. But in the opposite shore far away in the distance of that place is the Beast King country. I see, so that's why Lloyd Sama was letting me sending a letter to this country called Mialark. It was convenient since it was near the Beast King country. However, the journey won't be easy. I'm sorry to place these burdens on you, you sad Odino. You're depending on me, which is why I'll gladly take up this responsibility. Thank you. Instead, I should be the one saying that. I'm sure that Lloyd Sama had a lot of trouble trying to think of a way to fulfill my request. I couldn't thank him enough. At any rate, a country that's located in Waterhui. Was the country itself not that big since it was just a river? Or maybe the country was in the middle of something like a large lake even though it was called a river? Well then, about the specifics for sending the letter. Alfi, I'll leave it to you to tell you Sato Dono. Yes, as you command. Yusato Sama, and Amako Sama, right? This way, please. A woman with flax colored hair done in braids and who wore clothes that resembled a scholar's prompted us to go outside. This was my first time meeting her. I've visited the castle many times but I haven't seen her before. Was she a person from the outside? Or maybe we passed each other by coincidence. After giving a bow to Lloyd Sama and the others, Amako and I followed the woman to a passageway in the castle. The woman in front of us had a spring in her steps and seemed to be in a good mood. She suddenly turned around and said. It's our first time meeting, isn't it? I'm Alfie and I've been given the honor to be a scholar in this country. Well, I say I'm a scholar but the range of what I research is quite large. To put it in simple terms, I compile a lot of literature on this country's development. This was suggested by Lloyd as this country needed to build up knowledge which would help during emergencies. In other words, you can basically think of me as someone who has a lot of free time. I don't mind. This time around, I'll be teaching the general geography of the countries to Yusato Sama for the letter you'll send. Ah, but it's not that difficult. I'll make a proper route for you to follow so as long you're careful of monsters and bandits. I estimate that you should reach your destination in several months. Yusato, this person will talk for a while. In rapid succession, Alfisan went over all the important topics while Amako was holding back her laughter and smiling. We kept on advancing as the conversation went on. This person's character was quite the strong one. But I will able to understand some important things now since I'll be able to learn the geography for the country I'll be sending my letter to. Alfi led us to an area of the castle I hadn't seen before. When we reached somewhere with almost no windows, we stopped in front of a large gate made out of wood. Alfi turned around to smile at us and pointed towards the gate. It's here. It's something like a private room reserved for me, I suspect the other rooms are occupied by my co-workers so don't feel reserved and come on in. Ha! Huh. As we were led into the room, there was an abundant amount of paper everywhere. The papers were stacked on top of each other and were so high that they reached the ceiling. It was quite the sight. Alfi seemed to be making a path for us as she cleared away paper and prepared a table with chairs. While I still felt bewildered by the room, Amako and I sat down on the chairs. Alfi was looking through a bookshelf and eventually took out a big book along with a large sheet of paper. Alfi brushed off the dust from what she brought out and said. Now then, map map map. It's this. Yup, I'll start my explanation now. Alfi spread out a somewhat crudely made map and started to explain. Right now. We're residing in this Lingal kingdom and it's the place that's the closest to the territory of the Mu. The green section that was shown on the map was probably the plains area where we had just fought against the Mu army recently. It was also where it divided the two territories. I could see that there was forest surrounding this kingdom along with a few small villages sporadically spread out. It was definitely not a large country. And beyond this plains area is a river. The Mu territory is just beyond that river and they also crossed that river last time to fight. I see. I should say this beforehand. It's expected that Yusato Sama and the heroes will be arriving at the same location for the first place that will be visited. The same. Wasn't it better to send us to different places since we were all sending letters out to somewhere else? I understand your doubts. However, it will be a tough journey from Lingal Kingdom so it's necessary. 
It's important to play safety first and that applies to taking Dieters along the way. For this reason, it has been decided that your groups will first reach this place, the Magic City, Luquis. The Magic City, Luquis. If I recall correctly, this place had one healing magician residing here. And according to Amako, there was also that one beastkin who helped her out here as well. Of course, the letter will be handed to Luquis as well. They have a gathering of some of the greatest magicians across the continent. However, due to the identity of your magic attribute, you will be met with much discrimination so do take care, you Satisama. I'm worried that you'll carelessly start beating up students or something since Rosama was the one who taught you healing magic. Amako couldn't help but laugh a little at Alfie's somewhat playful statement. But I wasn't laughing. That's quite the harsh joke. I'm not that much of a monster. Eh. Just now, the person beside me gave something like an unexpected response. Ignore it, ignore it. I'm definitely a human. I didn't have superhuman strength like Rose who could fling someone in the air like a pinball. I also wasn't a brute who would heal someone once they fainted and made them continue running. Good grief, it was really weird for everyone in the rescue squad to think that I was the same as Rose. Calling Rose Sama a monster. You're just as the rumors say. Well then, along with Luquis, your group will be sending letters to three countries. Three hi, then along with the Beastkin country, it'll be four. Ah, that's not the case. The Beastkin country is among the many other countries out there and if I have to say it they're only known for two things. But in Yusato Sama's case, it's a bit special and why we're including this country as part of the route. Your final destination is still more or less Mialark. Right here. Following the direction she was pointing with her finger, there was a large river that had a circular form in the middle. At the center of that was a mark of a country. It was quite far from Lingal Kingdom. You will be handing a letter to the queen that governs this place. Ah, it's here. It's in just a bit of a distance away from Luquis. The country of prayer, Samriel. Samriel. Hearing that name, Amako was startled as her tail was standing on its end. Was there something in this country? I wonder what it was. I had a really bad feeling for some reason. This place here. In a certain sense, it was the country that was the most cooperative with us. They just don't like dealing with any non-humans. To the point that it's excessive, I take it. That's right. Which is why I want you to pay extra attention to Amako when you enter this country. I think there should be no problems in entering the country but when you are getting an audience with the ruler. It'd probably be better to not take her along. We're really sorry despite understanding these circumstances but still sending you there. Kazuki-sama and Inyakamai-sama are heading into a different direction from Samriel so. It's okay, you don't need to apologize. Just your thought of wanting to help us makes me happy. The country of prayer hoi? It seems like they are really religious. I'm an atheist so I shouldn't be influenced but it could turn out troublesome since Amako was a non-human. Still, this is unexpectedly not much, isn't it? We only have to go to send letters to three countries. It's because we don't have that much time. We'll be sending other knights to the other countries to bear this important duty. The countries that the heroes and Yusato sama are being sent to. The rulers all have difficult personalities and will be hard to please. However, if we receive their cooperation, it wouldn't be unreasonable to say that we would stand a chance against the Mu army. Which is why Lingal Kingdom is dispatching important people like the heroes and Yusato sama It's an action that shows our sincerity and good faith. It looks like I have a really heavy and important responsibility. I don't know if sending me could be called showing sincerity to the other countries. That's due to your efforts. It seems like you haven't noticed it, there's no one in this country who doesn't know you. You're someone who's been saving people in the rescue squad after all. It should be to the extent that people in the foreign countries have heard rumors about you, don't you think? Whether they believe it or not is a different story. Even if I'm famous, I'm not happy at all. I gave a sigh as my shoulders drooped down. It would be nice if I could walk alone on the streets even with all these rumors. Well, I'll do something about it when the time comes. Then, regarding the matter of the Beastkin country. To be honest, we don't know that much about them. You can take a ship in Mialark to the opposite shore but we don't know the geography beyond that. It should be fine, I'll explain to Yusato from there. I see. If that's the case, I'm relieved. It's a somewhat closed and isolated country so I only had materials from long ago to refer to. That was to be expected. After all, it was a race that held the human population in bitterness. There was no chance for any exchange of information between them. Still, this beastkin country was quite far. In that case, just how many people should I bring along? I was honestly planning of bringing just Blurin and Amako who would be able to deal with various situations when push comes to shove. If possible, I just wanted people who were straightforward and capable. For the journey, how many people should be taken along? We want as few people as possible so about five people. But Yusato-sama might want even fewer people. 
I'm sure there are not many people who can keep up with you on the battlefield. No, well. You're right but. She ended hitting it right on the mark. This person really understood my thought process. In addition. We also had a discussion of the heroes accompanying you for when you head over to the Beastkin country since the discrimination towards Beastkin slaves have been really bad in the recent years. The heroes would be able to help you combat a lot of threats or attacks against Yusato Sama but since you are taking Amako Sama along as well, the country might see this as some kind of ill intent by taking hold of a hostage. Therefore, we decided against that and felt that one or two people accompanying you as the core should be sufficient. No, in my case, I should be fine as long as I follow the knowledge and common sense taught to me by a certain person. I also feel that bringing too many people in the Beastkin country would have an adverse effect. Amako kept nodding at my words, it looks like I wasn't wrong. If that was the case, just who would be coming? It would be good if they were someone who wouldn't lose to a common bandit. Ah. If it was that person, I might be able to rely on them. Air. About the person to accompany me. How about Ark Girdle San? Ark Girdle. Ah, that gate guard. I see, him is it. He has an unexpected amount of extensive knowledge. Yes, Yusato Sama has good eyes. If it was that cool guard with red hair, Ark San, he wouldn't be defeated by a bandit and I could trust him since he protected the rescue squad during the war. What's more was that he was a cheerful and straightforward person. Afterwards, I'll try and receive confirmation to see if he'll accept or not. ERM, the explanation is now over. Wait, I forgot. Ah. Uh, it's about the matter of what you'll do after finishing your business in the Beastkin country. Afterwards? I see, we have to return here. I completely forgot. That's right, we had to get back home. I just kept thinking of how to get to my destination. That I forgot. Coming back is simple. Return to Luquis again and from there you'll come back. You could also give the letter when you return instead but as expected, that would be a bit. It sounds like a very wearisome journey back home. Well, compared to heading out on my journey it was, easy, I guess. That was because I had an important duty to accomplish by sending the letters and I wouldn't know what might happen. Alphysan seemed to be done as she gave a bow and headed towards where Lloyd Sama to report. Since we were done here, I should obediently accept it and go back. I wanted to meet Senpai and Kazuki but I'm sure they were having their own discussion of plans for their journey so maybe at another opportunity. Thankfully, there was still half a month left before heading out to send those letters. And that's what happened. Phew. After escorting Amako back home to Salrasan's place, I told Rose about what I discussed with Lloyd Sama and everything else related to the matter as I watched Film Train. They sure picked quite the troublesome country. Well, if it's you, you should be fine. Is it okay to be that carelessly optimistic about it? What? Do you feel uneasy? Seeing Rose's smile, I could only give up in my mind and let out a sigh. Compared to the first time I came here to train with Leader, I'm not particularly worried. Really? I bet you're just saying that. W wait, you're just ignoring me. Leader gave a weird laugh as Felm who was doing push UPS and seemed to be in pain spoke up. Seeing her, I scratched my cheek in confusion. Rose was only sitting on her and yet why did it look like she was in so much agony? When I was at your stage, I was already bearing stone blocks along with Rose on top of me. Well, do your best. When I did this, it was even stricter for me. Kuh, if you can do it. I can obviously do it too. As beads of sweat dripped down from her forehead, she started to frantically do push-ups. Rose shook her head in disbelief as she combed her hair upwards with her hand and crossed her legs. I'm about to take this one to the forest soon. During that time, I'll be counting on you to take care of the house. Isn't it a bit too soon? This fellow is always up to something when it starts getting easier for her. For the moment, I'll throw her in a place where she can't be at ease. This demon planned to forcefully correct someone's laziness. Well I guess it doesn't matter when, it's the path everyone has to go through here. It was special in your case. This one right here doesn't have enough guts so I plan to leave her there until the very last moment. Felm was in a daze by doing push UPS so she was unaware but tomorrow she will learn how unreasonable hell could be. But she probably won't experience something as cruel as me so it should be fine. Namu. Ka. Ha. Due to the abrupt intensity of her push UPS, Felm crumbled down on the ground from exhaustion. Since Rose was sitting on top of her, Felm had to face the inevitable weight of Rose as she collapsed. It felt like Rose was sitting on a tatama seat with no resistance. Damn it, again hey? How many times does this make it? Wake up. I'm adding another 500 push UPS, you idler. Goof. Oh wow. She's already fallen so many times but Rose is forcing her to get up every time. Rose stood up and started applying healing magic on Felm's shoulder while shouting abusive words at her. I should gradually hear something like a crying voice so I bowed to Rose in silence. I could always talk later. If I stayed here any longer, 
I felt I would be dragged in. I didn't have any problems with training but I would find it difficult and sad if Felm continued resenting me. Yeah, do your best. As to whether or not she could hear my voice. I would say probably not. It was the day after Lloyd had told us about the kingdom's decision regarding the letters. I was about to give Blurin his breakfast as usual. Suddenly, I heard a girl scream. I had a good guess of who it was and headed outside to take a look. I saw Rose carrying an unconscious Felm who was bearing a large rucksack on her back. When I had done this before, I didn't faint but... My thoughts were more or less the same as Felm's. Looking at this situation from a third-party perspective, it felt a bit odd. And then? Rose was heading this way? Q. Wah. Something with black fur and cute red eyes had abruptly landed on my shoulder. Ah, uh, I see. Rose was searching for this fellow. Kururu, leader is looking for you. Looks like this little one was going to the forest with Felm and put on their dramatic Save Me play. But this rabbit's perception sense was quite useful, it was similar to a hate and love relationship. Perhaps Kururu has become attached to me since it hopped onto my shoulder like this. While I earnestly thought so, Kururu got off my shoulder with a peon and stopped at Rose's feet. The scene before me looked like a painting of a carnivore meeting a herbivore. Then, I won't be returning for a while. Take care of things here while I'm gone. Yes. Do take care of yourself. Due to Rose's glare, I ended up replying politely. Rose seemed a little suspicious about my behavior but she decided that it probably didn't matter. Rose headed towards the gate along with Kururu. It's not like she was a bad person but... She's just too scary. Guru. Blurin was beating on my leg like he was saying, Hey, give me my breakfast already. You really are a glutton. Was this what you wanted? Ha fuh ha. Ha fuh ha. Blurin took fruit from my hand and started munching on it. Didn't this little guy try to munch on my finger last time? I felt a bit of fear but it wasn't anything too unexpected. The blue grizzly is an omnivore and they like to hunt their prey for food in their natural habitat. What should I do while leader isn't here? I thought about the upcoming journey while I fed Blurin. Including today, there was still 15 days left before the departure. Normally, I would be training and it would be optimal to be at my best physical condition but... If I just do that, I wouldn't get much results or changes. Actually, I would be tempering my body just by going on this trip. If that was the case, was there anything important I could only do here right now? Something I could only do here. Maybe studying? But from the reading I did under Rose's guidance, I should probably be okay. I thoroughly went through the readings and understood all if not most of the material. Then, maybe some martial arts or sword training. To begin with, I only had experience fighting with my bare hands and it was limited to punching and kicking. I doubt I could learn anything decent within 15 days. But since there was nothing to lose from trying, I'll take it into consideration. Other than that, there's also my healing magic. I could only heal wounds and fatigue at the moment so I didn't have a deep understanding of healing magic but maybe I should take this opportunity to do so even. Though Rose was absent. Fortunately, there was another amazing healer in this country besides Rose. For the time being, I'll finish today's training and take a look later. Gugu. And then? Ah sorry. My hands stopped. While getting another fruit for Blurin, I returned back to my thoughts. Olga San probably knew a lot and could teach me a thing or two. Well then. I'll end today's training earlier than usual and head towards the clinic. Inyakamai-sama, may I ask where you are going? And then? I just planned to head to the rescue squad's lodgings. I had quite a bit of free time today and planned to visit Yusato-kun since I could finally take a breather. As I walked towards the castle's gate, the guard called Arksan called out to me. You're going to Yusato-sama's place, right? Why yet? I nodded to his passionate question as the other guard held down Arksan and seemed to be troubled at their partner's response. Ark girdle. He was one of the people placed here to watch over the castle gate and one of the knight's undersigrees. He was someone capable of being promoted to a captain with his own squad but he volunteered to be placed here instead. At least that's what I've heard. He was a strange person. Well, the rumors were probably true. If they weren't, he wouldn't have been selected to escort me when I went outside. Due to my carelessness, I dragged Yusato-kun into a situation where the both of us went missing for a few days. Arksan was searching for the two of us during this time and didn't even sleep. Which was why I had a good idea of how honest and straightforward this person was. If it's Yusato Sama, I just happened to see him walk towards the streets. Is that so? I see, then I should probably head towards there instead. But now it looked like I was only going out to try and meet Yusato Kun. Well, not that it was necessarily wrong. But before that, I want to ask about the magic city, Luquis. I couldn't help but feel excited about the thought of a magic academy in another world. Therefore, I had to calm down and repress these heated thoughts before asking. Arksan, do you know anything about Luquis? It's difficult to say that it's a good place but... 
I do think that Luquis is the best environment for the most talented magicians to study magic. Which means that Arxan. I'm studying magic at Luquis at the moment. My only redeeming traits are with the sword and magic which is why I'm close to graduating. Arxan gave a very natural and refreshing laugh as he said so. However, from what I knew and could see. Arxan seemed strong. I heard that he could use fire magic and was quite skilled with the sword. While I tilted my head to the side in wonder, another knight beside Arxan folded their arms and nodded. They then proceeded to say. Even if you say you don't have any other talents, you're still pretty decent with archery and using a staff despite not being too familiar with them. In Yukamai-sama, if this person felt like it, they could aim for much higher and be part of some of the strongest knights under the king. Yes yes. Why aren't you climbing the ranks? You should hurry up and promote. Why you guys? And then? What do you mean by that? Arxan grabbed his colleagues, opened the gate that had just closed and then threw them in. He seemed a little embarrassed as he saw my forced smile and scratched the helmet that he was wearing with his finger. I'm quite the clumsy person you know. I can't protect more than one thing at a time. If that's the case, why not just promote? If he promoted, he could just protect the king. Wasn't that fine? No, the knights who protect the king would have to adapt themselves and focus on only protecting the king. Since I'm clumsy, that's not something I'm capable of. That's why I'm just protecting this place. He said so as he looked towards the castle gate. It looked solid and durable as it towered over the surroundings. It was something meant to stop intruders from entering. If I protect this place, no intruders will be able to enter. Which means that no one inside the castle will get hurt. It'll be over if they go over the castle gate though. Arxan was showing a bit of his playful side but I was thinking about something entirely different on the inside. It made me shudder. He is in an academy, in other words, he's a student. He has talent with both sword and magic. His attribute for magic is fire. Clumsy. H. He's a main protagonist. Arc Girdle. He's a knight guarding the castle gate that possessed a main protagonist's traits. He's a good-looking guy but in a different sense from Kazuki-kun. However, I'll have to leave my post for a bit. Eh. What did he mean? As I was pondering on what Arksan had said, the man himself straightened his back and said. This unworthy Arc Girdle will assist Yusato-sama from the rescue squad on his journey. His voice resonated with optimism. Eh. Ha ha ha, I'm surprised too. After all, I was only relayed this message just yesterday at the castle. Of course I felt shocked. After all, to decide a retainer just yesterday was quite fast. As expected of Yusato-kun, he was shrewd. I'm a little resentful of the fact that he got someone of such high caliber as well. No, he probably noticed it himself, the fact that Arksan had the qualities of a main protagonist. Phew, as I would expect from Yusato-kun. It's my complete loss. Arksan, please look after Yusato-kun. Yes. While feeling a complete sense of defeat, I walked towards town. Yusato-kun should be. Fine if Arksan is with him. Unless Yusato-kun faces an overwhelming enemy, he should be fine with that strong body of his. In addition, there was also Amako who could foresee the future. He'll definitely be okay. Actually, his party was on the level of an impenetrable iron wall. How would you defeat it? I was the one who felt the most troubled. I would be headed to a country with hot climate that held strong beliefs towards the heroes. The country is called Camario and it was really far, it felt troublesome in many ways. There were problems with being too popular. No, I shouldn't be feeling depressed. From what I hear, I should be able to gain their support. Since I was a hero, I had to be the one to go in our current circumstances. I had finished my training for the day and I was currently present in front of the clinic on the streets. The gazes in my surroundings directed towards me felt warmer now. Well, I used to carry Blurin all the time on the streets so I guess it was quite the difference. For now. Hello there. I gave a greeting as I lightly knocked on the clinic's door and opened it. As always, this place felt similar to the rescue squad's facilities and the surroundings were clean as well. It felt like it had been a while since I came here. As I was having those thoughts, I could a pitter-patter sound of footsteps making their way towards me. Before long, a girl that I was familiar with had appeared before me. Welcome to. Wait, it's Yusato-kun. Hello there, Oluru-san. I came here today to meet with Olga-san. Is he busy? Nope, it's all right. We don't have many patients today. It's a good day. A good day, hey. A day without many patients meant that weren't many wounded or sick people. Indeed, it's a good day. While following Oluru-san who was in a good mood and smiling, I told her my reasons for coming here. Hmm, big brother's healing magic hey. Yeah, I think it's a good idea. After all, that's his only redeeming trait. Oluru-san was unexpectedly strict and harsh on Olga-san. No. Maybe she was originally like this? But leaving my brother aside, 
Yusato Kun sure has becoming amazing. I heard about it. You exchanged blows with Rose San, right? Eh? That's not right. Eh? That's. Ah ha ha ha, now that I think about it. There's no way anyone could exchange blows with. She was just punching at me. You didn't, die. It didn't make much of a difference either way. Even if I did spar with her, I would still be the only one receiving punches. I've been focusing only on defense and did my best to avoid that one blow. But really, I did my best. But you can think of it as leader taking it easy on me. After all, I'm still alive. But why do you know about this? Ah ha ha ha, I heard a strange scream while I was by the rescue squad and I caught sight of you having a fight with Rose San. So from there, she thought I was having a fight with Rose. Even though I was simply clinging onto my dear life. I even remember begging for my life to Rose at one point. Even so, we resumed the training. Even so, it sounds like you went through quite a lot. Ah, this is my brother's room. Thank you very much. Alurasan knocked on the door and said out loud that Yusato is here. After a short moment, a voice came from the other side of door and told us to enter. Upon entering the room, I could see that there wasn't much furniture and could see the figure of a man sitting on a chair. Even though you fell sick, sorry for not visiting you, Olga-san. I don't really mind, I'd rather people visit me when I'm energetic. Alurasan's brother, Olga Fleur. He's a healing magician who was anything but average just like Rose and ran a clinic. He was the person I would ask to teach me. I see, you're asking me about healing magic before you go on your journey. For the time being, I explained to Olga-san about the current situation of how I would be sending letters to different countries. Olga-san was pondering on something but it didn't seem like he would refuse. However, I don't think it's really necessary for me to teach you anything, you know? You said Okun, you've already become a healer that's even more amazing than me. Even so, I want to ask you because Rose is in the forest right now. Why yet? After all, I don't have a strong body like you. Healing is all I've got. Olga-san said so as he folded his arms and looked troubled. Alurasan raised her hand and started to give advice to the troubled Olga-san. Well then, how about comparing our healing magic together as a test? You don't mind right, Yusato-kun. No problem. Then, let's do it. You're not going to ask for my opinion. Ha ha ha. I released my healing magic from the palm of my hand before Olga-san who was smiling bitterly and Alurasan who was smiling cheerfully. Just like when I did this test with the crystal before, the same pale green light appeared. Alurasan's healing magic seemed to be thicker than mine but the colors weren't too different. However, Olga-san's was. As expected. Dense. There was no transparency at all. It was completely green. Compared to Rose though, hers was a much darker green than Olga-san's. Olga-san, how do you usually refine your magic power? I seem to always get this thin green color when I do it. It's the same for me. I don't do anything different from you two. My magic is a little different, it's something you're born with. Born with. However, this dense healing magic is effective at curing diseases. In exchange, I get a much weaker effect from casting healing magic on myself. Ah ha ha ha. Perhaps the denseness of healing magic can tell you what it can heal? I looked towards the usual magic I released from my hand and slowly clenched it to form a fist. The light dwelling in my fist remained the same color it has been since I first started using this magic in this world. As far as I know, using healing magic to heal diseases is different than using it to heal injuries. Basically, you're healing them from the inside. Got it. You're not curing them of their disease, you're healing them of their disease. I don't really get it but I guess I can assume that Big Brother's healing magic is at least one step ahead of mine. Let's see. I guess you can think of it like that way, I don't think it's wrong. Compared to my healing magic, it was definitely one step ahead. Rose could probably help me in some way but I felt like this was something that I had to learn for myself. If I take into consideration of the difference between me and Olgason, it was the denseness in the color. If I were to be able to match those, wouldn't I be able to heal diseases as well? From what Rose has taught me, she would. For now, I should try to concentrate my healing magic instead of trying to expand it. I suppressed the overflowing magic from my palm so that the light wouldn't escape when I enclosed it. From there, I poured more power into my palm. My thought process was like. Maybe I could just increase the amount of magic power in one area to increase its thickness. Even I knew it was such a simple and plain idea. However, I could feel some sort of change as the magic power inside me started to travel like electricity. Yusato Kun, what are you doing? Eh? I just wanted to add some more magic power. I took my eyes off my hand and kept on putting more magic power into it. The green colored healing magic's light gradually started to become a darker color. Maybe I could do this. The moment I was thinking so, Olga San, who took a peek at what I was doing, suddenly took a hold of my hand. Yusato Kun. Stop what you're trying to do right now. 
Eh. Don't tell me that I succeeded. At that instant, the overflowing magic and light in the palm of my hand was scattered with fresh blood. Ha! Huh. One hour had passed since I tried to put more magic power into my hand. My magic did become a denser color at that moment. But afterwards, it might have been that my hand couldn't handle the amount of power. But my hand had ruptured with blood. It's not like my hand exploded but just that there was a cut and blood flowed out from there. I was surprised to learn about this kind of development. Of course, I healed my wound with my own healing magic shortly afterwards. I realized it as I was healing myself but it seemed that what I tried to do was quite dangerous. Alurasan wanted to try it too but was harshly scolded by Olga-san. I could understand where he was coming from though. When you increase the concentration of magic, it will become denser and have different properties. Olga-san started to teach me a bit more about these rules. He also taught me that as the color became darker, it would become harder to heal myself. I should take into consideration that demerit. In fact, I noticed it too. I tried to heal myself with that denser healing magic but I wasn't able to. Olga-san was naturally born with denser healing magic and even he had a lot of trouble when it came to healing himself. I could somewhat understand these results. It was something worth trying. I felt like I would be able to grasp it by repeating this process. I suspect that this was how Rose and Olga-san were able to quickly heal people. It would be difficult to heal people with diseases but up until now I thought it would be impossible for me. I should make sure to use a safer amount of magical power when I attempt this again. For that purpose. It seems like I'll need to do some training. I gathered my healing power once again to form a denser color. This new type of training was just perfect since I would be able to do it anywhere. But I didn't want to inconvenience these two again in case my hand got splattered with blood again. I should head back to the training grounds. But as I was walking home, I looked back to see. You sat Okun. Oh, if it isn't Senpai. I could see Senpai who was smiling and waving her hand towards me. She rushed over towards me with a happy expression and started to excitedly talk. It's a bit sudden but how did you notice Arksan's main protagonist traits? Just what are you talking about? It really was sudden, Senpai. Well, I was thinking of quickly returning home to try to this new training but I don't mind hanging around here for a bit longer. Senpai seemed to be acting really unreasonable right now. No, it was just the usual. Please wait a moment. Phew ha ha. All right, I'm ready. I took in a deep breath and released it. Is it that bothersome to talk to me, Yusato kun There's no way that's true. Only a bit. Well, I really don't mind talking with her though so I didn't say it out loud. Rose and Felm had come back from their trip to the forest. I think about ten days have passed. It seemed that Felm spent relatively the same amount of time as me when I went to the forest. Felm's expression when she came back, it's like she was tired of everything in this world. Felm was also spaced out and saying you betrayed me. I'm guessing she also had a similar experience with that savage rabbit. I'm fine now though since I had Blurin. However, after Felm had come back. I'm not too sure how to say it but she felt sturdier than before. It was just my hunch though so it might not exactly be the case. Lots of things sure happened here while Rose and Felm were in the forest. First of all, Lloyd Sama made a bold and grand declaration to everyone in this nation about sending the letters out. Well, compared to fighting on the front lines with the Mu army it might not seem like a big deal. But to me, it felt like it stirred quite the ruckus from the people in my surroundings. There was also my request for getting Arksan to accompany me on my journey. I wonder if they already told him? I didn't want too many people in my party as it would be harder to move around. I would prefer just having the minimum of people required. I was thinking of going to the castle and directly asking Arksan just in case but I decided against it. I can imagine a lot of adverse effects of having a large number of people. I think I have a good idea of how many people would be good while taking into account my own abilities. Since I was waiting and Rose wasn't here in that time, I just proceeded to train more healing magic. The results weren't too favorable. Manipulating the amount of magic power was too difficult and it would get depleted quickly while I was attempting this. I could only rely on my own intuition at this point and get a grasp for controlling my own magic power to just the right amount. I managed to get to point of maintaining the condensed state but it lasted for only a few seconds. It really is difficult. I was at the training grounds and attempted to condense my magic again. It wasn't stable at all as my magic power vanished. I felt exhausted and sat down on the ground. I would be heading for the journey tomorrow but despite that I hadn't made much progress. It was the first time I encountered a wall since coming to this world. Until this point, it was all thanks to Rose that I was able to progress through my healing training. I did feel like running away at times because of how severe her training was but I put in effort and I was rewarded with good results. That's why I did my best. I just can't always have things going my way, hey. While I sat cross-legged with the intent to gather magic power into my hands, the accumulated magic disappeared instantly this time. Did I not have enough concentration this time around? As expected, 
I couldn't expect to cure someone of their disease in ten days. Hey, you Sato. Yes? Wait, leader. What's the matter? I hadn't heard anything until now. Rose called out from behind me and she was sitting on a rock. What was it? She seemed to be bewildered or something. She's showing a reaction that I haven't seen from her until now. She approached me in silence and caught my hand. When did you start adding magic power into your hands like this? S sorry. It feels like I'm doing something wrong. Answer the question. Was I really doing something bad? Olga San got angry at that time and it did feel dangerous. For now, I should honestly answer Rose. I, I saw Olga San condense his magic and I tried to do the same thing to change the color of my own healing magic. Olga? You saw his magic and that's why you're attempting this. While I was feeling nervous, Rose hit my hand with a smack and folded her arms. She was looking at me in thought. After a few seconds pass, the corners of her mouth curved up and formed a crescent moon. Then while she tried to hide her eyes, her body shook as she seemed to suppress herself and let out a laugh in a small voice. Coo, ha ha ha. UMM, what's wrong? Did she finally turn insane? While I was thinking something rude, Rose had settled down after laughing for a bit. Then she showed a really wonderful smile. In fact, it was kind of scary seeing her smile like this. I've never seen her smile like this before. She unfolded her arms while I was confused at what would happen next. However, Rose grinned her hand against my head and combed my hair. She then revealed another smile. This is something like a special property of healing magic. I'm sure you've noticed it but as the color gets dense, the effects of healing get stronger. But to compensate, the healing on yourself gets weaker. As expected, it was like that. I didn't think you were capable of it yet. You could easily die if you apply it during the wrong situation but... Well, isn't it easy? If it's you, you should be fine even if you're dealing with a large number of people. Even I didn't expect for you to notice this by yourself. In other words, I exceeded her expectations and started being able to do something ahead of schedule. It might have taken me longer with much more training. Somehow I felt like I could try even harder now. Air. Is there a trick behind this? It's all about effort. There's no shortcut to this. It's the same as it's always been with your training. Since you've been able to put in effort before, you should definitely be able to put in effort now. Which meant that there was no other method or tricks to getting this to work. I just had to do my best and put in the effort. Now that I knew was making good progress, I grasped my fist tightly while feeling a sense of achievement. Which reminds me, why did Rose come here? Was she suspicious of me for practicing magic here? Or maybe she was surprised for a different reason. Right, I have something to relay to you. Tomorrow will be the day when the letters will be sent out. Which is why I'm supposed to tell you when you'll depart but... It seems that people will see you off so just wait at the gates tomorrow morning. It doesn't really suit me though. You can take Amako with you. Ah, yes. I understand. The heroes should join you shortly after. From there, you'll merge and start your journey together since your first destination is the same. Seeing me off, would the people in this country be seeing us off? The image I was getting of it was people cheering and shouting. I can agree that it doesn't suit with me too. I don't think Senpai and Kazuki would run away from it though. What should I bring? Take your uniform and the bare minimum essentials along with you. If you're taking that bear along with you, get something so that you can strap him on your back. Getting a cord to fasten him should be sufficient. The bare minimum luggage. I guess I'll take the knife I received from Rose and my notebook. I'll also carry a bit of rations too. That's all I really need, other people will probably bring anything else we would need. Is there anything else you want to ask me? For now, that's it. I see. Then before you head out tomorrow, there's one more thing I need to teach you. What is it? There were a lot of dangerous things on the outside so perhaps she had some advice for me. Fundamentally speaking, Rose's words are usually never wrong. I braced myself for next words as she presented her fist in front of me. If you ever get caught up in a situation with some fellows who look down on healing magic you can beat them down without holding back. I can't do that. That would cause a lot of problems. Even Arxan said it would be bad. This person's boiling point was really low. I can't even imagine what kind of mess she would make out there. Those kinds of people only know about what healing magic is like on the tip of the iceberg. But once you beat them up, they'll return to their real characters so there's no problem. You um. For the time being, I'll gratefully accept her words and change the topic to something less dangerous. That's pretty much all I wanted to say. You should go ahead and prepare for tomorrow. It'll be too late once it gets dark. Yes. I'll be returning to the lodgings. Whether it's for better or worse, this journey will definitely influence you. I'm expecting a lot from you. Yusato. After casually saying so, she started walking away from the training grounds. I couldn't help but mumble the words she just said as I saw her back. Expecting a lot from me, 
Hi. It makes me happy, damn it. Was I this simple of a man? Or was it because it was Rose who praised me? That could be the case since I did place a lot of trust in her. She was my teacher since arriving in this world and probably the first person that I respected. Well, then again. This might be due to the fact that Rose had tamed me to this extent. Now then, I should prepare for tomorrow since I already heard about what'll happen. I started slowly walking back to the lodgings as I stretched myself. I had to prepare a leather belt to strap Blurin on my back. However, I stopped walking once I noticed a figure of a shadow within the forest and could even hear their footsteps. Looking closely, I noticed that they had silver hair. I was able to easily identify the figure. What are you up to, Felm? Dogu. After the figure let out a startled voice, a girl with tan skin and silver hair appeared from the shadows. Her silver hair reached down to her shoulders while her eyes seemed to draw me in. She was also wearing the training uniform with the Rescue Squad's logo stitched onto it. She broke her line of sight from me and turned away. While feeling nervous and putting her hands behind her back, she spoke. I'm taking my break right now and I can't enter the town so I thought I would take a walk. But you're here. Ah, I see. But why hide? Although she was behaving right now, we were enemies at one point. She couldn't just walk on the streets even if you take into account how open-minded people were in this country. It's because I don't like you. Why did she not like me to this extent? Well, I guess it wasn't too strange since I was the one who captured her. If she doesn't like me then there's no helping it, I had to hurry and prepare for tomorrow right now. Once it gets dark, it'll be troublesome in various ways. Ha, huh? okay. You finally have a break and also make sure to let your body get some proper rest. Wait. As I was passing by Felm, she caught my arm. You. Are you going somewhere tomorrow? Hey? Which reminds me, I didn't tell you. Tell me. Eh. I'm saying to tell me where you're going. Even though she dislikes me, she's nosy enough to press me for an answer for this. Since she seemed to be frantic about it, I gave her a simple explanation about the letters. As I finished my explanation, she seemed to be angry and wanted to say something but immediately stopped. Instead, she hung her head down. What's wrong? Ah, perhaps you'll feel lonely since I won't be around. She kicked my leg in silence. I have no idea what but this girl was displeased with something so she kicked my leg. This amount of pain wasn't much and I was used to it so I didn't show any reaction on the surface. However, it was still a kick with demonic strength so it still hurt and made my leg numb. I was just joking but maybe she really did feel lonely. Kuh. Wait, don't tell me you really will feel. It's unfair. You get to escape from this hell. Ah, I see. She felt irritated after seeing my face once more so she kicked me again. Afterwards, she headed in a different direction from where I was walking. Her second kick had much more power behind it so it made me a little angry too. I couldn't help but think about how I usually interact with Rose during these kinds of moments. So while I really wanted to retaliate back, I was the senpai here and decided against it. Instead, I calmed down and looked at Felm till she disappeared from my sight. I could probably catch up to her instantly if I wanted to but it was probably best to leave her alone for now. The decision had already been made for me to go on this journey, there was no way for me to back out now. Maybe I should have at least said something like you can just suffer here, you clumsy girl when she kicked me again. Actually, what's with that? Saying that this was hell. I've certainly had a taste of what hell was. If I were in her situation, I would be in comfort. I had to deal with a grand grizzly and some big monster snake. I couldn't even sleep at night because I was scared of that snake, you know. Ha. Huh. Well, I should be open-minded here and forgive her. I started walking towards the lodgings again. I don't know if it was thanks to her or not but my strides felt a bit lighter now. While pondering on why my steps had become a bit lighter, I headed back to prepare for tomorrow. It was the morning of the day I would depart on a journey to give out the letters. Before heading to the meeting place, I went to the fruit store where Amako lived. I'll get used to it eventually. So I'll endure it for now. I really stood out with my pure white rescue squad uniform along with my large rucksack that was packed with all the necessities. However, the groaning blurin on my back probably stood out the most. I had fastened on a belt with blurin on my back while he carried the luggage. I was doing my best to carry all this but it felt very strange as I probably still wasn't used to it. I could only smile bitterly as I stroked Bluren's nose and headed to the fruit store in front of me. Amako and Salrasan came out from inside the store. I couldn't hear what they were talking about but after Salrasan said something to Amako, she gave her a big hug. Amako opened her eyes in surprise but showed a sad expression as she realized something. I'm sure it was hard for Amako as she considered Salra's feelings. Seeing the emotional parting, I did my best to not get in the way as I watched them. After they had separated, Salrasan looked towards me and gave me a profound bow. Please take care of this child. I could somewhat understand that's what she was saying to me. 
I couldn't clearly respond as I wasn't that certain about myself but I know for sure that I had to protect Amako no matter what. Saurasan had been protecting Amako all this time. Now she was placing that responsibility on me and it was an important duty with a lot of weight. Sending the letters, the journey itself, curing Amako's mom, and protecting Amako. It's heavy. I said so in a quiet voice as to remind myself of what lies ahead. Saurasan took Amako by the hand and walked towards me. I didn't know what to say in this situation as I looked at Amako whose eyes already seemed moist. As I was desperately thinking of what to say, Amako lightly tugged on my uniform. And then. You don't have to say it but. Thank you. It seemed she looked ahead a bit in the future and knew what I would say next. It was a very slight smile but I still noticed it as she looked at me. After realizing I was being teased, I gave a sigh of relief and started walking. Yusato. What is it this time? I slowed down my pace to match Amako's as we headed for the gates. As we were walking, Amako suddenly called out to me. I. Do you think it would be alright for me to come back here? What kind of meaning did she have behind those words? Did she not intend to come back here anymore? Or perhaps she couldn't come back anymore even if she wanted to? I couldn't help but tilt my head to the side in wonder. Amako looked down on the ground and started to mutter her next words. You can, return, here at any time. After all, this, is already your home. Saurasan said that to you. Yeah, but I don't know if I can come back. It might be possible I'll never be able to return. Rose did refer to Amako as the Princess of Prophecies at one point. Perhaps Amako's position in her country was a lot more important than I had initially thought. Understanding that, I had lost my next words to say to the downcast Amako. I didn't fully comprehend her situation and how large the scale of this problem was so I couldn't provide any words of comfort. It's really pathetic. As I mocked myself, my steps became a little faster as I could see the gate in front of me. Yusato is going away. Inside the rescue squad's lodgings, Rose was inside her office as she abruptly said those words and looked outside. She was looking at the direction of where the gate was. There was no other way to enter this country except for that gate. As for the gate itself, it would serve as a door for Yusato to go into a different world. The other countries weren't as easy going as Lingal Kingdom. There were also ferocious monsters inhabiting the lands. There were bandits that watched the roads as well. There were also people that bought and sold people as a business. She had a feeling that it would one day come to this but she wasn't worried about Yusato. She trained him so that he wouldn't be taken out by some nobodies. He would gain experience from entering this different world and although it wouldn't be bad to see him experience all this with her own eyes. Cuckoo. As she touched the window with her hand, she smiled. In truth, Yusato had exceeded her expectations. It wouldn't be an exaggeration to say that Rose's training was pushing the very limits of what a human could endure. But Yusato had faced that head-on with courage and did it without slacking off. Rose's first impression of him was a kid with a pitiable expression. Compared to the two heroes, he had nothing that would draw people towards him. In fact, he was only at Oluru's level when he first started training. However, Yusato had magnificently adapted. The key was his fight with that good-for-nothing snake. It was a threat that Yusato had encountered while he had been living in a severe environment. Even though it would normally be a good decision to fight there, anyone else seeing Yusato trying to fight the snake would probably think he was a big idiot. To begin with, it was already wrong for a healer to think about fighting. But that's good. In the middle of Yusato's fight with the snake, Rose had said those words as she looked at his struggle against the snake. It wasn't that it was wrong for a healer to not think of fighting, it was wrong for anyone to not think of fighting. A warrior who could still fight even after using up all their magic power. Rose was aiming for the very apex of healing magic. Her goal of subordinates who wouldn't die. Even if they were pounded, cut, pierced, smashed, or broken in two. It would be like a hero who could stand up no matter what the situation was. And then. Looking out from the window, Rose could see a silver-haired girl heading out. Rose couldn't help but laugh as she saw the girl being wary of her surroundings as she walked. As Rose was about to move to capture the fool. Excuse me. Ah. The door was knocked and a rough voice came from the other side. Rose put her coat on as she replied with an enter. A tall man with a frightening-looking face Alak had entered the room and gave a bow. What is it? Sorry for the bother but I couldn't seem to find Felm anywhere, have you seen her? Ah, you mean that? Distorting her mouth into a monstrous smile, Rose's line of sight fell onto the window. Looking outside, she could see Felm sneakily moving and trying to hide herself. She probably had some sort of plan to secretly leave with Yusato as she was carrying a lot of luggage. She was still not at a stage to leave from here yet. I see, she's going after Yusato and trying to leave here. Probably. After opening the window, she put force onto her legs and jumped out. With Rose's physical ability that far exceeded an ordinary person's, she instantly moved in front of Felm who had been walking ahead all this time. 
Thom who had been slowly walking was petrified when she saw that Rose had suddenly appeared and couldn't understand the situation. Well, just wait a moment. Thom ran away in the opposite direction once she regained her senses. However, Rose caught Thom by grabbing onto her clothes as expected and Thom dangled fruitlessly in the air. I, I am sorry. Even if you apologize at this point, you know. Thelm's face went pale like never before as all the power in her arms and legs were drained of strength. It was understandable considering the abuse she received from Rose thus far. At the moment, Thelm was being held by the collar by no other than an evil, hell-dwelling spirit known as Rose. Thelm understood she would be beaten up right away if she took on her usual attitude right now. You were probably planning on following Yusato and going to a different city. Why you re-wrong? Which part is wrong? Hey! As Thelm let out a pitiable voice, Rose started walking with Thelm in hand towards the lodgings. It wasn't like Rose couldn't let Yusato take care of this fellow. It would be a great chance for Thelm to learn more about humans and what is considered normal for them. But given the circumstances and Yusato's important mission, Rose had decided against it since she didn't want Thelm to get in the way. Either way, you would have been stopped by the gate guards. There's no way you would get through. E even I. Hey? Even I what? I it's nothing. Thelm had wanted to say something in objection but stopped halfway through. As Thelm went silent, she also became dispirited and slumped her shoulders. Well then, I still have to give you your punishment for leaving without permission. Eek. Thelm knew. She knew that she wouldn't be forgiven even if she begged Rose. Thelm had personally witnessed Yusato getting beaten up without question by Rose. When she saw Rose for the first time on the battlefield, Thelm just thought that she was scary. Now that Thelm met Rose in person, Rose was an existence to be feared as she shivered in terror before her. I'm going to hold a grudge against you for this. Yusato. Thelm had those thoughts against Yusato who had left as she was dragged away into the hell called training. Alak who had witnessed this scene from the window could only shake his head and think just the usual. From there, he went back to continue his own training. Weren't there too many people to greet me as I made my way to the gate? A lot of people had called out to me in loud voices as I was walked towards the gates. Before long, I could see a group with horses in the gate itself. There were roughly around ten or maybe more people. In that group, a young man had gotten off the carriage and waved his hand in my direction. Yusato. Ah, Kazuki. I didn't hear about the specifics of how we would be traveling but it seemed we would be riding in a horse-drawn carriage. Looking closely, I could see several lightly armored knights stationed around the carriage. They were probably arranged that way to protect the horses and the people riding them. In that group of knights, I could see Arksan. Blurin, you. Will you be alright riding this? Gwu. There's no way I'd be fine, is what Blurin implied as he kept pounding on my legs. Why you? You're really not holding back against me anymore. You're just too sturdy and tough, Yusato. Gwu. Blurin nodded in agreement with Amako's words which irritated me a little so I flicked his nose with my finger for the time being. As I headed towards the carriage arranged for us, I called out to Arksan. Good morning, Arksan. Good morning. After dismounting from his horse, Arksan placed a fist on his chest as he returned my greeting. As I was thinking he was energetic as usual, he suddenly presented his hands before me. We will handle your belongings, Yusato Dano. You should head towards your carriage in the front. Ah, uh, thank you. As for Blurin. I'm sorry to say so but he'll be moving along with us instead. As expected. Well. I can't imagine Blurin getting onto the carriage. As I gave my luggage to Arksan, Amako and I started walking to the front where our carriage was as we were walking, Blurin was scowling at me as he gave a gurura sound and retrieved my belongings that I had placed on the ground. Don't give too much trouble to Arksan, okay? Gurua. What's with that uncertain reply of yours? It should probably be fine. If anything happens, I just have to come outside and watch over him. Blurin handed over my belongings to a knight that was close by and I headed inside the carriage. There was enough room to fit about ten people and it looked a little more modest on the inside than I had initially thought. Paying closer attention to the surroundings, there was Inyakumai Senpai and Kazuki. There was also a woman with a white robe and long light blue hair, Welsi San. Good morning, everyone. For now, I should greet everyone. Amako and I replied with our own greetings. It's been a while since we've talked, Yusato Sama. E, Welsi San. You're also coming on this journey. You really left quite the impression on me, after all. Like when you suddenly took me by the hand when you found out about my magic attribute. Or how scared you looked when you saw Rose. Yes, it would be too much to leave everything to just the heroes which is why I'll do my best to help until we reach Luquis. Is that so? It's not like I thought we would be the only emissaries being sent but Lloyd Sama was really generous to send a mage like Welsi San who was really important to this kingdom. As for me, I'm really glad to have someone like Welsi San come with us. No no no, I can't contribute much with my amount of power. 
Senpai and I learned magic from you, have more confidence in yourself teacher. The two of them had a lot of trust in Welsi from the looks of it. Maybe Welsi was similar to how Rose was like to me as my teacher. Although I would have preferred Welsi San's calming aura over Rose's aura. After all, Rose's aura was like a savage animal's where just looking at her would cause me to tremble. If I said this to her in person, there's no doubt she would beat me senseless. As I was lost in my thoughts, Amako suddenly tugged on my uniform's cuffs in silence. Amako showed an expression of worry and directed her gaze towards Welsi San. I could somewhat understand what her thoughts were and spoke to Amako. This person is all right. Rather, you should be more wary of Senpai. Yet. Yeah. Nnn? Just now, did you naturally treat me like some dangerous person? Inyakumai Senpai didn't seem content as she said so and showed a sour expression. Ignore it, ignore it. I let my back rest on the wall, when the carriage suddenly shook and I could hear the wheel of carriage bumping into something. It might have been better to just walk. That reminds me, Welsi San. The letters. I'm taking good care of them, don't worry. Welsi San opened a small rucksack and retrieved several sheets of paper. Susan Sama and Kazuki Sama should have already been told this, but these are the letters you'll be sending. At the moment, I'll be taking care of them, but I'll hand over the letters to everyone once you go your separate ways. That's why you don't need to worry about these letters for now. When we depart, we're not sending a letter to Luquis. For Luquis, I'll be the one delivering the letter. Is what I've been told, but I don't mind if Susan Sama and the rest want to come along. In other words, Welsi San would be setting up an example of how we should present the letters? If that's the case, it would really help. It's not like you could suddenly appear, deliver a letter to an important person, and be like bye. Leaving aside Kazuki and Senpai who were in the student council in my former world, I wasn't used to doing something like this at all which was why I was worried. At least one of my worries had been resolved. Thinking so, I leaned back in relief as I looked outside from the window. I could only see the green of the surrounding trees. I was still used to the scenery before me but after a few hours, I'll be able to witness ones I haven't seen. The beginning of a journey a new place. It would be a great adventure with a dangerous road full of the unknown. For better or worse, I had become accustomed to this world. I didn't know what would happen beyond this point and I could only absent-mindedly dwell on the possibilities. Luquis, the country that resides next to Lingal Kingdom. Inside this country, there exists a large magic academia. The structure itself is large enough to be mistaken for a castle. There was also someone who held the most authority and governed this academia. This person would be similar to something like a principal or a headmaster at a school. The students studying here developed their own systems of magic and even competed against each other as rivals. From what Arksan said, the students here not only studied magic but other subjects as well such as martial arts, sword techniques, and so on. From what Welsi San said, one could only graduate from here with excellent grades and the ones that do graduate become powerful mages. From what Amako said, there was no shortage of discrimination against inferior lineages of magic that people were born with. There weren't a lot of factors to consider when characterizing one's system of magic to be superior or inferior. The factors were the raw amount of magic power, its usefulness, and how much demand there was for it. You could make up for some shortcomings with your own effort to a certain extent but you couldn't change the system of magic that you were born with no matter how hard you try. At least that's what I've heard. It was currently the night of the sixth day since we've departed. As I was blankly staring at the lit campfire, I thought about our current destination, Luquis. Except for the guards that were keeping watch, everyone else had already turned in for the day. I really should be resting as well since we were scheduled to arrive at Luquis tomorrow. However, just thinking about our destination made me feel restless and I couldn't fall asleep. Arksan, you shouldn't push yourself. No no, I rested plenty just a while ago. Arksan who was sitting in front of me gave a refreshing laugh as he replied. Since I couldn't sleep before, I had gotten out of the carriage. I noticed Arksan and had called out to him out of concern. I already knew this but he really was a very polite and kind person with good manners. It may be due to the nature of his line of work as a knight but it was fairly easy to have a conversation with him. He was similar to a committee chairman at school. Arksan, you? Yes. You've been to Luquis, right? Senpai kept going on about Arksan being a main protagonist and saying incomprehensible things about light novels. Of the nonsense Senpai spouted, she mentioned this matter. But Arksan had displayed a somewhat awkward expression to my words. Was it a topic that I shouldn't get into? Yet. Yeah. Sorry, was it something I shouldn't have asked? No, that's not necessarily the case. Arksan panicked at my question and quickly denied it by crossing his arms. I could see how frantic he was just from how the sword on his hip swayed from side to side due to his sudden movements. I suspect that. You'll know about it sooner or later at any rate. I should at least tell you about it myself. Is it related to what will happen tomorrow? Yes. I'm guessing that you've already heard about the discrimination in Luquis with regards to the systems of magic from Amako, right? Well. 
Although I thought it was cruel, I also personally thought of it as someone else's problem. Kazuki and Inyakumai senpai might get angry over this issue but I felt like it didn't concern me. The discrimination against what type of magic you possess. There's also discrimination against non-humans. Discrimination against non-humans? Wasn't this something in every country and not just Luquis? At the very least, that's what I've been told. Luquis is a gathering of people from various places and they all have their own objectives. Whether it's to become a knight or to live a life in luxury, everyone studies hard to achieve their goals. It would take too long for me to explain everything so I will omit most of it. The main thing that I want to say is that the non-humans who choose to enter Luquis will be persecuted and have to prepare themselves to face that. Aren't they aware of how dangerous it could be? Yes, but that's just how much value Luquis holds. If it was my world, I guess it would be like a school with a gathering of the elite. However, I just can't see how valuable this was to others just from this conversation. Why would they go out of their way to undertake magic training? That's just how. I speak from personal experience. You get struck and beaten down, if you get back up, you get beaten down again, if you somehow manage to avoid a blow, you'll be immediately kicked. I just can't imagine why one would participate in this kind of training which required no thought, it was simply physical suffering. Was it a school specifically for non-humans to get a beating? You're showing an expression like you don't understand. Well, yet. Yeah. I can't comprehend it. Even if it's filled with danger, there are things that they must accomplish. On the surface, Luquis prohibits the act of buying and selling non-humans but this is where students gather from all over the continent. Although there aren't many people who discriminate against non-humans, there will always a group of people or individuals with extreme prejudice against non-humans. While Arxan directed a slightly troubled smile at me, he reached over to a stack of dry wood and tossed some more into the fire. The fire grew larger and brighter from the added fuel. The illumination was also enough for me to catch a glance of Arxan's faint but sorrowful expression. That academy is the best place to study magic, there's no other place that would be considered more ideal. However, it is also the worst place to be for a small number of individuals. Honestly, I don't like it over there. I'm sorry. Ah, uh, no. You didn't do anything wrong, you said Odano. I really wanted to be helpful to you in some way and seriously thought about being your guard when I accepted the request. Even so, I was still the person to make Arxan accompany me to Luquis. He considered it the worst place to be, I couldn't help but feel very sorry. I incidentally, what kind of impression do you have of non-humans, you said Odano? My impression? Hmm. Different from humans? But that was obvious. Even so, the only non-humans I've met so far are Amako the Beast Girl and Felm the Demon. Looking at just those two. I don't really have any. It may have been due to the bad influence over me since the average non-human didn't seem all that monster-like or scary compared to Rose the demonic leader. It feels like the rescue squad itself was a band of monsters. In fact, Felm treated them like goblins and ogres. But what was with Arxan's question? The person himself seemed to pause for a moment but then in the next moment, he gave an uncharacteristically loud laugh. Ha 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 ha. E. What was so funny? Arxan tried to suppress his laughter. I don't think I said anything odd. It was just a simple and plain response with no other meaning behind it. Even so, Arxan laughed uncontrollably. Don't really have any, you say. It really is a statement that's unique and something only you would say, you said Odano. Only me you say. Yes, it suits you. That's probably why Amako was not worried about you. Someone like you who would treat humans and non-humans equally. Meaning that the people of this world had a much different impression than me, so much that they would burst into laughter, I guess. As expected of me. I wouldn't fear non-humans from how much fantasy novels I've read about them. To begin with, our common sense and impressions were different as we had come from a different world. Everything in this world already felt different after all, whether it be non-humans or anything else. The people in this world accepted magic as it was something ordinary and naturally regarded non-humans as dreadful existences. Even if you say it's very much like me to think so, I'm not exactly a good person like you think. You said Odano is a good person. You're just not aware of it yourself. Don't praise me so much, please. I might get conceited, you know. Ha ha ha, it would be better for you to be a little more conceited. From just our recent exchange, Arxan's expression had gotten a lot softer. He even had a cheerful smile. Right now, Arxan didn't give off the courteous impression he gave when we first talked but rather it felt like he was being more open and honest. Yusato and Ark got on slightly better terms with each other. I felt like those words appeared in front of me somehow. Nah, it was probably just my imagination. Hmm. What's the matter? I was sitting by the campfire and absent-mindedly chatting with Arxan when he suddenly looked in the direction behind me. Having my doubts, I turned around to look. Arxan seemed to have his attention focused on the carriage. It seems like there's one more person who couldn't fall asleep as well. 
the door was opened even though I closed it when I had gotten out of the carriage. I saw a figure of a girl through that opening. When our eyes met, she got out and started walking towards me. You can't sleep. You can't sleep either, Yusato. After saying so, Amako sat down and stared at the flames just like I was a moment ago. However, why was she up so late? Leaving me aside, Amako should have been sound asleep beside Senpai. Inyakumai kept on hugging me so I woke up. Ha ha ha, that's... Looks like Amako Dano met with a lot of trouble. Really, that Senpai is... Seeing that we were reprimanding Senpai, Amako's sour expression turned to a smiling one. Afterwards, I'll talk with Senpai before letting Amako sleep again. What were the two of you talking about? Just talking about what would happen tomorrow. It would be awkward to just say we were discussing the discrimination against non-humans in Luquis. Since that was the case, I just gave a rough explanation while omitting that part. Yusato, do you remember the things I mentioned to you before during my stay at Luquis? Hmm? I remember. If I recall correctly. There was a beastkin who helped you out. Is that so? Arksan was somewhat surprised and turned to Amako for confirmation. Amako replied by nodding her head. I'm not sure whether they're still here but... Yusato, could we visit them once you are finished with your business? I'm going to. Yeah. I'm going as well hey. What should I do if there's someone scary? No, I really don't think anyone could match Rose but, it didn't change the fact that it was bad for my heart if I met someone so intimidating. Luquis wasn't a safe place for non-humans and yet they were living here. Maybe they also had some kind of special magic like Amako? At any rate, I won't get anywhere without receiving permission first. Is it alright for us to go, Arksan? I think it should be fine. After delivering the letters, it's not like they'll make a decision immediately. We'll be staying here for a bit and that should give you plenty of time to do what you want. It might even take longer than expected which may delay you from sending your own letters. I don't mind at all. If that's the case, there shouldn't be any problems. Amako hugged her knees in delight, probably because she might see an old friend again soon. Seeing her appearance, it got me to remember that she had been separated from her own kind for a long time. It was probably hell for her until she met Salrasan. When I was around Amako's age before, I was just a whining brat that cried because I couldn't go on a trip. I couldn't help but give a bitter smile when I compared my childhood to Amako's. I'm starting to feel a little sleepy. After my exchange with Arksan, I started to feel tired. I initially thought I would go for an all-nighter but now I really did feel sleepy. Thinking of going to bed, I got up but Arksan called out to me as he remained seated. Yusato Dono, look next to you. Next to me. I was so absorbed in my own thoughts that I didn't notice it until now but Amako was dozing off next to me and my knee was supporting her head. Before I realized it, her hands were also grabbing onto my sleeves. Arksan noticed this and probably pointed it out as he didn't want to wake her up. As expected, she's the most reassured by your side. Is that so? Well, I guess I can just sleep here. How about you, Arksan? I'll be changing shifts to stand watch soon so. Are you going to fall asleep while sitting like that? It's okay. I'm used to it. During my time in the forest, I had to sleep like this while on a tree in case any monsters attacked. In comparison to that, this was nothing much. For the time being, I sat beside Amako and hung my uniform on my shoulders that I had folded up. Then, I'll be counting on you tomorrow. I should be the one saying so. After exchanging words with Arksan, I closed my eyes while thinking that it had been a while since I slept with someone beside me. Perhaps it was because I wasn't aware of how tired I was but I surprisingly felt my consciousness gradually fading without much resistance. Kun. Someone was calling out my name. I wonder who was calling me? While still half asleep, I opened my eyes. Before I knew it, I was lying down. I was certain that I slept sitting upright beside the campfire and next to Amako yesterday. In addition, I felt something soft like a pillow wrapping around my head. Hey, you sato kun. Nn. While my head still wasn't fully awake, I saw a figure of a person. Actually, even though my head wasn't fully functioning. I immediately recognized who it was. Ha. Huh. What the? Inyakumai senpai hey. W wait a minute. I'm letting your head rest on my lap, you could at least give me a better reaction than this. Seeing through the obvious ulterior motive of senpai, I got off her lap and looked around. It was quite bright already, it looks like I overslept. It seemed that everyone else that was inside the carriage, except for Amako who fell asleep at the same time as me had already gotten up. Seeing as I was already up, I went to greet them. Did you carry me, Kazuki? Nn? Yeah, but you don't really need to thank me. It was a little heavy but it wasn't too much trouble. Even though I ended up oversleeping, it really felt different to be able to just fall asleep surrounded by people you could trust. 
There was an unspoken rule in the rescue squad where you couldn't oversleep so it's been a while since I've been in an environment this carefree and lax. Leaving that aside Yusato, please do something about Senpai. Inyakamai Senpai. While giving a strained laugh, Kazuki turned his head towards Senpai. Sure enough, Senpai was sulking because of me and was patting the sleeping Amako on the head who was on the opposite side of the carriage. Really, so rude. A beautiful girl giving you a lap pillow and yet not being aroused at all. I mean, it was obvious to see your intentions. Also calling yourself a beautiful girl feels somewhat deplorable. Honestly speaking, she really was the beautiful girl type. In addition, if I was bluntly asked if I was happy about the lap pillow, I would answer I was happy, in a loud voice. But I wasn't a fish that would bite onto the fish hook in front of me with such obvious bait. Anyways, I heard from Amako. Senpai was hugging her so she couldn't fall asleep. At B but that's because she's so cute so I can't help it. Don't try and make excuses. Well, don't sulk so much. It's not like I wasn't happy, you know? Probably. It seemed that my words cheered her up since she cleared her throat within a hem and moved her hand away from Amako. Good grief. You're not honest at all, Yusato-kun. Yusato is unexpectedly shy and likes to change his wording after all. You two are just too honest. I say people like me are normal. There's no way that's possible. They reply. Kerr. Are these two trying to say my common sense was abnormal? Yusato-sama being normal. I can't help but think that this feels a little off. Even Welsi san Welsi san who had been scanning over the letter lifted her head and uttered so while giving a wry smile. If Amako was awake right now, she would definitely take this opportunity to side with everyone and say how abnormal I was. This time it was my turn to act sulky so I sat down and started to perform the magic training that Rose had previously mentioned. As expected, I'm not normal hey. You know, doing this isn't all that difficult. Welsi san said so with her usual expression. She's been saying this to me on every occasion ever since we started this journey. From what I heard, it takes several months of memorization before one usually learns a new magic spell. However, this wasn't considered to be that difficult. As long as someone knew the procedure, anyone could easily do it. Welsi san continued speaking. That's why I've been telling you, even if it's easy to do, it's still dangerous. If you mess up, the magic power you unleashed will blow up and inflict damage on yourself. Really, thinking it's okay to do this just because you're a healing magician. This is something you should only try once you've gotten better at controlling your magic power. From there I kept on getting lectured as usual by Welsi san and I stiffly smiled as I operated my magic power. To get from my dim green light color to something that resembled Olga San's dark green light, I repeated this process over many times. But without seeing anything in front of me, it was difficult to tell if I was making progress. However according to Welsi San, I was making a considerable amount of progress. I wonder if I could do that too. Senpai is a little irresponsible so it would be better to stop while you're still only thinking about doing it. There's no problem if you're here right, Yusato-kun. No no. Even though I seem to be doing everything naturally, I was really having a lot of trouble. If Senpai were to attempt this and easily succeed, I don't think I could regain my confidence. Also, I was genuinely concerned that Senpai would cross a dangerous bridge and I didn't want that. I didn't have that much reaction since I was used to it by now but when my magic discharged, it hurt quite a bit. Senpai was more or less still a female high school student. I was doubtful if Senpai would be able to endure it. You can't do that. Suzun-sama. Isn't it fine, Welsi san You think so too right? Kazuki. Yeah. It's not that I'm not curious but Welsi san has been telling you to stop, Yusato. It might be better to not try. Still, Kazuki really trusts me to this extent. Not that it's a bad thing. It would have been nice to get along with each other sooner back in our former world. Thinking back to the days where I thought of you as a normie who should go and explode, I really do feel sorry. M. Um, fine. I don't want to trouble Yusato kun too much after all. You were already troubling me quite a bit. Not that I would say it out loud. Seeing as senpai had finally settled down, I lightly sighed. That reminds me, how long was I asleep? I heard we would reach Luquis today but... Oh yeah, how much longer? You mean until we reach Luquis? Yeah, looking at our current location. Once we go over that hill in the distance, we should arrive. If that was the case, I estimate it'll be around one hour or so. I don't know if this world had something like a clock to tell the time though. A place with students its relation with non-humans, and someone who was part of the beastkin that helped out Amako. Although these all made me curious, what really piqued my interest was without a doubt. Look was healing magician. Though I felt uneasy during this trip, it only took a week for us to reach our destination by carriage. Thanks to Amako's foresight, we were able to reach Luquis without much trouble. We still ran into monsters but according to Welsi-san, our encounter ratio for this trip was considered very low. 
Well, Blurin was also here and acted as something similar to a deterrent to the monsters but it didn't change the fact that Amako's magic was amazing. After a few encounters along the way, we finally arrived at Luquis Gate. I was inside the carriage and looked at the impressive gate throughout the window. It's pretty. Lingle's gate gave off the impression of being solid and old. Luquis Gate was black and decorated with ornaments of various colors. It looked gorgeous. There was also something like a magic circle engraved onto this gate, it was possible this wasn't just an ordinary gate. I might be overthinking it though. It feels like a school. Although it's completely different from the kind of school we know. Well, of course. I nodded in agreement at Kazuki's words as he also looked out the window. Well see San was talking with the guards at the moment but I should mentally prepare myself for when we do enter. We were in a sense representing Lingle Kingdom so we had to be careful and act in a way that wouldn't degrade Lingle's reputation. Senpai, please pay attention to your surroundings. You definitely can't start an argument or cause trouble for others, okay? You know. I was a former student council president who honored the rules, don't. Treat me like someone who randomly attacks people on the streets. It seems you can't trust me even this much. I'm saying this because you are the former student council president. Senpai had a strong sense of justice and she would definitely jump out to help a student if they looked like they were being falsely prosecuted. But I did find this trait of hers to be praiseworthy. Amako, you'll be putting on my coat right? Try your best to not move your tail. It's all right, I'm used to it. I put an overcoat that was similar in color to my uniform over Amako. She'll be waiting inside the carriage while the rest of us along with Arksan's group headed towards the castle. It was an important mission so it felt more reassuring to be in their company. Our group consisted of Welsi San, Kazuki, Senpai, and me. I've received permission. Well then, we'll be entering Luquis now. Welsi San's energetic voice came from outside and the carriage started to move. At the same time, the gate opened and revealed what was happening within. The, the buildings and shops stood in rows. There were buildings of different sizes everywhere but they only emphasized the clear and noble atmosphere permeating the school dyed in white. What was with this? This school wasn't just some common building but rather it reminded me of the western architecture I would often see in my former world. It was possible that I was basing my standards on the impressions I got from Lingle Kingdom. There was a straight path alongside a row of buildings that led straight to the school. In Lingle Kingdom, stalls were also more commonplace. It seemed that the business here for these stylish and robe-like uniforms were good. Almost everyone on the streets wore the same thing and their ages weren't too far apart either. It was a strange sight. The amount of adults present here at the moment could be counted on one hand. This is, the magic city. Honestly, I didn't think there would be a place like this for students to live so freely. I heard it was a school so I was thinking it'd be more regulated. This would be more like a university back at home rather than the high school I attended. As expected, we can't just take this carriage and ride it down this street. We'll be walking from here. Ah, uh, yes. What about Blurin? The blue grizzly? It'll be at the stables with the other horses. It would draw too much attention, after all. I see. I was a little scared that I would have to take him into the city. I can't imagine what might happen so I was glad. Feeling relieved, we got off the carriage as Welzisan had instructed. As for our belongings. They were still stored on the carriage so it should be fine. I heard there would be night standing watch so I didn't need to worry about anything being stolen. Even so. It felt like I was getting some unpleasant stares. We had just entered through the gate but I could already see lots of students. Everyone was wearing a dark colored robe. Or rather, I should say there wasn't any other kind of clothing. Since I was wearing a white uniform, I felt like I stuck out. And then. What's wrong? Yusato. No, it's just. Inside the crowd of students, there was a boy glaring at me. It was the kind of glare you would give to a parent you didn't like. The robe of the boy who was glaring at me seemed to be dirty with soot. Nevertheless, a glare like this was an everyday occurrence for me. Not to mention the fact that this kind of glare didn't feel threatening at all. I made eye contact with the other party and they seemed startled as their body trembled. After a few moments, they ran away. Kazuki, could it be that my, eyes are scary? In response, Kazuki took a moment before replying rather than scary, your eyes give off a very chivalrous-like feeling. I felt that chivalrous was far from what it really was but I was still a bit happy that Kazuki said so. Chivalrous, hey. I see myself as someone timid, so praising me like that. I feel moved. Amako who was next to me muttered. During the times when he's scary, he's really scary though. But I pretended to not hear a thing. I definitely heard nothing. The compliment moved me from the bottom of my heart as Welsi San led us on the main street and pointed to the opposite side. Following her finger, I could see the largest structure in this city. That's where our goal is and it's not that far. The knights will please stand by here. We'll be handing over the letter. Well then. Please follow me. Yes. Well, I'll leave Blurin to you, 
Amako. I'm not particularly worried but do be careful. It'd be nice if you could show a little concern. No, these were Amako's words. They wouldn't mean much if someone else said them but since Amako was the one saying it, these words showed how much she trusted me and was probably her way of encouraging me. While persuading myself like this, the knights seeing us off bowed towards us for some time before we followed Welsi San on the main street. Our armors are durable and cheap. I'm quite confident in their quality. If you're looking to equip yourself, you should shop here at Carluna Armor Store. Our dried meat is the best. You won't find this kind of dried meat anywhere else. Don't assume that I don't have any skill just because I'm a student. I'm looking to buy almost anything, please come sell your items here. We can negotiate the prices depending on the items. There really were a lot of different shops here. I imagine that it would be a lot of work for a student to manage a business here. Still, I couldn't help but admire the students beckoning for customers to come over. They didn't look much older than me either. The students who don't have any spending money outside of school work here to earn some. They're just helping out adults who own the shops but most of labor force here is composed of students. Eh, uh, sort of like a part-time job. How interesting. Outside of their studies, the students also worked, it was just like our world. I slowed down my walking pace a bit to take a closer look at Luquis while making sure Welsi San was still within my line of sight. It was really difficult to imagine that a place so full of energy like this would have something as dark as discrimination against non-humans. Seeing the sight of laughing students walking down the street while checking out the stores. I ended up thinking out loud maybe this country didn't have something like that. Senpai, what do you think? You're interested in stuff like this. I wonder what Kazuki and Senpai's impression of this place was. I intended to ask them but I noticed someone was missing. Kazuki, Welsi San. Where's Senpai? Eh? Senpai. Hey. If it's Inyukami Sama then she's right beside. She's not here. Is that person incapable of sitting still for just one moment? We hadn't even walked for ten minutes and Senpai had already disappeared. My cheeks twitched, but just then I heard a familiar voice shouting amongst a crowd of people behind me. As expected of the magic city. The things they're selling look like they come from the fantasy genre. I couldn't see them but I had a good guess of who it was. I saw that Kazuki and Welsi San's cheeks were also stiff due to Senpai. I turned around in silence and headed towards Senpai who stood in the middle of the commotion. The person who raised their voice with such excitement was, unfortunately, a beautiful girl. It was truly unfortunate. The image I had in my mind of Senpai had greatly changed, in a bad way. Sorry, she's our companion. It's unfortunate, but she's with us. There were a lot of robed people around Senpai, but they were too preoccupied by what was in front of them to pay much attention to her. Senpai stood out as she was wearing a custom-made armor from Lingal Kingdom, while the people around her had dark-colored robes. In spite of this, there were so many people around Senpai that I was slowly losing sight of her. I couldn't help but sigh heavily. She really was enjoying her time in this world a little too much. If it was before, she was practically at an unreachable level for most people at school. At least that's what I thought, but it seems Senpai has fallen. A almost, just a little more. I had finally advanced enough to clearly see Senpai again. She had a gleam in her eyes as she looked at a shopkeeper who was speaking at great length about some sort of armor on display. Don't tell me you already forgot our objective for coming to this country. She was just like a child who was in high spirits and couldn't suppress herself. I quickened my pace a bit. However, maybe that wasn't a good idea as I suddenly collided with one of the onlookers. Ow. Ah, sorry. Did I bump them in a bad spot? I wasn't sure but they had fallen on their back. I was about to extend my hand to them to help them up, but... I caught a glimpse of their slitted pupils staring at me and gulped. These eyes were just like Amako's beast eyes. I couldn't see their face clearly since their hood was up. They probably didn't want others to see their face. With that being the case, I should pretend that I didn't notice anything to avoid arousing their suspicion. I didn't want to get entangled in anything troublesome at the moment. It would be no laughing matter if problems came up before we delivered the letter. Are you all right? Coming to a decision, I reached out with the hand I had frozen in place. Their eyes remained calm as they took my hand. I got a clear look at their eyes, which confirmed my guess. I didn't say anything and slowly helped them get up. You're quite the unusual person. No. An unusual person you say. Well, I guess I am. I'm someone from a different world after all. To the people of this world, I was a very unusual person. They patted the dust off their robes after getting up and then glanced at my face. They probably saw that I looked a bit worried since they proceeded to say. I only fell down, I'm not injured at all. That's good. I really do want to give a proper apology but I'm in a hurry at the moment so. I glanced at the crowd. I really wanted to apologize and maybe treat them to something but Senpai was like a child right now running around everywhere. I had to bring her back to Welsi-san and Kazuki. 
After saying I'm sorry again, I started walking towards where Senpai was. Wait. Tug. My right arm was firmly grasped and pulled back. Looking back, I could see a sharp glint in their eyes. As they pulled me back, they drew closer to my face and sniffed it. I don't think their intentions were lewd. Rather, I felt anger and bloodlust emitting from her instead. You. Have a smell I'm familiar with. Well, what kind of smell are you referring to? I didn't take a bath since yesterday. But I couldn't say that and it probably wasn't that. He was probably referring to something else when they grabbed my arm. No, judging from their voice, it was a she. She was referring to a different smell. If it happens to be that. Don't play dumb. Why do you have my acquaintance's scent on you? And then? Could it be that you're the one who helped Amako back then? The moment I said that, the hand that was holding my right arm tightened like a vice. What strength she had. She didn't have as much as Rose but it was still a considerable amount. At the very least, it wasn't strength that a human would have. It seemed like they intended to drag me somewhere else but I couldn't allow myself to leave. I used my own strength and raised it just enough to resist her pull. She raised her voice in surprise at my resistance as she realized how dangerous the situation was for her. I can't move you. As expected, Amako is all ready. Now I'm next. Wait, I think you're misunderstanding the situation too much. Calm down for a moment. Calm down, hey. It seemed like there's been a weird misunderstanding. They mistook me for some villain coming after them. However. Before I knew it, I was suddenly bound by some kind of thread and my arms were pinned. I had let my guard down. It seemed she had prepared the thread in advance and hid it in her left hand within her robes. The surrounding onlookers noticed the situation and wanted to say something upon seeing the thread but... They just walked away. Hey. Save me, you students. A slave trader? A bandit? Or perhaps you're part of the famed kidnappers from Lingal. Sorry, the last option was probably my group. But they kidnapped people in a different meaning. Ah really, just calm down for a bit. Amako and I are. Yes, we're friends. Friends hey. Humans sure say the most convenient words to match the situation. W.L. Before I finished speaking, she tightened her grip. One of her arms were holding my right arm to prevent me from escaping and, although I didn't see what was behind me, I was used to the peculiar sound of a hand clenching into a fist and storing power. This was bad. Although I had more strength than her, her grip on my arm prevented me from escaping. What was up with her grip strength? Ha! Huh. From behind, she launched her fist and aimed it right at my spine. In the middle of her punch, I caught a glimpse of the ears on her head. She had light brown hair that was tied up and poking through her hair were beast ears. She had a young and pretty face but there was also anger on it. While feeling that this was an unreasonable situation for me to be in, I resigned myself to my own fate and caught her fist to stop the blow. Momomu. The power from her fist was sent directly into my palm and I received the impact. If it was a month ago, I would probably faint from the pain in just a few seconds but... After enduring that sandbag hell training... This amount of power wasn't enough for me to faint. At least that's what I thought but the palm that received her fist was minced. Ouch. Fresh blood scattered from my palm. But I immediately used healing magic to close up the wounds. I felt something sharp cutting into my skin but it was shallow and the speed of my healing magic was faster than her ability to injure me. Wah. You caught it. No, it restored itself. You're not, human. I'm human, you know. Really, how rude. I'm still human. The real monster was Rose, the great devil king. The color on her face changed, was it that strange for me to receive their blow? Now along with the anger on her face, there was also a trace of fear. She let go of my arm. And cautiously glanced towards me. We'd stand out too much here. Seeing the confidence in my eyes, she showed a sour expression. She fixed her hood and said to me your face. I remember it. After leaving these words, she ran and disappeared into a back alley. Should I chase her? I had some confidence that I could overtake her with my speed. However we had an important mission right now and it won't be a good idea to pursue her when the letter hadn't been delivered yet. Instead of going after her here, maybe I should report to Amako afterwards? She said Amako was an acquaintance so it might be a better idea to let Amako resolve this misunderstanding. In the worst case scenario, I could just forcibly persuade her. I wonder if this was good news for Amako. Amako said she helped her out and all. Wow, I'm getting a lot of undesirable attention right now. It felt like I was some kind of animal at the zoo in a cage. While calming down after the encounter I just had, I headed towards Senpai and called out to her. Yikes. This person didn't notice at all. Kazuki and the others were obstructed from her view, but since I was this close, I really wish you would notice. Senpai. Mew, you've come at just the right time, Yusato-kun. Look at this. 
Don't you think this type of crafting method is very elaborate and exquisite? Senpai. I mean, I know I received a sword and all but I really do want to try using a bow too. Alright, alright. I got it, I'll go back so. Stop looking at me with that expressionless face. Senpai replied while sounding frightened as she looked at me. From there, Senpai. Followed me in silence and we walked back towards where Welsi San and Kazuki was. Thankfully, we didn't encounter that beast girl again. Welsi San and Kazuki didn't see my exchange with her either. We were about to deliver a letter so it would put us in a bad position if we injured any of the students here. I brought her back. In Yakumai Sama. You should be a little more conscious of the important mission you've received. Well, sorry sorry. I couldn't hold myself back. Please don't make too much trouble for us. Even if it was only for a short time, you were the president of the student council. You Sato, you all right. I'm fine, just a little tired but... Other than bringing Senpai back, nothing else happened. While observing the exchange between Kazuki and Inyakumai Senpai, who was in shock, we proceeded towards our objective again. I already got mixed into some trouble in Luquis. Next time I won't say anything unnecessary. After twenty or so minutes, we arrived in front of a large white building. We had finally arrived at our goal. Just from my initial impression, it didn't look like a castle you would see in Lingle but rather resembled an extravagant school building. This is. Is it really this building? Yes, this is the center of Luquis. The very essence of the magic city the magic academy of Luquis. This was the place where the first letter would be delivered. Honestly, it exceeded my expectations so I couldn't help but feel restless. There were students no matter where I looked, enough for my eyes to hurt. What's with this guy, and there's someone. Who looks really plain in that group were some things I overheard from the students. Yet. Yeah. It was really true so I couldn't voice any objections. Did we receive permission to enter? Air. I got a guard to relay a message when we arrived at the gate so. So we're waiting for someone to escort us. I wonder what kind of response we'll get. I can't cross out the possibility that they might treat us poorly but we were messengers from a neighboring country. I won't say we'll get a courteous reception but it should at least be a moderately cordial one, right? Hey, those are some nice clothes you're wearing. You. I was astonished as someone whispered close to my ear. Rather than feeling that it was creepy, I was just surprised because I had never experienced something like this in my life. Was Inyakumai Senpai committing another crime? No, it was a different voice. Looking towards the source of the voice, there stood a young boy with grey hair and a gentle smile. He was also a bit shorter than me. No no. I'm truly sorry for surprising you. Your esteemed group should be the envoys from Lingle Kingdom right? Why yet? You are not wrong. Then, you are. Yes, I will be the one escorting you to the principal. You can call me Hafa. He bowed respectfully and his black robes fluttered. Hafa. San? I thought he was a young boy but he had a neutral face so I couldn't really tell. Being taller than him doesn't tell me much either. The robe was also covering most of his body so I couldn't really find any distinct features. No, leaving that aside. It was really mysterious how he whispered in my ear without me noticing at all. Even if there were a lot of people in my surroundings, I didn't relax my guard at all since we were in an unfamiliar place. At the very least, I don't believe he's just a simple guide. You sato -kun. If they're acting as a boy, they must be some man's daughter right? Senpai, my composure right now has a crack in it. Please be silent for a while. Are you always so bitter? There was no point in having a conversation with this person unless they calmed down and thought about the meaning behind my words. We stepped onto the grounds of the academy and followed half a san. There was a plaza in the center surrounded by school buildings in rows. Students were spending their free time by reading, talking, and practicing magic here. As far as I, and most likely Inyakumai Senpai, were concerned, this scene fit our expectations of the kind of school a magic academy would be. Wow. It was pretty much just like I imagined the everyday life to be like in a magic school. The atmosphere, filled as it was with magic energy, overflowed with the energy of youth. What am I, an old man? It seems like you have a strong interest in them. Half a San who was walking in front of us turned and addressed us. His voice didn't feel cohesive like when he whispered in my ear. It's something we've never seen before. I apologize if it was impolite. No no it's not impolite. In fact, I greatly welcome it. They should be proud that esteemed individuals such as yourselves have taken an interest in them. Hafasan's casual words. Those words made Senpai twitch for a moment and caused Kazuki and Welsi to stare in wonder. I wasn't that surprised. After all, this was Senpai and Kazuki. Did the principal talk about us? No, but seeing the carriage your group arrived in and its quality, I knew your group couldn't be ordinary. Also, Hafasan turned around and faced me while pointing a finger towards my chest. Was there something behind me? 
I looked behind but there was no one. Me? No, I really didn't stand out that much apart from my magic power that was slightly more than the average person. Other than my rare healing magic, there was nothing else that I had. If I had to list one more thing, it would be this uniform that I received as my proof of being in the rescue squad. Lingal Kingdom's rescue squad, the second unorthodox healing magic user who dons the white uniform. Eh, you know about me. Or rather, unorthodox you say. Unorthodox. Yet. Yeah. Even though I healed wounds like normal healing magicians, I was really alienated. No, even if it was Rose's healing magic I was still really insane to do something like destroying my own body and healing it repeatedly. But I really went through all of that. Well, I admit it was really odd from other people's perspectives if you thought about it. However, I really didn't think this would spread to other countries. In reality, just hearing about anything related to healing magic would make most people suspicious. In reality, I haven't seen it with my own eyes so I can't say if it's fake or not yet. Fu fu fu. That's probably what the majority of people are thinking. However, even though the amount of magic power you have can't be compared to the other two beside you, you have a surprising degree of natural magic power diffusing throughout your entire body. An ordinary person is incapable of this. Are you capable of magic vision? While Hafasan was still pointing at me, he nodded to Welsi San's question. Magic vision, I wonder what it was. Magic vision is a type of magic eyes. It can see the magical power flowing in living beings and in the atmosphere. Just like Yusato Sama, it's a rare system of magic. So that's why he knew about us. Being proficient at seeing the flow of magic. But being the same type as me, did that mean that he couldn't do anything else? That was a rash assumption. I had a feeling that this person wasn't normal at all. Well then, let's hurry on. I've received a command to guide to you to the principal so it won't do to be late. Senpai, Kazuki, and I looked at Hafasan's smile in turn and started walking. Our steps were light but as expected. I just felt insecure somehow. You sat Okun. P-O-N P-O-N. Senpai tapped on my shoulder with her finger. While gazing steadily at Hafasan walking in front, I directed my awareness towards Senpai. He's disguising himself. I don't like it. Hating your own kind. I'm convinced. I'm not concealing myself anymore. I was only casually responding but... Eh? Was Senpai in fact wearing a mask before? No. Thinking about it carefully, I never talked to Senpai back in our former world despite how much we were talking right now. In those days, I truly thought that she was a flower on a high peak. That was how much. I respected her but... Now she was friendly yet deplorable. Well, I guess she just likes it better here. Mew, did you just say something, Yusato kun it's nothing at all. Hey, please face the front. Before I noticed it, I couldn't see any students around us anymore and only our footsteps resounded in the hallway. It was as spacious as the castle in Lingal Kingdom. Suddenly, Hafasan who was walking in front stopped. This is the principal's room. After saying so, he turned towards the door and knocked on it. Con con. Principal, I've brought them. Hafasan's words were brief. After a few seconds, a slow go-ahead came from the other side. Hafasan smiled at us and opened the door. As I entered the room, I saw that the room was filled with a dazzling golden color. The person sitting on the chair wasn't old, like I had expected, but rather a woman whose age was around her twenties. She greeted us with a friendly smile. Welcome to Luquis. I'm here to receive you. And declared so. She's carefully examining us. Those were my thoughts the moment I made eye contact with the woman in front of me. The woman had a neutral expression as she gently addressed Hafasan who still stood at the door behind us. Good work, Hafa. Yes. Then, I will excuse myself. After Hafasan bowed and left the room, my attention returned to this woman known as the principal. I didn't mean it in a bad way, I was just curious. I wasn't the only one that was curious. Inyakami Senpai and Kazuki were also focused on her. The cheerful grin on the principal's face seemed miscavious, yet strangely comforting. Well si San then stepped forward and spoke in a familiar tone. I'm truly sorry for the abrupt visit. It's been a while. Principal Gladys. It really has been a while. I'm happy to see you again, Welsey. I wonder if you could introduce me to the children behind you. Of course. Then, everyone. Were these two acquaintances? Well, Welsey San was a magic expert so it might have been strange for her to have no relation at all with a school that helps cultivate magic. The three of us introduced ourselves in turn. I'm Inyakami Suzuan, it's an honor to meet you. I'm Ryuzen Kazuki. I'm Yusato Ken. These children are overflowing with talent. My name is Aela Gladys, Luquis has been entrusted to me and is under my care. Aela Gladys-san nodded in admiration towards us during her introduction. Not only was she the principal of this school but she also governed Luquis. It was an amazing feat considering how young she was. 
she looked only slightly older than Rose. Now then, you didn't come here just to greet me right? Naturally. We came here today to discuss the crisis approaching this continent. Welsi San retrieved a letter from her bosom and carefully handed it over to Glay Disson. She opened it and silently read it. I forgot to consider this until now but, this was a school and a place for learning. Although the contents of the letter didn't explicitly request that students fight, we were still asking for their cooperation and assistance. I wonder if Gladys San would disagree with that. If she thought this letter was requesting for something like conscription, it would be difficult to explain. After a period of silence, the letter in Gladys San's hand shook. She sighed lightly, stood up from her chair and left the letter on her desk. I see, the Mu army. But I heard that you were victorious in the recent battle. It was a battle that we were supposed to lose. We won only due to the heroes and this healing user. It was also due to the efforts of one more person. One more person. She probably meant Amako. If it wasn't for her, it would have been really bad. I really was walking on a dangerous tightrope. Ha! Huh. To think that Lloyd would send the two heroes over here. He did so because he wanted to express how serious he is, right? Yes, he realized that just sending a letters would have no meaning. He really is absurd. Well, that's one of his good points. Gladys San seemed to be at a loss as she folded her arms and took another look at Kazuki and Inukami Senpai. I can tell that they're the heroes just from looking at them. They're exceptional, as expected of the ones that were selected among many from a different world. Additionally, there's one more young man. Judging at his uniform, he's part of her unit. She was puzzled as she looked at me. I felt like I was out of place here. That was natural since Inukami Senpai and Kazuki had the qualities of a hero. I had healing magic and the differences in our magic power were overwhelming. Hafasan probably saw that clearly when he looked at us. He's a healing magician just like Rose and was summoned from the same world as the heroes. That's why he is present here. Was Welsi San worried about what Gladys San might say? Welsi San seemed to support my participation as she explained my identity. Gladys San stared at me in wonder as she listened to the explanation. I thought so, but to think it really is the same white uniform as hers. I see. You really can't judge a person by their appearance. Wait a moment. It seems like you know who Rose is, but this felt unfair. Unlike her appearance, Rose is a perverted and sadistic person whose eyebrow wouldn't even flinch at someone suffering. Yet not judging me by my appearance. Actually, how I looked on the outside is exactly what I am. Did she think I'm like Rose? I felt discontented by her misunderstanding. Gladys San had a troubled expression and knit her brows as she continued. Could you wait a bit before I give a reply? As expected, I can't just decide on my own for something as big as this. I need time to discuss it. Or are you short on time for? Your journey? No, we're not. In the end, we're not the ones deciding so we'll stay here and wait for your official decision. Then we will arrange housing for your group. You're all guests so it's proper manners. Thank you for your kindness. The conversation went a lot smoother than I expected. We even had our housing arranged for us. If the letters I deliver are received with the same goodwill, then it'll be. Yeah, it won't. The last place I would go to isn't very welcoming to humans after all. For now, we just have to wait. Yeah, there's not much else to do. I felt relieved as I whispered back to Kazuki. It would take some time but it seemed to be all right. On top of that, we were even given a place to stay. I was feeling a bit tired now too. I didn't notice how nervous I was until now. Gladys San held a jewel in her hand and muttered something to it. In the next instant, Hafa San entered the room and greeted us again. Well then. Hafa. Can you guide them to their lodgings? Leave it to me. Then, everyone follow me. Hafa San bowed as he answered and turned around to lead the way. His grey ashen hair, which extended to his shoulders, shook under his light steps as he urged us towards the door. We followed Hafa San's example and bowed towards Gladys San. As we were about to turn around, Gladys smiled at us. She seemed to have thought of something. Ah, that's right, while we're making the decision. If it's all right with everyone, how about observing some of the lessons here at our school? Individuals such as yourselves possessing excellent powers would be a good stimulus to the students here. Of course, I don't mind if you refuse. Ah, that kind of proposal was right in the strike zone of a certain someone. Is it really okay? Sasazun-sama. Just as I had thought, Senpai took the bite immediately. She was excited and delighted while Kazuki and I forced a smile. Gladys San was surprised by Senpai's response. Hey there, settle down Senpai. Sorry, she's a person who can't hold herself back. Along the way here, she caused many, many, problems. Ah, H hey. Let go of me you sad kun S so rough. Are you someone who likes doing it forcefully? Yet, yet. Seizing Inukami Senpai's arm, I drew her closer to me as I dragged her away. 
It was the usual occurrence where she was just joking around so there was no reason to think too deeply about it. If we stayed any longer here, she'll expose her true character in front of Gladys San. It was better to let Gladys San's first impression of Senpai remain that of a courteous person. Well, we'll be on our way. I said as I pulled on Inyakumai Senpai's arm. I dragged her with me as Hafa San led us to our rooms. Kazuki and Welsi San's expressions looked like they witnessed something amazing. Was it my imagination? I was only pulling Senpai out due to my instinct and sincerity after all. Hafa San led us to an inn near the school. The lodgings for the knights in our group had been taken into consideration as well, according to Hafa San. I felt relieved knowing that Arksan and the other knights would be able to get a good night's rest. They protected us during this journey after all. Although we were given time to rest, I still continued my healing magic training. While doing this type of training didn't involve any physical activity, it still caused fatigue. I really hoped to use these few days to rest both my body and mind. Since I now knew where we would be staying, I should move on to the next most important objective. It was important to carry my belongings but granting Amako's request comes first. Seeing the figures of Inyakumai Senpai and Kazuki entering the inn, I called out to Welsi San who was also entering the same inn as us. Welsi San, I'll inform Ark San and the rest of this place. Additionally, thank you very much for your help today. I had to meet with Amako's friend, I couldn't ignore this matter. While I was thinking this, Welsi San laughed awkwardly and scratched her cheek. I wonder. Why does it seem like she was showing an apologetic expression to me? I didn't really do much, it was nothing. Compared to you, Yusato-sama, you had to deal with something much more troublesome. If it's about me, I'm fine. Besides, I decided on my own to take on such a troublesome task. It could also be seen as my way of repaying the kindness that Lingal Kingdom has given me. Suzun-sama and Kazuki-sama have also said something similar. While still looking apologetic, she said these words and realized that her worries were unfounded. The three of us had already reached a conclusion regarding the initial summoning. Kazuki, Inyakumai senpai and I didn't resent anyone in the kingdom. They were under desperate conditions and had to use the hero summoning. I've slowly come to understand their circumstances over time. I'm really glad to have been able to meet you and many other people. I was also able to get along extremely well with a nice person like Kazuki and a pretty person like Inyakumai senpai As far as I'm concerned, that's more than enough. That's, something that wouldn't be good to say in front of Suzun-sama, right? That's right. That's why this conversation is a secret. Fu fu fu, I understand. Welsi San's tone was much lighter than before and her stiff smile had also relaxed. I'm glad she was energetic again but I really hope she wouldn't say anything to Senpai. My previous statement about her sounded so conceited for someone like me. It was like I was some kind of playboy. T then. I'll be going. Yes, take care. Despite how I acted so confidently in front of Welsi San in the beginning, I left in such a pitiable and cowardly state. I immediately turned away from Welsi San as I would die of embarrassment if she noticed anything. It really didn't suit my character at all. Exiting the inn, I returned to the streets, my face still feeling a little hot. It was getting closer to evening now so the avenues were somewhat less crowded than the daytime even though I was walking on the main street. And then, on the other end of an alleyway, there stood a group of people in robes. Within this group of people, a young boy glared at me. While I couldn't completely read his expression, I could tell it wasn't a trivial matter. I was curious about the boy and got closer to take a peek. The alley led to a park with a plaza. The robed people from before were displaying their magic and laughing like children. Other than the boy who was expressionlessly looking at the magic on display, nothing was out of the ordinary. Except for the presence of magic, it was a normal park. Is it just my imagination? I thought the boy was being bullied, but it looks like I was just overthinking it. I might have been still been on guard because of that beast girl who had attacked me. Since it looked like I had no business here, I returned to the previous street and walked towards the gate. The boy from before had soot all over his robes unlike the others. The other kids seemed to be around Amako's age and their robes were clean and tidy. That was all I really saw, I wonder why I felt curious. Something about the situation felt off. No, it was probably a bad idea to enter a situation and handle it poorly. That boy was glaring at me with resentment after all. I didn't want to be entangled with something strange and I already had my hands full with Rose. Ooh. I arrived at the gate. The carriage was in a stable and I could see Arksan and Amako near it. I was relieved to see that Blurin was behaving himself. I waved at them to get their attention. You sad Hodano. Arksan noticed and waved back. I should summarize today's events and tell them to Arksan. I see, an inn in front the school. I'm familiar with that place. Surprisingly, I didn't need to explain much. We were able to smoothly deliver the letter but the response would take some time, which is why it was decided that everyone would be staying at the inn. While I explained the location to Amako, 
Arxan folded his arms in thought and then laughed after a few moments. If it's about us, you don't need to worry at all. I'm familiar with the inn that Yusatodano described. You don't need to guide us there. You should go ahead and take Amako to meet their friend. It's been a long time since you've seen your friend, right? I bet you want to see them as soon as possible. Arksan. Amako, you should thank Arksan. Thank you. Ark, San. Amako, you could also call my name with a San attached to it. I don't mind, you know? If you think about it, I'm older than you. As I was thinking to whisper my thoughts to Amako, she faced me and spoke out first. Calling you Sato with a San attached feels somewhat embarrassing. Hey, just what do you mean by that? She could say that because of her foresight abilities, but did she say it because she was sensitive towards this kind of thing? Or did she say it because it would be unpleasant to call me with a San? I really wish you would make it clear for me. Wait, I needed to calm down before my line of thinking start becoming similar to Senpai's. I had something important to do right now. I would be going with Amako to meet with her friend. Fufu, you two can go and leave us to stand watch here. I'll inform you if we get a reply for the letter. You can also leave Blurin to us. Really? I don't know how to thank you for everything. Then I'll accept your offer, Arksan. Let's go, Amako. Yet. Yeah. Then, this way. As expected, Arksan was someone you could rely on. Only capable people like him would be able to say these words. Bidding farewell to Arksan, Amako led me through the streets and crowd by hand. Amako seemed to be in a good mood. I could tell since her tale, hidden as it was under. The white coat, was swaying from side to side. However, I still had to tell Amako about what happened. Of course, I was referring to her beastkin friend who had attacked me this morning. Ah, Amako. Before we head to your friend's place, I need to tell you something. Her home is just nearby, we'll reach it soon. I want to hurry and introduce you to her. No, that's... Was Amako that happy? Even if I tried to stop her, I don't think I would be able to. What should I do? My first impression was the worst. If the person I would be meeting was the same person who had punched me in the daytime. She might just attack me the moment we meet. While I was endlessly thinking of what to do, Amako who still led me by the hand had stopped. Before I knew it, the path we were on had become quite dark. Here. I saw a crumbling building with faint light leaking from the windows. The house seemed stable enough that it wouldn't collapse at a moment's notice, but when it was coupled with the dark atmosphere it gave off, I couldn't help but feel that this house was ominous. I guess I could describe it as one of those western buildings I would see in Japan being converted into a haunted house. It made me wonder if someone really lived here. For people like us, it's more convenient to live in places like this. Ah, uh, I see. As one would expect, nobody would think about coming here to this gloomy and eerie place. It was sort of like a forbidden area. However, it was bad for me at the moment, in various ways, to meet this person in a desolate place. After all, she went all out against me despite the fact it was daytime in front of so. Many people. I can't imagine what she would do without any spectators. Amako, I don't want to disturb your reunion with your friend. I think it would be a better idea for us not to meet yet. I would be satisfied at just being able to see you happy. What are you saying? Yusato, you're going to meet her too. Don't make excuses. I don't mind Yusato coming along with me. You won't get in the way. You're being weird Yusato, are you hiding something from me? You easily destroyed my attempt at a natural conversation to a surprising degree. I've already conveyed everything I wanted to say on this topic. I understood I would be meeting her friend just from this conversation. Forget it, I wouldn't try to talk my way out of this as it was an everyday occurrence. Ah, Amako would have a response no matter what I would say as she could just foresight it. It made me realized once again that I wouldn't be able to win an argument in this lifetime with this girl as my opponent. Being able to see the future was just way too convenient. If I had foresight magic, Rose would. Impossible, my body wouldn't be able to react in time. Ha, I get it. I'll tell you. I told Amako about what happened today. When I described that person's ears and hair, Amako confirmed that it was the person I was about to meet. When I told Amako that I stopped her friend's punch, she moved away from me. Just how many more times was she going to draw away from me? I understand the situation. Yusato should stay behind me, I'll clear up the misunderstanding. I've really placed my troubles on a girl who is younger than me. I sighed and walked with Amako towards the old house. She knocked on the door. However, there was no response but the moment I thought that, the door in front. of Amako burst open and something flew towards me. Eh? What was coming towards me? You tailed me all the way back here? You monster. Ah. I see now. The moment that the door in front of Amako opened, someone with a broom commenced their attack on me. It was a familiar voice. 
Seeing her swing her broom down towards me, I dejectedly coated my body in healing magic. The door near Amako was kicked open and a beast girl came out with a broom. The beast girl's long, slitted eyes were filled with anger and it didn't seem like she would listen to anything I had to say. This situation was just like this morning except that she now had a broom to swing at me. I see, Amako foresaw this and dodged to the side. Yup, this is dangerous. I really wish you would help me out and say something. Ha! Huh. I dodged the downward swing from the broom and distanced myself from her. My opponent seemed very tense. She huffed like an infuriated predator, then charged forward with her broom. I don't know what kind of monster you are but... I won't let you put your hands on my friends here. Wait, let's correct something first. I'm a human. If I keep being called a monster like this, even I'll think that I'm some kind of monster. I don't really want that. You can regenerate your own injuries. If you're not an ogre, what else could you be? You're telling me you're a human? Don't take me for a fool. Even I can differentiate between a monster and a person. You've really said it now. Something that shouldn't be said. Calling someone an ogre is something you absolutely shouldn't say to a person, you know? It would cause quite a lot of problems if it wasn't me, you know. Someone who could regenerate themselves had to be an ogre. As expected, even I would be annoyed at a statement like that. Amako, hurry and resolve the misunderstanding. Why were you standing still in fear? There's a fearsome beast girl right in front of me but why are you stepping back away from me? Even though I'm extremely calm right now? The calmest I've ever been. Looking at the current situation, it looked like I couldn't depend on Amako. Even so, I doubt I could convince this enraged beast girl in front of me right now about Amako. It might just add more fuel to the fire. Then from this situation, it looks like I'll have to do something by myself. There's no helping it. I guess I have to make it so you'll listen to what I have to say. I felt the thin healing magic around my body and focused my magic around my fist. Secret, healing punch. It wouldn't leave you with any injuries so it was a punch filled with kindness. I'll use this punch to make you settle down so you'll listen what I have to say. A technique that could render the other party powerless and prevent future trouble. It was a wonderful technique and the most suitable for me. Phew. My opponent stood still and just observed. We couldn't stay in a deadlock like this forever. I'll aim for that broom first. I'll destroy the broom and then go for her body. Here I go. I closed the distance in an instant by taking a step forward with all my strength. Appearing before the girl's eyes in one breath, I threw out my magic-coated fist. You Sato, stop. Amako forced her way through and appeared in front of me. Being surprised at the sudden appearance of Amako, I forced my legs to stop like hitting a break. Amako put out her palm in front of me and indicated me to stop. You can't do that, Yusato. No. I just thought I'd make her more submissive first or something like that. Even if you can heal her injuries, you'll leave scars in her heart. I wonder what Amako meant by that. I don't think I would give her a trauma nor did I have the intention of doing so. The fact that you are not self-conscious about it is what makes it truly scary. And then. It's nothing. Just leave the rest to me. Well, Amako intervened, so I should just leave it to her. Thanks to Amako forcing her way through, it seemed that the other beast girl had finally calmed down. T that voice. Is it a Amako's? Long time no see, Kiriha. As Amako called out to her, she slowly took off the coat's hood. Amako exposed her golden hair and triangular fox ears before the beast girl called Kiriha. Amako looked at me and then spoke reassuring words to Kiriha. This person isn't an enemy. Also, he's more or less, a human. Hey, more or less. What do you mean by that? Sorry. It was my misunderstanding. The misunderstanding with the girl called Kiriha had finally been cleared up. That was great and all but the problem came afterwards. Once Kiriha learned that I might be able to save Amako's mother, she started to blame herself even more. I had to move away from her because of how long she was blaming herself. Kiriha was kneeling down on the ground before me at the moment but that didn't make me any less uncomfortable. I was a little surprised people in this world also bowed down to someone to apologize. It's okay, Yusato doesn't mind. He's a little awkward but he's a nice person. But. I did a lot of violent things to him. Leaving the awkward part aside, it's just like Amako said, I don't mind. You have your own circumstances too. And look, I'm uninjured. I squatted down and presented my hand to Kiriha who was still prostrated. It was the hand she injured this morning. The wounds were cured in a flash with magic and my hand didn't have a single scratch on it. Kiriha looked up and took my hand to carefully examine it. After a few moments, she spoke in astonishment. I'm convinced since I know you used healing magic but... To think a genuine healer could do this much honestly amazes me. There are no traces of your injury too. Do you know someone else that can use healing magic? I know one other person but they don't use it. They don't use it. 
the fact that they were able to study here without using it is really something. If possible, I wanted to ask more about this topic but Kiriha had finally raised her head. I'll find another chance to ask about it. We didn't come here to receive an apology. It was to let Amako meet her friend. That was why I wasn't really bothered by the fact that I was attacked by Kiriha. It was trivial in comparison. I said it before, but I really don't mind. I have a general understanding of how people view the beast kin here. That's why I don't blame you for misunderstanding the situation and thinking that I was trying to capture you. It was also partly my fault because of how I acted so we're even. I really overdid it this time. There was no need to receive that fist of hers, I should have tried to persuade her more with words. I guess I couldn't help but want to test how much I had grown from my training. I'm too immature and inexperienced. I still had a long way to go just like Rose had said. Ha ha ha. What a strange person. I was shivering in fear because of what you might demand from me. As expected of the person Amako brought along with her, I should say. Really? Such a strange human. There's no way my eyes would be mistaken about his character. I agree with that. There's no way Amako's eyes could be wrong. Kiriha laughed at my words and finally got off the ground while patting the dust off her tail. Since Kiriha had just come out from her house, she was wearing some plain and simple clothes instead of the robe that she wore this morning. It was probably to conceal her ears and her tail. Most of her tail was white in color with a light brown tip. It didn't resemble a fox or a dog tail. I wonder what type of beast she is. She reminds me a bit of the Japanese yukai, Kamaitachi, so maybe she's part of the weasel family? It's possible. Either way, she's definitely someone I couldn't introduce to Inyakamai senpai Yusato, it's not polite to keep looking at her like that. Ha ha ha, sorry sorry. Really, you're quite a strange human. When other humans see my appearance, they immediately look at me with scorn. You don't do that. I wasn't someone from this world after all. Besides, I was one of the people that found animal ears to be cute. I doubt many people from my world would hate them. Let's leave those worthless thoughts of mine aside for now. I just noticed that Kiriha had presented her hand in front of me. When I made eye contact with her, she blushed. Amako seemed to be urging me from the side. Were we just shaking hands? While feeling a little embarrassed, I lightly took a hold of her hand. UMM. Yeah, I didn't get to introduce myself yet. I'm Kiriha. I'm attending the senior classes here at school. I'm Yusato, a healing magician of the rescue squad in Lingal Kingdom. Well, I guess this is sort of like a handshake to make up with each other. With this, it looks like Amako and Kiriha would finally have a chance to talk with each other. Ah, uh, this won't do. I was in the middle of making dinner. The people who headed out will be returning home soon. If you would like, how about staying here to eat? I still want to apologize for what I did. Or at least I thought so until Kiriha directed the conversation towards me again. Dinner, hey. It was still a little early, plus they might have something prepared for me back at the inn. It might be awkward to eat with the people who live here too. It seemed like a better idea to leave Amako alone here to talk with her friend. ERM. TNN. As I was about to reject Kiriha's offer, Amako pulled on the sleeve of my uniform. She looked up and our eyes met. Although her face was expressionless, she made a humble. Request. Yusato, you should eat too. I guess I have no choice. Amako really knew how to handle me. Salrasan left me with the responsibility of looking after her. I probably didn't want Amako to feel lonely in any way. Kiriha was already energetically talking about preparing my portion of the meal once she saw my exchange with Amako. Since it had come to this, I didn't really have much choice. You don't have to mind the people living here. Come now, while I can't call it a luxurious meal, I have some confidence in my skills so you'll be in for a treat. While opening the door that had been kicked open, Kiriha urged us to come inside. Amako and I walked towards the entrance and looked inside. The inside was similar to the housing in the rescue squad. It wasn't that spacious but there was a table that could seat about ten people. I could also see stairs that led to the second floor. It's, a nice place. Is that sarcasm? Or do you really think so? I live in a similar place in Lingal Kingdom. I really think it's a nice place. I feel really comfortable here. I wonder how Felm was doing. Was she energetic? Was she eating regularly? She was probably skipping out on training and getting beaten up by Rose but she was still my cow or hay. I should at least wish for her well-being in my mind. Yeah, in my mind. Are you spacing out? Let's quickly go inside. N.N. Ah, sorry. Looks like I was lost in thought for a moment there. Following Kiriha, we reached the table and chairs I saw earlier. I could see steam coming out of a room deeper in the house. Was that the kitchen? Kiriha looked back towards the door. It seemed to have been broken from her kick as it couldn't close properly. Ah ha ha ha. 
I guess it was a little rash of me to kick the door open like that. Kiriha, you never think things through first. I was close to being hit by you when you jumped out the door. Actually, I did get hit by the door when it opened. That's why I said I'm sorry. I'm going to prepare dinner, you can sit anywhere. I'll be done in a moment. Kiriha seemed to be using that as an excuse to escape Amako's reproachful eyes. I lightly chuckled at seeing her escape and sat down to take a breather just like I had been told. Amako then sat down on the seat next to me. I wonder if she sat in that same chair the last time she lived here. Amako was deep in thought as she sat down, as if she were reminiscing. I'm glad you could visit your friend, Amako. Thank you for taking me here, Yusato. I still haven't saved your mother yet so it's still a bit early to thank me. But. Thank you. Really, I'm troubled. If you show me such a meek expression, I really don't know how to react. Despite the fact that I haven't fulfilled your request yet. Although she played an indirect role in preventing the kingdom's ruin and the death of my close friends, it didn't change the fact that she saved the lives of many people. I didn't lose my friends and companions. The one who should really give their thanks was me. You saved my two friends and a lot of other people's lives. That's why I want to grant your wish. As much as I can. As much as you can hey. You really are weird, Yusato. Like I said many times, I'm normal and not weird. I continued the conversation by talking about what happened with Kazuki and Inyakumai Senpai when I just woke up. Of course, I was referring to the there's no way responses I got when I said I was normal. Amako listened while resting her chin on the table. She even gave an uncharacteristically bright smile. You finally smiled but to think it would be because of this. Looks like I really am weird. It would be a problem if you become any weirder. When you're the one saying it, I feel like that might just happen. I didn't know what kind of girl Amako was when we first met but I'm just glad she's able to smile like this now. Well then, how was I supposed to surprise her? There wasn't much point of a conversation with Amako if she could just foresight what I was going to say next. I had to think several steps ahead of her. It was worth a try. Just as I was about to speak to Amako, she was looking back toward the entrance and the broken door. I turned around to look behind me and saw that that someone had arrived at the front door. Eh? The door is. Did something happen, here? Eh, uh, my stomach is growling. And then? Why are you just standing there? Who are you? Two beastkin had arrived from the entrance. One girl and one boy. The girl seemed to be around Amako's age and had a tail that resembled a cat's. The other beastkin was. The boy who was just a bit shorter than Kiriha and had similar characteristics. The girl was in a daze as she looked at me and Amako. The moment the boy saw me, he moved toward me, hostility emanating with every step. The patterns on his arms and legs resembled the ones I had seen on Kiriha's. However, I had learned from the previous experience and surrendered before he began his attack. W wait, I'm someone that escorted Amako and came here. I'm definitely not someone suspicious. I was used to getting hurt by now, but it's not like that made it any less painful. If I could avoid getting injured, I would do so. Ha, Amako you say. He ignored my words and continued his advance. If you're going to lie, you should make up a better, one. Upon seeing Amako sitting behind me, his tail froze. Shocked, he pointed at Amako and shouted. Amako. You you're alive. The boy, who seemed to be familiar with Amako, stared with his eyes wide open, while the girl didn't show much of a reaction. The girl was peeking out from behind the boy. I'm guessing she didn't know Amako? They're both beast kin. Of course. If they were both human, the boy in front of me wouldn't be reacting like this right now. NN, it's been a while, Q. This person isn't an enemy. Not an enemy. But just from a glance, he's very suspicious. I agree that he's someone who certainly looks suspicious but... You shouldn't speak poorly of him. Calling me suspicious. Was that supposed to be a follow-up? I just found the weakness of my healing magic. It appears that healing magic had the hidden ability to inflict emotional scars on people. I was used to abusing it to heal but... It looked like it had an effect in less serious situations like this too. I see. Suspicious, hey. But I've taken a liking to this uniform. Ka. The boy was at a loss as Amako stared him down. The boy in turn, glared at me as he had no outlet for his frustration. I didn't think I would earn his trust immediately like with Kiriha but it looked like this was going to be more difficult than I had anticipated. Well, it's not like I came here to put this guy in a good mood so it didn't really matter. The essential thing was whether or not Amako could stay here. The others staying at the inn would be able to relax if they knew that Amako was in a safe place. I was starting to hesitate a little because of the boy glaring at me but it would probably be a good idea to entrust Amako to this place for a while. T then, this guy is a healing magician, right? Are you really okay with this weak looking guy? Just why aren't you convinced? You're really trying to find some weird faults with me. 
This statement didn't really bother me so I just ignored it but it looked like Amako was going to say something but... You don't need to worry about that, Q. He's different from the healing magicians we know. Nei Chan. Kiriha had come and forced her way into the conversation. She had cooked dishes in both hands and looked proud of herself when she entered. This is my little brother, Q. The girl next to him is Satsuki and she's one year younger than Q. I didn't think that they would return home so soon. It seems like things got a little complicated. After the introductions, we sat down to eat and Kiriha set the dishes on the table. It seemed like Q didn't like me. He kept his glaring eyes locked on me as he ate his bread. How odd, Kiriha properly introduced me so why was he still looking at me like I was an enemy? Hey hey, I get that you are worried about Amako but you shouldn't glare like that. Nei chan you don't think he's suspicious? I really did think so. But Amako trusts him and he's totally different from the humans we've met before. He's giving his aid even though it's to a beastkin, he doesn't look disgusted at seeing our ears and tails, and he's not asking for anything either. See? He's weird, right? Was my existence really that unusual? Amako put her hand on my shoulder as she looked at Kiriha who was delightfully talking to Kyu and Satsuki. Kyu's expression seemed to say someone like this. Actually, just why was he so bent on clashing with me? Could it be that he likes Amako? I couldn't rule out that possibility. Although he was being this cheeky, I'll just leave it be and say it's just a cute side of him. Looking to my side, I could see Amako nibbling on some bread. I lightly sighed and drank some soup with my spoon. And then? This soup, it's delicious. It seemed to be a potato soup with a mild taste and just the right amount of salt. Ha ha ha, it's the first time a human has praised me. Yup, this part of you is weird too. I honestly praised that it was delicious, but after expressing her surprise, she ended up calling me weird again. What? Just what do I have to do to stop being labeled as weird? I didn't know the table manners for Beastkin so I would have to ask Amako later. After making that mental note, I continued to drink the soup, but Q noisily stood up from his chair. I can see that this healing magician is different from the humans that I know. I'll acknowledge you for the time being. But you should prepare yourself if you do anything weird to Nei-chan, Satsuki, or Amako. He declared with more hostility than I had seen before. I had no idea what he experienced before but he probably had his reasons to see the humans as his enemies. To be honest, I don't really care whether you trust me or not. What did you say? The reason I came with Amako today was to ask if you guys could give her a place to stay. Eh? Is that so? Amako, I thought you already knew. She seemed to be surprised and Q doubtfully looked at me. It was probably awkward for him to make eye contact with me as he quickly looked away and sat down. He didn't say anything so I looked in Kiriha's direction. Kiriha, could I count on you to look after Amako during our stay in Luquis? We would be at ease and sleep soundly at night if Amako were to stay with you guys. I'd be happy to. We have countless rooms available and the cost of food for one or two more people isn't much. I don't mind at all. I see, I'm glad. It was obviously better for Amako to be at a place with her own race rather than sleeping with us. Also we were important guests in this country right now. It would be a bad idea to draw unnecessary attention towards us. If Amako's appearance were to be discovered in the middle of all this, I can't say what might happen. It didn't really matter if we would gather attention but it was possible that some people may scheme to take Amako from us. Then, I'll have to prepare two rooms. It was probably fine to leave everything to Kiriha. She'll definitely protect Amako. Additionally, there were people from her race here like Kyu and Satsuki. If they're here, I could just leave it to wait. Wait a moment. Two rooms. Two rooms? Just who else was she counting in addition to Amako? I spoke out in confusion and Kiriha who saw my response replied with an eh, was I wrong, expression. Aren't you also staying? Ha. Huh. It was really unexpected so I didn't have a response. Nei Chan. As expected, you can't allow that. If you let someone like him stay here. I it would be bad. Right. Q took the opportunity provided by my stunned silence to argue against my stay. I had no idea how she interpreted that I would stay here but... Q, who had received... A shock like never before, had spoken out for me instead. No no, I mean it would be better for Amako to stay with him here, right? It's okay, it's okay, there's no need to worry. I had already prepared myself long ago for this possibility. Amako, you would rather be together with him, right? A hey, Amako. Kiriha brushed Q to the side and directed her question towards Amako. Q was shivering as he said Amako's name and Amako who was being questioned seemed perplexed as she looked at me. Amako, it'll only be for about 14 days. It was similar to entrusting you to another guardian, you should be fine even without me, right? To begin with, there was no way Amako would think it would better to have me stay here with her. If Yusato is fine with it then. You're kidding right, Amako. 
the words that I imagined I wouldn't hear really came out and the spoon in my hand fell down. Even though it would be harder for you to open up to your friend with me at your side. Yusato, that's what Amako said. What do you want to do? Kiriha said with a mischievous smile. Q was next to Kiriha blankly staring at me with jealousy while Satsuki was steadily watching me as she continued to take small bites of her bread. At first, only I was looking at them but now the three of them were fervently looking at me. Just what was going on? I was trapped in every direction. The way you said it was really unfair. Saying that if I'm fine with it. I'll need to immediately go to the other knights and ask them first. If you say it like that, there was no way I could possibly refuse, you know? Trader A-I-Z-E-N, I guess El Anval.3 starts around here. Our house is located in a small and secluded part of Luquis. I, the older sister, live here with my younger brother. We didn't need to worry about drawing the human's attention around here. That's just the sort of place it is. We also have another person in our house. Of course, that person is also a beastkin. In the beginning, I thought we would be accepted, since there were a lot of different people here. People from all over the continent gathered at Luquis, after all. It wouldn't be strange for a few of these people to be more open-minded towards beastkin. Holding on to that faint hope, we left the hidden village of our birth and arrived at Luquis's gates in order to study magic. My family back at home often told me I had talent in magic and that I should go study it. I also wanted to make some friends outside the village. However, it didn't take me very long to realize how much of an idiot I was for holding on to that faint hope. Luquis prohibited the persecution of non-humans on the surface. Due to a public policy like that, I didn't think anything could go wrong but I was completely avoided and assaulted by a sense of isolation. Distrust. Contempt. Fear. It was an environment that forbids one from forming friendships with others. The heavy pressure of isolation. This wasn't somewhere for a beast girl like me to prove my own value as a magic user. I had no social relationships or influence here. I was just me. Ah. Really, I thought that Luquis was where the elite gathered to further improve their skills. But I do understand their thought process. To the humans, beastkin aren't considered people. There were humans who followed the majority and grouped with other humans. There were also humans who were apathetic towards us. Rather than being friends with someone from a different race, it was natural to be with people from the same race. Don't get involved with the humans. There's no way we'd get along. Don't trust anyone. My mind grew weaker due to their disassociation. Without getting involved with anyone, I just studied magic. If I just set my own expectation low, I didn't need to hope for anything. Ah, doing it this way makes it a lot easier. I'm glad. Since when did I start to think like this? I reached the point where I would hide my ears when walking in the corridors and focused all my attention on how I could improve my own magic. There's no meaning in coming here if I don't improve. I didn't come here for the sake of getting along with others. I continued this line of thought and persuaded myself that I still had my younger brother. It was enough. I wasn't lonely. I told myself this over and over and over. It was around this time that I met another beast girl in Luquis. Unlike us, she wasn't from a village. She was a strange girl from the country who had a strong hatred for humans and the ability to see the future. Her name was Amako. In order to save her mother, she traveled far, far away from the country to search for a healing magic user. It's a magic exclusive to humans. I thought it was impossible to get the humans to cooperate with her plan though. In reality, it seemed that healing users here faced rejection too. Kiriha, I won't give up. But that girl didn't give up. She had no choice but to keep moving forward despite the danger. She wanted to save her mother. Despite the fact that it was probably not easy for her to come this far. And that it was probably dangerous for her everywhere. I tried to stop her from going but I wasn't able to. I wonder if I could be like Amako and put that much effort into something. Would I be able to trust humans? Humans who got along with Beastkin. They probably didn't exist, right? I should have known the answer to that long ago but I couldn't say it. I'm sure I was still hoping for something. I was still thinking. One day a human who could get along with Beastkin would arrive. Morning, hey. I awoke to the sound of a large bell chiming outside. The bell would usually ring. Around this time. A nostalgic dream. I felt like I had one. I don't remember what dream I just had but I knew it was an unpleasant one. I got up from my bed and started combing my tail. Once I was satisfied with grooming my tail, I got off of my bed. I swiftly changed my clothes and exited my room to prepare breakfast. I would normally just make something simple but... Things were slightly different today. Hey? What's wrong Satsuki? You're up so early today. Satsuki was a beast girl who had come along with me and Q from the same hidden village one year ago. She was currently peeking out of the house from behind the door I broke yesterday. When Satsuki noticed me, she put her index finger on her lips and silently whispered ASHH. What was going on? 
Just what was she looking at? Should I take a peek too? Overflowing with curiosity, I walked behind Satsuki and peeked out as well. Amako, you are way too light. This can't be called training at all. But that's not my fault, Yusato. What was this human doing? He was up so early doing push UPS. Amako was also innocently riding on his back. It's amazing, Kiriha. Since that person went out, he's been doing that all this time. And like you know, it's like he's not tired at all. I really don't know what's going on. I can't believe he's human. Since he woke up, he's been doing that all this time? If he hasn't been taking any breaks, then I really can't believe he's a normal human. Although directly catching my punch capable of splitting a boulder wasn't normal in the first place. Was this the type of training he did to achieve that much power? But I really couldn't imagine how this type of training could do that. But rather than that. Satsuki. You've been watching Yusato all this time. Yeah. Right now, the problem was Satsuki who was smiling brightly and looking at the scene with great interest. This girl was usually quiet but once something catches her interest, it's like her personality changes and she starts jotting things down in her notebook. In her own words, she apparently calls it the mysterious things and happenings notebook. In other words, Satsuki considers Yusato to be a deep and mysterious existence. Usually, she's a really, really, really good and obedient girl. But since things have come to this, I could only leave her alone and let her do what she wants. She was silent the whole time when Yusato and Amako came here yesterday but she probably didn't have a chance to talk. She was definitely overwhelmed with interest. Well, keep it at a moderate level, okay? I know. Leaving Satsuki, who remained at the front entrance, I headed towards the kitchen. I should prepare breakfast first. Usually I would finish this up real quick but Yusato and Amako were here today. I'll make a proper breakfast. As I was getting the ingredients from all over the kitchen, I remembered Yusato's words from yesterday's dinner. Delicious, hey. I wasn't flustered over his praise by calling my cooking delicious given his personality but it was true that I was surprised. At that time, when Q asked if I trusted Yusato, I was honestly still not completely sure if I could. That was why I sat as close to Yusato as I could in case anything happened and, got him to try cooking made by a beast kin. After all, humans would normally never try anything cooked by us nor would they call it delicious. I'm really just all talk. Even though his hand was healed with healing magic, I did inflict a cruel injury onto Yusato by cutting up his hand. He forgave me for that but somewhere in my heart I still didn't trust him. I couldn't help but mock myself. Right, breakfast. Satsuki's classes were quite early so I should hurry. I should also wake Q up soon too, since he had to walk Satsuki to school. If I continued making breakfast at such a leisure pace, I wouldn't have time to make breakfast for those two. That won't do. Today, I decided to go all out and make a proper breakfast. I had to do it right. After successfully preparing breakfast, I went to wake up Q and told Satsuki that breakfast was ready. Yusato joined us for breakfast a bit later since he was exercising. Come to think of it, it's been a while since breakfast was this lively. Hey, you. If you do anything weird to Nei-chan, I won't forgive you. After finishing his breakfast, Q went to get ready for school. However, he didn't forget to give a warning to Yusato who was currently drinking some water. I bitterly smiled at the sight of my overprotective little brother. But upon seeing Yusato's troubled expression, I decided to help him out. Q, isn't it almost time to go? If you don't hurry and take Satsuki to school, you'll both be late. Eh? It's already this late? Satsuki. Let's hurry. We gotta go. Wait, you're writing in that notebook again. Just a little more, a little more. Satsuki was sluggishly trying to put on her robe as she continued to write in her notebook. She was still writing about Yusato? Q was panicking due to my reminder. He grabbed Satsuki by her collar and ran out of the house. Before long, the two of them disappeared into town. Yusato looked at the direction where Q and Satsuki ran off to, then turned to me and asked. Kiriha, is Q and Satsuki studying magic in the same place? They don't look like the same age though. Ah. That was something you would naturally question. Q is the same age as me, 17 years old. Satsuki is 12 so our ages aren't close at all. Yusato was probably confused since the both of them had left already while I was still here. Q is just walking Satsuki to school. Satsuki is still quite young after all. Q and I are in the same class but I usually have a lot of chores to do at home before heading out. Q walking Satsuki to school was also just a precaution. It'd be troublesome if Satsuki were to be bullied by others. Our classes were much later than Satsuki's so it was convenient for us. That means you'll be heading to school sooner or later, right? Yeah, that's right. What are you and Amako going to do? Do you want to both wait here until then? No, we'll be heading towards the stable near the entrance gate. 
We came here together with other people so we need to meet up again. Amako, you're fine with that, right? Yeah. Other people that they came with. Yesterday, Yusato went to inform a group of people. That he would be staying here. I wonder if he was referring to the same group. I guess I didn't have to worry about them staying inside the house with nothing to do. Still, Amako and Yusato couldn't just loiter around the streets forever waiting for me to return. I should try to come back earlier than usual. As I was washing the dishes and thinking of what to make for today's dinner. Yusato spoke to me as he was putting on his white uniform. Oh right. Thanks for lending me a change of clothes. Just before breakfast, I washed them and hung them up to dry. I hope that's okay. You don't have to worry so much about it. I just lent you some of Q's clothes, it's not much to thank me for. As I said so, I glanced outside and saw clothes that were neatly hung up. He was unexpectedly tidy. It was such a big difference from yesterday where he showed such a scary face. His face yesterday was just too dreadful. While calling him an ogre might have been too much, I don't really know what else could have made a face like that. I didn't think it was possible before but now I knew that it was certainly possible to overpower someone just by looking at them. Your face looks pale, are you all right? Amako asked. Aya. I I am okay. Yet. I'm okay. Without realizing it, my thoughts started to show on my face. Amako ended up being worried about me as a result. Didn't I already hear a lot from Amako about Yusato just yesterday? He's not a bad person in Lingal Kingdom where Amako lived for two years is a place better than I could ever imagine. Those were Amako's words. I poured some cold water over my shivering hand, trying to regain my composure. After finally calming down, Yusato who was in the living room had come to the kitchen. We should get going soon. We're heading out now, Kiriha. Yusato and Amako spoke in turn. There was no sense of discomfort from seeing these two together. Seeing a human and a beast girl together like this. It was probably something I imagined countless times before. However, witnessing such a scene in reality made me feel. I wasn't too sure how to describe it but I felt like my heart was being filled with a weird sensation. Ha ha ha, have a safe trip. Despite my efforts, my voice sounded very hollow. I could see the two of them looking slightly worried. It was hard to tell with Yusato but I saw him tilting his head to the side in wonder for just a moment. As for Amako, it definitely looked like she was suspecting me of something. Even without her foresight, she was a sharp and clever girl. I should get ready and head out soon too. I was able to meet the friend I wanted to see. Even so, my heart still felt strangely tight. A message from Senpai. Gwaha. From Kiriha's place, we headed straight to the stable where Blurin and the other knights were. I was giving breakfast to Blurin who was still half asleep. It was then that a knight came to relay a message to me. Apparently Inyakumai Senpai and the others came here yesterday. Since I wasn't here they asked one of the knights to pass a message to me. Yes, the heroes wanted Yusato Dano to go to where they are staying. In other words. The inn they're staying at. I was planning to go but now I'm scared since Senpai was asking me to go. That person, she really was like a child. I hope she doesn't get upset over anything weird again. I guess I should hurry. Knowing Senpai, she'll come looking for me herself if I delay any longer. She knew I would come here in the morning, after all. We didn't see each other yesterday after I left the inn. Even though it was supposed to be where I would be staying, I left without explaining much. I supposed I needed to tell them about my situation in detail. Amako, could I count on you to look after Blurin today? Mm, no problem. I don't mind looking after this little guy. She seemed to be in good spirits as she crouched down and lightly rubbed one of the fruits against Blurin's nose. Now Amako had something to do and wouldn't be too bored. I could also trust the knights standing guard here to protect Amako in case something were to happen. I said farewell to Amako and the knights for the time being and started to lightly jog away. I was heading towards the inn in front of the school. At my current pace, I should be able to reach there in just a few minutes. I was able to get a sense of the general direction yesterday and I was getting used to maneuvering through the crowd of people. But, upon realizing that this wasn't Lingal Kingdom, I brought my jog to a halt. It wasn't really normal for someone to run through a crowd of people like this. Wait, how would I bring Blurin around what am I thinking? That wasn't normal at all. The people here would definitely be shocked. I should try and avoid the crowds. Maybe I'll have to ask for Gladys San's help. I've heard that there are familiars. Maybe I could get Blurin approved as my familiar. I'm not too sure if Blurin could be contracted as a familiar though. We're an unusual case but it's worth testing. It'd be nice if Blurin and I could both go on runs together. Hmm? This is. I was absent-mindedly jogging and found myself in the same alley as yesterday. This was where I saw that group of students. Normally, I would just continue jogging without paying any attention but something on the other side worried me a little. There seemed to be a lot of onlookers on the other side. Just what were they looking at? 
deciding to take a detour, my curiosity drove me toward the other end of the alleyway. Again, it's those guys. They're really doing something cruel. It'd be better to just leave it alone. It wouldn't be funny if we got involved. I heard whispers throughout the crowd and they didn't sound good. I quickened my pace a little to reach what they were looking at. When I arrived, I was astonished. In the center of this group of people, the boy covered in soot that I saw yesterday was in tatters and on the ground. I immediately approached the boy and applied healing magic on him while lifting him up. As I did so, one of the onlookers nearby came up to me and spoke in reassurance. I don't know where you came from but that person is fine, you don't need to use recovery magic. No matter how I look at it, he's injured. Just how is he fine? That's a user of healing magic. Look, even though his clothes are tattered there are. No wounds on him at all, right? At. After the onlooker who seemed to be a student as well pointed that out, I took another look at the soot-covered boy. It looked like he was hurt all over. No, he might look injured but there were no wounds on him at all. Was this child really a user of healing magic? This was the boy who was glaring at me yesterday, right? I didn't understand, what led to this situation. You said this boy is a user of healing magic just now. What happened here? Did you only come here recently? Well, there's no helping it if you don't know. A troublesome group of people have their eyes on this guy. Each and every time, they find him and use him as a magic dummy target. He has to use his healing magic every time of course. A troublesome group of people? What they? Healing magic outside of training wasn't something to be used like some kind of sandbag. That's not the kind of magic it is. I really didn't think I would get to meet the healing magic user of Luquis I was interested in so soon. And to think he was being tormented to this extent. No, it was probably worse. This looks like a complicated matter. For now, I should wake him up. I lightly shook him by the shoulders to wake him up. I also wanted to see if he was really okay and could regain consciousness. Even though he wasn't injured and I wasn't really involved in this, it would leave a bad taste in my mouth if I left him here without seeing him wake up. You you. Oh. After ten seconds or so, I heard a faint groan and I could see him slowly opening his. Eyes. He unexpectedly regained consciousness faster than I thought. Maybe I was worrying too much? Looks like you're awake, how do you feel? Let go of me. Whoa. The moment he came to his senses and saw me, he brushed my hand off from his shoulder. I was slightly surprised at the sudden rejection. The youth in front of me, however, was unconcerned about me and looked at the sky frantically. The time. Ka. Ah, hey wait. It was like the boy didn't hear me as he ran off toward the main street. He seemed to be in a hurry, it definitely didn't seem normal. Did he have something important to do? But I didn't think I would be brushed off like that. He might have just that much distrust towards others. At least it seemed so. Looking at his current circumstances, I could certainly see why Amako said even holding a conversation with him was difficult two years ago. Well, then. What to do? I finally got to meet a healing magic user outside of Lingal Kingdom but I feel a little irritated. I wasn't a human who could pretend that they didn't see anything but I also wasn't someone who would let my emotions get the better of me. I couldn't do anything at the moment. Actually, I didn't have any power right now. In a place like this, as a person who possesses healing magic, I definitely wasn't in a position to say anything. For now, I should meet up with Senpai and everyone else. I should consult with Senpai and Kazuki first. I didn't really know what to do so it'd be better to ask those two for some advice. In that case, I should quickly head towards them. Hey, Yusato-kun. Yusato. Two voices called my name from behind me. Turning around, I could distinctly see a handsome guy and a beautiful girl in the crowd of people on the main street. It was Kazuki and Senpai. Looks like I don't need to head over to the inn anymore. Seeing Kazuki vigorously waving his hand towards me, I couldn't help but smile from the bottom of my heart. I started walking towards the two of them. Just as I had expected, Inyakumai Senpai was complaining about the fact that I had left the inn without saying much. Of course, Kazuki and I were bitterly smiling throughout the whole process. Seriously, Yusato-kun. If you were going to stay at Amako's friend's house, then you should have told me. I would have wanted to come along too. Please don't ask for the impossible while heavily panting like that. It was quite troublesome on my end too. If Senpai came along and Q saw what kind of person she is. I shudder at the very thought of it. I know Senpai isn't a bad person but I don't want to take her along until I've built a certain level of trust with Kiriha. Besides, you already have a place to stay, Senpai. Aren't you guys staying at the inn? Senpai said she was going to meet Yusato so I tagged along. But since we encountered you here, it'll save us a bit of time. Hmm? Is there something going on? Could it be that the school already made a decision? There was no way. They said it would take quite a bit of time before they decide. For some reason, 
Senpai had a proud look on her face and seemed excited as she drew closer to me. Was it because she guessed my thoughts or something? Yesterday, Principal Gladys invited us to observe the school and attend some of the classes, right? That's why, you should come too, Yusato-kun. Observing you say. Oh yeah, that was mentioned when we handed over the letter. I see, Senpai was really going to take advantage of Principal Gladys' sincerity and accept the offer. This kind of treatment was almost too good, it made me a little uneasy. Was I really this timid? I'm also curious, I'll go. I knew you would reply like that, Yusato-kun. Then, let's hurry and go now. Inyakumai Senpai grabbed a hold of my hand and Kazuki's. She then started to quickly walk in the direction of the school. Just how much were you looking forward to this? As expected of the Senpai that loves fantasy more than anything else. As long as Senpai is having fun, then I guess it's fine. But you're having fun yourself too. Right, Yusato. I guess it's impossible to hide these things from you, Kazuki. Kazuki nodded and smiled. I looked at Senpai who was walking in front. Yeah, it looks like she's having a lot of fun. I guess it was natural. We were in a different world and we would be able to see a real magic school with different magic users. It was the romance of all hardcore fantasy fans, most would roll around in excitement just at the thought of it. The problem I wanted to discuss. I'll leave it for another time. We were summoned into this world. As fellow friends from the same world, it wasn't too late for us to have some fun. Senpai basically dragged us all the way to the school's entrance by hand. We looked around the school near the entrance and noticed Hafasan coming out. We started walking towards him and I initiated the conversation. Hello, Hafa-san. We haven't seen each other since yesterday. Good morning, Yusato-san. I heard you stayed somewhere else yesterday, were you alright? I'm alright. More or less. It's not like I could tell him that the house's owner attacked me. Hafa-san tilted his head to the side in puzzlement but it lasted only for a few moments. He wryly smiled and replied. Well. If you're fine, then that's all that matters. In any case, it looks like Inyakumai-san is really looking forward to this so let's not delay any longer. I'll be your guide, please follow me. Fortunately, Hafasan didn't continue to question me. We followed Hafasan as he led us into the school. We passed by the plaza that I saw yesterday but there weren't any students in sight. They were probably attending classes around this time. Classes, hey. I wonder what they're learning. I thought out loud. I mean, they're most likely taking practical classes for using magic, right, mused Kazuki. That's just one of the many things the students learn here. Hafa answered. Students can also study different martial arts. When they graduate, there are many paths for them to take. Some of them become adventurers, knights, scholars. This is why we provide them an opportunity to study a wide variety of subjects. It really felt more like a university than a high school here. For the job I want, I would take classes related to that profession. It was a little amazing how similar the system here was to my former world. We walked around the school for several minutes making small talk as we went. We then reached a door which seemed to be an entrance to a room. On top of the door was a plate that had characters from this world engraved on it. Hafasan paused for a moment before turning around and saying. Inside this room, the classes for the foundations of magic are being held. When you first take lessons in magic here, almost everyone starts with this course. Naturally, I have taken this class too. Foundations of magic. I'm curious to see how it differs from the lessons that Senpai and I received from Welsi San. How did I learn about magic again? I don't think I can remember anything other than running. If I recall, Rose said this during our magic sessions, while you're running, feel the flow of magic. Thinking back to it, I still don't know and understand how to really use magic. However, it's unfortunate. This isn't our destination, we'll be observing the class I'm in. Half as. Yes. Today, my class just happens to be having some practical lessons for magic. The three of you can observe from the side or you could even participate in them if you would like. Is it really okay for us to participate? We might get in the way, you know. We've received permission from the principal so there's no problem. I think it would be fine for Kazuki and Inyakumai Senpai to participate, but it's impossible for me. After all, a practical session for magic meant that they would be practicing their offensive capabilities for magic. I have healing magic. I could restore but I couldn't destroy. If we were talking about physical attacks though, I did have some offensive capability in that regard. I could punch and kick but that wasn't really magic. It was just violence. Yusato-san, you won't be participating. Hafa asked. I'm. You know, have healing magic. Even if I go, it would be meaningless. I see. That's unfortunate. Why did you look so disappointed? It was obvious from just looking at you. Now you're making me strangely guilty for no reason. Just what are you expecting from a healing magician like me? I'm not much, 
I'm just a magician who can only run, punch, and heal. It seems like the time has come for you to display your true strength. You sat Okan. Inyakami said, both proud and elated. As usual, her words and conduct towards me lacked any common sense. In a certain way, it made me feel relieved. Like I'm saying, I can't use magic like Senpai and Kazuki. If you're talking about what I can do, then I could punch or kick. But I think that punch and kick of yours is a little too destructive. Just now, I thought I heard Senpai mumble something but I didn't really catch it. No, I actually heard it. Even I know how to hold back. I'll just pretend I didn't hear it. Still, no matter how I see it. I was using a physical attack and not a magic attack. I didn't really want to show it to people who were using magic properly. Hmm, we've taken a bit too much time talking here. Let's hurry and advance to our destination. Hafasan appeared reluctant to leave, but led the way once more. Yeah, I don't really know why he looked disappointed when I said I wasn't participating. After all, it was definitely better for both the heroes, Kazuki and Inyakami Senpai, to participate. Perhaps, there was a reason for why he wanted me to participate? I'm probably overthinking it. There was no merit in having me take part. Was I too self-conscious? I muttered quietly and Riley smiled before catching up to Kazuki and Senpai who were following half a san. We walked through a tidy passageway and entered a large open space. From here, we could finally see the class that was taking place. Unlike when we first witnessed students casually using magic in the plaza, the students here purposely aimed their magic at other students. Burn. H-A-A-A-A. -A -A -A. The first thing that caught my eye was a boy who launched a fireball from his hand. The girl who was his practice partner blocked the fireball by forming an earthen wall as she placed her hand on the ground. Sparks flew everywhere as the fireball slammed against the wall. The girl then made several baseball-sized stones and fired them at the boy. Whether it was the amount of spirit everyone was exhibiting or anything else. It was completely different than what I saw yesterday at the plaza. Senpai, I get that you're happy and all but. Please stop beating on me. A senpai like this was already troublesome. It's reached a point where she's so troublesome that I don't even need to think of what she's doing that's troublesome. Senpai seemed to be in really good spirits at the moment. When she took a look at my face, she couldn't hold in her excitement and started shaking my shoulders. Honestly, no one could match her when it came to making trouble. Kazuki, do something about this senpai. Ha ha ha, impossible. Do your best. You didn't need to laugh while saying it. You look like you're enjoying this. Kazuki abandoned me and senpai's excitement was wearing me out. Hafasan who guided us all this way turned to us and said. This is the class I'm in. However, we're doing some combination training with the juniors today. So it's not like everyone here is my classmate. Juniors. Now that you mention it, there are students who are a bit shorter. It seemed to be true. Looking closely, there were senior students who looked three years apart from the junior students observing from the sidelines. Hmm. I could see a familiar face practicing their magic at the edge. That's. Q and Kiriha. They're in the same class as Hafasan. Kiriha was repeatedly thrusting with her palm and shooting wind that minced the target in front of her. Q had some sort of equipment on his leg and unlike Kiriha, he made wide kicks that shot out much more wind. Wind, hey. How cool. I watched them continue their practice. But then Q noticed me. They were quite far away so I couldn't tell for sure, but it looked like Q was surprised and urged Kiriha who was next to him to look this way. When Kiriha faced where I was, I waved my hand towards her. She was amazed and staring at me in wonder but still managed to give a tiny wave with her hand. Are you acquaintances with them? Hafasan asked in surprise, as I was looking at where Kiriha and Q were. I didn't read too much into how he addressed them as acquaintances. He spoke once more while he earnestly stared at me with interest. Q and Kiriha rarely get involved with any humans, you see. Honestly, I'm quite surprised. If you try to call out to them, you would only face rejection. That was how they were at school? Well... I shouldn't stick my nose where it doesn't belong. Just as I thought to head to where Kiriha is to see how she's doing. Senpai lightly tapped me on the shoulder. She had finally calmed down, but I just now noticed it. Those two are Amako's friends. Senpai lowered her voice in consideration so that Hafasan wouldn't hear. I whispered back. Yes. Those are some nice animal ears they got. Introduce me afterwards. I will politely refuse. I smiled and gave an immediate response. I definitely couldn't allow the trust I had finally built up with them to be destroyed by your excitement. I'm sure you'll be crushed by my response but please bear with it for a bit longer, senpai. But why? Why, why? You sat Okun. As she complained so, she caught my shoulder once more and starting shaking it. A female student with a different uniform from the rest rushed over to our location and called out. Hafa, you've brought them along. Not seeing her tall stature as she got closer, she was probably a teacher. 
Hafasan directed his arm toward the teacher as if he was planning to introduce us to her. This is my teacher. I'm Carla. She reminded me a bit of Rose. She gave off this masculinity as a woman. No. She didn't give off a violent feeling like Rose though. I've already heard from Principal Gladys. You've done well to come all the way from Lingle Kingdom. Feel free to observe all you like today. If you have any interest, I don't mind you participating either. It would be a good stimulus to the students here since the three of you have fought in the front lines already. Stimulus, we aren't really. Your group is definitely not ordinary as both Hafa and the principal approved you inclusion. What's more, your master is also my master. Suddenly, Carla San looked at me after she mentioned master. Oh wow. This person feels like an acquaintance of Rose. I didn't feel the wild aura from here but they were definitely in a relationship where they get along. This person has a gentle face but I dare say that this person has a high possibility of having something like Rose's iron claw. Damn. Even after leaving Lingle, I couldn't escape Rose's curse. But I didn't find it that unpleasant, it just felt frustrating. Well, before that. We should probably introduce you all to the other students. I felt I would faint from Carla's loud voice as she suddenly shouted. Assemble. Her voice was loud enough for everyone here to hear her. After Carla's voice resounded, the students stopped practicing and gathered in front of her. The students' gazes naturally fell upon our unfamiliar group. We're supposed to be doing combination training today with the juniors but... Today the magicians from Lingle Kingdom have come here to observe the classes here. Don't underestimate them just because they're not students here. They are stronger than all of you and have already experienced fighting in a real war. Most of the students gulped due to nervousness but among them there were a few doubtful glances. Or actually, most of those doubtful glances were directed towards me. Incidentally, Q was also looking at me with doubt. In reality, I was just an ordinary guy compared to the beautiful-looking senpai or the handsome-looking Kazuki beside me. It would be a wonder if no one thought it was strange. Even with power being added in as a factor, both of them were above me. Haha. <laughs> I'm definitely not feeling sad. Ah. That person in white. It was the person that Kiriha was beating up yesterday. Among the group of students noisily discussing with each other, someone voiced that out. If you're talking about yesterday, I wonder which time of the day were you referring to. If you're talking about noon, then you were clearly trying to give me a bad image. Sure enough, after hearing beating up, several more students directed suspicious glances at me. Did something happen yesterday? It was just a misunderstanding. I replied back to Kazuki who was beside me while my brow twitched. I'm reaping what I sow. Is what I wanted to say but it's hard to blame someone for misunderstanding a situation like that. I guess I could find some respite in knowing that Senpai and Kazuki won't doubt me. If those guys are stronger than me, then why don't they show us what kind of magic they use in the lessons? It should be fine, right? However, my relief was short-lived. It was a very young, high-pitched voice from the junior student's side. Even so, a girl with twin tails looked this way. Her eyes were full of suspicion and she raised her hand as she spoke up to Carla San. When Carla San saw who had spoken, she clicked her tongue and said under her breath. This lass again. She said it so quietly that I could barely hear her hey, you're supposed to be a teacher. The voice I heard from her just now, it reminded me of the feeling I got from Rose. Just why? I felt like her stare froze me and sent chills down my spine. Carla San is really scary. No, who cares whether Carla San is scary or not right now? No, I mean, not that it doesn't completely matter but... This situation is a little bad. What's bad? The person who would definitely make a move in this situation is... I don't mind. Sounds good, let's do it. Where should we fire our magic? Ha. Huh. The girl who kindled this fire, you made one mistake. You didn't consider the variable of a hero who has an extraordinary passion for fantasy. Senpai walked triumphantly as she received permission from Carla San to participate. I couldn't help but put a hand to my forehead. The contents of the training were simple. Use magic to attack the target in front of us. If it was just that, it wouldn't be different from normal. However, this training was slightly different from what I thought. Yeah, this wooden sword is a little hard to use. This was specially made to resist magic so even if it's hard to handle, bear with it. A weapon that utilized magic. Of course, I didn't have to use this. I could go barehanded, anything goes really. It was easy to understand since all you had to do was fire magic at the target by focusing your magic into the wooden sword. Thinking back to what I saw when I first came here, I did see students hit the targets but they weren't destroyed. These targets must have high magic resist. In the training field, Senpai was waiting to get started. Behind Senpai were a group of students eagerly awaiting the announcement for Senpai to start. Among them, I saw Hafasan and Kiriha with Q. Kazuki and I stood just a bit away from the group of students. Hey, Kazuki. Hmm. Senpai, do you think? She'll go easy. 
Even though you already know the answer, it's our senpai, after all. Looking away from the front, Kazuki turned to me and spoke again to reassure me. But, regardless of how senpai likes to handle things, I think she can't forgive the people who tried to make a fool out of you, Yusato. Senpai is. Senpai was thinking about me and doing this for my sake. I'm a little moved. I looked at senpai who was in high spirits and whose sword was already surging with lightning. No, wait wait. Enough about me being moved. Senpai was not holding back, and this training wasn't going to solve anything. At the very least, hold back a bit as I was about to voice my thoughts, senpai had already moved. With a light run, she drew closer to the target. Then, similar to firing an arrow from a bow, she launched herself and instantly appeared before the target. Her lightning-fast movement was too swift for the spectators to see, the students didn't know what happened. But once they saw her wooden sword pierce the target, they finally realized she had performed her attack. Ha! Huh. It was understandable that one of the students voiced their confusion. Even after receiving Rose's training, it was at a speed that I could barely perceive. It's not over yet. Senpai said this after releasing her wooden sword. Just what was she up to? Senpai, her hands now free of the sword, gathered more lightning magic in her fingertips and fired it towards the wooden sword. Senpai looked elated as she proudly shouted. Extra attack. Shouting what seemed to be some kind of signature phrase for her attack, the lightning fired from her fingertips hit the wooden sword directly. An explosion, caused by the electrical discharge, bursted out of the sword. The sword that had pierced the target mere seconds ago had been reduced to cinders. Don't you think, you overdid it? I kept my mouth shut and continued watching you but who the heck told you to do this much? Or actually, what was up with that terrifying technique of yours? If you show people something like that, the people after you have nothing left to show. The surrounding students were speechless at the scene they just witnessed. Senpai looked around in satisfaction as she folded her arms and nodded. As expected of the heroes of Lingal Kingdom, you exceeded my expectations. Karlasan approached me and Kazuki. How about you guys? Do you want to teach a lesson to my students like her? I can't use any magic like that so. You can use anything to attack the target in this training. Whether it be swords, magic. Normally though, there's almost no one who could destroy that target with their bare hands. Looks like I've been completely exposed here. However, I was a little stubborn. Despite how high Senpai set the bar, I wouldn't be satisfied unless it was overcome somehow. Yes, which is why. Instead of me, Kazuki should go. And no, instead of me, it'd be better for Kazuki to go. Your magic is flashier than mine. Yet. I don't know if you're joking or being serious, but. Well, I'll go if you don't want to go, Yusato. I wanted to go and try my hand at this too. I felt a little sorry for pushing this onto Kazuki. But. My magic couldn't be displayed in front of an audience at all. I couldn't make any explosions nor did it have any power. It was just plain. I wonder how Kazuki was going to display his magic. He was currently receiving some instructions about the training from Carla-san. Alright, if you're going to do it, use the target next to Inyakamai's. I don't mind if you damage it as much as Inyakamai. Are you going to use a weapon? No, I'll only use magic this time around. Kazuki carried a wooden sword and walked towards his target just like Inyakami senpai Inyakami senpai came back as if switching places with him. A large number of the students' stares were directed at her as she made her way next to me. It's Kazuki-kun's turn next, hey. Yusato-kun, are you really not going to try? The hurdle is way too high for me. Senpai, do you want me to smash that target or something? Fufu, it's not like you can't do it, right? Compared to the blue grizzlies in that forest and that demon, those targets are just paper. I really don't know how to react to that ridiculous comparison of yours. To begin with, I never smashed a blue grizzly apart and as for the demon. I knocked Felm unconscious with healing magic. I never smashed any of those apart. No, I guess you can say I smashed Felm's armor. Oh. Without any warning, Kazuki had created three large balls of light filled with magic. Light magic it's a rare and powerful magic. Upon seeing this, the students made more of a racket than when they saw Senpai's magic. However, Kazuki's eyes didn't leave the target as he concentrated and focused more magic power into his palm. Mumu, I've never seen that move before. Forming magic remotely instead of firing it directly. What an interesting way of thinking. It'll serve as a nice example for my idiotic students. Carla San voiced her admiration as she watched Kazuki. I was astonished that he had enough magic power to remotely form his magic like that. Unlike fire or lightning magic, I thought Kazuki's light magic and my healing magic disappeared on its own once it was detached from our physical bodies. If I worked hard, would I be able to achieve that too? It seemed convenient to form a healing ball to heal people at a distance. Go. After Kazuki's short phrase, the balls of light in his palm fired at the target. 
the spheres seemed to still be under Kazuki's control even as they were in flight. They moved a little awkwardly. My magic is dangerous so. Descend. Kazuki maneuvered the three balls of light so they were directly above the target. Afterwards he swung down with his hand and the three spheres shot down with an absurd speed. The technique that Kazuki brought out wasn't flashy and was even a little plain compared to Senpai's. However, his technique was much more dangerous. I mean, the lights that came down and exploded from Kazuki's technique formed a hole in the ground. It looks like Kazuki-kun has figured out his own weakness and overcome it since his fight with the Black Knight. Why yet? It seemed like these two have both invented their own dirty little technique. The magic from the two heroes the students who had doubted them before were now looking at Senpai and Kazuki in both awe and fear. Did I not mention it? These two are the heroes from Lingal Kingdom, they are strong individuals who have survived the carnage in the fight against the Mu army. Of course, there's one more. Was there really any more reason for me to go out there? The stairs that were on Senpai and Kazuki were now on me. I wonder what kind of magic he uses. It looks weak compared to the other two. Maybe it's just not eye-catching. I heard such heartless remarks throughout the crowd. Even I didn't want to display it but to think I would hear such comments just from my outward appearance alone. Fortunately, Kazuki wasn't here to overhear these remarks. Um, just what magic does he use, someone asked Carla-san. Carla-san's eyebrow twitched at this question and, and gave me a glance from the side. I'm only speculating but... She knows the students here will cause a commotion once they learn what my magic is. In other words, I shouldn't worry about what the other students think. After all, she knows I'm a disciple of Rose and she surely knows what that means. Ha! Huh. I guess there's no helping it. Since Senpai and Kazuki personally revealed what their magic is, I didn't really have a choice. I sighed without realizing it. My fate was probably sealed the moment I decided to attend this class. It seemed impossible to hide it anyways. I sighed again. I straightened my uniform, stood tall, and took a step forward. I'm a healing magician that belongs to the rescue squad in Lingal Kingdom. Now then, how will they react? I've grown a little from the abuse and unreasonable situations I've been placed in. A bit of ridicule won't hurt me. Hafa brought Yusato and his companions to our class. While Q and I were in the middle of training, Yusato waved his hand at me. Q obviously didn't wave back and I only waved back after making sure that the people around me wouldn't notice. Why was he here? But just as I had this thought, I remembered Carla Sensei mentioning that we would receive some guests today. I immediately understood that those guests referred to Yusato's group. As Carla Sensei was introducing Yusato's group to the students in this school, the situation quickly escalated. Their group got provoked and were now going to partake in today's practical lessons. I could clearly see that they didn't like how our class was underestimating them. It wasn't really a surprise my class would think so considering how many extraordinary individuals there were. I don't know how strong the other two are but I have my doubts as to whether or not Yusato could do this. He had magic that was capable of healing any injuries. At the very least, his strength should be equal to mine or maybe even greater since he stopped my punch. This was considering the fact that I used wind magic along with the natural strength I possessed as a beastkin. Other than a demon, there weren't many opponents who could receive my attack unscathed. However, one of the students brought up the topic of me attempting to attack Yusato in the middle of town yesterday. As a result, more people were looking at Yusato with looks of doubt. Carla Sensei also sent me a sharp glance. I was reaping what I sowed because of my mistakes yesterday, which was fine and all but. Because of me, the problem child from the juniors class Mina elatedly caused this current situation. She's an ill-natured and high-class girl with a rotten personality. She was the one responsible for ganging up on the soul healing magician in this school. She's been tormenting him during these few years. Thanks to her family's close ties with the school, no punishment has been given out to her. A girl like her with an excessive amount of pride was able to smile and easily state why don't you show us what magic you can use. If it was just her who desired this, it wouldn't have been a big deal. But no one stopped her. That was because everyone here wanted to see Yusato's true ability. I, couldn't stop her either. Even if I tried to talk to my classmates, they probably wouldn't listen. Hafa, the only person who might lend an ear to me didn't stop the situation either. However, the magic that Yusato's two friends displayed greatly exceeded my expectations. The girl, who displayed destructive power never seen before with lightning magic. The boy, who controlled the powerful and rare light magic. Completely dumbfounded. Those were accurate words to describe the people around me. But it should be expected since they were the heroes that were together with Yusato and Amako. If it only just ended here, that would have been great. If. Everyone was convinced from the two heroes, and just remained silent. I'm a healing magician that belongs to the rescue squad in Lingal Kingdom. After those words were said, the atmosphere changed. Of course, it changed in a bad way. Q, who was next to me, had his hand over his forehead. Naturally, I was doing the same. 
My classmates were basically a collection of magic idiots that focused on offensive power. With the exception of one person, they all thought that magic was good as long as it was strong. I'm not trying to say that healing magic is bad but for my classmates who didn't know much about it, they have a poor impression of people who use healing magic. What they? It's healing magic. Even I could win against him. Was he just running away in the war? Stronger than me? That's a lie. Just as I had thought, the power-obsessed idiots in my class were already looking down on him. And naturally, the ill-natured rich girl wouldn't let go of such a perfect opportunity like this. Eh, healing magic? Are you really that strong? But I feel like even I can win against you. She suddenly said so in a loud voice, cutting through the quiet murmuring. When Yusato received those words, he just smiled and said in a monotonous voice, Eh ha ha, I'd be quite troubled. But all of a sudden, the hero who used light magic was being restrained. His arms seemed to be tightly bound behind his back. Yusato was beside him but because he didn't have any change in his expression, I didn't really understand what was going on. Due to the sensitivity of our ears, Q and I could hear the almost inaudible conversation between Yusato and the heroes. I understand how you feel but calm down said Yusato. Kazuki-kun, you can punish them but don't overdo it, okay? Just enough so that they get scorched. Said the lightning magic user. You can't do that, Yusato rejected her statement. If Mina knew that the hero that used light magic couldn't tolerate her statement just now, she would definitely feel troubled. But since she was just an ignorant rich girl, she didn't take note of his action. Mina raised her hand and took a step forward while saying, Carla Sensei, I want to have a mock battle with this gentleman, would that be okay? A mock battle, you say? Yes, if I have a mock battle with a healing magician that fought against the demons in the war, then I don't have to worry about them being injured. Isn't that right? Really, what a rotten little girl. It sounded polite but she was basically calling you Sato a target. Mina uses explosion magic which originates from fire magic. It may not possess that much power but it's the perfect magic for inflicting pain on others. If you add her rotten personality in the equation, it's the most suitable magic for her. I see, a mock battle. Sure. Let's do it. Carla Sensei replied. Eh. Yusato was surprised. Yusato, it's a mock battle where you use magic. Can you do it? Why yet? Well, I can do it but... But, you picked the wrong opponent this time. The healing magicians she knew of were practically on a different dimension to what Yusato was. Normally, a healing magician wouldn't try to face me, a beastkin, head on in a fight. Additionally, they shouldn't be able to contend with a beastkin's strength either. Nei-chan, is that guy going to be okay? As expected, my little brother had a gentle nature deep down inside him. Seeing my little brother looking conflicted, I told him, Yusato will be fine. My wind magic shouldn't fall much behind Mina's explosion magic in terms of power. I doubt it'll work on Yusato. Since Yusato's opponent is the simplistic Mina, I'm a little relieved. Just as I thought I could see the outcome of this match. One of my classmates walked forward and headed to where Kalra Sensei and Yusato were. Excuse me, for the mock battle, do you mind changing the opponent to me? Wah! I couldn't help but voice out my own surprise. It was understandable. The person who went out was the exception in my class, a man of manners that didn't possess offensive magic Hafa. He suddenly made his appearance and intervened between Yusato and Mina's mock battle. Somehow, I was now participating in a mock battle. I could only gaze blankly in shock. I really don't know how I ended up in a situation like this. After I told them that I use healing magic, it seemed to have flipped a switch on for the girl with twin tails. I wasn't that worried about the mock battle itself but rather how much I should hold back. Furthermore, Hafasan suddenly requested to participate in the mock battle instead. UUMM. Hafasan, when you said change, you mean. The girl with twin tails asked, frightened. Oh, don't worry. I have no intention of fighting you. Hafasan answered. To begin with. You don't stand a chance against me. He turned his light purple eyes toward me. Yusato-san, you don't mind, right? Yeah, well. Take it easy on me. My opponent has magic eyes that could see the flow of magic. He probably won't use any strong magic attacks on me. Even if he has some powerful magic, I could just run away to escape it. In the worst case scenario, I'll use a healing punch and knock him unconscious. For the mock battle, where should we fight? Just fight in middle of the training grounds, the targets might get in your way but... You'll have to deal with it. Carla San didn't look all that happy a moment ago but now she looked excited, as if she would get to see something interesting soon. Was there a reason for this? Once Hafasan entered the stage, the other students evidently got noisier. I accepted this mock battle without much thought. Perhaps. I got myself into something bad? I'll know once I try fighting. Well then, the two of you, 
I'll be participating in this mock battle for the time being. Go for it, Yusato. Do your best, Yusato-kun, for my sake. Thank you, Kazuki. Hey. Ignoring Senpai who looked confused, I rolled up the sleeves of my uniform and started doing some light warm-up exercises. Although it was pitiable to ignore Senpai like this, I couldn't be bothered to react every time. Even I have times when I don't know how to react to something. While I was stretching my arms and legs, I could see that Hafasan was picking a weapon to use for the mock battle. I didn't require a weapon even though I did use a spear that one time. It would be dangerous if I accidentally poked myself. Hey. NN. Hey. From the group of students, Q was quickly making his way towards me. He was gathering a lot of attention from his classmates. Would he be okay? Is it okay to talk to me? I really don't want to but... I specifically came here to warn you. Warn? You? Me? What brought on this sudden change? I thought he hated me. Behind Q, Kiriha also made her way through her class. She also had a serious expression similar to Q as she looked at me. What were these two doing here? The person you're about to fight, Hafa, that guy looks like a nice person on the outside, but really he's just an outrageous and insane bastard that doesn't know how to hold back. Amako would be troubled if something were to happen to you, Yusato. I'm telling this for your own good, you shouldn't participate in this mock battle with Hafa. Having him as your opponent is far too dangerous. Even if you both tell me that. If I could stop it, I would do so. But since it's come to this already, I probably can't. If word were to spread out that someone from the rescue squad decided to stop their participation in a mock battle with a student, the rescue squad's reputation would fall and this was probably one of the obstacles I would face in my journey. Most importantly, if Rose and Lingle knew that I got cold feet and ran away from a mock battle, there's no doubt I would receive a punishment worse than death. I definitely didn't want that. Whether it was getting Rose angry, receiving punishment from her, or disappointing her. I didn't want any of that. You too. Even though you both came here to warn me, I won't stop my participation. As long as I'm wearing this uniform, I can't afford to lose. Although I meant that I can't afford to lose or I would receive punishment. That guy is in a different league on his own. He's strong. He's not someone a frail guy like you can handle. He won't hold back. He drives his opponents so far into the corner until they completely collapse, you know? Don't you get it? Don't worry, he's not as bad as my master. Unless he can send people flying ten or more meters with a punch, I won't fall. I also got a general understanding of Hafasan just from what these two told me. From when he snuck up on me to whisper in my ear and greeted me, to his attitude upon seeing my uniform, to his disappointment when I stated I wouldn't participate in today's training he's been observing me all this time. He judged me as someone worthy to observe. Then, Yusato-san. Are you done your with your preparations? After I walked away from Kiriha and Q, I arrived at the center of the training grounds. Hafasan was slowly making his way here as he spoke to me. In his hand was a wooden pole that was as tall as him. No, it was a quarter staff. He started rapidly spinning it in his hand but his expression didn't change. He was smiling. I'm good, let's start. Oh, is that so? Carla sensei please give us the signal to start. Kalrasan nodded. Hafasan and I faced each other. Although there was still some distance between us, Hafasan had already lowered his posture and was in some sort of fighting stance with his quarterstaff. His light violet eyes started to shine brighter as it perceived both light and magic. While getting a chilly sensation from his suspiciously glowing eyes, I coated my body with healing magic just like usual. It would be good if I could perform well from the start since I didn't have much experience with mock battles. For the time being, I'll move just like I usually do in training. First of all, I should focus on evasion. I'll avoid all the attacks that I can avoid. If I'm also given the chance, I want to test just how much my healing magic has grown during this time. All right, I'm giving the signal. Aren't you enjoying this situation a little too much? Once we were informed by Carla San that we would begin soon, Hafasan and I faced each other once more. From there, Hafasan took a step forward just as Carla San's hands lowered. Begin. Upon hearing her voice in this tense atmosphere, I ran forward with all my power despite being a step behind. At the same time I sprung out, Hafasan's quarterstaff was already in the position I was at just before the mock battle started. Even though I clearly stepped out first. I have some confidence in my legs, after all. In that case, I'll have to catch you. From our initial positions, we were about 10 meters apart. Hafasan had assumed his stance and used one thrust with his quarterstaff to cover that distance instantly. Fast. With the exception of demons and beastkin, and also the heroes, Kazuki and Inyakami Zenpai, this might have been the first time I've seen someone this fast. Rose and the scary group back at home? Those guys are beyond exceptions, so they weren't good people for comparison. Phew. Oh, oops. 
I slightly shifted my body and avoided the quarterstaff aimed at my neck. To think you would mercilessly aim the quarterstaff at my neck. If it hit me in a vital spot, I might faint from the pain. Hafasan started to perform consecutive thrusts with his quarterstaff as I continuously dodged them by moving my head horizontally. I won't let you. It was annoying but it seemed like he knew exactly what I was going to do. He rotated his quarterstaff after his thrust towards my head and aimed it at my leg with the other end. Which caused me to trip. At this rate, I would receive a severe hit. Just as I was falling over, I placed both my hands on the ground. Pushing down, I used brute strength to instantly bring myself back up. You're a more troublesome opponent than I expected. That's what I'm thinking right now too. Ha. Huh. It looked like he didn't intend on giving me any time to rest as he continued his relentless thrusts. I would dodge this again if I avoided this way. Or so I thought, but for some reason he changed direction just as he was aiming for my face. It was like he could foresee my moves. This was really difficult to deal with. I dodged the incoming quarterstaff by bending over but in the next moment, Hafazan's knee was already making its way towards my face. To think you would aim for this, you're really dirty. Just as his knee touched the tip of my nose, I twisted my body and avoided it. No matter what, he kept aiming for the vitals. This was why Kiriha and Q tried to tell me to not participate. This really was too dangerous, I would have been forcefully incapacitated by Hafasan already if I didn't receive Rose's training. Moreover, he has been able to foresee my movements for some time now. After his first attack, he feels awfully faster. Was it related somehow? Either way, this isn't easy. I have Rose's evasion training but it's hard to dodge an attack only for it to lead to another attack. After barely avoiding Hafasan's attack, I used the brief moment to think about why he could predict my movements. But I couldn't think of a reason at all. What a terrifying person you are. Really. To think you're uninjured after all this. We're at a stalemate, this isn't going anywhere. Even so, Hafasan continued to attack. I couldn't carelessly get close to Hafasan due to his quarterstaff but... Phew. I can't just always rely on Rose's words. I'm not someone who moves just because they're told to. I have to adapt myself to the current situation. After slowly taking a deep breath and exhaling, I concentrated my healing power into both of my arms. I formed a cross with my arms, stopping the quarterstaff that swung down at me. There's some pain but it isn't a spear or a sword. I'm fine. Magic in your arms. Hafasan said this with surprise as he looked at my arms. At this moment, I released a kick but Hafasan saw it coming and jumped backwards. However, it was now my turn to receive his attacks again. Hafasan who had retreated backwards had already assumed a fighting stance and launched a flying kick towards me. Kuh. You dodged it, hey. Just as his kick was about to connect, I evaded it. As expected, he had an advantage over me as he could read my moves. For some time now though, Hafasan hasn't taken his eyes off me for even a single moment. Well, I'll pray that he doesn't have a cheat magic like Amako's ability to see the future. I will be approaching you with more force now. Hafasan warned. But I achieved one of my objectives. I wasn't in a position where I had to keep dodging now. Hafasan quickly recovered from his shock and resumed his attack. I really wanted to reach a conclusion to this battle soon too, so I won't just dodge his next attack. Even if my movements are being predicted, I will still attack without concern. As I coated one of my fists in healing magic, he attacked without pause and aimed for my face once again. I lightly tilted my head to the side. However, due to how fast Hafazan's thrust was with his quarterstaff, my cheek was scratched and blood oozed out from it. I didn't mind it as it wasn't as injury I needed to worry about. Ignoring the slight damage I just took, I threw my fist at Hafasan's abdomen. Gah! My fist felt something hard and solid, obstructing my punch from connecting. But I continued increasing the power in my fist without pause. Due to the force from my punch, Hafasan was sent flying backward in the air. He wasn't pushed all that far but it felt strange that I was now seeing what Rose normally sees weight. Ah! This is bad! Am I an idiot? Why was I using Rose as a standard for comparison? It would have been fine to just knock him unconscious, why the hell did I send him flying? Even if I hit him with healing magic, this was bad. I just added another chapter to the tale of Amako's avoidance to Yusato. I started to panic and ran up to help Hafasan who was about to hit the ground. However, contrary to my expectations, he was able to land safely on his feet after flying through the air. Shortly after landing, he knelt down on one knee. Ha ha ha. This is the first time I thought I would die in a mock battle. I'm sorry. I made a mistake, I didn't hold back enough and ended up sending you flying. Hey? Just now, it seemed like the surrounding students including Kiriha and Q had expressions that said you're kidding, right? Their faces also looked pale. It would have been dangerous if I didn't have this. He showed me the quarterstaff that was now split right in half, one part in each of his hands. I see, 
he guarded with his quarterstaff just before my fist reached his stomach. He sure had some fast reactions to be able to guard that in time. At the very least, he was stronger than a certain good-for-nothing demon. As I admired Hafasan's strength in my mind, he took a stance once more while dual wielding the broken quarterstaff as swords. It's not over yet. If possible, I don't want it to end. You're much stronger than I imagined and you've exceeded my expectations. Moreover, you possess a strength that fascinates me fortunately, I'm not very injured since you're using healing magic. It would be nice if it just ended here but it looked like Hafasan was still eager to go. I already want to stop it here but... The fact that things won't just go my way was what made this battle hard. Ha! Huh. I opened my fist and gathered healing magic in my palm. I healed the injury I received on my cheek. After confirming that the scrape had completely disappeared, I took on a fighting stance. For some reason, that brought a smile to Hafasan's face. Looking at the current circumstances, I probably had the advantage. But Hafasan's weapon had now changed. The quarterstaff that had split in two would definitely become a problem. Although his range was now shorter, it wasn't going to make this battle any easier. I smashed that apart, hey. I didn't put in that much strength in my punch just a moment ago. But it should have been more than enough to render him unconscious. The other students had been silent for some time now and it was bothering me. But I had to focus on Hafasan who was in front of me. Even I was starting to get tired of an opponent that aimed for my neck each and every time. It was a little scary too. Looks like you're finally ready to start for real. I've been going at it for real since the start so. That's a good joke. Even someone like me is capable of understanding my opponent's true strength when fighting them. Your abnormal physical ability alone has already surpassed my eyes. However, you don't desire to fight. I truly apologize. Despite the fact that your true duty is to heal and save other people. But this is also my duty. Duty? Why was it a duty? Didn't Hafasan desire to participate in this mock battle himself? Hearing the lingering remorse in his voice, it caused me to think too deeply about the current circumstances. No, it didn't matter whether it was some duty or not at the moment. Although there was sorrow in Hafasan's eyes, it quickly disappeared. Now he was giving off an amazing presence, similar to a beast's intimidation aura. Looking at his stance with the broken quarterstaff, it felt like he was waiting for me to attack first. His violet eyes, filled with magic power, were focused on me. There was definitely some sort of trick behind those eyes. If you're waiting for me to attack, then I guess I have no choice but to go. If we continued to stare at each other like this, it would only be a waste of time. In that case, I'll move first. With a light spring in my step, I rushed out. Whether he was aiming for a counter or trying to guard against my attack, it didn't change what I would do. I would run up to him and punch him just that. SHH. While keeping Hafasan who was still retaining his stance in my sights, I jumped to the right and attacked. Sure enough, Hafasan knew I would attack but I continued to throw out my fist infused with healing magic without concern. Hafasan used the two pieces of the quarterstaff to block my blow and was sent flying backward from the impact. Kuh. His response was unnatural. Despite how he was watching me this whole time, it was evident that Hafasan's reaction was a step too late. I continued my attack by drawing closer to Hafasan and kicking at him. But this time, he was able to react in time and evaded it. Was it because he was able to clearly see me this time? Un. His attack came again. After I dodged Hafasan's broken quarterstaff pieces, I took a few steps back and took another look at him. Despite how close I was when I kept attacking him, he never properly attacked me back. He did attack me once but it was very safe for him. It made me think that. I wouldn't be able to beat Hafasan if he kept guarding and evading like this. Physical strength, speed, and stamina. I definitely lose in all three when fighting against you but... There are still other ways to fight. Hafasan said, defiantly. Please don't show that kind of face to me. Your current expression is telling me that you are facing some kind of terrifying and powerful monster. Was I supposed to be some kind of mid-level boss in an RPG? But he was right, there were still other ways to fight. I could see sweat dripping down his forehead as he kept evading my punches and kicks. He looked like a tortoise with an impenetrable defense. It was a pain in the ass to get into his range every time, only for him to move away. He's been able to evade my attacks all this time. Is it because I'm inexperienced? I didn't train in any martial arts, maybe that was why he could easily read my moves. If that's so. I attacked again, knowing my attack wouldn't land. After I punched, I quickly drew closer to Hafasan, who had retreated, and sent forth a kick. Sure enough, he could only guard against it and the impact caused him to fly back. But I didn't stop there. I continued my pursuit without pause and swiftly caught up to Hafasan. So that's what you're aiming for. You won't be able to run around anymore. Even if I lacked experience, there was no way I would let him get away this time. I clenched my fist tighter this time in anticipation of Hafasan's guard. 
I've been fighting for him this long so I know. There's no reason to hold back. Break through. Smash apart that broken quarterstaff of his. I was already storing power into my fist when I knocked Hafasan back. I wasn't aiming for a direct hit on his body. I would break apart that annoying weapon of his first. I swung my left arm down. Phew. But the person I was aiming for, Hafasan, reacted just before he landed. He kicked some sort of object behind him, allowing him to land faster. He then twisted his body and avoided my incoming fist. Then, allow me to attack you from the back now. Kyuah. Utilizing the momentum that he gained from twisting his body, he struck a blow from behind with his quarterstaff. Although it wasn't that painful, this blow was enough to delay me, allowing my target to escape. My magic-infused fist had now lost its target. It continued on its path and I ended up punching at the object that Hafasan used to regain his ground. It was clearly not some living organism but the object in question seemed to wrap around my fist with its toughness and elasticity. However, it only lasted for a few moments before my magic-infused fist started penetrating through the elasticity. Ah! From there, I finally realized what I had just punched. It was white and its shape was similar to a log. I punched at it with a lot of force and drove it straight into the ground. It was the same type of target that Senpai and Kazuki had destroyed earlier. Normally, it won't break. It's extremely durable and tough. There isn't anyone who could destroy it with their bare hands. Ignoring Hafasan, I quickly turned around to Senpai's direction. Kiriha's entire body was trembling while it seemed like Kyu was worried about his sister. Carla-san was looking at me and laughing. The other students were looking at me like I was some kind of alien. Kazuki looked at me with sparkling eyes. Lastly, Senpai gave me a thumbs up while looking more satisfied than I had ever seen her. This is just a coincidence you see, it just happened to break on its own. While giving such a desperate explanation, I tried to pull out my arm that was still embedded in the target. Wait, hi? I can't pull away. I won't show any mercy. Seeing his opportunity, Hafasan had started running towards me from behind. W wait, wait wait. Time out. Time out. I can't pull it out. I'll make use of anything and everything I can. I really didn't think you would penetrate. Through that but. This is also part of my strategy. What kind of random and unplanned strategy is that? As I was distressing, Hafasan commenced his attack. This is quite bad, my arm is still stuck in the target. This isn't an opponent I could take on with just my right arm. Actually, I couldn't even freely move in this situation. My legs are sealed, this is already checkmate. No no, I refuse to be checkmated in such a stupid way. Rose would murder me for an outcome like this. Nuuuuu. I deflected Hafasan's quarterstaff pieces with a wide kick. I defended, only to buy myself a bit of time. Using this short gap, I'll exert all my strength to pull my arm out of this damn target. With my brute strength, I lifted the target up. My left arm was stuck in the target while my right arm supported it. You sad Okun? You're finally doing it. You're going to surpass the limits of being human. Hey, that senpai over there. You're being a little noisy. I felt like an immobile telephone pole. I also felt like my feet would sink into the ground. I continuously used my strength to keep myself from falling and I clenched my teeth as cracks started forming on the ground around my feet. Ora. Once I felt like I was stable enough, I threw the target down. Using the gravitational potential energy, I pulled on my left arm. It didn't seem deep as I thought. My arm started showing itself once it fell approximately one meter. It was coming loose but my arm was still stuck in the target. Hafasan had already recovered and was using his weapon to attack me again. I won't be defeated that easily. At the same time that I turned over to Hafasan, I swung with the target to ward him away. With some light steps back, he avoided it. He wryly smiled and looked at my left arm that was still stuck in the target. Seeing someone attempting to pull their arm away from a target. It's such a strange thing to see. Who do you think caused this current situation? Even I'm surprised. But it seemed unexpectedly shallow since the target finally loosened and fell from my left arm. Using your magic to reinforce yourself to remove it. You easily surpass my expectations. Fu, phew. Even I had a bit of trouble removing it. Carla San boomed. I couldn't do anything other than reinforcing myself with my magic to remove it. Carla San, you really don't need to say it in such a loud voice for everyone to hear. However, I'm astonished at the fact that he was able to kick off the target and get behind me. His close quarters combat is excellent and he's good at using his surroundings. I can understand why Kiriha and Kyu were worried due to how strong he is. More importantly, he's able to completely read my movements. I have to do something about that first. Which reminds me. As I was healing my left arm that I forcefully extracted from the target, I remembered something. Hafasan's magic vision, I think it was called? 
Well C. San said it was a type of magic eyes that could see the flow of magic in people and the environment. I was too used to Amako's ability to see the future that I could only use her as a reference for Hafa San's magic. I didn't know anyone else with something similar. Either. If those magic eyes of his were similar to Amako's foresight to see the future no, in this case it would be his ability to see an attack. If he could feel an attack coming, it would make sense for him to anticipate my attacks. When Hafa San first met me, he mentioned that the magic power in my body is extraordinarily smooth or something along those lines. In other words, Hafasan's eyes wouldn't be able to see the flow of magic during the times I'm not using it. If I took that into consideration, then maybe. Maybe. If I change how I currently think about my flow of magic for this fight from what he has seen so far from me. It's something worth trying. Even if he can predict an attack coming, he can't tell what the exact attack will be. Even so, it was dangerous to rely purely on my strength to fight against a human like Hafasan. It wasn't like the time when I was fighting those blue grizzlies in the forest. He was able to use my own strength against me and put me in a difficult spot. There was no other way but this. It looks like you're up to something. I lightly clenched my left hand and formed a fist. I started concentrating healing magic into it and approached Hafasan. I didn't have to go out of my way and attack him close what I wanted to confirm. Is this? I transferred the healing magic from my left hand to my right leg. But I left a small amount of healing magic in my left hand, an amount that you wouldn't even notice. Then, I punched. It was something like a telephone punch. It lacked speed and power. It was something Hafasan could easily dodge but. It seemed like Hafasan didn't expect it at all. He was flustered and tried to block my punch quickly. He almost wasn't able to guard it in time but he managed to at the very last second. It looks like my hunch was right. The flow of magic isn't the only thing your magic eyes can see, right? Looks like you realized it. He lowered his weapons and exhaled to show his acceptance. Magic flows by circulating inside a person's body. Oops, you already knew this part. It looked like he had no intention of hiding it. Hafasan was unexpectedly going to reveal his own trick. But I guess it didn't really matter to begin with. Against an opponent who could completely predict your moves, you could only throw sand or something in their eyes. Magic flows gently just like a river. When it's activated by the user, they produce a fluctuation. I look for this fluctuation when I'm reading your movements. Although I say this, a body like yours has one big weakness that cannot be overlooked. I expected some sort of reaction to magic but... I see, fluctuation, is it? I wanted to test this and so I purposely operated my magic in a weird way. The reason why Hafasan looked so flustered was due to the fact that he couldn't tell where my attack was coming from. It was either my left arm or right leg. This caused his response to be delayed. He had been able to read my attacks until now. Hafasan looked at me sternly, as if re-examining me once more. He pointed his weapon at me and said. However, that little feint of yours won't work on me again. It's not over yet. I can still fight. No, it'll be over in the next round. If you were predicting my attacks by observing the flow of my magic, then it was easy. If a simple feint won't work then I have an ace up my sleeve. There's a bit of risk involved but it'll be exceptionally effective against someone like him who looked at the flow of magic. I bolted out, heading for Hafasan again. I intended to end this match with my next attack. No matter how fast you are, to think you would head straight for me again like this. Even I know that it's not optimal. But the hand I would play this time, it was better for me to be directly on the opposite side of you and in the center of your vision. Hafasan got into position to meet my next attack. I stopped running, and focused healing magic into my right hand. I made sure he could see it too. A feint won't work. Even this. I guided and concentrated as much healing magic as possible into my right hand. The thin and pale green color of my magic became denser like it was blotted with ink. The overflowing magic caused the light to radiate and shine. Light. Basically, the countermeasure I had against Hafasan's magic eyes was to blind him. His eyes must be quite sensitive since he was able to predict my movements this entire time. I swung my right hand in front of him and he seemed to be trying to resist, but he didn't break his line of sight from me. Ha! Huh. This worked because his eyes were too good. With his sensitive eyes, I knew there was no way he would look away. Even more so when a great amount of healing magic was being focused in my right hand. I drew closer at this instant to deal the final blow to Hafasan. I kicked away his two quarterstaff pieces into the air and let loose my fist. Wah! I sent an uppercut to Hafasan, and it was far too fast for him to guard in time. Just right before I would make contact with him, I stopped. While holding this position, I was secretly fearful that he would still want to continue. Looking at his expression though. Ha, ha 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 ha. To think, I would so easily. How unsatisfying. I surrender. I completely lost. He raised his arms as he said so. It looked like he finally admitted defeat since my fist would have hit him. 
It was finally over. It was a close match. Phew. I sighed in relief and withdrew my fist. Because I felt relieved, I finally noticed the pain tormenting my right arm. Looking closely, blood was pouring out from my hand. I was still too inexperienced and tried to use more magic power than I could control. The burden resulted in tearing my hand apart. I immediately applied healing magic to my hand to heal the wound. After a short moment, it was completely cured and spotless. I gently closed my palm. But compared to the injury last time, it isn't as bad. I was also growing. At least more than before. Feeling a real sense of achievement in my growth, I did an uncharacteristic fist pump. Fu fu fu. Despite saying all that, I knew you would be able to do it, Yusato kun. After finishing with the mock battle, I returned back to the group. Only to receive words from senpai that didn't make me happy at all. I looked around and could see students noisily talking to each other while looking at me. The only one among them who looked content and smiled was Hafasan. I discovered one problem after fighting him. It was that I held back when my opponent was another person. Demons and monsters were sort of in the grey area for me. It still bothered me to fight them. Actually, I've been fighting nothing but them. This was my first time fighting another human and this problem felt very apparent. No, Rose doesn't count. Ha. Huh. I understand your personality quite well. However, don't you think you were showing far too much for a demonstration? A demo. What? What's that? Was it some sort of English word? After asking that question to Senpai, she only gave me a profound smile. If you know what it means then I'd prefer you tell me instead of acting so knowledgeable and important. You too, that fight just now was magnificent. I really didn't expect to meet a magician here who would reach this level already even though your reinforcement is incomplete, I didn't think I would get to see all that. Just as I was about to question Senpai again, I held it in since Carla Sensei initiated a conversation with us. It seemed like she was surprised about how I added more power to my own magic. But it also seemed that the other students had no idea what she was talking about. Come to think of it, I still haven't taught it yet. Reinforcement is a type of strengthening technique that increases the concentration of magic power. Generally, the concentration is always the same but this technique allows you to increase it. If you were to polish this technique, it's very possible for even a weak fire magician to manipulate tremendous fires. The reinforcement of healing magic? I was simply just increasing the power of my healing and enhancing my own physical abilities. But it looked like there were different effects for strengthening other magic. It was irrelevant to me though. It looks like you are all wondering why I didn't teach you all of this technique already. Reinforcement isn't something an inexperienced magician can handle. If you don't control it properly, your magic can overflow and it will cause damage to yourself. You have to be quite good at controlling your own magic. As I was listening to her talk about something that had nothing to do with me, Carlassen made her way over to me. Her arms were folded and all the students' eyes were on her. She took a glance at me. The corners of her mouth distorted upwards and she suddenly placed her hand on my shoulder. She looked over at the student's direction once more and said. Your hand was in a pretty bad shape but it looks like you've been training to heal injuries no matter how severe they are. You sure showed something nice today. You were able to show how the supportive healing magicians can fight. She was totally adding more oil to the fire, wasn't she? There were definitely people in the crowd that were scowling at me. Among them, the twin-tailed girl who had suggested the mock battle at the start was looking at me with some unreasonably bloodshot eyes. And then. I caught sight of a boy who was just a few steps away from the entrance. He seemed dumbfounded and was staring blankly at me. It was a short boy covered in soot. It was the boy that was a healing magician, just like me. Our eyes made contact with each other. He wasn't glaring at me like when we first met, it felt more like he was looking at something unbelievable. Excuse me, Carla San. Leave him alone. At least for now. It seemed she noticed and gave an immediate reply. Even without Carla San and Hafa San's advice, it might be careless for me to act when I didn't know anything. He might just have been simply been drawn here by healing magic without realizing it. However, I didn't know at this time what result my actions would bring to this boy whose name I still did not know. Well. Cheer up, Yusato kun. I it was the first time that I've seen you fight but, Yusato, you were really amazing. After the practical class had ended, the three of us were led to the dining hall. The dining hall was quite spacious, as you'd expect from a magic school this large. I quickly ate my meal and was currently taking a breather. My thoughts naturally went back to the mock battle I just had. I can't believe how careless I was. How could I be so thoughtless? I'm ashamed of myself. These two next to me were heroes who could use amazing magic. In my case, I used healing magic which had a bad name attached to it. I also couldn't really call myself a magician with how I just fought. I wouldn't be surprised if bad rumors about me were already spreading. It's our fault too. If we thought about it carefully, we wouldn't have participated in something so unfavorable for you, Yusato. 
I couldn't control my own emotions and went with the flow. I apologize. Don't apologize, please. I still decided to participate on my own. I replied as the two of them tried to take on the blame. It was wrong to blame them. The problem now was that I didn't know what kind of influence I would have on the school due to my actions. One thing that comes to mind was. The other healing magician might receive even harsher treatment. First of all, I should discuss about the other healing magician with these two. I started to explain about what happened just before they met with me today. Kazuki. Seemed to be in thought as he listened to me. Inyakumai Senpai was folding her arms and deeply pondering something as she tilted her head sideways. What do you want to do? Senpai suddenly asked. Eh. Do you want to save that other healing magician? Or do you want to stop others from bullying him? Although these two phrases sounded like the same thing, they were completely different in meaning. The former would ensure that there would be no more harm done to him while the latter was only a temporary solution we had to decide between them and make a plan accordingly. Honestly, I don't really know. Just, I can't turn a blind eye to someone when they obviously need help. Well, I couldn't just do nothing either when the other students were treating you like a fool, Yusato-kun. It's a little different from your situation but it's also similar. You can boldly say such embarrassing words, hey. I think of you as a precious friend, so it's natural. Hearing Senpai's sudden words, I put a hand over my mouth and turned away. Senpai looked like she was about to tease me and say oh, you're embarrassed, but Kazuki made eye contact with her and silently told her just stop it. How could this happen? How could I receive such a surprise attack from this deplorable Senpai of mine? Her methods were far too despicable and cowardly. As I was still facing away from Senpai, she put her hand on my shoulder and got me to turn around. She had a gentle expression and it looked like she remembered something. I have a bad feeling about this. It felt it would be something troublesome again. Ah, that reminds me, Yusato-kun. About the place you are staying at today. No can do. Why can't you just go with the flow and say okay? Look, I'm a good Senpai. You were really going to say that about yourself? You have the inn's gorgeous meals and beds, just bear with it. I don't need those. I just, just, want to live a life with fantasy in it. You don't need to worry about that. Everything you've been saying and doing so far is already full of fantasy. She seemed so honest when she spoke just now. Overwhelmed by her excitement, I let out a sigh. Convincing her to give up would be difficult. Suddenly, she grabbed both of my shoulders. People around us started looking in our direction. Way. Just calm down for a moment. It's not like I'm bullying you or anything, you know. Kiriha told me to ask you, Yusato-kun. What? When did you make contact with her? Was it during the training? Either way, I can't believe I overlooked this. Moreover, Kiriha was pushing everything onto me. Senpai, please calm down. You're making things difficult for Yusato, please stop it. Kazuki shouted out to stop Senpai. He was probably thinking it'd be bad if we gathered any more attention. Senpai would usually give in at this point, but it looked like she was being stubborn this time. I won't stop. I won't back down this time. Hmm. Senpai who was still grabbing my shoulders, tilted her head to the side and looked behind me. She was being so unreasonable just a moment ago but now it seemed like she recovered. Was there someone behind me? I turned around. Fu fu fu, it looks like you are having fun. Just what on earth are you two doing? The woman with golden hair, Gladys San, along with Welsi San who was following behind her. The two of them looked at me and Senpai with strange eyes. Did they have something to discuss with us? They sat down beside Kazuki. At least it didn't seem like they came here to eat. I came here to apologize to the three of you. Apologize? Why? Nothing comes to mind. Why were we receiving an apology from Gladys San? In fact, I should be the one apologizing for causing such a commotion in class. Despite how we were gathering attention from the surrounding students, she didn't mind it and continued to talk. After your group left yesterday, I gathered all the teachers here to talk about the Mu army and the cooperation with Lingal Kingdom. Is it related with why you're apologizing? Did we receive an unfavorable result? About that. A few of the teachers felt that some of the contents in the letter are contradictory. Are the heroes really that amazing? Enough to drive away the Mu army? That's one of the doubts. They're suspicious of your true strength. They also can't trust you, they don't believe that the heroes would come themselves to protect the students here. Although we are messengers from Lingal, we are just strangers. I don't mind that we're being suspected. But you see, that's just the surface. In truth, everyone is actually afraid. The magic army here has never fought the Mu army, something that has only been heard from old stories. They seem like a powerful enemy. That's why they're desperately denying it. However, if Lingal had lost the recent battle with the Mu army, they would attack Luquis next. That was obvious. 
If you thought about it carefully, the Mu army would appear with even more force to attack Luquis once Lingle falls into their hands. Luquis was a place full of inexperienced magicians. I don't think they would stand much of a chance against the Mu army. I was sure Gladys San understood that too. No matter how much I tried to elevate your true strengths, they wouldn't believe me. Wellsy and I could only give up on such an unreasonable negotiation. Was that why you had us participate in the training with the other students? You noticed. When Yusato Kun was fighting, I noticed there were quite a few people spectating outside. I had a good guess as to why because of that. So that was what she meant when she said it was a demonstration. As expected, she was sharp and noticed these things. At times like this, she was really reliable. But I really wish they told me beforehand. Even if it was necessary, it still took me a lot of effort to fight against Hafasan. I definitely gathered too much attention as well, with what I used in that fight. No, this person probably planned this. They wanted to gather this much attention. Gladys San covered her mouth and chuckled after listening to Senpai's words. Gladyson's actions made her feel like someone with wisdom yet also someone with a bit of playfulness. I really feel sorry for not saying anything. But you exceeded my expectations, the teachers who raised objections before could only remain silent once they saw your true ability. Phew phew phew, I really didn't think you would destroy that target with your bare hands. Yup, it definitely wasn't normal for someone to get their arm stuck in that target and try to pull it out. Since I trained every day, I was able to tell that I was getting stronger. But I didn't expect to become this strong. It made me realize once again just how important it was to continue practicing the basics every day. While I was feeling satisfied by my conclusion, Welsi San seemed to remember something and abruptly slammed the table with her hand. She then looked at me with frantic eyes and said, Yusato Sama. Didn't I say it just yesterday? It's dangerous to add more power to your own magic like that. But you used it. Used it in such a reckless way. It's definitely the wrong way to use it. ERM, Welsi San. How about thinking it this way? It's my way of fighting. Please don't say something that Rose would say. I still hadn't reached that person's level yet. I was still fine. If I continued to say more unnecessary words, I would just be lectured. I let Welsi San calm down. Meanwhile, I directed my attention to Gladys San. Did Hafasan move according to your instructions? Yes, but the girl who spoke and challenged you in the beginning wasn't part of it. Hafasan was the only one cooperating. That girl in the beginning wasn't part of it. That was why Hafasan interfered when the girl suggested the mock battle. Then what about Carla San? Was she an accomplice? But I had a feeling that someone like her could receive permission to do almost anything if she just talked to you. I'm really glad I left it to him. If it were a magician other than him, it would have ended before we could see your true abilities. As expected from her subordinate though. There's no way her subordinate could be ordinary. She can easily send people to the skies with just her fists, after all. Ha ha ha, I've still got a long way to go. I was beaten all over with a recent training I did with her. It was ten times harder than my fight with Hafasan. And you know what? Even though I succeeded in dodging her punch, she just used a roundhouse kick on me anyways. So unreasonable, right? Well, I'm just talking to myself. Don't mind it. At first I thought I would die. But once I got used to it, it wasn't so bad. Although it felt more like my body started getting numb from the pain than anything else. I I see. Yusato sama, you are. Eh? This was where you were supposed to laugh. Wow, just how much power does Rose have, I was expecting a reaction like that. Gladys San who was smiling just a moment ago had returned back to her serious expression. Welsi San was looking at me with eyes that said really, just how on earth are you still alive? Rose San is incredible. Just what is that person? I wonder. Kazuki and Senpai gave their individual reactions. I created a really weird and awkward atmosphere. T that reminds me, Gladys San. I have a request. What is it? As long as it's not too excessive and within my power then. Blur in. I mean, the familiar that I have with me. Do I need to receive permission to walk around town with him? There are a lot of students with familiars here so I don't mind. All right, I've received permission. Just you wait, Blurin. Your days of indulging in laziness are over. I'll make sure you run tomorrow. I felt slightly pumped at knowing I would be able to do some training with Blurin. But for some reason, Welsi San nervously called out to me. ERM, Yusato Sama. Blurin isn't a familiar, you know. Eh, is that so? How could this be? Then what would Blurin be? What do you mean, Welsi? Gladys San questioned. Er, that is to say. Yusato Sama doesn't have a familiar contract. Or it's more accurate to say that it's not necessary. Not necessary. A familiar contract, did it literally mean there would be a real contract? I didn't have anything complicated like a contract with Blurin. 
But what did she mean by not necessary? A familiar contract is formed by mixing both the familiar's blood with the master's. It acts as an intermediary. Additionally, it requires for the familiar to completely yield to their master. These are the strict requirements required. Yes, there are a lot of required steps to form a contract with a familiar. There were so many bothersome steps and requirements to form a contract? I guess you couldn't just sign a paper and be done with it like that. But I didn't want to control Blurin like that. He definitely wouldn't want to submit to me either. Even without that, he wouldn't do anything to betray me. Yusato Sama and Blurin don't have a master and servant relationship. Let's see. Their relationship is closer to being good friends. He, that's quite incredible. The familiar in question. What type of monster is it? It's a blue grizzly. And then. It's a blue grizzly. For some reason, Gladys San didn't respond so I repeated my answer. After repeating it, she was still silent. Well see San showed an as expected expression and hid under her arms. Why did it feel like I was the weird one here? Since I didn't understand what was going on, I could only question it. I remembered that Uluru San said that blue grizzlies usually didn't stick with people. Was that why? Or was it that it was too dangerous of a monster to take as a familiar? Well as long as it's not dangerous, then it's fine. Just be careful and pay attention so it doesn't act violently. Yes, I understand. If it comes to that, though, I'll subdue him myself. Normally, I would doubt the one saying that and think they're lying. But strangely. When you're the one saying it, I don't think so. It really is amazing. I thought I heard Gladys San mumble something just now. Was it just my imagination? At any rate, I received permission to walk around with Blurin. Senpai, Kazuki, what are you two going to do now? Let's see, how about going to Blurin's place? Since we received permission, let's go meet him. I'm feeling a little tired so I'm heading back to the inn. Yeah. Have fun with you Sato, Senpai. Kazuki was heading back first. I was a little worried to go with just Senpai but she had a point. We should go meet with Blurin. Before that, I also had to go pick up the luggage I left back at the inn. Well, that's how it is. We'll be going back. Yes, come again if you'd like. That's right, there will be a mock battle competition in a week. I think you'll be able to see a lot of different magic, so if you're interested, please do come. One week, hey. As for the letter, we're still having a discussion over it. You three might be bored during this time, so come if you feel like it. A mock battle competition. It seems interesting. We bowed to Gladys San and left the school. Just you wait, Blurin. Don't think that you can just sleep all day. Yusato Sama and the others were leaving the dining hall. I watched as Principal Gladys sent them off. After making sure that they had all left, I voiced the doubt I had. Was it really a good idea to not talk about it? I don't need to worry about him. There's no need to say anything right now. The mock battle between him and Hafa, it was to convince the teachers but we don't need to tell him the other reason yet. Of course, the other teachers recognized everyone's strength. It was a splendid result. Suzun Sama's overwhelming offensive ability, Kazuki Sama's precise control over his light magic, and finally Yusato Sama's healing magic that allowed him to surpass a human being's strength and speed. But even I didn't expect him to use so much reinforcement against Hafa. It was part of the reason why I felt shivers down my spine as I was watching him. Strength, magic power, and race. We need a trigger to reform the students who are biased against these three things, Welsi. For that reason, I got Hafa with his magic eyes to fight against a healing magician such as Yusato. Hafa-san and Yusato-sama's fight wasn't a coincidence. Originally, instead of Yusato-sama, it should have been Suzun-sama or Kazuki-sama fighting. Principal Gladys purposely chose Yusato-sama for the other students to see. Magic that can't do anything but heal. Magic that can't do anything but see the flow of magic. Even though they are different, they are also similar. This battle had value because these two fought against each other and showed the students no, the people who live here, what is possible. It was a mock battle to change how people viewed magic. You could say it was effective. The students who possessed strong or rare magic would despise other magic. That was exactly why they would understand they still had a long way to go when they saw that the magic they despised had greatly surpassed them. It was an overbearing method but I couldn't think of anything more effective than this. However, even though the letter was one reason for this mock battle, I felt pain for not telling Yusato Sama and the others. Fu fu fu. Yusato's actions are truly unexpected. Despite how I went to the trouble of arranging an inn for him, he stayed at another place. What's more, you told me that the house's inhabitants are actually beastkin. Even though the people that live here detest them. Really, he's such a strange child. Eh ah ha ha Principal Gladys giggled while I gave a strained laugh. The three of them who had been summoned from another world really had different views from us. They experienced and saw everything in this world with excitement in their eyes, they were like children. 
especially. The beast girl, Amako, who was together with Yusato-sama. It made him look very dependable. Seeing a beast girl like her together with Yusato-sama, it was normally something I would never be able to see. It's because he doesn't avoid other races that I want him to change this country's mistaken ideology. No matter what magic you possess, you can make it shine. It would be a waste of your talents to not polish it. As long as you desire it, you can grow. I want them to understand that. Principal Gladys who had been left in charge to look after the city. Her eyes looked very gentle at this moment. She knew that everyone wanted immediate results and were impatient. She aimed to improve the school's environment at all times but she couldn't make any careless moves when considering her position. Which was exactly why she was borrowing some influence from another country she intended to make it so others officially recognized his power. But her gentle expression quickly became sullen as she put her hand on her forehead. The problem is whether or not that child who viewed the mock battle today would think the same way. After saying goodbye to Gladys San and Welsi San, we walked to the inn. Once we separated with Kazuki at the inn, we then headed in the direction where Blurin, Amako and the other knights were. As we walked, Senpai was in an awfully good mood. I was worried she would get distracted and run off to look at some weird merchandise again. The boy who is a healing magician like you, he was part of the junior's class that was present for the training rite. Yeah, he was surprised when he saw me. Do you think he was shocked to see another healing magician? He recognized my face too. He was probably astonished to see how different you were from him. He's probably never seen a healing magician like you who could fight like that, after all. Don't you finally know the reason why Carla San wanted you to tell them you're a healing magician? That was one way of looking at it. I was aware I wasn't the same as the other healing magicians. It would explain why Carla San had that expression during the mock battle. But when the boy was knocked unconscious, why was he in such a hurry? Because he was late for class? It was strange. If I was bullied for several years, I wouldn't want to go to class. If there was another reason. No, I shouldn't try to come up with any weird reasons. Senpai didn't say anything as I was lost in thought and we walked in silence. It was some time around noon so there were a lot of people on the streets. When the others saw me and Inyakumai Senpai, they would move away and create a path. They also seemed to be whispering to each other. My white uniform especially stood out. It was obvious since it was designed to stand out. But it still annoyed me during times like this. Your uniform is really conspicuous. Would it be better for me to remove it? No no, there's no need. Your uniform not only looks good but I know there's a proper meaning behind it and that's why you're wearing it. Actually, I want to wear it too. You can't. I didn't mind lending it but I heard that there wasn't another one like mine. Other than Rose's uniform, there wasn't another uniform like this right now. I didn't know what materials were used to make this either. But I knew just from feeling the cloth that no ordinary fabric was used to make this. You sat Okun. In front. Yes. Senpai urged me to look in front of us. Following her gaze, I could see a crowd of people in a familiar looking alleyway. Up ahead was where I found the unconscious boy, who was also the only other healing magician in this city. I had a bad feeling about this. Let's go. Eh, ah, uh, you sat Okun. I immediately ran towards the alleyway and rushed to the edge of the crowd. I pushed my way past the others. I heard a thunderous sound. It sounded like an explosion. Hearing an explosion here was definitely not normal. I imagined the worst possible scenario in my mind. I had to hurry. I recognized one of the spectators from this morning and approached him. Why you read that person from this morning with those weird clothes? What happened? T the group that was bullying that boy this morning are doing it again. And this time. They're going at it more than usual. Was it my fault? I really didn't think they would do something this fast. If they wanted to vent their anger, wouldn't it have been fine to just come directly for me? I felt something boiling inside of me. But I was calm. I first had to get past these spectators. Senpai. I'm going ahead. You sat Okun. I jumped along the walls of the alleyway and made it past the onlookers instantly. I heard people exclaiming in surprise but I didn't have the composure to care at the moment. After landing, I could clearly see the open space in front of me. In the center was that healing magician boy that was. The twin-tailed girl who challenged me to a mock battle? There was also a group of both boys and girls surrounding the healing magician. If you were hiding your true ability, why don't you show it already? I'm, different. In the girl's hand wasn't a fireball. It was an orb that was slightly orange in color. The surrounding group had evil-looking smiles. The girl then aimed and fired the orb at the boy. Looking at the boy, he looked worse than when I had seen him in the morning. Judging by his current state. He was completely out of magic. Don't you know what would happen if you launched your magic at someone who was completely out of magic? Did she really understand? This is bad. I hurriedly took off my uniform, wrapped it around my right hand, and began running at full speed. After only a few moments, 
I arrived in front of the boy and used my right hand that was wrapped with my uniform to stop the oncoming orb. Using just a flick, I deflect the sphere of magic. The orange orb exploded and caused a bit of black smoke to form. Ha! Huh. However, this magic wasn't much. It wasn't powerful enough to burn my uniform and if a person took this head on with magic, it wouldn't cause a big injury. Shaking off the black smoke from my hand, I turned around to look at the boy instead of the group of students in front of me. He looked at me, befuddled, as I expected, and I began gathering healing magic in my hands. It looks like you really exhausted all your magic. I'm surprised you are still conscious and holding on. W.Y. Are you? The same, as me. It looked like he had reached his limit. The boy fainted as I was applying healing magic to him. He suffered from some light burns. Was he beaten? His face was bruised all over. When I rolled up his sleeves, there were countless wounds. The problem was the injuries were so bad that a healing magician like him couldn't heal them. Just how many minutes, no, how many hours was he tormented? It was possible that this group headed straight for him once the mock battle had ended. Hey! Can you like not get in the way? First of all, I should restore all his fatigue. If I don't heal him properly, these injuries could become permanent damage. But I was really surprised that they allowed magic to be used so freely like this. The knights in Lingle had proper morals to follow. I wasn't saying that the students should only use magic for their country, but there were still some things a person shouldn't do. Hey, someone shouted, touching my shoulder. Ah! I was getting irritated. I couldn't help but respond with a rougher tone. The boy who had called out to me and put his hand on my shoulder. He drew back in silence once he saw my face. If you didn't like something about me, why didn't you just tell me directly instead? I it's a misunderstanding. He's my friend. Since you're not related, could you step away? I see, not involved. Ha! Huh. This was it. It was already useless. I didn't know what to do anymore. Wouldn't it just be fine to knock all of them unconscious? That was way too simple so let's not do that. While trying to calm down and telling myself countless times to keep cool, I looked at the group in front of me. Especially at the girl who threw the orb just now. Five people. Hey. Healing magic, you see. It's not something you can conveniently use to vent your anger, don't you know? I learned. I came to respect the pain from hell. The magic she taught me, I was able to use it to save a lot of people. This magic was absolutely not a substitute for a sandbag. It's also not a magic that exists purely to boost your own worthless pride. You know. Even though I was irritated because of you, I just calmed myself. Despite how you tried to cast that explosion of yours directly on someone's body. It would have caused quite the injury but I guess someone as ignorant as you wouldn't know, right? Ignorant, you say. You really say some cheeky things. Did you really think such a flimsy lie like saying you were his friend would get me to back off? You thought it was enough for me to overlook this? You thought that I would forgive you as long you showed an innocent expression? For a healing magician that's just tagging along with the heroes. Don't get too cocky. My superior, that's also a healing magician, once said this. I didn't think my personality was like this. Unexpectedly, I got angry pretty easily. Back in my world, I rarely got angry for real. Besides, the shitty people in front of me was something I thought I would only see in a bad movie. But, this really wouldn't do. Unlike the time when Film tried to kill Senpai and Kazuki. It was obvious that a different kind of anger was spreading within my heart. Seeing a nearby tree, I placed my left hand on it and started squeezing it. The section I was gripping conspicuously distorted, and the entire tree shook. During a time when you meet people who look down on healing magic and there are no other means to resolve the situation. Feel free to beat them up. That's what she said. You see? I'm referring to you guys. Also, calling him your friend. That's a nice thing to say, and a good excuse, right? Crush. Grabbing a chunk of wood in my hands, I crushed it and allowed the pieces to fall onto the ground. With just that, the formerly assertive girl withdrew in fear. You mentioned that I'm just a healing magician tagging along with the heroes. Or something like that, right? Do you want to meet the same fate as this unconscious boy here? You're just a little girl who can't do anything without ganging up on someone. I took a step forward. Her face got even paler. It looked like some of them were about to cry. Once I saw that, I slowly relaxed myself a bit more and eased the current tension. I threatened them this much, they'll probably behave themselves for a bit. I imitated a bit of Rose's tone for the last few statements. It seemed extremely effective. I wasn't childish enough to raise my hands against these kids just based on my emotions. Speaking from my own experience, they probably won't rebel anytime soon after tasting this kind of fear. I had finally threatened someone like this. It would have been nice if I could have brought Blurin along too to further increase the effectiveness. But I really didn't want to threaten people if I could help it. 
Was this issue settled for the time being? Now I just had to take this unconscious boy and put him in a bed. You sat Okun, calm down. And then. Senpai had finally pushed through the crowd of people and put her hand on my shoulder, telling me to calm down. She came at just the right time, I just settled the situation. I wanted to consult her for advice as to what to do with these students. Ah, Senpai. Right now I'm. It seems like you guys really hold a grudge or something against healing magicians. Good grief, if your true ability only amounts to this, then you've convinced me of how mediocre you all are. However, she didn't listen to my words and turned to look at the twin-tailed girls. Group. She threw down some very provocative words as well. Senpai, don't tell me. You really thought I snapped from anger? Senpai walked triumphantly in front of me. While the twin-tailed girl was somewhat afraid of the blunt senpai, she also looked angrily at her. Yusato kun and I are both outsiders here. We have also been entrusted with an important mission that concerns the country's future that's why you guys can't do anything to him. I'm sure you're mortified but... Don't misunderstand and get ahead of yourselves though, we're not the ones who will put you guys in your place. You guys can't do anything to him senpai had a faint smile as she said that. I understand why she was angry. Although... It made me happy that Senpai was paying attention to me despite how she was struggling with the crowd back there. W what are you talking about? Isn't there a mock battle competition one week from now? There's no way I could win. Not against that monster and the heroes. Hey. He. Despite how you were calling me a monster, your reaction was strange. At the very least, you didn't think of me as a person. The girl was being unreserved and just labeling me as a monster. I guess it couldn't be helped, she already considered me as an enemy. Leaving that aside, Senpai mentioned the mock battle competition. Wasn't it different from today's unofficial battle? I suspect only official students would be able to take part in it. Yusato kun and I won't be competing. It will be the boy that you guys just tormented. Ha, ha. You're saying that guy that's on the ground right now will be able to win. Against me. Wait a minute. I couldn't understand Senpai's intention at all. If he fought against them, it would be a completely one-sided game. The boy was unconscious right now and didn't even agree to anything. I didn't really have the right to speak out right now either since I just threatened them. The girl was looking down on the boy that had collapsed on the ground. She then glared at Senpai but it had no effect. Senpai lightly smiled before telling me her plan. Make him stronger than everyone else in a week Yusato kun, that's what you will be doing. Ha. Ha. I'm the one doing it. Throwing such a thing at me without warning, I would obviously be surprised. I lowered my voice and said to Senpai. Jay just wait a minute, please. What are you trying to say? This is the best way to resolve this situation. It's a little drastic but I couldn't think of a better method than this. That's true but... Furthermore, the person who understands healing magic the best in this city right now is you. Training him? Just seven days. No, he fainted so there was no way he could do anything today. We also had to account for the fact that he couldn't do any training on the day of the competition. In reality, we only had five days. As for the training itself, it'll probably be impossible to accomplish anything unless he goes through the same type of training as me. But, if I were asked if there were any better methods to stop the bullying, then I really couldn't think of any. You had to use your own strength to stop the bullying. In a way, this was the best way for this boy to resolve this, but also the most difficult. I remained silent as I understood what Senpai was trying to say. Senpai turned around and continued provoking the other party. Whether you accept or decline, it's up to you. If you're scared of losing to a healing magician like him then. I don't mind if you decline, you know. Ha, what a joke. Prepare yourselves for the consequences when that person loses. Whether you're the heroes or the messengers from Lingal Kingdom, it doesn't matter. Compensation. When I win, I'll demand it from you if I have to. Just try your best to make that failure over there stronger. After giving her ultimatum, she laughed mockingly and left with her group. They walked past the alleyway and disappeared into the main streets. All that was left were the spectators, the unconscious boy, and the two of us. Thinking that I got caught up in something troublesome again, I sighed. Well I was really panicking when I saw that you lost your cool, you sato kun. Now she won't try and do anything to you. The letter shouldn't be affected too. Wait. Ouch. For the time being, I lightly chopped senpai's head with my hand as she tried to continue the conversation without me. I knew senpai did it with good intentions in mind, but I wouldn't feel satisfied if I didn't do this. W what are you doing? Senpai had tears in her eyes as she spoke, even though I only lightly chopped. It made me feel like I was doing something wrong but I ignored it and started my explanation. Senpai, although I was angry, I had no intentions of doing anything to them. At. Eh. Ha, ha ha ha. But you had such a scary face. I was planning to just lightly threaten them. 
I heard some of the spectators muttering in the alley. Lightly. That's gotta be a lie, right? His expression was like an ogre's. I've seen it before, I read a book on it. He took a chunk of the tree's trunk with his bare hands. Unless you're a beastkin, that's not the type of strength a human possesses. Beastkin? Could it be, he's one of them. W.L., let's just say my acting ability was that good and leave it at that. But I didn't think that these spectators would get involved too. But it doesn't change the fact that you suggested the best solution to resolve the current situation, senpai. The problem is whether or not this guy is up to the challenge. Deciding everything on my own, that's... Although I feel bad about it, I believe it was necessary. That's for sure. In a situation like that, it was natural that you would want to do something about it. Especially if that person was senpai. Nevertheless, I'm glad that the other party behaved exactly as I imagined. It would have been really embarrassing if I was wrong. Why did you try and go through with such a hit or miss proposal? Really? Astounded by senpai, who went with such a reckless plan, I checked the boy again to make sure there were no other wounds. Even if healing magic could heal the damage done on the body, it couldn't heal the damage done to the mind. If that earlier explosion had hit him when he had exhausted his magic, then a blow to one of his vitals could have killed him. I had once heard that there was nothing more frightening than giving a child a dangerous weapon. It looked like that was really the case. She was a person who could cast magic that hurt others with a smile on her face. After confirming that there weren't any other wounds on the boy, I put him over my shoulder. He's quite light. Feeling that his weight was appropriate for his young age and height, I felt something boiling inside me once more when I remembered his desperate expression. The method of making a healing magician stronger. There were a lot of ways to do that but I first had to ask this boy what he wanted to do. I just got back. Why did it suddenly become so lively here? Since I didn't know where this healing magician boy lived, I brought him to Kiriha's place. The boy was sleeping on the bed while I was being questioned by Kiriha in the same room. Q was also present. I was honestly glad Kiriha allowed the boy to use the room for the time being, but I just didn't know how I would explain everything to her. It's not like I'm trying to blame you for bringing him back. No matter how I look at it, his current condition tells me that he must have been through a lot. Thank you. That'll make things a little easier to explain. And? Just what do you want to do with this guy? Q asked, pointing at the boy. You have a reason for bringing him along, right? I started to recount today's events. As I continued my explanation, Q and Kiriha's expressions gradually turned grimmer. Yusato, that person's name is Mina. Although I'm the one saying this, do you like to get involved in troublesome situations or something? H how rude. It's not like I like being dragged into situations like this, you know. How vexing. To think that Q of all people would say that to me. Whether it was this morning's training classes or the matters regarding this boy. They were both plans proposed by Inyakumai Senpai. Leaving that aside, Kiriha mentioned that the girl's name was Mina or something, right? Just from her initial impression, she seemed like an arrogant and selfish person. Was she exactly as she seemed on the outside? Kiriha and Q's expression seemed to say that her personality wasn't that good. Ha. Huh. Then, about that Mina girl. She's the daughter of a noble. People rarely have praise for her. When you were saving this boy, you probably saw it yourself, right? She's the kind of person who can cast magic on someone while laughing no matter how wounded they are. She was probably spoiled by her parents when they raised her. She doesn't have a fragment of common sense. In addition, she'll do anything to have her revenge. Once she has her eyes on you, nothing good will come out of it. Although Kiriha tried to punch me when I first met her, she had a proper reason for it. She was doing it to protect the ones around her. But that girl called Mina didn't possess any morals. She might have thought it was amusing to surround someone like that judging by how she was laughing back then. But from my perspective, she had a really disgusting hobby to entertain herself with. If I didn't consider the boy, this situation could be easily resolved with my own fists. But that wouldn't really change anything. Well, I'll just have to try my best to train him. Will you be alright? Even though you have a week to make this boy stronger, if you exclude today and the day of the competition, you really only have five days. It's not like I don't have a method to make him stronger. But it's quite unreasonable and it would really push him to his limits. Unreasonable. You say. I'll have him conduct the training that my superior gave me. At the very least, he shouldn't have as much trouble as me since he can already use healing magic but. It won't change the fact that this kind of training is really pushing a human being's limits. I basically started with no healing magic at all, so he should have an easier time than I did. Nevertheless, the important part was what this boy wanted to do. I wouldn't force him. To fight if he didn't want to. If he didn't want to participate, I'll go and apologize to that girl afterwards. She said something about compensation or some kind of reward though. I felt a little scared. Until this boy wakes up, you can't get started on anything, 
right. After a slight pause, Kiriha continued to speak. I have one more thing that I want to ask you. Is that all right? Hmm? I don't really mind. Kiriha had a strange expression as she queried me. What was it? Did she still have something on her mind? But shortly after asking, Kiriha sighed and looked away, she then turned to the door behind me. And then both Yusato and I made our escape from the forest full of monsters. Amazing. Amazing. To think the two of you defeated two blue grizzlies. Inyakamai and Yusato are both strange. What are you going to do about that? Through the slight opening of the door, I could clearly hear a familiar voice that was more excited than usual. Although it couldn't be helped under these circumstances, was it a bad idea to bring Senpai here? Kiriha and Kyo probably didn't like the idea of having another human in their home. Rather than that, why was she having such a friendly conversation with Satsuki? Unlike how silent Satsuki was in the morning, she seemed to be smiling right now. Just what happened? I heard from Amako about the heroes. I know they aren't bad people. But. Even I didn't expect that her affinity would be so compatible with Satsuki's. I kind of have trouble dealing with that woman. Q muttered in low spirits. I'm guessing that the energetic senpai talked to him before he entered this room. Sometimes I forget but senpai is older than me and everyone else here. It's easy to see how senpai dragged Q into her own pace and warded off any resistance he may have had. She really isn't a bad person. In fact, she's a really good person but... Yeah, I'll have her go back in a bit. No, the two of you should at least stay for dinner. Since you're both here already, how about it? You won't refuse, right? It was a little odd since Kiriha looked worried as she asked this. But after telling her that there was no way Senpai would refuse such an offer, she smiled in relief and said, I'm glad. I wonder what Kiriha meant by that she was glad? But before I could ask her, she had already walked out of the room to start on her preparations for today's dinner. That left me with just Q and the unconscious boy on the bed. Well then. I had to watch over this boy and nurse him back to health. That was my task at the moment, but it felt unusually uncomfortable to do it. The reason was... Q. He was next to the door and leaning on the wall while staring at me. Hey. N.N. After a brief period of silence, Q spoke out to me in a somewhat reserved voice. I gave a casual reply as my attention was still on the sleeping boy. It was my bad. When I first met you, I said some things to you without any basis. Eh. I turned around to look at Q due to his sudden apology. But just as our eyes met, he quickly turned away in embarrassment and scratched his cheek. I was astonished that he would say those words to me due to his initial attitude towards me. While still feeling embarrassed, he continued to talk bit by bit. At first. I doubted that someone as fragile as you could protect Amako. But after seeing your fight today, I have to reconsider. You're not a weak healing magician. It's mortifying to admit it but. Amako made the right choice in choosing you. I guess this was what people called a blessing in disguise. The mock battle with Hafasan brought an unexpected outcome. It seemed that this was a favorable one. After seeing the battle, Q acknowledged me. When I first arrived here, I said I didn't really care about his thoughts. But that was only on the surface. His words honestly made me happy. Yesterday evening, he was staring at me with hostility like I was an enemy. I couldn't see any trace of hostility now as he looked at me. I couldn't help but let out a laugh. W.Y. are you laughing? No, I just thought. You really do like Amako, eh? It was quite pleasant to see his genuine concern for Amako. Ha. Huh. However, he wasn't shy or angry about it. He looked confused. It was like he was saying he didn't understand what I just said as he blankly looked at me. Since his reaction was different from what I expected, I couldn't help but immediately ask at. Was I wrong? You have the wrong idea. I don't like Amako, so yet. Is that so? I thought you liked her and that's why you kept thinking about her. It looked like he kept worrying about Amako. Was that not the case? As I folded my arms and thought about what other explanation there could be, Q gave a big sigh and said, I guess it can't be helped. After a brief pause, he continued. The reason I'm so concerned about Amako. How do I say it? During the time when we met Amako, she was always so reckless. She often got herself in a lot of dangerous situations. It was enough to make anyone think she might just get kidnapped and disappear somewhere one day. That Amako. Well that's how it is, that's why I couldn't break the habit of worrying over Amako. I mean, it's important to save your mother and all but. There's no point if something were to happen to you too. There was no doubt that she had a tough and difficult journey. She came all the way from her home and traveled to various countries before arriving in Luquis. Just from how Q described it, I could imagine what kind of risks she took to make it this far. During her two years in Lingal Kingdom, it was probably more than just a safe place for her. She might have used that time to heal the wounds in her heart. I didn't want to accept it, 
but the only person who can save both Amako and her mother is you. It's definitely impossible for me. That's why. Yusato, I'm entrusting it to you. I gave a firm nod to his words. Q was a more gentle and honest person than I initially thought. The first thing he did when the mock battle with Hafasan was announced was to come warn me. Although his words to me in beginning seemed a little severe, he was just worried about the others around him. He looked a little wild and rude but he was a very kind person. Actually, why did you assume that I liked Amako? She's younger than me. No matter how I look at it, our ages are too far apart. She's way too ouch. Q suddenly shouted in pain and jumped up. Surprised by his cry, I tried to see what was behind him. He was holding his tail and squatting down in pain. Was someone attacking? But that thought was immediately erased in the next moment. Amako was behind Q and looking at him without any expression. Q, if you say any more than that. I'll get angry. A hey, Amako. You. Isn't it against the rules to grab my tail like that without holding back? I could feel the intimidation in Amako's empty eyes as she stared down at Q. She felt a lot different than usual. Did Q provoke Amako and incur her imperial wrath? I heard before that this topic was a taboo among girls. But I didn't think it would apply to Amako as well. The next time I think about teasing Amako. Yeah, I shouldn't. As I watched the situation unfold, Q tried to make a quick escape and headed for the door. However, Amako placed her foot in the way, which caused him to trip and fall over. My body was overcome with fear upon seeing Amako use her magic to prevent any means of escape. Jay just wait a moment. Whose age is too far apart? Even I have my times when I can't tolerate something. If I hear you say it again, don't think you'll get away with only this much. Amako looked at Q with cold eyes. Q, who was frightened, raised his voice. Am my bad? I was wrong. While still clutching his tail, Q begged for Amako's forgiveness. There was no trace of the manly apology he made to me only a few moments ago. The more I observed this scene, the more lifeless it appeared. I was secretly trembling inside but I still decided to step in and help Q out of his predicament. Eh hey, Amako? Did you come here for something? Yet. Q, how about checking on Senpai for me? I need to talk with Amako for a bit. I I got it. Q slowly got up. His shoulders drooped and he left the room while holding his tail in his hand. It was Q's own fault for saying something he shouldn't have said but I couldn't help but pity him when I saw him leave the room like that. Amako turned to me in silence. She gently tilted her head to the side. She looked at me a little suspiciously as I made eye contact with her. W what? After staring at each other in silence for a few seconds, Amako replied. Nothing. It's just that this boy is going to wake up soon. She had her ability to see the future so it wasn't strange for her to know. But the way she said it. It felt like she was familiar with him. Is he an acquaintance of yours? I know him from my visions. What kind of person is he? He's someone who no one could trust so he ended up as a person who couldn't trust anyone. He's quite pitiable. When I saw him in my visions two years ago, he was just someone that other people didn't bother with. Despite the fact that he's younger than me. His present situation is actually this cruel. Wasn't this kind of heavy? It wasn't at a level where I couldn't handle it but. If it were Rose, she could just train him without any mercy. But I don't think I'm capable of that. It's all right, Yusato. You can do it. You say it so easily. Well, I couldn't back out and say it was impossible at this point. I still had to talk with the boy and ask what he intended to do. Everything would begin from there. I looked aimlessly at the ceiling while Amako was watching over the boy. She grabbed a wooden chair and sat next to me. He's waking up. Amako put her hood over her head as she said so. I nodded in response and turned my attention to the boy's body. After a few seconds, the boy, lightly groaned and opened his eyes. His hair was in a mess and there was quite a bit of dirt under his eyes. Looking closely, he was a little thin. Did he not eat much usually? No matter how I looked at it, he didn't have a healthy body. He was currently staring at me and Amako. Including me, the three of us were silent. We wouldn't get anywhere unless we started talking but he kept glaring at me. No, his long hair was sort of covering his eyes and it only looked a bit scary. He wasn't necessarily glaring at me. Maybe I misunderstood him when I first met him near Luquis Gates. I thought there was hostility in his gaze. Still, his eyes seemed to be quite good if he could see me from such a long distance. Well, in my case, I was used to being observed from a distance like that. Do you remember what happened this afternoon? Why? Yeah. What's your name? Nak. You are. Yusato, right? A healing magician just like me. But I don't know who the person next to you is. Well it's a given you would know about me, you saw my mock battle with Hafasan. Ah, you don't have to mind this person next to me. Anyways, I'll explain to you what happened after you fainted. 
Stay calm and listen carefully. Why yes. As my explanation went on, his face gradually became paler. I gave a detailed explanation of what happened while he was unconscious and told him about how Inyakumai Senpai set him up for a duel. After I stopped talking, he hugged himself with his arms and trembled in fear. I I. Why do I have to? Just as I had thought, Nak was in a state of shock. His reaction is understandable. If a match suddenly got decided for me without my consent, I wouldn't want to fight either. But that's just how unstable the situation is. It would have been even more dangerous for you if this match wasn't proposed. But that's because I'm a healing magician. No. I heard that you've been bullied quite a bit. I don't know exactly how much, but Mina went far enough to exhaust all your magic. If you received another hit during that state. Let me just be frank with you. If you took another hit from Mina's magic, you would have died. It wouldn't have been just a small injury preventing him from going to school. I was disgusted at the fact that this group in their spare time would fire magic at Nak until his magic was exhausted. But. The reason they took it that far this time was because of me. Due to my rash actions, I put you in a dangerous situation. I'm truly sorry. I put my hands on my knees and bowed my head down. Nak panicked upon seeing me lower my head but this was obviously something I had. To say. Their group probably never took their abuse on Nak this far before. The reason was simple, Nak would have already died long ago if they did. By showing Luquas the strength of a healing magician, Mina's pride was wounded. But I only felt anger right now because she didn't come directly for me but rather another healing magician instead. She went for Nak. I I was saved by you so. It's fine. So please, raise your head. I raised my head once I heard Nak's flustered voice. I held some responsibility for this current situation. That's why I'll give him a choice. I looked directly into his eyes and said. Then, Nak. Let's get right to the point. In one week. Will you be able to fight Mina? Please give me an honest answer. Once I threw down these words, the boy hung his head in shame and gathered the front of his robe in his fists. It felt like he was trying to squeeze something to death. After a few moments. The boy, Nak, opened his mouth and spoke. It's. Impossible. Can you tell me the reason for it? It wasn't I can't do it but rather impossible. He clearly stated that there was no way he could win. While I was pondering on the possible reason, Nak gathered healing magic in his hand and placed it in front of me. You're a proper healing magician, right? I'm just a defective one, my healing magic is. It's impossible for me. Defective. Defective? Nak wasn't referring to healing magic itself, he seemed to be referring to how he used healing magic. But what did he mean exactly? Did he mean it literally or was there some other meaning? I looked at his extended hand in confusion. Nak looked vexed and continued to explain. I can't heal anyone except myself. Before I came here, I was still able to do it but. I can't do it anymore. He lost the ability to heal others with healing magic? Were there different effects depending on how one strengthened healing magic? The reinforcement of my healing magic didn't result in anything like that. Since when? I noticed it about a year ago. Mina and her group were bullying me as usual. As I was walking back home, I saw an injured familiar. That's when I realized it. You can't operate your healing magic at all except on yourself. Nak nodded. Next to me, Amako was astonished. It seemed like the circumstances were unexpected for her too. Still, why was it that he lost the ability to use healing magic on others? I never heard anything like that from Rose. Was it because the concentration of his healing magic became too thin? No, something like that couldn't just suddenly happen. Olga San was born with his special concentration but Nak clearly didn't fit in this category. The light in Nak's hand looked normal too. If I were to consider one more possibility. Did he develop this condition because of how Mina's group bullied him? I shouldn't think too deeply. If I thought any further down this path, I wasn't confident in keeping my composure. There was a more urgent problem that we had to address first. Healing magic is a magic used only for healing others. That's why, my magic is broken. My magic has lost its only function. Yusato. Amako probably felt that this situation was bad and looked at me with worry. But it wasn't necessary for him to heal others if he decided to participate in tomorrow's training. I smiled and placed a hand on the gloomy Nak's shoulder. It's okay. The process of making you stronger won't require you to use healing magic on others. Eh. If you decide to fight with Mina. Undertake my training for five days. The problem wasn't healing magic but rather his resolve honestly, this kind of training was the equivalent of hell to him. The training was on a level where I couldn't even joke about it. I wouldn't go easy nor would I try to gloss it over with some pretty words. I needed to make sure he had the will to see through this training. Additionally. Broke in? Can't use it anymore? Defective? A magic whose only purpose is to heal others? Telling me that I'm a real and proper healing magician? 
you're completely off. Knack, you've been trying too hard to use healing magic the right way. I wasn't wrong. I wasn't a proper healing magician. It was true that healing magicians were supposed to be like Olga San and Uluru San who specialized in healing others. The first thing that my master taught me wasn't how to heal others. She simply taught me how to heal myself. That's why. It's fine. If you can still do that much, it's enough for you to receive my training and kick the asses of those guys who bullied you. Ha. Huh. Eh. My words appeared too startling for Nak as he stared blankly at me with his mouth partly opened. I wryly smiled and continued to speak. Well, what I'm saying is. I'm not teaching you healing magic. I'll use these five days to train you to a level where you can completely overwhelm that little girl. Me? And Tamina? Of course, it won't be easy. The training tomorrow will be plain and much tougher than you could ever imagine. You might vomit blood, you might scream and cry, you might faint well, I'll use healing magic on you to prevent that. I'll ask you again, Nak. Do you have the resolve to fight against Mina? It might have been an exaggeration to say he would vomit blood but I wasn't necessarily lying. I didn't vomit blood when I trained, it should be fine. After around 10 or so seconds passed, Nak hesitantly spoke. UMM. That's. I feel like the training is scarier than having to fight with Mina. Yet. I won't deny that. Yusato. Amako, stop looking at me with those eyes. It's like you're disappointed in me. There was really no other option here. If Nak wanted to get stronger, he would have to go through the same training Rose gave me. There was also the fact that I didn't know any other ways to get stronger. But don't worry, Nak, you will definitely have an easier time than me. At least, I think so. W.L. If you don't want to, I'll go bow down and apologize to Mina. That's why you don't have to force yourself to fight. There are other paths to take. Nak was looking down on the bed. No matter what his answer is, I won't say anything about it. If you wanted to win, you had to go through this training. In truth, I understood from personal experience just what kind of training you would go through. I didn't want you to experience this training from hell either. Running until I collapsed, only to be revived so I could continue running. Continuing that endless cycle was one of the basics of the rescue squad's healing magic. But you haven't seen true hell until you got past that part. You had to deal with the mental burden too. Waking up in the morning and thinking about the running you had to do for the day wasn't the most pleasant experience. Although you wouldn't be tired or receive any injuries due to healing magic, you would feel a strange sense of pain in your legs. It was the type of training that deteriorated one's mind. But in turn, you'll be rewarded with definite results. You'll still have mixed feelings about it though. Even someone like me. Can win. I'm not making any guarantees. But if you're determined, you'll definitely be rewarded for your efforts. I am proof of that. I obviously wouldn't do the training where I would send him flying in the air every few seconds. It would be more accurate to say that if I did do that, Nak would die. After receiving my words, Nak still looked indecisive. But that was only for a moment. It wasn't long before he looked like someone who had made up his mind. His eyes were still gloomy but I could see a faint spark of light in them now. I'll do it. I'll really do it. I'll defeat Mina. That's why. Please, make me stronger. Well said. I didn't think I would train a healing magician just like Rose. I'll thoroughly temper. And train this boy, Nak, in the rescue squad style of healing magic. I swore this inside my heart. The training will begin tomorrow. For today, be sure to eat well and get plenty of sleep. Since Nak was determined to fight with Mina, the next problem was his body's current condition. He probably didn't eat anything that gave him a good source of nutrition. His complexion was slightly better now thanks to his healing magic being restored but I couldn't ignore his poor health. Healing magic couldn't restore mental fatigue or nutrition, so it was important to eat well. I realized just how important a good source of nutrition was after a session of training. Every cell in my body would scream and demand me to eat something. On the first day I started training and got to eat something at dinner afterwards, I shed tears. No, how should I say it? It wasn't an exaggeration to say that when Tong snatched my food, I felt like a tiger that had just entered a fierce world. UMM. As I indulged in a nostalgic memory, Nak looked around the room restlessly. By the way. Where are we? Ah. What kind of explanation should I give? Should I just honestly tell him this was Kiriha's place? Where other beast kin lived? I don't think this boy had any prejudice against non-humans but... What should I do? Yusato. What is it, Amako? She had the habit of tugging on my sleeve when she wanted my attention. I couldn't see half of her face due to the hood covering it but I could tell she was looking at the door. Sorry, I was too late. Eh? What was too late? As I was about to ask, the door behind me slammed open and someone stepped in. From there, I understood what Amako meant. Senpai had appeared with Satsuki in her arms. 
You said Okun. Could we take this child back with us? Wait. Hey. I told you that you can't. Are you really a hero? Yusato, stop her. And behind her was Q, who requested my help. Senpai was brightly smiling when she first entered and saw me. But she returned to normal after seeing that Nak had gotten up. Amako was hiding under her arms and hood in shame. Nak looked at Senpai who was carrying Satsuki and at Q who was behind the two of them. Lastly, he looked at Amako who had taken off her hood. He was dumbfounded. His mouth flapped open and closed like a fish. He kept looking back and forth between them. Senpai let down Satsuki, she probably felt that the situation wasn't good. She placed a hand on the back of her head and embarrassingly said. ERM, I'm sorry. Needless to say, it would take a while to explain everything to the confused Nak. Yusato brought the healing magician boy, Nak, to my house. Although Yusato had his reasons for bringing him here, I could see from the boy's eyes that he was truly afraid of beast kin like us. But I let him stay here because he still hadn't fully recovered. I recognized Nak. I had seen him quite a few times when our classes did joint training with the juniors. We never introduced ourselves to each other, the main reason was because Nak avoided contact with almost everyone. This was probably because he was targeted by Mina's group and didn't want to get other people involved. He was just bad at talking with others but that wasn't really the problem right now. Nak had to train with Yusato and become strong enough to defeat Mina in five days. Although Mina acted arrogant, she was actually one of the stronger students in her year. Even if she was still learning and developing her explosion magic, it was a type of magic that could display bursts of power in short intervals. Unlike Yusato who had exceptional physical ability, Nax was very poor. I was worried. Just how would he be able to reach a level where he could defeat Mina? It seemed impossible at first glance but I couldn't help but be curious about Yusato who might exceed my expectations. If I remember correctly, he mentioned yesterday they would be heading to the streets. The everyday life for students varied. Every student had some degree of freedom and time to study for their classes. It was possible to graduate earlier if you learned faster than others. Are they really training in town right now? Well, that's what he said yesterday. I was together with my brother. The two of us started and ended our classes at almost the same times. Since we got off early for our afternoon classes, Q and I decided to check on how Yusato and Nak were doing in town. I didn't know what kind of training they were doing. But I did see Yusato's expression before he headed out in the morning. He was expressionless. The training was probably hard. I also remembered Yusato's superhuman strength in the battle against Hafa. I couldn't even begin to imagine what kind of training they were doing. Even if it felt a little scary, I still wanted to take a look. Nei-chan, you didn't see anyone else leave in the morning when Yusato left right? Yeah, at least not that I'm aware of. Yusato woke up earlier than me and I only saw him heading out the door. It seemed like he was going out for Nak's training. I left some bread at the table yesterday for Yusato. When I woke up in the morning, it was gone. It was a good thing he was at least eating breakfast. When Amako woke up, she said she had some matters to attend. I believe she said something about going to a stable. Q, Satsuki, and me. These were the three inhabitants of the house. In a sense, I felt it would be better for more people to eat breakfast together. It unexpectedly felt a little lonely when the two of them didn't eat with us. Maybe I thought that because that strange hero called Inyakami ate with us last night. It was very lively, in various ways. Satsuki is at Inyakami's place. What surprised me was how Satsuki and Inyakamai were kindred spirits. Satsuki was like a fish who had found water. It was quite noisy last night. I let some bitterness show on my face and, dropping my gaze a little, held my forehead in my hand as I spoke. Yeah. I'm going to meet up with Inyakamai. You guys don't need to wait for me. Is what she said. Really, why can't she sit still for just a moment? W.L., it's just a short meeting. It's not a bad thing to meet with a hero called Inyakamai. Although she was very strange, she was still a hero. Inyakamai should have a good influence on Satsuki. Probably. I was still fine with Satsuki and Inyakamai but what really surprised me was Q and Yusato. Q actually opened up his heart a little to a human. Q had been exposed to a lot of malice from humans since his arrival here. After some time, he couldn't look at humans favorably anymore. Nevertheless, that completely disappeared towards Yusato yesterday night. What? You keep staring at my face. No, it's nothing. It was my gentle little brother again. In fact, I'm fairly certain he was pushing himself and tried to act like that. I'm glad. I honestly thought so. But on the other hand, what about myself? Was I forcing myself? And then? It's a little sudden but I just remembered something. Nei-chan, when you sat o punched through that target in the battle against Hafa, you seemed awfully scared. Why? Why you mean yesterday? Due to Q's abrupt words, 
I remembered the scene of Yu Sato piercing through that sturdy target with just his bare hands yesterday. He also extracted his arm afterwards. When I first encountered Yu Sato. What if I ended up just like that target? I couldn't help but shiver when I thought about it like that. I remember clearly how he took a step forward and got ready to punch. He had the same amount of power stored in his fist. There was also the fact that Amako stepped in and stopped him. With her foresight, she probably knew the end result. It probably wouldn't have ended well for me. It didn't matter that he was punching with healing magic. It's nothing at all. Nothing at all you say. If you're fine then I guess it's okay. I sounded a little uncertain but Q reluctantly accepted it. But this was the result I wanted. After Q stared at me for a few seconds doubting my words, he turned to the front again. Seeing as he didn't question me further, I felt relieved. As we kept walking, we noticed the situation on the streets was unusual. W what's going on? Yeah. Did something happen? Whether it was the shopkeepers or the students, they were gossiping about something. Was there something going on? Just what could it be? It isn't strange that the streets are noisy, noisy is normal. However, it usually isn't this lively. There is definitely something. Up ahead. Q said hesitantly. Q. I turned to the direction that Q indicated. Among the people walking on the streets, there was someone who stood out with his ashen grey coloured hair. He also had a suspicious looking smile on his feminine face. Hafa. Oh. Oh my. I unintentionally called out his name as I was lost in my own thoughts. Hafa. The person who had a mock battle with Yusato just the other day. Q and I weren't good at dealing with this guy. He was a magician that fought without holding back at all. He didn't like not being able to fight someone at their full strength. He would immediately try to approach people in a friendly manner as long as they were strong. The worst part was how unpleasant it felt when he had his eyes on you. Q had a bitter expression upon noticing Hafa. Hafa didn't seem to mind and started walking towards us while waving at us and smiling. Hey, you two, you're walking back home. He was an unreserved guy, as always. But why was Hafa here, so far away from the school grounds? He lived in the dorms at school so he rarely came outside. Ah, that's right. Didn't you get injured yesterday? Fu fu fu, you don't need to worry. Yusato's attack transmitted his healing magic throughout my body. That's why I'm safe. But the impact was beyond my imagination was what he indicated as he looked delighted and patted his arm. I was enlightened once more that this person had a mental disorder when it came to fighting. I'm curious as to why this mentally disordered person is here. So, why are you here? Did the principal have orders for you? It was indeed unusual to see him outside of school. I knew for a fact that he didn't use any magic tools and he didn't need to buy anything for classes. The only other possible explanation I could think of was that it was the principal's instructions. Half his magic eyes were convenient in many ways. Since he was able to see the magic quantity of various things, it was a valuable type of magic for research. Instead, Hafa uses his eyes more for combat. If you added in his true abilities and strength, he was one of the few students that Principal Gladys could trust. It was natural to think that Hafa, who seldom came out into town, would be moving according to the principal's orders. Hafa smiled and nodded. Then he replied. It's exactly as you guessed it. The principal requested me to urgently find Yusato and ask him to go to her. Urgently. You didn't know. Hafa tilted his head to the side in surprise. Did Yusato do something that would get him to be called to the principal's office? No, he isn't someone who would do something to draw attention to himself like that. Although he is a little dense and a bit of an airhead at times. I don't know the specifics myself but I heard something about complaints regarding him running all over town. At least that's what the principal said. W what did that guy do now? Running everywhere? In town? And getting complaints? Eh? It definitely isn't something normal if he's troubling the people here. Just what on earth did Yusato do? I don't have the slightest clue. I replied to Hafa, who was voicing his confusion. The average population in Luquis was young, younger than the ones in other countries. It was a lot livelier around here. No one paid any mind to magic flying around as it was an everyday occurrence. From what I heard from the people around here, Yusato should be arriving soon. That's why I'm waiting here. So that's why you came here. Yes, I had to walk all the way here just to see Yusato-san running around in town. Hafa said this with a troubled expression and lightly scratched the back of his head. You sure are talking a lot today. Q commented. Eh. Whenever you usually greet us, we never really talk about anything. That's why I'm honestly surprised right now. He had a point. Whenever we normally talked, Hafa never tried talking to us this much. Q and I didn't have anyone in class we could call friends. We might be acquaintances but the only one who tried talking to us was the whimsical Hafa. There was also Carla Sensei, but she was one of the exceptions. 
she was a human that didn't discriminate against us but it wasn't like we got along either. I don't like talking to someone like you, even now. So you can stop smiling at the fact that you were able to have a real conversation with us. Ha ha ha, you're harsh as always. Q gave a humph, to half his words and half a showed a troubled smile. Q was right, Hafa didn't ignore us but he never really tried to have a proper conversation either. It was unusual for me to talk with a human like this too. I unconsciously realized the reason for it. It was probably because Amako and Yusato came here. Only two days have passed since we met, but these two people definitely didn't have a small influence on me and Q. I hear it's coming here. H hide your familiars. You're joking, right? As I was immersed in these sentimental feelings, I could hear shouts on the streets. What is it? As I wondered this, the students in my surroundings started to hide their familiars in fear. They concealed their familiars by putting them behind their own backs. Eh? What's with this? It's like some sort of dangerous monster is approaching. Why is everyone trying to conceal their familiars? Q and I were bewildered by the students' reactions. It was a fresh and bizarre scene. Only a few moments passed before some sort of loud clatter along with sluggish footsteps started making its way closer. It sounded more like a monster was coming rather than a person. It was impossible since we were in the middle of town but I rolled up the sleeves on my robe and got ready to fight at a moment's notice just as a precaution. Along with Q who was also on his guard, we both took a closer look at what was coming. Up ahead, we couldn't see anything other than the large gate. Wait, why did you come along? Well, I was curious too. After scowling a little at Hafa who followed us, I faced forward again. I followed the main street with my eyes and looked all the way over at the gate. Unlike humans, Beastkin could vividly see things this far. I absent-mindedly stared at the street before a small shadow rushed out from the corner of the street. Hi. Gwa. Ha. Ha. And then? That's. Knack. That small shadow was Knack. He came out on the main street with vigor and started running. Every step he took looked dangerous. It was like he would fall over any moment. His state was, miserable. His face was covered with his tears and snot. He approached us like he was about to die. In any case, I had a bad feeling about this. I was puzzled at first but when I looked behind Knack a blue thing rounded the corner behind him and my thought process screeched to a halt. This blue and white clump was running with their feet on the ground. E. E. I was finally able to discern what that clump was one person and one animal. At the same time I realized what had just appeared, I raised my voice in uncontrollable astonishment. One was on top of the other. The blue was on top of the white. The boy was shouting in fear at the expressionless and strange blue-white clump chasing after him. While lightly carrying a blue monster bear on his back, the boy in white was pursuing the boy desperately trying to run away. It was the healing magician from a foreign country. That person was Yusato. Gladys-san called for me. We caught a glimpse of Yusato's training and were in shock. Yusato noticed us and he was about to continue with the training but Hafa called out to him. He then told Yusato that the principal needed him for something. After hearing that, Yusato let down the monster known as the Blue Grizzly from his back. He stroked the monster on its head and folded his arms in thought. He then proceeded to say. I understand. Then, I'll head there right away. It'd be best if you could. And. That boy, is he fine? And then? You're referring to Nak. Hafa looked perplexed and his eyes stopped on Nak who had lightly fainted on top of the blue grizzly. It looked like Nak was running away from Yusato in fear for his life. But once Yusato called out to him, he looked relieved and collapsed on the spot. He's fine. He's only been running for half a day. After applying some healing magic, I don't think there'll be any problems. Right now, it should be fine to take a little break. No no no. That's not the problem here. Are you some kind of demon? I knew it wouldn't be some ordinary training but this is obviously weird. What kind of training have you been making him do for half a day? Nak wouldn't look like that if you only exhausted all his stamina. And the way you were talking, it's like you plan to do this every morning? First of all, the blue grizzly is a famous and powerful monster you know? It isn't a monster you place on your back. I screamed on the inside while feeling my own character break down. The brute in front of me was momentarily confused before looking troubled. Eh, no. In my case, it's not so bad. I don't qualify as a demon. Yusato was puzzled at my words but he said this with a straight face and a bitter smile. Eh? You're kidding. This guy seriously thinks so? Q and I both drew back from Yusato. On the other hand, Hafa looked in the distance and nodded while smiling. Yes, as expected of Yusato-san. Stop thinking that right now. It annoyed me to think this but Q was the one who had the most composure in this situation. It was a lot different from Hafa who was looking away from reality. It definitely wasn't at the as-expected level. The students around us were getting noisy. 
I couldn't blame them. Fundamentally speaking, we didn't get any chances to fight against wild animals in our lessons. The familiars that the students possessed were ones that didn't have strong fighting capabilities. A powerful monster like the Blue Grizzly was something you normally would never meet since they lived in the deeper regions. Even if you were to meet one, it was normal that you would die to their sharp claws. You wouldn't be able to do any damage to them either due to their thick skin and large build. Even so, there was an abnormal healing magician who was easily lifting up a blue grizzly and running with it right in front of them. You couldn't help but doubt whether they were really human. Fwa. Oh. Gayho. Was this guy who looked like he was on the verge of death, and just now fainted, really fine? Rather than training, it looked more like Yusato was torturing and punishing Nak for losing in a contest. I swallowed the words I was going to say, just as they were at the tip of my tongue. Yusato looked at me suspiciously but seeing as I didn't say anything, he placed his hand on top of the blue grizzly's head and introduced it. Blurin. Ah, it's this little guy's name. He's my partner who also came along for this journey. I finally received permission from Principal Gladys yesterday to take him into town. Guru. While Yusato felt content about receiving permission, he lightly petted Blurin on the head as it grumbled. It seemed like Blurin was getting annoyed by Yusato's constant petting and started to use his front paws to beat on Yusato's legs. The blue grizzly's strength was great and it made a large impact on his legs. However, Yusato's face was still gentle and calm. I drew back even further from him. Okay, so now that I know about Blurin. Why were you carrying a monster and chasing after Nak in broad daylight? Do you just want to make the training harsh? I have a feeling there's another reason for it. No, the things you do are quite weird already though. I thought I should do some training too so carrying Blurin was just an extra. As for Nak running around. I'm limited to only five days so I didn't really have much choice. Extra. That's only extra. I received a shock like never before. Adding Yusato's previous fight and now with this blue grizzly. I really wanted to scream. The time I'm being given to train him is simply not enough. I can't be completely cold and heartless either though. Which is unfortunate since his training could be more efficient. There's also no way to temper his entire body in such a short span of time. That's why, I thought I'll at least train his legs. The only thing he has to do is just run, it's not that difficult. I won't shout at him, I won't kick him into the skies, I'll allow him to faint and cry. I'm even willing to listen to his requests. That person is really unreasonable compared to me. It seemed like Yusato was trying to convey that as he gave a dry laugh and smiled. Seeing his expression made me recognize that real healing magicians were truly frightening existences. Once I return back to my hometown, I'll be sure to tell everyone healing magicians are bad news. Well, if I temper his legs, he'll be able to run away and increase his stamina. The basics of the group I'm in called the rescue squad in Lingle start with running. I'm alive and well thanks to that training. I was also able to save a large number of people because of it. But I really don't intend for Nak to go through what I did. Incidentally, what did you go through? I got left in forest rampant with monsters for 10 days and I couldn't go home unless I took down a grand grizzly. I was made to endlessly do push UPS until I was told to stop. I did some evasion training with the leader where I would continuously try to dodge her fists. The others were. No, that's enough. Seriously, just how are you still alive and standing here? After I stopped Yusato from continuing, Kyo commented. I couldn't help but question on the inside was he really human? Yusato mentioned something, a leader, right? The person who taught him healing magic? Could she be actually a demon disguised as a human? I stiffly smiled at Yusato as he looked stumped. At first I thought this is too harsh and thought about running away many times. However, I realized that all of it was necessary so I don't have any regrets. I think. I'm positive about one thing though. I wouldn't have met Blurin were it not for the training. I guess a lot happened. I was very curious about just what kind of events led Yusato to form such a relationship with this blue grizzly. It must be quite the story. I understood just from looking that Blurin had a lot of trust in Yusato. It was different from a master and familiar relationship. Something that was hard to perceive between one human and one animal. Seeing the harmonious relationship between him and the blue grizzly, I dazedly muttered. That's nice. Hearing my voice, both Q and Hafa turned their attention to me. Leaving aside Q, I didn't want Hafa to have some weird misunderstanding. I felt flustered and waved my arms from side to side. Eh, um. No, I just thought that this little guy is cute. Eh? Nei-chan, are you being for real? You're not frightened. However, I would regret trying to make some random excuse to gloss over something I unconsciously muttered because. Yusato suddenly interjected after Q spoke. That's right, he's cute right? Want to pet him? And pushed Blurin towards me. Blurin who was being displayed. He snorted and gave a humph. He was also glaring at me. And. No, I'll pass. 
Yusato, you have to go see the principal, right? Shouldn't you hurry? That's true. There's also Nak's training too. We can always do this another time. I felt relieved. Even if Yusato could guarantee that Blurin was obedient, it was still a blue grizzly. Petting such a large monster still required a lot of courage. I should get going soon. Hafasan will you also be heading to Principal Gladys? I still have something I want to buy so I'll bid farewell to you here. I see. Then, Kiriha and Q. Ah, I won't be back till sundown today so. Sorry to inconvenience you guys, but could you also prepare next dinner? I don't mind. There's not much difference in adding one or two more people's portions. Thank you. Let's go, Blurin. Feeling reassured, he thanked me. Blurin turned toward the school and growled. A healing magician that was a young man in a white uniform and a big monster bear. He placed the bear along with the boy on his back like he caught some big game. Afterwards, he started walking. How should I say it? It was quite odd and bizarre. We didn't even talk for that long but I felt like I was very tired. Yusato is unbelievable, in a lot of ways. Yeah. But he's an example others should follow. I think. Next to Kyu who looked in admiration. That was the only thing I could say as I watched Yusato walk away. In the middle of Nak's training, I met Kiriha's group and just said goodbye to them. I was headed to the school along with Blurin and an unconscious Nak to meet Principal Gladys. I left these two to wait outside and entered the principal's room. The moment I entered and our eyes met, Gladys-san gave a big sigh. You're really too much. ERM. Gladys-san was completely baffled. As expected, it seems like I overdid it a little with the training in town. I was used to the environment in Lingle but it was clearly not the same here. I'm sorry, I'll find a different place to run next time. I'm not talking about that, you know? UMM, perhaps you don't know. You're talking about the training I did in town right? As for Blurin, I received permission yesterday. Nothing else comes to mind. I certainly gave you permission to take your blue grizzly out. But. That was because I thought you would take it out for a walk. Not carry it yourself. How could I have imagined that you would run around town while carrying a blue grizzly? She had a point. If you thought about it carefully, it was abnormal. It was only because the people in Lingle were used to it. I just thought the people in Luquis wouldn't mind seeing me run around with a monster haha. Yet. I lost self-control for a moment. Let's get to the topic at hand. I heard the gist of what happened yesterday but if possible, could you tell me in detail? I understand. I gave a simple explanation of what happened yesterday and how Nak was now currently training under me. After finishing my explanation, Gladys San looked bewildered. I am truly sorry. The students here have caused you a lot of trouble. No, I decided to meddle in these affairs on my own so. Even so, it was a blunder for me to leave her alone. The girl called Minalai Ashia. Did Gladys San view that girl as a problem child? I thought she was just some neighborhood bully but it seemed like someone really troublesome had their eyes on Nak. Can't the school do something about her? It's complicated. As the person in charge here, I can say we would lose a lot of trust from her family, and they are giving aid to this school. The nobles are quite troublesome. They possess a large network to exchange information with others. If any scandals happened, they would report it and everyone would know. Luquis isn't a completely independent country. This country is mostly being supported by donations from nobles. In other words, you have to take careful consideration before doing anything to that girl. Yes, that would be the case. What's with that? That was just too absurd. But I did understand Gladys San's reasons. There wasn't a lot that could be done since this matter could negatively impact the whole country. But that didn't mean Mina could do whatever she wanted, right? In my former world, Mina would be one of those selfish kids who had monster parents that would come complain to the teachers. But at least there were still several ways to resolve situations like that. But it was different here in Luquis. The nobles here provided backing to this country. Were it not for them, Luquis wouldn't be able to function and maintain itself as a country. I couldn't help but compare the two since the environment in Luquis was similar to the schools back at home. I couldn't entirely accept how things were being run in Luquis. It was a bit of a sarcastic way of expressing it, but the times here were really ahead of me. You need a place to train that healing magician, right? Gladys San who had been silent for some time suddenly spoke. Eh, well, yes. Deciding to run in town was a little rash of me. I was thinking about where else I could bring him to train. Then you can use the training grounds here. It should at least be a better environment for him to train than in the town. The people with important roles here can't interfere with the students' matters but I'm personally hoping that the healing magician boy will succeed. It might feel like I'm saying this because it's convenient for me. It was certainly something convenient for her. She didn't do anything to Mina and looked the other way, that was the truth. But it wasn't like I had any right to say anything so I had no intention to lecture her. 
Even if I didn't say anything, Gladys San already knew. Leaving that aside, I should be thinking about the new training spot. The training grounds that Gladys San mentioned probably referred to the place where I fought Hafasan yesterday. It was spacious there so Nak and Bluren should have no problems running around. I then proceeded to ask Gladys San regarding the usage of the training grounds. After a few minutes, I learned that the training grounds were open to everyone this week. It was made available to everyone because of the mock battle competition. The other students still had to attend class so they wouldn't be using the training grounds often. So until the school closed for the day, I was basically free to use it as much as I wanted. In that case, I should get back to the training right away. Gladys San, I apologize for raising such a commotion. Don't run around in town anymore, you hear. Well then, I should wake up the unconscious Nack and resume the training. Nack should be fine now since he had a long break, there were still a lot of things I wanted to try out too. Since I came all the way to a magic school, it wasn't a bad idea to polish my own healing magic and reinforcement too. I guess I really do like training. As I wryly smiled to myself, I started to walk. But just as I took a few steps down the hallway, I saw a tall and familiar woman. Hello there, Carla San. Ooh, if it isn't you Sato? Why are you at the school? Did you have something to attend to? Rather than something to attend to, I was called here. I'm already finished though. Carla San's aura resembled roses. Well, since Carla San was passing along here, I guess she had some business with Gladys San. I didn't want to get in the way. I should end the conversation and hurry along. I lightly bowed and tried to pass her. As I was thinking of returning back to Bluren and Neck. For some reason, Carla San stepped in front of me, blocking my path. Eh, but why? U.M.M. How about talking with me for a bit? Ah, uh, don't worry about me. My matter isn't urgent. I don't need to see the principal right away. We'll walk as we talk. If that was the case then I didn't really mind. But I felt a little uneasy. It felt like Rose was next to me so I couldn't compose myself. There's also only one topic that came to mind in a private conversation with Carl Lassen. I think you already noticed it but I know your master. But of course. There was only one person who I thought of as my master who also happened to be my superior. It seemed like she knew quite a bit about these matters. I should take this opportunity to ask some questions that were on my mind. You know leader? You're referring to the one in Lingle's rescue squad, right? Yeah, I used to be a knight in Lingle before coming here to teach. That's when, I got to meet Rose. At that time, she was the youngest. I have a lot of respect for her as climbed to her original status with her own strength. You could also say she's my goal. I had a rough idea that Rose's position wasn't ordinary. But from the way that Carl Lassen described, it seemed quite exceptional. Thinking about Rose's true abilities though, it wasn't that strange. To begin with, that person was beyond normal. When did you first meet? I still remember. Even though it was five years ago, I can still recall it. I wasn't her subordinate but I did learn the basics from her a couple of times. She was strong. It was plain and simple. Her physical ability was remarkable enough to smash apart steel swords. Yui. Just how much of a monster is she? Even I haven't attempted to smash apart steel with my bare hands. I didn't have any chances to do so but I also wasn't confident I would be able to do it. Seeing my reaction to Rose's past, Carla San showed a bitter smile before lightly laughing. Haha, is that something you should say? From what I can see, you belong in the same category. First of all, you overcame her healing magic training. It would be best that you realized you're definitely not normal anymore. I'm still only halfway there. At the very least, it's nothing much when compared to Leader. I felt a little annoyed since she basically implied that I was a monster. I knew just how strong my own body had become. But to say I was in the same category as Rose would just be rude to her and was something I personally couldn't accept. It wasn't like I desired to obtain her strength. I simply respected her and becoming a healing magician like her was one of my objectives. I was still far from reaching a passing mark from Rose. It was vexing. As far as I'm concerned, your strength is more than sufficient. At the very least, the reinforcement you possess exceeds the majority in your age group. What happened to Leader? She wasn't in Rescue Squad before, right? You mentioned she held some exceptional status. I wasn't good at dealing with being praised openly like this. I might feel a little elated if I got any more praise. That was why I decided to shift topics. However, it seemed like I asked something I shouldn't have. It was only for a moment but Carla San looked startled. UMM, was that something I shouldn't have asked? No. She made the rescue squad before the revival of the Mu. Lingle had fought the demons in the past as well, although it wasn't much. Even when the two sides met, they rarely clashed against each other. Were there some issues with the demons even before the Mu's revival? While I stared at the empty hall, I visualized in my mind when Lingle is still at peace. 
but the image in my mind didn't seem that different from the present. The only real conflict at the time was the discord with the non-humans. Even with that, it was peaceful. It would have stayed that way, were it not for that. That. No. As I voiced my doubt, Carla San cleared her throat and dodged my inquiry. What's with that? It's obvious you're hiding something. Suspicious. You're acting too suspicious, Carla San. As I was about to press her for an answer, Carla San, who was in front of me, stopped walking. She turned around, and, with a serious expression, Carla San looked me in the eyes. Thinking about it. This really isn't something I should be telling you. If you want to hear about it, you should ask her yourself. But I can at least say this. You. Are a very precious existence to Rose. You're exaggerating quite a bit. It didn't seem like she was joking. Just what did she know and what happened to Rose? I don't know. No matter how I thought about it, I didn't have the slightest idea. To begin with, what did she exactly mean when she said I'm a precious existence? A precious group member. I don't think so. But I really don't have a clue. As I was pondering, Carla San was already walking in the opposite direction. I was dumbfounded as she waved her hand at me and then disappeared at the other end of the hallway. Ha! Huh. This isn't the time to be standing still. I ended up losing some of Nak's training time. I had to make sure he got some light running done today so his body could adjust and quickly get used to it. He had to at least be able to operate his healing magic and run at the same time tomorrow. I turned around and jogged to my destination. Perhaps I took too long with my conversation with Carla San. After a few moments, I finally reached Blurin and Nak who were at the front entrance. I made you wait, Blurin. Well, I still need to wake Nak up. He's been resting for at least 30 or so minutes. He should be fine now. Seriously, I was too soft. Rose would definitely never give me this much time to rest. Nak was lying on top of Blurin and drooling in his sleep. I lightly shook Nak and called out to wake him up. After several seconds of repeating this process, Nak groaned and came to his senses. You okay? H huh? You sad to san? I I. Why was I sleeping? Ah, ah, that's right. I had a scary dream. I was being chased by a monster and I almost died. Nnn. What happened? He said he had a scary dream. Well, I've heard that people have nightmares when they sleep for only a short amount of time. It was nothing to worry about. His body looks fine, we should head to the training grounds right away. Well, let's go. Eh. Eh. You're going to do it right. Nak looked petrified. It looked like he had no idea what I was talking about. Then he finally realized he was on top of Blurin's back. He looked like he received another shock. He slowly and rigidly turned his head to me like a broken puppet. W what am I going to do? Continue with the training. The light in Nak's eyes disappeared for just a moment. The results of Nak's training for day one were not bad. His stamina was still a problem. We still had four days left so I wasn't too concerned but he still lacked the speed I desired. His endurance would gradually grow as he continued to train but I could only hope that his speed would also increase during that process. And lastly, there was also his healing magic that I had to take into consideration. It was difficult to use healing magic and run at the same time if you weren't used to it. Nak would have a hard time. In my case, I started by using healing magic and running at the same time. I was forcefully made to remember that sensation, whether I liked it or not. Since Nak had been using healing magic in a normal way all this time, it would probably be difficult for him to use it while exercising. Well, as long as he gets used to it, it'll work out one way or another. On the second day of Nak's training, Blurin was chasing after Nak on school's training grounds while I was pondering over my own training. Amako, who had a hood over her head, was sitting next to me as she watched Nak. For these past few days, she was at the stable along with the other knights. But since I took Blurin with me, she had nothing to do and came here to look at Nak's training. This is really the worst. So this is Rose's legacy that I'm passing on. Her brute and savage ways of using healing magic. It hurts my conscience a little to train him like this. That name for the training doesn't sound normal at all. Ha ha ha, there's no way it would be normal at all. It's leader we're talking about after all. Yusato, you're the one using this kind of training as a last resort. You're not normal either. How rude. My training yesterday can't be compared to that demon's. It wasn't like I kept healing Nak after he exhausted all his stamina and forced him to keep running. Compared to that, I would say I was the gentle one. Amako was looking at me with pity for some reason. You can't make Nak become something like you, Yusato. Hey, it's like you're saying my way of learning magic was weird to begin with. As you're someone who overcame that training, I can't consider you anything else but weird. Eh? Uh, hey? I was the weird one? But at that time, I just desperately trained. My memories were also a little vague. I felt that I progressed a lot though. 
W.L., let's leave that aside for a moment. I had to focus on Nax training right now. Escaping Amako's pitying eyes, I turned my attention to Blurin who was running after Nak. Nak's pace was gradually slowing down. Blurin would slow down his own speed to match Nak's. He did it very discreetly so that it was almost unnoticeable. This won't do, this really won't do. The true bane of training was taking it easy. Although Nak wasn't a formal member for the rescue squad, I couldn't allow Blurin to have an easy time. Nak, your speed has dropped. Blurin. You're not here to relax and have fun. You're a monster right? Then act like one. While only giving Nak a warning, I shouted harshly at Blurin. Despite how I gave a gentle warning, for some reason, Nak was the one who accelerated as his eyes overflowed with tears. As for Blurin, he was carefree and growled a few times as if to say yet, yeah, yet. Yeah. I got it before raising his own speed to match Nak's. The both of them seemed to giving it their all now. I could understand Blurin's reaction but why was Nak? As I tilted my head to the side, Amako removed her hands from her ears. She looked at Nak who was dazedly running with all he had and said. It was effective. It was super effective. Yusato, you were trying to be gentle but Nak would obviously try even harder and would desperately give it his all if he was treated like that. As expected of you, Yusato. Just how many times do you plan to surprise me on this journey before you're satisfied? Why are you convincing yourself with that? But in response, Amako just kept on nodding. Even so, it was a good thing that Nak had the motivation to strive for more. In the worst case scenario, Nak would just be running at a slower pace. It would be fine as long as he could keep going. Unlike Felm, Nak was a healing magician and would use his healing magic unconsciously if he was about to faint. Because he would always get surrounded and beaten, it was no surprise he would activate his healing magic on instinct. However, this wasn't good enough. Nak couldn't just operate his healing magic with autopilot. The minimum result I desire from Nak is for him to use healing magic while moving. He should also have fortified his stamina during this period of time. Amako, can you use your ability to see the future while running? Sort of. My magic requires a tremendous amount of concentration, so I can't see that far in the future while I'm running. I was trained to run and use healing magic at the same so I don't really get it. Could you advise me? Am I going about this in the wrong way for Nak's training? Amako looked away from Nak who was running and turned to me with a troubled gaze. Honestly, I don't know since there has been no precedent. But I can say this. It's already wrong for a healing magician who isn't supposed to fight to be training to fight. But, Yusato. Your methods are strict, unreasonable, and you have a screw loose in your head so the results you desire make sense. Even though it's unreasonable and you have a screw loose in your head. You don't need to say it twice. I thought this before but your words are really sharp. Still, to think there was no precedent. It just means it hasn't been tried before. In that case, I'll continue on this path. Training itself would never betray you. I was fully aware of that. Anyhow, I should do my best too. I had such a good spot to train it would be a waste to not make use of it. While I paid close attention to Nak's training, I started to apply the idea for my magic that I thought of yesterday. What are you trying to do? Trying to see if I could use healing magic at a distance. I wasn't trying to be like Kazuki and use my magic at attack an opponent from a distance. I just wanted to see if I could create and fire a ball of magic. As for how to exactly do that, I wasn't sure. I would just experiment and try to get a feel for it. Yusato, so what you mean is you want to fire a sphere like other offensive magic? Something like that. Although my healing magic is continuously increasing and I can deploy it throughout my body, there will definitely come a time where I won't be able to heal someone unless I can get closer. If I could make it so my healing magic could be fired and fly a certain distance to heal someone, it would surely come in handy. Currently, my healing magic could cover my entire body while healing wounds and fatigue over time. This was the end result of Nak's training. From here on out, I would be attempting the unknown. Something that Rose hasn't taught me. Or it could be that she felt that there was no need to teach me this. If Rose was here, she could probably give me the appropriate advice. But since she wasn't here, I could only rely on myself to find a solution. I closed my eyes. I slowly emitted healing magic in my right hand and the light gradually grew brighter. My control over magic seemed better than the average person. I kept on gathering magic in the palm of hand until it formed a sphere. I tried to think of a strong image inside my head. In Yukami Senpai, she would unleash her lightning from her palm like an electrical discharge. Kazuki, he would create a sphere of magic by gathering the light in his surroundings. The image I had in my mind was a pretty and green sphere. I didn't need to reinforce it, I just needed to gather enough magic power to completely fill this sphere. I certainly felt a sense of magic power on my palm. I opened my eyes, and in my palm was. It was easier than I expected. It's a bit anticlimactic. Just like the image in my mind, there was a sphere of magic lightly floating in my hand. 
It wasn't that difficult. Hey? I thought I would have more trouble. While I had this doubt, Amako let out a sigh. This result is obvious. Forming a sphere is one of the basics of magic. Whether it be humans or beastkin, this is the basics of the basics. You could say it's strange that you haven't done this till now. Well, getting beaten up was the basics of the basics for healing magic. Amako averted her eyes from me and looked at the sphere in my hand. The sphere was floating and would follow wherever my hand moved. All right. Tisk. Looks like she found out. Since I wanted to test this sphere of healing magic, I moved it closer to Amako. But as it was about to make contact with her, Amako jumped backwards. She looked at me in astonishment. Did you just try to push that sphere towards me just now? What are you talking about? Do you think I would do something like that to you? Nope, it's impossible. You definitely clicked your tongue just now. I saw it too, I would have been enveloped in a green light if I didn't dodge just now. Other than your healing magic, Yusato, who else could have done it? Her body would be enveloped in a green light? I see. When this sphere makes contact with someone, all the magic in it would be used to heal them. This is convenient. Releasing this sphere might not be faster than healing someone directly. The sphere could also only heal a fixed amount. Still, this could be useful in emergencies. Huh? <laughs> my bad. I didn't realize that the magic in my hand would fly towards you, Amako. Mew. At any rate, it seems like this sphere had a practical use and I was able to get some revenge on Amako. I felt very satisfied and couldn't help but smile upon remembering some of my bad friends in my former world. Amako was glaring at me and angrily huffing. I warded it off with a laugh. I moved to a target and stood about 10 meters away from it. Well, it'll probably fly out if I cut off my connection to this sphere. I extended my right arm and aimed it at the target in front of me. I formed an image of me launching the sphere in my head. When I first started using healing magic, I would have some sort of image in my head so I was very used to this process. There shouldn't be any problems. While imagining a bomb, sound effect, the magic ball fired. Seeing that the sphere easily fired out from my hand, I raised my voice in excitement. Oh, oh. I was confused since after the initial acceleration when the sphere fired out, it quickly decelerated before completely disappearing. I retried this process multiple times but the result was the same. But why? It looks like emitting and firing magic is not one of your strong points, Yusato. This. Well, we all have our strong and weak points. After arriving this far, I discovered a fatal weakness. It seemed I wasn't good at controlling magic at a distance. The initial acceleration was good but... Actually, didn't it only start that fast because I was pushing the sphere with my hand? My happiness was short-lived. Wait a moment. The initial speed was because I pushed my arm out to accelerate it, right? If that was the case, couldn't I put more power into it? It should at least fly a certain distance before losing speed. In the first place, I didn't need to control my strength at all for something like this. I didn't have the magic talent anyways. I didn't need to restrict myself to the conventional way of firing magic. If so, I should use my own method to make it so this sphere could have a practical use in a real battle. My own way of doing things. In other words, making use of my strength. Yusato, there's nothing you can do about it. Everyone is born with different qualities. You're already strong enough. I still have something up my sleeve. Amako. Eh. I concentrated once more and formed a sphere of magic in my hand. While tightly gripping the orb in my hand, I twisted my body a little. I didn't need the magic talent to emit and fire magic. I won't give up so easily. I'm stubborn like that. I raised my arms up. My right arm swung down and threw the magic ball in my right hand at the same time like a pitcher. They, re, at. The ball of healing magic continued to fly forward with tremendous speed and it showed no sign of dropping it then crashed right into the target and the light scattered. Hmm. My aim is a little off. Well, I didn't have much interest in any sports back in my former world. There's no helping it that my accuracy isn't that good. I'll just have to improve by continuously training. As I exhaled out with a few, I looked at the spot that I hit. This time, I fired at around a distance of 20 meters. I was very close to hitting my mark. But since this ball of healing magic didn't have any weight, I probably couldn't throw it very far. It's perfect. No no no, it's strange. Throwing magic that has no weight is a little. This is my own technique, the healing magic ball. Strange, strange, strange. Amako kept repeating dazedly while her body swayed back and forth like a metronome. I bitterly smiled at her reaction and turned my attention back to Nak. Nak was running along with Blurin just like before but he suddenly lost his balance and fell forward. Oh. I could see he was forcing himself to maintain that pace. Before he fell onto the ground, I had already jumped out to catch him. 
although he was somewhat far away, I was able to quickly close the distance and support him. You all right, Nak? Ha! Ha! I'm, so, rry. He didn't exhaust his magic, he just couldn't concentrate enough to heal his fatigue. I applied some healing magic on his back. His complexion gradually got better despite his rough breaths. As expected, it's a little hard for you to use healing magic while running. Yes. It's not like I can't do it. But as soon as I lose concentration for even a moment, it breaks apart. You aren't used to it yet so it can't be helped. Even I wasn't able to do this in just one day, no need to rush. We still have four days. You could also say we only have four days. Well, I could also train him to dodge my attacks and make his body learn to automatically use healing magic when necessary. But that wouldn't allow Nak to freely use healing magic while in motion so. Only in the worst case scenario. Nak has really been trying his best. He's been taking a break from his important studies and focusing everything on his training for this week. He truly desired to train. However, even if he was giving it his all, I still had to consider what to do if things don't go as planned. As I was hesitating and thinking of what to say to Nak, I saw a familiar figure looking at Nak from the entrance. This person had twin tails and was laughing as she looked at Nak being supported by me. That hairstyle, it was Minahui. I thought she came here to train but after laughing at Nak, she turned around and headed back to the school. She came here to jeer at him, really, she's. Her personality was really bad. She also left without doing any training here. She was basically saying she was confident she could win even without doing anything. Either way, there was no need to be concerned over it. Suppressing and cooling my own thoughts, I continued to heal Nak. After I finished, I propped him up. Nak held one hand against his head and turned his back to me. She's, always like that. She treats me like a fool and always verbally insults me. But I. Whether it be magic or anything else, I'm inferior to her so I can't talk back. Nak, you don't need to mind it. Of course I mind. After all. Before I got driven out to this place, it wasn't like this at all. Just because I have healing magic, everyone changed. They had no choice but to change. Even though I don't want to be here, what can I do? I have no place to return to. No place to return to? This place, he was referring to Luquis. While I was slightly puzzled at Nak's words, he continued to talk. It was like he was trying to spill out everything inside his mind and express his sorrow. Yusato-san, this training will make me stronger, right? I'll be able to win against Mina? Really? Even someone like me? Nak suddenly became silent upon realizing what he had just said. After a moment of silence, Nak spoke again as if to smooth over the awkward situation. I'm sorry. I was saying things that didn't make any sense for no reason. Please, don't worry about what I just said. No, of course I'm going to worry. From his own words, there seemed to be something much more important to address than Nak's fight with Mina. I'm very grateful to you, Yusato-san. However, the only thing I've been doing these past two days is running. I know it's very disrespectful for me to doubt you but... This training, I can't see the meaning of it. No. But before I continued speaking, I paused upon seeing Nak's back. I was about to say no, if you have time to worry about something like that, you should focus on training. It felt like such a natural response that I couldn't help but be shocked. At myself. That won't do. Rose was having a bad influence on me. He was burdened by a lot of things. I couldn't just say something that excessive and merciless to him. I took a deep breath and erased the words I was going to say from my head. I thought of some kinder words to say to Nak and spoke. It's not a matter of can you win or not, it's you will win. Mina is also underestimating you. This isn't a bad thing. Since she has her guard down, you can take advantage of it. Because she won't expect an attack from you, this is why I'm training you so you have more offensive capabilities. That's why. Do your best. Do my best, you say. Upon hearing my words, Nak nodded and started to run again. I still had some mixed thoughts about his words just now. Spotting Blurin who was lying down and slacking off, I woke him up. Don't slack off, don't slack off. Gyoha. Hey, Nak's going to overtake you. I forcefully pulled Blurin up and he started running once more. I looked over at the scene of Nak and Blurin running, and it got me thinking. It probably looked like this when Rose saw me and Blurin training together before. Back in the rescue squad, I only saw the backs of that scary bunch with their ridiculous stamina haha. But when I saw the young Nak running along with Blurin, it gave me a mysterious feeling. Master and disciple, hey. While I nonchalantly murmured this, I moved to a spot where I wouldn't be in the way of their training. Thinking about it carefully, it was around this time when I noticed it. Because of the appearance of Mina who caused a lot of suffering for Nak, I thought everything would be resolved as long as he could defeat her by himself. But I was wrong. 
the darkness he carried was much crueler and harsher than Inyakumai Senpai and I had thought. I realized it during the morning for the third day of training. At first, I thought he already left and was doing his own training. After all, he wasn't in the bedroom that Kiriha lent him. But he wasn't at the training grounds. Oh my, is he late because he did some independent training and overdid it. I thought, then waited one hour with Blurin. At the moment that I started to doubt whether Nak would show up or not, Amako arrived. She came a bit late but when she pointed out her suspicions, I finally realized it. The reality and fact that Nak ran away from training. I ended up running away. The training was harsh. I didn't want to fight Mina. I didn't want to waste any more time and effort in something pointless. I didn't want to look like a fool. I had a lot of reasons. No, I had a lot of excuses. Either way, it only made me realize once again how pathetic and weak my own existence was. My fate might have already been set in stone when I discovered I had healing magic. It was also possible that I was fated to live a miserable life the moment I was born. You you you. I was sitting in a back alleyway devoid of people. This was a convenient place for me since non-humans didn't pass through here. As I stared at the ground, I felt a sense of helplessness tormenting my body. Around the time Mina and her group started to bully me, I found this place and would always escape here. No one else came here. No one would talk to me anyways, so this was my own secret hiding spot. Even if someone discovered this alley, there was nothing special about it so they would easily forget about it. I felt truly at peace here. You you. You you you. I was crying here like usual. Without the need to worry about feeling any sense of shame or stares from others, I cried. I always cried here when I got bullied but I was crying for a different reason today. I'm. Sorry. I'm. S.O.R. Re. I ran away. I ran away from you Sato. No, I ran away from Mina. Just from seeing the look on Mina's face yesterday, and how she was laughing and looking down at me. I couldn't help but feel a real sense of fear. It was pathetic of me but I understood something from that. Mina could only make an expression like that due to the confidence she obtained from abusing me for all these years. She was insane. My body trembled. Whether I wanted it or not, the faint hope that I had for victory disappeared just like that. I thought I had matured a little. Even though I had a burdensome healing magic attached to me and my life was messed up, I thought I would grow. Then, I would become as strong as Yusato one day. With those thoughts alone, I was somehow able to stick with the training. Even when I felt like I would faint, I gritted my teeth and held my ground. When a blue grizzly chased after me, I desperately ran, fearing that it would take my life. Yusato-san would never shout at me harshly so I would frantically try my best to be recognized. But the moment I faced Mina's pure malice, my thoughts cooled down instantly. It was called training but all I did was run. What was the point of training my legs? Why did I have to use healing magic as I ran? Was there a reason I had to experience something so painful? Aren't there other ways? To win? Stop it. This is wrong. I'm just making up convenient excuses. There was definitely a good reason for Yusato san's training. Despite only training for a few days, I felt some differences in my body. My body felt lighter and my stamina went up by quite a bit. These were the results of training for just two days. There was nothing wrong with Yusato san's training. It was obviously me who was wrong. I was supposed to meet Yusato san right now and train. Instead, I was sitting here in such a sorry state and drowning in despair. I'm, an idiot. I was afraid of fighting Mina. There was nothing I dreaded more than fighting against her. If I lost against her, something even worse would happen to me. I didn't want to imagine what exactly would happen but it wouldn't be strange for Mina to come up with something to exceed my expectations. In that case, remaining like this was just fine. It was fine as long as the unfortunate things only happened to me. But if I lose against Mina, Yusato-san and the other hero beside him would have to compensate. Since I ran away from the duel, I would be the one to shoulder all the blame. I didn't want anyone to have any expectations for me. It was better to not cling on to some small hope. It was fine as long as I was the only one who was hurt. Since all I could do was heal myself, I didn't mind being hurt. By doing this, no one would expect anything from me. I would also not have any expectations for someone to help me. Whether it was Yusato-san, that hero, or the beast girl Kiriha-san who lent me a place to sleep. None of them would have anything to do with me anymore. Yu Yu. Yu Yu Aha. My tears kept flowing as I immersed myself in my own thoughts. I started to recall what I did in the past two days. It was nothing but difficult training. Despite this training being pushed onto me, it was done with good intentions in mind. I experienced kindness again from others for the first time in a while. Yusato-san tried to train someone as useless as me. He didn't abandon a failure of a healing magician like me. No matter how many times I lost consciousness, he would encourage me. When I was exhausted and couldn't move, 
he would carry me back to Kirihasan's house and allow me to eat some warm cooking. I remembered the scene of Yusato-san talking cheerfully with the family of Beastkin. They had crossed the set barriers that usually divided them. Kirihasan, Kyusan, and Satsuki didn't frown at Yusato-san even once. Since I always ate dinner alone, this scene felt especially vivid and bright in my memory. Yu Yu. Ah. Ah. I destroyed everything with my own hands. I wouldn't be able to experience something like that again. I didn't have a future anymore. At the very least, these warm memories allowed me to temporarily forget about that. Unpleasant family of mine. This time, I really had nothing left. I could only wait for Mina to carry out her punishment on me. But this was my own fault. I was the one who gave up. I just hope that my actions don't inconvenience Yusato-san and his friends. As long as I would bear the burden alone, I will accept any of Mina's conditions. Everything will be over with that. I swallowed my own sobs and frantically used my sleeves to wipe my tears. Let's go. I wasn't a beastkin but I will kneel down if Mina tells me to. No matter what she tells me to do, I will do it. Instead of trying to fight Mina and miserably lose to her, it was better for me to choose the path that would lessen my pain by admitting defeat. I should go. All right, I found you. Eh. Just as I was about to get up, I heard a cheerful voice. It resounded in this narrow alleyway and felt out of place. Upon hearing that voice, my legs felt weak and I sat back down where I was. I turned toward where the voice came from, there stood a young man who wore a white coat in this dark and gloomy space. Since it was so dark, I couldn't see his face. But from his built and voice alone, I knew who it was. My mouth unconsciously moved and said. Yusato-san. Finding Nak was quite easy. Although I say it was easy, I would have had a difficult time finding Nak by myself. But with Blurin and Amako here, the story changed. I used Blurin's nose to track Nak's scent first. Following Blurin, we got the general idea and direction of where Nak was. As we followed Blurin, Amako would look into the future. She would check different paths we had taken in the future and see whether or not Nak was there. Blurin basically narrowed down our search area while Amako pinpointed Nak's position. It was the perfect combination and coordination. Although I was completely useless. As a result, we were able to easily find Nak. When I first spotted him, he was sobbing and I panicked. Was my training really that tough? You're kidding right? I thought I did my best to be as gentle as possible. Rose never gave me any breaks but I would give them frequently to Nak. Wait. Wasn't giving breaks during training something obvious to begin with? A eh, anyhow. I ignored the condemning gazes from the fox girl and bear behind me and walked towards Nak. I'll try talking to him one on one. I did my best and called out to him in the friendliest voice possible. Seeing Nak's response, it looked like he was willing to talk so I sat next to him. The sun's rays didn't reach this alleyway so the ground was nice and cool. Nak looked at me when I sat down but hung his head in shame shortly after. Ah, uh, eh, how? This town isn't that big. Finding you was no trouble for us. Even though I sounded confident, I didn't actually do anything. Seeing Nak looking at me with surprise and shock, I couldn't help but laugh a little at myself. Sorry. Looks like I was a little too strict with you. I should have realized that since it was still my first time trying to teach someone. I still have a long way to go. That's, not it. I ran away. It's not your fault, Yusato-san. I. I was intimidated by Mina and lost my resolve to fight against her intimidated. It looked like it wasn't the training's fault. Then why was he here crying? I tilted my head to the side in confusion as Nak started to explain. After listening to his explanation, it was evident that he was scared of Mina. This wasn't as simple as I thought. Mina was deeply embedded in Nak's psyche. She was powerful enough to completely crush Nak's determination just by meeting him. Nak's image of Mina was probably beyond my imagination. Is Mina bullying you because you're a healing magician? I didn't ask this before since it was a sensitive topic. However, I couldn't leave things as they now that we've come this far. Back in my hometown, we were just acquaintances. But my family was on good terms with her family. So they were nothing but acquaintances and their families got along. Hey? If I recall correctly, Mina was the daughter of a noble. Did that mean that Nak belonged in the same class? It didn't really make sense. If Nak was a noble just like Mina, then Mina should treat Nak the same since they were similar. But the reality was completely different. I understand your doubts. Yusato-san. My family indeed belongs to the noble class. Even within the nobles, my family is the most influential. I'm aware I lived quite a good life before coming here. Could you explain in more detail? The people in my family have a history of being born with the ability to use water magic. My father even purposely chose someone who could use water magic as his bride. That person later on became my mother. Of course, my father's plan was to initially hire an instructor to teach me water magic but... 
But you have healing magic, hey? Yes. Before coming here, I had just turned nine years old and was celebrating my birthday with my little sister. It had already been arranged beforehand to examine both our magic talents on this day. My parents and my little sister naturally thought I could use water magic. But the result was that only my little sister demonstrated the aptitude for water magic. Although Nak was mocking and laughing at himself, I could feel a sense of emptiness from him. This situation already went beyond the worst case scenario I thought of in my head. I suspect that for an abnormality like Nak being born in an influential noble family, his parents have already. After that, my life completely changed. Despite how affectionate and kind my father and mother were before, they became cold towards me. I couldn't meet my little sister who I got along with before either. Ha ha ha, it's really ridiculous, right? Just because they discovered my aptitude for magic, they started to discriminate against me. What's even more ridiculous was they drove me out of the mansion and forced me to come here to Luquis. At that point, I had already lost a place to return to. But when I left that mansion, I felt like a burden was lifted. I thought, I was finally free. Come to think of it, I remember my first encounter with Nak. He looked desperate and panicked when he realized he would be late for his class. The only place he had left was this school. He probably didn't want to be expelled from school for missing classes. Since something as important as that was on the line, it made sense for him to be in such a hurry. But even if he viewed the school as his only place to call home, he still couldn't live there in peace. And then Mina, who didn't really get along with you, started to target you. I have no idea why Mina is bullying me. It could be my family's fault, the fact that I have healing magic. There are a lot of things that come to mind. Either way, I... I don't want to go back to my family. This was heavy. Why were all the people around me carrying such heavy pasts and troubles? Amako definitely had a difficult past. Kazuki had his own concerns too. I seemed to draw in people like this everywhere. This was truly bad for my own heart. Looking at how troubled Nak was, I basically didn't have a choice. I don't want to abandon him. In other words, you want to know why it is that Mina bothers to find you even though you are not that close with her. No, it's not that simple and cute. I understand that your parents are complete fools. I know that you have no other place to return to. But what are you going to do from now on? After graduating from here, you'll have to go on a journey. What will you do? T that's. This world was harsher than I thought. I tend to forget this because Lingal was peaceful to its kind king. Other countries trafficked slaves, there were also bandits and monsters between each country. When you traveled from one country to another, you had to be careful and pay extra. Attention to your surroundings. Nak had healing magic which wasn't all that special compared to other types of magic. Everyone could use magic to recover their wounds, healing magic was only slightly better at it. The worst part was that Nak could only use healing magic on himself. Nak probably understood the gravity of his own situation since he was staring down at the ground. I gave him a wry smile and slowly got up. Just come to the rescue squad. Eh. I've talked about it before right? If we included you, we would have three healing magicians. Well, there's also one member that's a little special. I guess. You can rest assured that leader won't mind if you joined. I mean, she's even okay with a bunch of scary looking guys who are like monsters. Judging from the results of Nak's two days of training, he should be able to keep up with what Felm was doing. Even if Nak couldn't use healing magic while running, he could join the scary bunch's group of black robes. In either case, Rose wouldn't reject him. If you don't want that, you could also come to Lingle and live there. I have a friend who is also a healing magician and runs a clinic. He could certainly use another helper. If you don't want to go through with the rescue squad's training, this is also an option. He should be fine in Olga-san and Alura-san's hands. It was possible that Nak's ability to heal others would come back too. W wait just a moment. W what am I going to do about my fight with Mina? If I lose against her like this, Yusato-san, you'll... Well, it's not like you have to go out of your way to compensate her or receive her punishment. As long as I threaten her a little, she should keep her mouth shut. It'll be... Fine. E. Honestly, it wasn't necessary to go along with Mina's conditions. If she requests the impossible I'll just use some more forceful methods. Of course, I would only use this kind of measure if there were no other ways. To put it bluntly, Mina was just a little girl were it not for her family's noble status. It would really, really, break my heart to use such drastic measures but... Well, what can I do? Sometimes I have to become the demon. Ha. Huh. You're right. I was totally enjoying the idea of punishing Mina with a little force. While I'm at it, I should also invite Inyakumai Senpai to join me. I'll prepare a place for you. Somewhere you can return to and feel like you belong. That's why you don't need to mind it. You feel like it's stupid that people are classifying and discriminating against people based on what magic they have, right? 
there's nothing wrong with who you are. You should just find a place where you can be yourself and live happily. I've been entrusted with an important mission so I can't personally lead you to Lingle right now. Therefore, I'll write a letter for you to take instead. But since I'm still unfamiliar with using these characters to write, it'll probably take me quite a bit of time. Nak sucked in a breath of air and looked down. It looked like he needed some time for my words to settle in. I advanced the conversation on my own but now all I could do was wait for Nak to make a decision. If he were to go with Olga-san and Alura-san, I wouldn't need to worry. The problem was there was a high possibility of Rose saying just when did you become so important that you could add a group member to the rescue squad on your own? Hey. Then Rose would get mad and start beating me up. I was a little scared. Hey. Didn't that mean that I would face the consequences if I returned back safely from this journey? H.M. I probably shouldn't think about it for now. I've already said this much. What do you want to do? Is it, really okay? You don't need to think like that. You're the one deciding. I'm just showing you one path you can take. Just like how Rose showed me a path when I first arrived in this world, it was now my turn to show Nak a path. I looked at Nak and presented my hand to him. Nak looked at my hand and his eyes visibly quivered. He extended one of his hands to meet mine. But as they were about to touch, he stopped. I think. I will fight against Mina after all. You don't have to force yourself, you know. There was no need to burden yourself with something you couldn't handle. Nak slowly shook his head and looked directly at me with his swollen red eyes. He looked serious. Within his black and dull eyes, something had obviously changed. He looked much more reliable now. There was a spark that wasn't there before. Right now, I don't have the right to be at the place you recommended. I'll properly sever this tie I have with Mina. Unless I face her head on, I'll never be able to be satisfied with myself. That's why. He paused briefly before grabbing onto my hand and pulling himself up. That's why. Please continue the training with me. I felt like this was the first time Nak truly wanted to overcome this. He was similar to me back then. It was a strange feeling but I didn't hate it. In that case. I should stop trying to project myself onto him. Taking it easy on Nak. Wouldn't actually help him. In fact, it was impolite. I got it. But this time I won't be so gentle. Even if you faint or ask me to stop, I won't stop. If you faint, I'll wake you up. Even if you somehow lose your legs, I'll restore them back to normal. No matter what happens, I'll make sure you're constantly using healing magic. Eh. I I I'll do it. I won't complain anymore. We still had time, we can make it. I felt like I saw his determination waver a bit. Perhaps I was just seeing things? Well, I probably didn't need to worry about it. Let's get out of this dark place. Let's go back to the school and resume the training. Yes. I headed towards where Blurin and Amako were waiting. The time I had left to train Nak including today was three days. We lost a bit of time but it wasn't really a big deal. Nak was overflowing with motivation now and I wouldn't go easy on him anymore. I actually didn't want him to experience Rose's methods but Nak looked confident right now. He didn't have a single trace of unwillingness anymore. Even so, was I capable of using Rose's methods on someone else? No, it wasn't a matter of whether I could do it or not. It's I would do it. Nak had faith in me. It was my duty to respond to that. I'll throw away these useless thoughts of pity and sympathy for Nak. For Nak's sake, I'll steal myself and become a demon. Right now, I didn't mind even if people called me a fiend or the devil. I won't just teach Nak what Rose taught me, I'll beat it into his body. We had three days remaining. During this time, I, I will become a sadistic brute. You you. See cold. Nak was walking next to me and his face suddenly paled. Was something wrong? Nei-chan, I hear you Sato is up to something again. After today's classes ended, I met up with Q. Again. Those were my only thoughts to Q's words. Just what was that outrageous healing magician up to this time? If I remember, he looked worried when Nak wasn't here this morning. Does that have anything to do with it? I don't know. But from what I heard, Yusato has really lost it. Lost it? Like he snapped? Yusato did. Although Yusato looked scary, I couldn't imagine him with an angry expression for some reason. Well, he was borrowing the school's training grounds. It wouldn't hurt to go and take a look. I had already seen Yusato carry a blue grizzly around while running, so I probably won't be too surprised anymore. I listlessly dragged my feet as we moved towards the training grounds. It wasn't particularly far from here but I noticed that the students along the way had some strange expressions. Although I had my doubts, I felt like there was no need to worry and continued on. We arrived at the entrance of the training grounds. There were a few students observing here and it seemed like they were focusing their attention on something inside. I should find you Sato first. I decided, making my way around the group of students near the entrance. 
But then I discovered a hooded girl with blonde hair Amako. Just as I was about to greet her, I paused when I saw the look on her face. Her eyes seemed to be looking far away in the distance. Since I had never seen Amako with such empty looking eyes before, I was confused. Q then lightly tapped me a few times on the shoulder from behind. Any. Nei chan Hmm? What's the matter? What is that? For some odd reason, the color had drained from Q's face as he pointed towards the training grounds. What is it? I looked where Q was pointing as I pondered. Eh. My reaction was same as Q's, but much stronger. After all, Yusato. That Yusato had a gruesome smile on his face and was trampling onto the back of Nak who had fallen down. Are you telling me you were seriously running just now? You think you can become a first-rate healing magician like this? Get up, you can still run, right? Hurry up, you dunce. Do you have any idea how much time you are wasting by lying down so pathetically like this? Ha. Ha. Why yes. Yusato's foot glowed with the light of healing magic as he used it to poke Nak and heal him. Seeing the smile on Yusato's face, I couldn't help but think he was someone else. What happened to the gentle Yusato from yesterday? Nak was in tears and got up while groaning. He then started to run just like Yusato had. Instructed. Yusato stood and glared at Nak from behind. My mind was scrambling as I saw the scene. E. E. W. Wait a moment. Who is that? Nei chan, I know you can't believe it but. That's Yusato. That was Yusato? There has to be a mistake. Did an ogre infiltrate this school? Yusato had to be an ogre. I mean, he still looked the same. But. He had completely changed on the inside. In comparison to this, Yusato's actions seemed normal two days ago. Just what happened this morning? He looked normal when he woke up at least. My thoughts were in chaos as I couldn't believe the person in front of me was really Yusato. It didn't end there. Before I knew it, Yusato had vanished from my sight. He had leaped and my eyes couldn't keep track of him. As soon as I could see Yusato again, he had landed near Nak. While Nak was pushing his limits and running with overflowing tears, Yusato moved behind Nak and lightly kicked him into the air. Wait, eh? Ugh That won't do, Nak. You have to make sure to use your healing magic while running. Yusato looked at Nak with cold eyes and grabbed a tight hold of his head. Yusato forced Nak to face him. I told you before, to feel and sense your magic, right? So why did you lose your concentration after a light poke from me? Are you really trying? If you're really trying, I would really appreciate it if you could show me, Nak. But. I, I am not used to it so. Hey? It's already been two days, you know? Do you think you can use that as an excuse? You started learning magic before me. In other words, you have a head start and should be able to learn faster than me. I might have forgiven you yesterday but it's different today. I can't do it are not the words I'm looking for, you understand. His tone was gentle as usual but his face was terrifying. I felt a chill and quivered. Just looking Yusato from afar was enough to intimidate me and paralyze my muscles. Nak's body was shaking and he averted his eyes from Yusato's gaze. But Yusato forced Nak to look him in the eyes. If I remember correctly, you said this. I'm going to beat that shitty, arrogant little girl and make her pay for everything she's done to me so far. I I didn't say that much. <laughs> I I said it. I want to beat Mina very much. Yes, I'll beat her till she has bruises all over her body. Nak responded with a loud voice while his head was still being grabbed. I got goosebumps as the contents of this conversation were too disturbing for me. If Mina were to witness this scene right now, even I would feel pity for her. In truth, the students who were intending to train here were speechless and looking at Nak and Yusato. I see, I see. But you know. Are you really taking this training seriously? Just from your attitude it looks like you are. However, you don't actually have to try that hard for this training. Nak looked like he couldn't fully comprehend Yusato's words. Even I didn't really understand what Yusato was trying to say. It wasn't necessary to do his best for this training. What did Yusato mean? There's nothing wrong with using words to express your intent in doing your best. But that's not what I'm trying to accomplish. This isn't the kind of training you can do just because you want to do your best. In fact, it actually gets in the way of this healing. Magic training. What are you trying to do your best for? It's just harsh training. If you think like that, you'll get tired of it. If you plan to support yourself with such empty words, then it's useless and futile. That's why you shouldn't think you'll obtain some sense of accomplishment from this training. Forget about all that. You'll only achieve results by concentrating on the training itself. Discard any unnecessary thoughts. Yusato rapidly spoke his mind. I see. In other words, don't think of anything. Just become a puppet that follows the training. 
To obtain definite results, you needed to focus on what was in front of you. For this type of training, this was very true. It was really efficient and a dreadful way of thinking. But you will definitely run from that kind of training. At the very least, I would. I had no doubt that every other student here felt the same way. You're just relying on these feelings of doing your best? Are you underestimating healing magic? You need to give it your all. What you're doing is simple. All you have to do is focus on running. You're not used to using healing magic while running? Do you want me to run beside you and constantly remind you? If you have time to think about such worthless thoughts, then run. Kyoha. I will make you stronger. But no matter how much damage you suffer during this process, I'll heal you as much as I can. But if you just want some half-assed results I'll stop being so strict towards you. It looks like I was an idiot to try and help you. Ong. You're wrong. I don't want some half-baked results. Then start taking this seriously and concentrate with everything you have. You have no strength or stamina. Obviously you are going to need to rely on your reflexes. To the very limit. If you can do it, do it. If you can't do it, you will still do it. If you can't succeed on your own, I'll lend a hand and succeed somehow anyways. Yusato roughly let go of Nak's head. I couldn't see Yusato's expression from this side but there was no doubt that he was looking at Nak with a frightening gaze. Then get up. If you don't stand here, then you really are a good for nothing. Nak, I think you're going to break. Yusato's training was something you couldn't back out of once you started. It was dangerous and there was no telling just how far Yusato would take it. Even if your body was fine due to healing magic, there was no way your mind would be. Yusato was the weird one to have overcome that. But contrary to my expectations, Nak violently wiped off his tears and returned a sharp glare back at Yusato. I'll, do it. I just have to do it, right? Nak forcefully gritted his teeth and started to run, despite staggering. While Nak was running in such a dangerous fashion and wobbling, a green aura coated over his body. Thanks to Yusato, Nak was able to fully concentrate. It was apparent that today's training was different from yesterday's. Koo. Koo. Nak was frantic. No other words could describe his current situation better. Once Yusato saw Nak's change, he relaxed his face and sighed in relief. He returned back to his usual gentle expression and smiled. We ended up seeing such an intense scene without really understanding what was going on and the situation seemed to have already resolved. Fuh, this is quite the nostalgic scene. Sensei. While we still hadn't recovered from the shock of this situation, a tall woman had suddenly shown up. It was Carla Sensei. She was the magic teacher in charge of our class. Although her personality was troubling, she was one of the few humans who didn't discriminate against other races here. She looked happy and was laughing. Did she know the reason why Yusato became like this? Hmm? Kiriha and Q. That reminds me, Yusato is staying at your place, right? Yes. It wasn't that strange for her to know that Yusato was staying at our place. The problem was. Why did Sensei suddenly bring it up? I felt a little tense due to Sensei's smile. You don't have to be so cautious. I don't think it's particularly strange or anything. Yusato is a human while we're beast kin. I think if other people knew, they would think it's quite strange. Q interjected. I have no intention of stopping Yusato from staying at your place. I have a general idea of what kind of person he is. Meeting a human like him must be a first for you too. I couldn't respond. It was true that I haven't met such an unreasonable human like Yusato before. Q was somewhat used to Yusato's existence by now but I felt like something was still hindering me from accepting Yusato. I didn't have any negative feelings towards him for sure but there was some sort of irritation. As I was being tormented by my own complicated feelings, Sensei turned her attention back to Yusato. That's just an act. Yusato's master is on a completely different level. His master is the real brute. Even so, Yusato is doing a great job at acting and passing Rose's training. Seriously. I couldn't help but be happy at seeing a disciple being so similar to his master, but at the same time, they are also different. A an act? He's doing that on purpose. He was performing such an absurd role too. He's outrageous. Yusato was like a demon that could make people shiver just with his very presence. There was an even more frightening existence than Yusato and she was the one who trained him. My image of Yusato's master didn't look like a human anymore. But if he didn't do this, it would really be impossible to strengthen Nak in such a short period of time. In reality, his training yesterday was too gentle. I don't know if something happened but Yusato is finally teaching some real healing magic training. It was something I used to see in Lingle but to think I would get to see it in Luquas too. It's moving. Oh wow. Sensei's healing magic training and our healing magic training obviously differed. In any case, three days have passed including today. Nak's efforts will definitely bear fruit. Well, 
there's no helping it if his personality changes a little. Ha 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 ha. Sensei gave a light-hearted laugh as she said this jokingly. But her joke felt convincing due to the fierce training happening right in front of me. Q felt the same and weakly smiled. He turned away and looked at the setting sun. Seeing that it was already so late, I said. We should return. It seems like you Sato won't be done anytime soon. Then I'll go and pick up Satsuki. I'm counting on you. There was no problem in coming here to see Yusato's training but we stayed here longer than expected. I still wanted to observe him but we should really go home. I entrusted Q to pick Satsuki up. It was probably a better idea to leave Amako alone. As a form of courtesy, I also lightly bowed my head to Sensei before leaving. Why are you sluggishly running like that? Run with all your strength. Why yes. I should probably make more than usual for tonight's dinner. I idly muttered as I saw Nak madly sprinting. In the end. Yusato, Nak, and Amako came back almost immediately after I had finished making dinner. Q and Satsuki had already returned as well. And so dinner began with six people. But. Ugu, you oh. Delicious. Ugu. I'm. I'm alive. And Nak. You shouldn't cry while eating. Yusato brought back an unconscious Nak. As soon as Nak woke up, he started eating dinner. With tears and snot dripping from his face, he swallowed the soup in front of him in one gulp. Despite my warning, Nak didn't seem to mind and instead looked delighted. Meanwhile, Yusato was looking at this spectacle with a pleasant smile. Ha ha ha, you're really exaggerating, Nak. No no, isn't it your fault? Your personality was completely different during training. Q lightly reprimanded Yusato. I was just trying to act like my master. Didn't it seem like an act? It didn't seem like an act at all. It looked like you were enjoying it. H how rude. Don't put me on the same level as that sadist. Amako. You should know, go on and tell Q. Am I similar to leader? A child that should return will return, I guess. What do you mean by that? It's a beastkin phrase. Satsuki excitedly shouted. Its meaning is similar to you can't differ too much from your own parents. Thank you Satsuki. But I wasn't really asking for the meaning. I was sort of asking why Amako would think that. Eh, you meant that? Then I think Amako meant your master is something like an ogre. Wait a moment. Then if I followed the phrase you described just now, it's like you're saying you thought I looked like an ogre during today's training. Hey, let's stop saying something that can be easily misunderstood. You're not wrong, you're definitely an ogre. Q interrupted. Yup, an ogre. Satsuki agreed. Q, why don't you step outside with me for a bit? Why are you only calling me out? It was a lively and noisy dining table. In the middle of all this, Nak was wholeheartedly eating my cooking. I couldn't help but sigh and asked him something that was on my mind. Nak, are you okay? Uga. Okay? What do you mean? You're being pushed so far by Yusato, aren't you scared? Since he was going through with the training despite how harsh it was, he was probably willingly doing it. My question caused Nak to open his eyes wide in surprise and he looked a little hesitant in answering my question. It's certainly scary but it's something I personally desire. I see. Nak had properly thought through this on his own. The look in his eyes was clearly different from the first time he came here. I suspect that something happened. Additionally, I think of the Yusato during training and the Yusato who is sitting at this table as two different people. Ah, uh, I see. What was that? I felt like the light in Nak's eyes disappeared just now. Nak was staring at Yusato, Q, and Satsuki who were joking around. Nak's eyes were lifeless and his cheek twitched. Yusato at this moment seemed to have remembered something and turned to face Nak. Ah, uh, that reminds me. Nak? I have something to give you. Something for me. Is it related to training? Hmm, something like that. You might need it so you should take it. As Yusato spoke, he retrieved a stack of paper from his pocket. No, he presented a notebook to Nak. What am I supposed to use this for? It's a diary. I recommend that you write in it starting from today. But if you don't want to, that's fine too. He, healing magicians have something like this in their training? Let me guess. You write in the diary to record your own progress. These records allow you to confirm how much you've grown, right? Q questioned. Ha ha ha, it's not something as cool as that. This is just something to aid you because of how harsh the training is. I did this too. Leader said to do it and so I did. And thanks to this, I was able to not lose sight of myself and continue with the training. Not lose sight of yourself. What's the purpose of writing in this diary, Yusato-san? Nak also had doubts and asked. A diary was something you wrote for yourself so why would you lose sight of who you are? You might want to escape reality due to the training and this diary is to prevent that. Well, we only have two more days of training to go. 
Nak might not need it. That's not a diary. I couldn't say anything in response but I was clear of one thing. This was a diary that wasn't a diary. Yusato. Nak was bewildered upon receiving the diary. Yusato smiled as if he was seeing a nostalgic scene. Seeing this pair of master and disciple caused me to worry about Nak's training tomorrow. Afterwards, the lively dinner had come to an end. Everyone else had returned to their rooms and I quickly cleaned up the dinner table. After finishing, I checked the ingredients to confirm there were enough for tomorrow's dinner. Since I was the only one who could cook here, I basically managed the entire food situation. It was precisely because we didn't have much money that I had to be cautious in case the worst happens. I would purchase only the required amount of ingredients, not too much or too little. Well, I wasn't too worried about money. There was a store run by non-humans and I would take turns working there with Q. Our financial situation wasn't that critical. All right, everything seems to be in order. Yuuun. I finished the preparations for tomorrow and stretched. What should I do next? I could return to my room and study. But I had some early lessons tomorrow so I should probably just take a bath and sleep. As I yawned, I left the kitchen and headed towards the living room. No one is here, hey. It was natural since everyone returned to their own rooms. That reminds me, Nak took that diary along with him into his room. In contrast to how Nak looks, he's earnest and methodical. He received it from Yusato and all, he might be writing in it right now. Musing quietly to myself, I headed towards my room for a change of clothes. Is there someone outside? Bam. I could hear a clattering noise coming from outside. A thief? But there haven't been any robberies here and there wasn't really anything of value here. I retrieved one of my gauntlets hanging on the wall and slid it onto my right hand. I headed towards the entrance door. I slowly opened it and peeked outside. There was no other light source but the moon and it shone on the figure of one person. I clenched my right hand upon seeing this suspicious figure. But as my eyes slowly got used to the surrounding darkness, the mysterious figure became clearer. Once I knew the identity of the person outside, I relaxed. What the? It's Yusato. Hmm? Oh, Kiriha. What's wrong? Yusato noticed me from the other side of the door and tilted his head in confusion. That should be what I should be asking. But I'm glad it's not a robber. Really, you shouldn't make me so worried for no reason. Isn't it natural for me to be curious when there are mysterious sounds outside? What about you? What are you doing? I'm just practicing some magic. This late. This was around the time where Nak and Yusato would normally be asleep. I thought I could make use of this for tomorrow's training. That's why I'm doing some light practice. Make use of healing magic? Aren't you already using it? For example, when you made Nak run or when he lost conscious. Haha. <laughs> Yusato was smiling for some reason when he heard my words. He looked full of confidence and started gathering magic into his right hand. Green magic flowed into his palm and formed a sphere. It was obviously not something Yusato used in his fight against Hafa. It was the offensive emitting type sphere Q and I would form. In other words, Yusato was practicing to shoot healing magic spheres. Just as I thought I understood what Yusato was doing, he gripped the sphere in his hand and twisted his body. Fuhun. Throw. Wait, E. What kind of method is this? Firing magic by throwing it. I couldn't comprehend something like this but the sphere of magic vigorously crashed into the wooden box in the distance. This was the sound I had heard from inside the house. Yusato looked at me with a proud expression as I was still dumbfounded. If I had to say it, his talent for firing magic was non-existent. But he used his ridiculous strength and created such an outlandish result. Although I don't think casting magic is something you use physical strength for. You came at a good time. Stay still for a bit, Kiriha. I want to test how effective it is. I I don't want to. It's obvious that you are adding your own strength. It's healing magic so it's safe. Even if it's healing magic, there's no way I would be fine with getting hit by a ball of magic with that much force, you know? Just how much strength are you using to make it that powerful? Well. It's only the strength of one arm. This young man was really a monster. Even if he looked harmless, he could say and do such things like it was normal. Ha. Huh. Ever since you came here, I've been constantly surprised. There was my first meeting with him, his fight with Hafa, Nax training and he brought along Amako too. He has exceeded my expectations every time. I really don't know what to do. I thought humans were all cold and heartless. We were treated so differently just because we had different ears and had tails. Even that oddball Hafa had some sort of classification. He basically didn't care about you if you were weak. It was still hard for me to believe I was having a conversation with a human like Yusato right now. But it's not that weird. For me, I feel that it's very normal to talk to you like this. Normally, talking to someone like me is what's weird. To begin with, humans don't consider beast kin like us to be human. But I don't think like that. 
It's this town's. No, it's this world's common sense. You're able to talk to us normally. Yusato, you're the strange one here. But after saying this and seeing his troubled expression, I felt some regret. He didn't do anything wrong. As I was thinking of how to apologize to him. He spoke first. He sat on top of the wooden box he blew away a moment ago and said his next words with a sense of yearning. This world's common sense, hey. But I'm not someone from this world so it doesn't matter to me. Ha. Huh. His words were so unrealistic that I couldn't help but raise my voice. There's something called the hero summoning in Lingle. It was only supposed to summon the two heroes you saw before but I ended up being caught in this summoning too. The heroes. It's really like the heroes from the stories. What else could I be referring to? What else you say? For these past few hundred years, people would earn achievements in war and a few would be chosen to serve directly under a king. These people were revered as heroes. At the very least, that was what the students here thought. Although there aren't many, there were still heroes. However, these heroes weren't really the heroes from the stories but just a title. But the heroes that Yusato mentioned in Yukami and Kazuki. They seemed to be genuine heroes. A few hundred years ago, a hero was summoned from another world and they sealed the demon king. Yusato was from the same world as the two heroes. I could somewhat understand why he had an absurd amount of power now. You got caught in the summoning and came from the same world as the heroes. I see. Now I know why you're so strong. Ha ha ha, I'm different. I only have a bit more magic power than most people. My strength comes from the results of my training. I think that's also a problem. Despite the lack of talent, he possessed strength that could rival the heroes. If I thought about it carefully, the fact that I could make such a comparison was weird. Yusato only had physical attacks while the heroes possessed strong and powerful magic. I got off topic. As I was saying, I come from a different world so this kind of discrimination doesn't really exist. I can't really comprehend it. In fact, my world doesn't have any beastkin or non-humans. Then aren't you afraid? Because you've never met someone like me. I was astonished that there weren't any non-humans in Yusato's world but shouldn't that mean Yusato would be even more disgusted at seeing me in Amako? Like hell I would be scared. But Yusato rejected my words. People with ears like us aren't normal. Humans don't have tails either. Our eyes and noses are several times more powerful than a human's. Our strength too, we could easily split a large boulder with our bare hands. Even I can smash a boulder into small fragments. Eh. But I didn't say anything about smashing a boulder into small fragments. No no. I can't be pressured here. No matter how I look at it, we're more like monsters. There are monsters that are capable of human speech. No matter how similar we look to humans, there's something about us that's decisively different. Then I guess I'm an ogre. It's just like you said, there's something different about me from other humans. I might as well be a monster. You're similar to an ogre and your very core is like a monster's but... You're still a human. I'm really curious about that statement and want to comment on it but... Let's leave that aside for now. Yusato turned his entire body towards me and folded his arms before continuing to speak. Honestly, it doesn't matter to me whether you're a human or a beastkin. That's why you're misunderstanding me. My perception of this won't change either so there's no point in trying to tell me about the common sense of this world. Even after saying all this to Yusato, he didn't feel any disgust towards me. It was still the gentle Yusato who smiled, just like when I first met him. I just think of you as some girl who's wearing cosplay. For your ears and tails that is. Ha! Huh? Cosplay. It looks like some of Inukami Senpai's bad influence rubbed off on me. Forget about that word just now. Well, I don't mind. Ahem. I have a vague sense of what you are worried about, Kiriha. But let me say this again, humans, beastkin, or even the demonkin, they're not that much different in my eyes. To begin with, I think that the perception of the people in this world is a little off. I don't think there's any real need for you to change yourself to match other people's perceptions. If you were to ask Inyukami Senpai if she were scared of you, her answer would certainly be this scared? A foolish question. Of course I'm aroused. Fu. Fu fu. What was that just now? Was that supposed to be an impression of Inyukami? You absolutely cannot tell her I said this. Her real nature is like this which causes me to be embarrassed. I couldn't help but laugh at Yusato who tried to imitate Inyukami with a slightly higher pitched voice. Even though I was overcome with doubt and suspicion a moment ago. I see. The worry that I had over these few days might have been simpler than I thought. When I first arrived in Luquis, I held the hope of getting along with other humans. Before I knew it, I had forgotten about this hope. I was just scared of remember this feeling I had forgotten. I had seen a lot of the cruel acts of humans and didn't want to be betrayed. I didn't want to be abandoned by the human I could believe in. I was trying to deny it myself. My heart wouldn't allow me to trust another human. But deep inside, I was still thinking maybe one day. 
I was just overthinking things. It doesn't need to be that complicated. That feeling from the depths of my heart was revived upon seeing a human like you Sato getting along with Amako. My emotions were all over the place with this unexpected encounter but I finally understood them. You really are a weird human. Your magic is unusual and your attitude towards us isn't normal either. Your training is also beyond my understanding because of how abnormal and strange it is. E. You're really talking without holding anything back. Even though it sounds bad, I'm actually praising you. Thanks to how strange you are, Amako was able to find someone like you and Nak is able to stand up on his own. And I'm able to talk to you like this. I don't feel like I'm being praised but... Well, it's fine. I noticed it this late. But I could still make it. After all, this was something I wanted long ago. When I first arrived here, this was something I desired from the bottom of my heart. I wanted human friends. It was a foolish desire I had when I was still only a child. But I lost sight of that somewhere along the way. However, the reality was right in front of me. My wish could be granted. I could finally take a step forward again. First of all, I'll try my best to become friends with this strange human in front of me. Training Diary Day 3 I started to write in this diary since Yusato san said I should. Today marks the day where I was reborn. Although it sounds cool, I actually ran away the other day. It was only thanks to Yusato san that I could finally find my own starting point in life. But I'm still a young boy who is a coward. I couldn't meet all of Yusato san's expectations for the training either. Yusato san encouraged me to join the rescue squad, but I was actually really worried about what to do. I would probably just be a burden to Yusato san's group. I feel anxious when I think about the distant future. From what I hear, Yusato san's master is also a frightening person. I don't know whether that's true or not, but she was the person who taught Yusato san. I should write about my training. In comparison to how Mina treated me, the training was much more severe. I finally realized just how much Yusato san was holding back in yesterday's training. Yusato san said it was just an act, but I suspect that this was another personality he possessed. It could be that I'm venting my displeasure here. Yusato san would yell at me as I desperately ran to my very limits. Whenever I did something wrong, he would knock me down and heal me with a kick. I really didn't know if he was acting or not. It felt like he discarded any trace of his own conscience once training started. In my head, Yusato san is a monster during training. But outside of training, he's human. My hands are trembling as I write in this diary. There's nothing wrong with my body since I had healing magic. In fact, my body is in really good shape right now. I'm shivering because of fear. I feel uneasy at seeing the good and evil sides of Yusato san. When I imagine Yusato san's smile and what he plans for tomorrow's training, my trembling wouldn't stop. It's no good, I didn't have the will to continue on writing. I'll end day 3 right here. Day 4. I'm sorry for being so inexperienced. I ended up fainting in the hallway. I was desperately reaching for my pen and trying to write in my diary. It was a first experience for me. I strongly remember how flustered Kyusan was when he witnessed this scene. At any rate, I should record today's events. Let's start with the abuse in today's training. According to Yusato san, my stamina was unbelievably weak. Even so, he also said my stamina wasn't that different from an average person's. But this kind of stamina wouldn't suffice for the healing magician that Yusato san wanted me to be. He said my body was feeble like a sheet of paper. And if I were to take one punch from the rescue squad's leader, all the bones in my body would shatter. With that being the case, he combined the magic training with some measures to help me overcome this problem. I was finally able to get a feel for the magic training so I lamented a little once he told me this. I thought I reached a stable foundation for healing magic. I was wrong. I couldn't have been more wrong. I wrote about how I had a starting point yesterday but let me revise that. Nothing had actually begun for me. In the first place, the real training only started once I developed. A feel for my healing magic. The training intensified. The abuse became fiercer. I was optimistic that I could manage with yesterday's training but it had completely changed today. This new training was simple, I just had to avoid these magic spheres. Since my body wasn't all that strong, I just had to avoid getting hit. Or at least that was the idea behind this training. But Yusato san's way of using healing magic was wrong on so many levels. Actually, why would he do something like throw a magic sphere? There had to be a mistake somewhere. He was definitely born in the wrong species. The speed of his magic sphere exceeded Mina's. Just what does he think I'm fighting against? The most unreasonable part was that I would get knocked back if I got hit and Yusato would blame me don't get hit, damn it. When I tried to say that it was impossible, he grabbed me by the collar said I was pounded with fists. Getting hit by some magic ball shouldn't be a big deal, right? I had no excuse once he said that. Since the sphere was made of healing magic, it didn't hurt. I only felt the impact when I got hit. 
but even that was more than enough to scare me. I was also a healing magician though, so maybe I could do it too. It was impossible. I didn't have that kind of monstrous strength to begin with. Being able to inflict that much impact with a sphere of healing magic wasn't normal either. Of course, it didn't end there. Yusato-san continued to restore my fatigue with his healing magic and I ended up doing this training for the entire day. I really thought that this type of training was a little too insane. I couldn't feel tired even if I wanted to. Whenever I got hit with a magic ball, it would heal me. I had no choice but to keep on dodging. And although I didn't want to admit it, I was able to sense the flow of healing magic whenever I got hit by a magic sphere. I continued to move my body until Yusato-san used up all his magic. Although my body was fine, my mind was exhausted. I have heard from my lessons that your mental state has an effect on your body. It seems like it's true. Even as I'm writing in this diary, I feel like nothing matters anymore. Rather than worrying about my fight with Mina, I'm thinking about how I will survive my training tomorrow. I can tell that there is something wrong with my current state. It's no good. I don't really get it but I know it's no good. I should sleep. I'll end the diary right here. Day 5. The final day of training. The only thing I could think about was training. Whether it was the spectators or the bullies. None of that mattered to me anymore. Ran, blown away, yelled it, blown away, blown away, ran, blown away, blown away, yelled it, dodged, blown away, blown away, ran, blown away, blown away, yelled it, yelled it again, blown away, got kicked into the air, blown away, ran, dodged. After repeating this for the entire day, the training finally ended. In the end, I could only dodge Yusato-san's healing magic ball a few times. Yusato-san muttered did I overdo it, but I felt satisfied. Thank you very much, Yusato-san. And prepare yourself, Mina. I didn't want revenge nor did I have any grudge towards her. I just wanted to settle everything by cutting this tie. Then I'll be able to proudly stand next to Yusato-san and join the rescue squad. There was also one more reason and it was something I didn't tell Yusato-san. This match is going to be how I will say farewell and separate from that unpleasant family of mine. I won't be bound anymore. My life will then truly begin. For that sake, I... I won't yield anymore. I'll defeat Mina. Wagering everything I have, I'll beat her down. After reading this in Nak's diary, I closed it. I saw that it dropped on the floor in his room so I picked it up. And then I thought. Healing magic training changed people into demons. Just a few days ago, Nak was a timid boy. But now he had completely changed. Is this really going to be okay? He had already left to fight with Mina. I planned to head out as well. I wonder if Nak would be able to win against Mina. It was a little hard to imagine. I'm sure Yusato has something in mind. Yet. Even if Nak got heavily injured, Yusato should be able to heal him. As I nodded and withdrew from reality, I placed the diary back on the desk. I then prepared to head out with Kyu and Satsuki. Today was the day of Nak's fight with Mina. Amako and I were at the crowded entrance of the school wedged among the students. Nak had already left a moment ago. Blurin was back at the stable. As expected, I couldn't bring an irregular existence like Blurin to a place like this. Once I told my reason to Amako for not taking Blurin along, she commented in astonishment you actually considered it. But since I was open-minded and generous, I forgave her after flicking her on the forehead with healing magic. Amako held her forehead like she was in pain. You sat oh. Oh, you came. While ignoring Amako's spiteful glare, I responded to the voice that called my name. I could see Inyakami senpai and Kazuki making their way towards us. We waited here for no reason other than these two. We hadn't met at all while I was training Nak. I guess I was worried that senpai would do whatever she wanted and interrupt the training. And there wasn't really a reason to meet during this time. He, Yusato-kun. It's been a few days since we last met. I wonder if this phrase is appropriate in this context. Amako, what's the matter? Yusato bullied. Wow. It's been a few days since we've last seen each other. Kazuki, how've you been? Yeah, I've been good. It looks like you were quite busy, Yusato. Amako was trying to seek help from an annoying person so I quickly greeted Kazuki and used him as cover. I wonder if Senpai heard? On the other hand, Kazuki was giving a radiant smile. As always, Kazuki was a handsome young man who could give such a dazzling smile. What were you guys up to? We went to places like the Grand Library and did things like practice magic. Basically anything we could only do here. I really wanted you to come along, Yusato. But you had your own circumstances so it can't be helped. Kazuki responded. I thought you would probably be busy training Nak. So I did my best to not visit and get in your way. Inyakami senpai thoughtfully said. I see. I feel bad for letting you take so much consideration for me. But I'm glad. 
Even though it was an act, I didn't want these two to see me acting like Rose. I didn't really get it myself but Kiriha and the others seemed to have witnessed something dreadful. What about Welsi San? She had some matters to discuss with Gladys San. They're probably discussing that letter. One week had passed since we delivered the letter. They might have made their decision by now. I forgot all about the letter during training. At the very least, nothing major was decided yet. Shall we go? Although we still have a bit of time left. There's nothing wrong with going a bit early. Let's go. I'm extremely curious as to what kind of fight I'll see from someone personally taught by you, Yusato. We were going to see Mina and Nak's mock battle. Nak should be able to fight with the training he received from me in these five days. There was nothing else I could do. The rest of it depended on Nak's own power. Amako, what are you doing? You're going to be left behind. Why you? I'll definitely never forgive you. I won't forgive you. Seriously, I only flicked you on the forehead. It wasn't that big of a deal. I guess it can't be helped. While Amako was still glaring at me with resentful eyes, I placed my hands on her sides, picked her up, and walked towards Kazuki and Senpai. People were glancing at me with strange gazes. It was a little odd to carry a girl who was wearing a hood like this but I was already used to people looking at me like this when I trained Nak. Yusato-kun, is Nak going to be alright? Although Inukami senpai looked at me suspiciously because I was carrying Amako, she asked me this question instead. He'll be fine. I like to believe I've done everything I can for him already. Does that have anything to do with how the people around us are looking at you? Who knows? This senpai of mine was really sharp. She already noticed it. While I smiled and played dumb, I took a look around at my surroundings. The students immediately averted their eyes. What's with their reactions? Am I some kind of gangster? You did such an amazing training? Enough to shock all the students here. Why yet? I don't really know if it's that amazing or not. It was just the training I received before. Stop looking at me with those eyes beaming with curiosity, senpai. My training is really plain. All I did was make Nak run and dodge some magic balls. You're really good at smooth talking. Be quiet, you little fox girl. When I saw that Kazuki's smile had stiffened at Amako's words, I started to shake her up and down. This is your punishment. Become nauseous. I thought as I kept shaking Amako. But before I knew it, Senpai was staring into my eyes with a doubting gaze. It looks like you're getting along really well with her now. Eh? Well, I guess. We were together and all. Together, together. Hey. What was she getting at? Senpai who had been walking in front of me had turned around. She placed both of her hands onto her cheeks and looked at me with upturned eyes. I wonder. Am I jealous? Hearing such sweet words and seeing the lovely expression on Senpai's beautiful face. I couldn't help but think that the people back at our school would faint at this sight, regardless of gender. In reality, I was confident that this would have applied to me too. If it was the Senpai from before. Ah, I see. What kind of magic practice did you do, Kazuki? Even if you acted like a maiden now, it wouldn't change your deplorable aspect. Ignoring Senpai who was looking at me, I caught up with Kazuki. Hmm? Let's see. I was working on controlling my light magic better. You saw me perform. It during the training right? At the moment, I can't control it without putting all my concentration into it. Well, in my case, I can't fire out any magic. But maybe you could try thinking of a different method to control it. It might work out for you. Wait. Just wait a moment. As I was having an enjoyable conversation with Kazuki, Senpai suddenly shouted from behind and vigorously gripped my shoulder. What is it? So bothersome. Shouldn't you have a better reaction than that? Are you a deadpan person? How impolite. If it wasn't me, any other guy would have been in great joy. I won't just suddenly fall in love. But ending it with an, ah, I see reaction is a little bit rude, don't you think? I'm a beautiful girl, you know? Why can't you be honest and feel shy about it? Please realize that there's something wrong with you for admitting that about yourself. Calling yourself a beautiful girl was one thing but the dreadful part was that there would be no one here to deny that claim. No matter how I looked at it, she was indeed a beautiful girl. But I won't fall for such an obvious trap since I wasn't a fool. It was also pleasant and interesting to see Senpai's face full of frustration. Wait, no no. That's wrong. I'm not going to be like Rose. If I really thought that, wouldn't that really make me a sadist like Rose? I took in a deep breath and took Senpai's hand off my shoulder. Yet, yeah, yet. Yeah. I'm super shocked. Is this fine? I'm going ahead. Kyoha. I've been humiliated. I feel like he's even more of a sadist than before. Senpai muttered this and her cheeks flushed red. I continued on walking. Kazuki had seen everything and cheerfully laughed. Ha ha ha, you really get along well with Senpai, Yusato. 
I feel relieved whenever I see you two talk. I agree, I feel the same when I talk with her alone. I responded without denying anything. Although I was usually dishonest, I really wanted to be honest during times like this. This was bad. I felt like my face was getting a little hot. I shouldn't have said something so out of character. I had to at least make sure I walked in front of Senpai so that she couldn't see. I also covered my face with my hands so that Amako couldn't see either. You Sato, what's wrong? Hiding your face like that. Do you have some horns or something? Amako questioned. I've calmed down. Thanks to your needless comment. Just what kind of monster did this little fox girl think I was? I'm a human, how could I have horns? A large number of students were gathered on the training grounds. Two students were fighting at the center. The mock battles had already begun. The surrounding students were spectating the match. Ha! Ah. All right, I will win this time. He, what a sight. I let Amako down and caught up with Senpai and Kazuki to spectate the match between the two students. The two students both had wooden swords. After one of the students roared out, both of them clashed their swords against each other coupled with their distinctive magic. Senpai looked at the fight with great interest but she suddenly turned around to look at me. It's just like what I expected. A fight between two magicians should feel something like this. It's quite different from your match with Hafakun, Yusato Kun. Well, there aren't many magicians who use their body to fight to begin with. So obviously a fight like this is the norm. Hafasan used his magic eyes and close quarters combat to fight. I relied on my healing magic to boost my own strength and left everything to brute force. In my case, I wasn't savage enough to pick a fight if someone just bumped into me. But I definitely wasn't a normal magician. My way of using magic was wrong at its very root. There are a lot of magicians that use a weapon to complement their own magic. But there really aren't a lot of magicians who use their bare hands to fight. Ha ha ha, I don't need a weapon anyways. I didn't really require anything sharp while I was in the rescue squad. I also have my new technique, the healing magic ball. I didn't need something like a sword. I did use a wooden spear against the snake but now I feel like it's not something I needed. I did kind of want some gauntlets like the ones Kiriha had, though. I shouldn't ask for the impossible. We decided to walk around and find a good spot to watch the match. As we were walking, we noticed that the students were looking at a familiar student with ashen gray hair. Don't mind me, everyone. Hello, Hafasan. Did you also come here to watch the mock battles? I greeted Hafasan who showed a gentle smile. I saw Hafasan during my training with Nak but I don't think I have seen him since. Yes, I have an interest in this so I have come to pay a visit. I actually wanted to participate too but my opponent had already forfeited. Ha ha ha. I I see. I'm willing to bet they were scared of you. You only aim for the vitals, after all. I felt a sense of fear during my fight with him too. Hafasan shrugged his shoulders in disappointment and started walking back to his original spot. You can see well from here. It's strange that no other students come here to spectate. Yes, I understand your doubts, Yusato-san. Why did it feel like he was indirectly saying I was the one scaring the other students away? That shouldn't be the case, right? They're scared of Hafasan, not me. This guy aims for the vitals. When I tried to look at my surroundings again, the students averted their eyes. I I can't accept this. Really, just what did you do? It's obvious that these students are afraid to make eye contact with you. Inyakumai Senpai expressed her doubts. Oh, you didn't know? In the training grounds, Yusato San Upu. I sealed Hafasan's mouth with my hand. I used my other hand to make a gesture by pressing my index finger against my lips. This is a secret, you got it. I wonder if my message got across. After seeing Hafasan nod, I let go. I then turned to Senpai with a composed expression. Nothing happened here, right? Yes, nothing happened here. This is way too suspicious, you know? Your exchange just now is obviously suspicious. Just what happened while we weren't here? I couldn't deceive Senpai. Her breathing became rough and she drew closer. I knew she wasn't someone I could trick by using brute force but what should I do? As I was thinking of what to do about Senpai, Kazuki stopped her advance from behind. You shouldn't inquire too much. Even Yusato has one or two things he doesn't want others to know. Gah. Mew. T that's true. I didn't really mind if they found out, but if I could avoid it, then I would. I mentally thanked Kazuki and directed my attention towards the mock battle. This time, Hafasan threw a question at me. Yusato-san. Who is this? Hafasan looked at Amako who was hiding herself behind me. Hum? Ah. This person is. A friend who I'm going on this journey with. It seems like they possess magic too. But it's different. I see a collection of white magic power around her. It feels similar to my magic eyes. No, maybe even more powerful. 
I saw her during your training with Nak but just who is she? Yet. Yeah. No, you don't have to say anything if you don't want to. I'm well aware of the difficulties of possessing a magic similar to mine. It really saves me the trouble when you're so understanding. Amako's ability to see the future was special even among the beast kin. If Hafasan knew this, he would definitely be able to deduce her identity. Still, Hafasan's magic eyes were amazing. Just by looking at Amako's magic power, he roughly estimated what her magic was. It was also possible that he just felt that their magic was similar. I'll change the topic. I've been entrusted with a message from Kiriha. She wanted me to tell you if I spotted your group. Kiriha. It wouldn't look good if we were together so we'll be cheering from somewhere else. I see. Thanks for delivering this message. No, don't mind it. I'm personally happy that she would entrust a human to deliver a message. It's something I've never seen her do. Hafasan was smiling at me like an idiot as if to say maybe something caused her to change her way of thinking. I ignored it. It seemed Kiriha's group was spectating at a different spot. It would be easy to find them though. They weren't hiding their faces like Amako. It's unfortunate that we can't observe the match together but there's not much I can do. But I really wonder when Nak's mock battle will be coming up. From what I heard, there weren't a lot of participants this time around so his turn should come up soon. The match in front of me seemed like it was about to finish so I looked around. Then I spotted a boy with short black hair and a girl with twin tails confronting each other. Ah, found him. It's Nak. And Mina is there too. Was Senpai also looking around? She stood next to me and looked towards where Nak and Mina were. I was worried that Nak would be intimidated by Mina and it would affect his movements during the mock battle. But it looked like I didn't need to worry. Mina tried to provoke Nak but he only had his eyes on the match. It was the result of training, or more accurately, his heart had grown stronger. I felt like I was a little too harsh but the result was alright in the end. All that's left for you to do is to defeat her. The bell rung, marking the end of the current match. At the same time that the crowd of students cheered, Nak and Mina stood up to begin their fight. Mina had a silver shield and, looking at her proud expression, it seemed like she thought there was no way her impenetrable defense could be broken by Nak. But if you underestimate Nak too much, you'll be in for a world of pain. Healing others wasn't all you could do with healing magic. Mina was probably also the one who caused Nak's healing magic to no longer properly function. She'll personally experience what I mean with her own body. Since Nak couldn't use healing magic on others, I didn't teach him my healing punch. It was a technique that could be used to knock others unconscious without hurting them. Nak's attacks will deal real damage to Mina. She could even suffer a large injury if she wasn't careful. This is why I'm here. You don't need to hold back, Nak. Show your heartless parents and those guys who bullied you that none of them can match your speed none of them can catch up to you. The suffering you experienced in these five days and the results you obtained. Today is the day to show it. You sure look confident. Aren't you being a little conceited? Mina suddenly spoke. My match with Mina would begin shortly. The fight between the two senpais in front of me had just ended and they were shaking hands with each other. It was a good match. I often dreamed of being able to fight and use normal magic like them. It was supposed to be a dream that shouldn't have come true for me. However, I was standing at this stage right now, regardless of the fact that I possessed healing magic. As I surveyed my surroundings, I spotted Yusato's white uniform among the students wearing black robes. No matter how hard you try, nothing will change. It won't change the reality that Ajisama and the others abandoned you, or how your beloved little sister was pulled away from you. Lastly, there's nothing you can do about your magic. If I had to compare my magic with yours, it would be like the difference of heaven and earth. Right, I have a little sister. Because of that worthless household of mine, I was separated from her. I'm sure she has been living in happiness, surrounded by my parents' smiles. I didn't feel jealous. After all, she's my one and only little sister. She thought of me as family until the very end. I wonder what my parents told her about me leaving. I'm sure they gave her some convenient answer like I was working hard somewhere far away. I still didn't understand why they wanted to hide my existence so desperately but it really didn't matter at this point. Mina, those things don't really matter to me anymore. Whether it's to be a noble again or getting revenge on you. None of it matters anymore. Are you saying you are willing to discard your noble lineage? You still have a chance to start over but because of your foolishness, you would willingly cast away your proud. Noble status? Knack. Knack Argles. You sure say some strange things. I've already been discarded. By Ajisama and the others, as you would say. That's why we became unrelated to each other the moment those idiots put me in here. In that case, why are you standing here right now? You should know just how painful my magic is. But I've actually been holding back, you know? You're not that much of an idiot, right? That's right. Despite how she's someone that found joy in hurting others, there has never been a time where she seriously used her explosion magic on others. 
she has only used her magic to inflict the maximum amount of pain that people could withstand. That's what she was doing to me until now. I couldn't help but smile when I saw that her reaction was exactly what I imagined in my head. Have you gone mad? I actually didn't need to fight and keep this promise with you. I was shown another path but... I'm no good at the moment. When I saw the broad back of that person I admire, I couldn't help but think something this presumptuous, I want to stand shoulder to shoulder with them. I haven't gone mad, Mina. I finally found it. It's something worth betting my entire life on. Before meeting with Yusato san I had nothing. I got kicked out of the place I've called home. I've been frantically and desperately trying to live ever since then. I had no future and lived an aimless, everyday life. But I was given a path. I found hope. No matter how much abuse I received, my feelings of gratitude didn't change. I'll become a healing magician like Yusato san someday and proudly enter the rescue squad. That's how I want to grow and mature as a person. Are you referring to that healing magician guy who is secretly a monster? You want to stand shoulder to shoulder with someone like that? It's proof you're not sane. I truly feel sad. You actually want to become something that isn't human. I'll admit that he's someone with monster-like strength. But no matter how strong a person is, if their character isn't good, it just becomes plain violence. For example, someone who has explosion magic like you. He. Her eyes widened. But I had survived these three days. Her wrath didn't startle me in the slightest. Mina, I'm going to defeat you and say farewell. Afterwards, I'll slip out of Luquis. This was something that wasn't going to happen anytime soon. I plan to make various preparations to leave Luquis after this mock battle and head for Lingle. I don't have any reasons to stay here. I don't have any friends. Still. I don't know whether Kirihasan and the others could be called friends but it was really heartbreaking to bid farewell to them. Originally, I was someone that was naturally hated. I was awkward but they didn't treat me any differently. It was painful because I couldn't return this debt of gratitude in any way. It seemed like my words really startled Mina. Her eyes were wide open in astonishment and filled with scorn. She squinted her eyes and glared at me. I felt a sense of danger. Leaving here? Without my permission. That's an interesting joke, Nack. This is surely what it means for someone to be extremely conceited, right? I was only intending to have you taste a bit of pain and let you off but... I changed my mind. Fortunately, Ajisama and the others have told me do as you like for this fight. Mina pointed at me and continued. I'll make you cry and beg me for forgiveness. I'll make sure to have you wear some rags and be my slave for a lifetime. It's an honor, right? You really are someone who does and says whatever you want. No, you've always been like this. To begin with, I don't even know how this conversation ended up here. Serving as Mina's slave for lifetime? I'll pass. There's no way I would want to seclude myself here. I took in a deep breath and regained my concentration. Mina took half a step in response to my words and readied herself in her giant, shiny, silver-colored shield. She then started emitting a large amount of magic power from her hand. I'm not afraid of you anymore. Now you've said it, you pitiful little dropout. There was no need to respond to her. This would be the crucial moment. I would show what I've obtained in these five days with Yusato san. A strange silence dominated the training grounds. At the same time Mina started firing her magic. I kicked the ground and dashed out with as much strength as I could muster. A scarlet sphere formed in Mina's palm. Explosion magic. A rare manifestation of fire magic. The characteristic of this magic is that it can momentarily heat up the atmosphere of a given space and cause an explosion, roasting and blowing up the target. As I can only attack in close quarters, it's a bad matchup for me. Additionally, Mina has a shield. This is a problem. I suspect that her shield isn't for guarding against my attacks. It's probably to protect against her own explosion magic. It's a good tactic to prepare a safeguard like this. The fatal weakness of explosion magic is that it could harm its user. As I thought this, I kicked the ground once more and leapt to the side. The place I was just at a moment ago was hit with a ball of magic and the impact caused a small explosion. As I examined the power of Mina's magic, she looked at me in shock. You. It's not like I came here to play around. Take this seriously. Don't underestimate me. She started to form more magic spheres. Just as Mina said, she added much more magic to her sphere for this fight. It was on a completely different level than the ones that hit me in the past. I wasn't happy at all but it seemed like it was true that Mina was holding back before. But it was overwhelmingly slow. It was around half the speed of the magic orbs Yusato San threw. Honestly, it was a little odd for me to use him as a comparison but I ended up doing it unconsciously. Way too slow. I ran from one end of the training ground to the other as crimson spheres of magic made their way towards me one by one. Using this time, I started to read where the attacks were aimed at. I twisted my body at the very last moment to dodge one. 
I immediately squatted down to avoid another and picked up some pebbles near my feet as I did so. Without any delay, I started throwing the pebbles at the balls of magic heading towards me. This triggered the explosions earlier, and I jumped back before the impact reached me. I've certainly obtained some results. Yusato-san. While I patted the dust off myself, I felt the growth of my strength from my own effort. I didn't feel proud. But I did feel thankful. I thought it was a magic that couldn't be used anymore. I thought it had to be a magic. That needed to be used for someone else. There was nothing that made me happier than using this magic to strengthen myself. yu ah -huh. As I rejoiced, Mina's magic flew towards me. Despite the fact that the dust hadn't completely settled from her attacks yet, she continued her assault. I could understand just how angry she was due to my words but... This is a chance. Mina is just taking shots in the dark. She doesn't know exactly where I am. But I can tell where Mina is just based on where she's firing her magic. That's why. I didn't have the endurance to receive a direct hit from Mina's explosion magic. It's highly possible I would faint the moment I got hit. But as long as I couldn't get close to Mina, I didn't have a single chance of defeating her. For this reason, I have to go. I placed my right palm on the ground and stored power in my legs. I'm going. With that shout of encouragement, I used all my power and ran through the cloud of dust straight toward Mina. This is a suicidal act as everything would be over if I got hit by Mina's attack while charging in. However, Mina is only firing at where she thinks I am. She wouldn't think I'm trying to recklessly charge her from here. It's still possible for me to run into one of her attacks but it's not like I didn't consider that. While explosion magic continued to bombard the training grounds leaving dust hanging in the air, I didn't lose sight of Mina. When I was sure of her location, I took a firm step forward with my right foot and jumped out in that one moment. You. I broke through the cloud of dust and appeared several meters in the air right in front of Mina. At. Eh. Eat this. The momentum couldn't be stopped. As I dropped diagonally toward her. I coiled my body, preparing to kick the dumbfounded Mina. Ha, eh. At. He. On the spur of the moment, she thrust her shield in the ground. She aimed the shield towards me to receive my kick while she hid behind it but. That shield wouldn't be enough. It wouldn't be enough to protect you against my efforts in these five days. Do you think an iron plate could defend against my kick? What? No way. Kaya. I fully utilized my body and rotated it to further increase the penetration power of my kick. Mina was went flying back from the impact of my kick along with her shield. While she flew through the air, even as she tumbled across the ground, I didn't take my eyes off of her. Her clothes were now covered in dust as well. I won't yield to you anymore. Mina Liashia. I'll cut off this tie I have with you today. This is my strength. This is the strength that you and your group looked down on. I pointed and shouted at her as she got up. It seemed like she scratched herself a little when she landed, as blood dripped down from her mouth. Other than that, she wasn't injured thanks to her shield. But there was a clean dent right in the middle of the shield where she blocked the kick. I could also see a small crack within that crevice. Even so, Mina still recovered. Ha! Huh. Very good. I'll make you regret making me get serious. Using her dented shield to support herself, she stood up. While violently wiping her mouth, she glared at me with bloodshot eyes. I entered a ready stance as she glared at me, her intense stare filled with anger and bloodlust. From here on out, I would be fighting against a frantic Mina. A side of hers that I didn't know. He's gotten stronger. As I was watching the match between Nak and Mina, Senpai, deep in thought, suddenly spoke. When I took a look around, everyone was dumbfounded. Even the people that appeared. To be teachers. It was natural. I tried to copy and reproduce Rose's training to the best of my ability. I felt a little proud to see my disciple's growth. He became stronger thanks to the training. However, he obtained that kind of strength by following through with the training until the end. It must have been painful. Even my heart hurt to go through with it. But Nak held on and completed it. It was only five days of training but the last three days weren't something I planned. They were much more severe, after all. I watched with folded arms as Nak evaded the spheres of magic. I heard from Senpai that it was only five days of training but... This is amazing. Wouldn't it be bad if that girl called Mina were to get a direct hit from Nak? Look at his kick from just a moment ago, she would get knocked out. Nope. He really should have settled the match with that kick just now. Eh, why? Kazuki was surprised and turned to face me. Without looking away from Nak and Mina's fight, I started to explain my analysis. Mina's responses were faster than I had expected. But there's also the truth that Nak's only strong point is his legs. Unlike me, his arm strength isn't any different from an average person's. You can think of Nak's kick just now as his most powerful move. But Mina's shield was tough, matching its appearance. I thought that since it was heavy, it would take quite a bit of strength to lift it. And Nak's speed might have been enough to take advantage of that. 
Since Nak couldn't destroy the shield, this is going to be difficult. Mina probably isn't an idiot. You might not have another chance, Nak. Well, that's just how it is. Nak also doesn't have much endurance so one hit might just knock him out. After all, I didn't get a chance to make him tougher by beating him. Up with my fists. One punch from you would kill Nak, okay? Inyakumai Senpai exclaimed. Ha ha ha. Ha ha. What should I do? I ended up punching Nak once or twice yesterday as part of his evasion training. But since I coated my fists with healing magic, it was safe, right? Nak himself looked completely fine too. I was trembling a little on the inside. If they knew, they would definitely move a few steps away from me. You shouldn't lie. You Sato, lying is bad. You should confess everything right now. This little fox. While I innocently smiled at Senpai and Kazuki, I secretly aimed a finger behind me. As I did so, Amako's face paled and she protected her forehead with her hand. She also started pulling on my uniform and tried to hide herself. Hey, hey. My uniform is going to stretch if you do that. I sighed at the sight of Amako concealing her forehead with my uniform. Ha. Huh. Well, Mina's endurance is about the same. The match will be decided the moment either of them takes a hit. And after seeing Mina stand up without losing spirit despite receiving Nak's attack head on, it's clear she's not just a simple bully. I expected for her movements to falter after receiving one blow from Nak. Mina is one of the more capable students in her year, you see. Hafasan interjected. She's a bit overconfident but she understands the characteristics of her own magic well. You can see this from how she incorporates the shield into her own fighting style, both for offense and defense. I really have no idea why such a capable girl like her is scared of me. I can't help but have my doubts. Hafasan. Your fighting style is the natural bane of most magicians. Your way of fighting is dangerous as well. It's obvious they would be scared. Still, a magician who uses both magic and shield, hey. This seems troublesome. If Nak could destroy her shield, I think he would have the advantage. The problem is that he doesn't have that many options to destroy it. But Nak is an evasion type magician. Although there are aspects where he falls short, there are also aspects where he excels. Actually, he's been dodging balls of magic for the past three days. You could say it's a countermeasure for this situation. While Nak was busy trying to dodge my throne orbs, I would also use a physical attack. It was Rose's sandbag training revised edition. Or maybe it was more accurate to call it Yusato's shooting training. With my new technique, I would throw orbs like a ranged attack to train Nak's evasion. With this training, normal attacks with balls of magic weren't really effective against Nak anymore. But it was only magic balls. If something else was added in, then this training wouldn't serve its purpose. Don't let your guard down. Even if you've grown stronger you still have a fatal weakness. If Mina takes advantage of that, it will be severe. Even if healing magic could heal wounds, it wouldn't erase your sense of pain. You can't take a beating like me. If you make a slight mistake, you might just suffer a lethal wound. It looks like you are fast at running away. A scorching hot ball of magic was flying towards me. I pondered how I could attack after evading it. But the density of this orb was evidently much thicker than before. Maybe it was to prevent me from conducting another surprise attack while using the dust as cover. The moment the orb made contact with the ground and exploded, I jumped away to avoid being caught by the shockwave. This. Is proving to be a big problem. Gua. It looks like I'm not capable of completely dodging it. Explosion magic slammed into my back. It felt like all the cells on my back were being scorched by a hot wind. She had strengthened the power of her attack again. My injuries wouldn't be that bad with healing magic but the pain was tormenting me. I'm really envious of your ability to continuously launch attacks like this without a care. It's a talent I was born with. It's because I'm a genius. As expected of a high-class noble lady like her. Her words were obviously different from the others in the same year. She was overflowing with confidence. She was a talented girl who couldn't even imagine her own loss since her birth. It was quite a contrast when compared to someone like me who was abandoned. Her amount of magic power was abnormal and she had that hateful look in her eyes. But there were things even I could do. Here I come. I ran with these legs and trained them until my magic was completely exhausted. As I dodged the incoming orb of magic, I attempted to draw closer to Mina. Although Mina was the one casting and firing spheres of magic, its speed wasn't much compared to Yusato San's. Its only threat was the amount of power it held. I kicked the ground and started to run in a zigzag pattern. I closed the distance between us in one breath. I'm in range. Mina couldn't use her explosion magic this close or else she would get caught in it too. Grabbing onto to that weakness of hers, I felt confident in my victory. One blow I just needed one kick to connect and the frail Mina would easily fall. I jumped to her defenseless right side as she hid behind her shield. I anticipated that she would block her own vision to defend herself and it would be at this very moment where the match would be settled. I've got. 
I kicked, feeling assured of my win at this instant, I could see Mina laughing through the small crack. No, she isn't just laughing. She's looking this way. It looks like she understood everything from that expression of hers. I felt a chill like never before and tried to hold back my kick. Without taking my attention off of her, in the next moment I was assaulted with an impact on my defenseless head along with a gone, sound. Gah. My vision went black for a moment but I clenched my teeth, preventing myself from collapsing. Shit, what did she do to me? While holding my hand against my head and suppressing the pain, I glared at Mina but the moment I did so, a silver wall made its way towards me with tremendous force. Ka. Ka. I could see the attack coming but my body wouldn't move. Mina proceeded to knock me away, slamming her shield into my defenseless body. I collapsed and rolled on the ground in pain while holding my head. You really are a big fool. Mina smiled in good humor while lifting her shield. She looked down on me in my agony. Her shield. Don't tell me, she got into position before my kick. When I flinched, she charged at me with her shield. A shield isn't just for defense. At least as far as I'm concerned. Well, it won't work anymore after seeing it for the first time. But don't you think it's good for a surprise? Attack. Ga. Ha. Did I get cut on my forehead? Blood trickled down my skin. When I tried to operate my healing magic, I felt unsteady and couldn't concentrate properly. If I couldn't concentrate then my healing magic would only have half the effect my wounds wouldn't heal immediately. As I fell down to my knees, Mina scowled at me. Let me tell you this, you can't win against me just because your legs and vision have improved. A magician who doesn't understand their own magic's properties can't win. Of course, you have to take into consideration the matchup against your opponent. My magic against your magic, is the worst matchup. Actually, why were you so conceited that you thought you could win against me? I thought you of all people would understand that. The distinction between opponents you can and can't win against. Opponents I could win against and ones I couldn't win against. Is she saying that there are absolute win or lose match UPS among the students and Hafasan here? But I'll praise you. You really did well. Even I'm honestly surprised that you've come this far in only one week. How about it? If you surrender now, I'll make an exception and forgive you. You don't want to be in any more pain, right? Why? I'm genuinely astonished at how she was openly praising me instead of ridiculing me. Her words also felt excessively sweet. After all, my situation might drastically change if I were to admit defeat here. I might not get bullied anymore. Yes, this is what I thought. However, my answer didn't change. No, way. My situation would change? Wasn't that just an IV way of thinking? It was true that I felt that this was the first time Mina had recognized my ability. Since she despised me until now, I felt a sense of accomplishment. If I said I wasn't happy, I would be lying. She was basically admitting that I had real ability. But that's all. If I didn't defeat her and overcome this, she would still continue to suppress me. My everyday life wouldn't change. I would be below her, and she would be above me a relationship I wouldn't be able to reverse no matter what. Hmm. I came here today to beat you up. There's no way I'll recognize my own loss. If I yield here, I think I'll be a loser for the rest of my life. That's why I don't want to yield. Whether it be to my parents, the group that bullied me, or you. I admit that if I forfeit here, my shitty everyday life might become a little better. But then the five days that Yusato san spent on me would be wasted. That's something I definitely don't want. Is it really that important to you? You've only known each other for a week, right? Yeah. That's right. It's only been one week. In that short amount of time, I've received so much and I can't even express my gratitude for it all. It was harsh, painful, and I wanted to run away. But I was happy. I didn't want to have expectations for anyone. I didn't want anyone to have any expectations of me. I was deserted by my own parents and I couldn't believe in anyone from the bottom of my heart. I wasn't anything special but I was properly trained right here on these training grounds. He believed in my victory. Wasn't that reason more than enough for me to not admit defeat? He said I could choose to believe again. Ever since that day I awakened to healing magic, I've been living at the very bottom in darkness. It was something I never even considered again. That's why even in a situation like this where I'm likely to lose, I will absolutely not surrender to you. Ha. Huh. You really just said that. Is this what it means when people get a rush of blood to their head and become idiots? I think it would be better to consider your own circumstances and carefully choose your words before speaking. Don't forget, I'm a healing magician. These injuries are nothing. I got off my knees and stood up. My wounds had already healed. Ironically, this conversation allowed me to buy enough time to recover. I wiped the blood off my forehead and flicked it onto the ground. I can still fight. I see, it can't be helped. We'll continue. With a sharp glint in her eyes, 
she pointed her palm towards me. I immediately retreated and put some distance between us. I couldn't take another hit from her again. A small explosion appeared at the spot I was just at. Mina sighed upon seeing me dodge. She held a hand against her forehead and directed her gaze at me. I'm going to change my method. Ha! Huh. I thought I could just pin you in a corner by aiming my shots precisely but you're more stubborn than I thought. It looks like that won't work. That's why I'm going to change my method. She thrust her shield into the ground and started using both hands to form a new magic sphere. But it was different this time. She wasn't creating just one sphere, she was making several smaller ones. The globe of magic split into multiple orbs, five floating in each palm. Knowing that some kind of attack would be coming, cold sweat dripped down my back. Fu fu fu, although I'm not a monster like that hero, I can at least do this much. I'll just keep launching explosion magic towards the direction you're heading. I won't focus so much on my aim anymore. One ball of magic will trigger the explosion of another, causing a chain reaction. The resulting explosion will lead to your destruction. Combining the magic in both palms, she has a total of ten. She showed a fearless smile and spread out her hands. She then quickly jumped back. If you think you can run away and escape this, why don't you show me? In the next moment, several bomb blasts violently rushed towards my body simultaneously. <laughs> Nak shouted in anguish as he received a direct hit from Mina's explosion magic. Nak continued to run after the initial hit, but the destructive force of Mina's attack covered an extensive range so there was no room to escape. Yusato. Is he going to be okay? Yusato-kun. Kazuki and Senpai worriedly looked at me. You could say that Mina's magic is basically only explosion magic. Although it's not reinforced like Yusato's magic, it still holds quite a bit of power. She has scattered her magic everywhere now. Even if Nak's legs are fast, it's obviously disadvantageous if his space is restricted. Yusato-san, I really don't think he can. It was just like half a san said. The situation looked hopeless for Nak as he had no place to run. Yusato. Is he going to be okay? Amako clutched my uniform and worriedly looked at Nak, just like Kazuki and Senpai. Yeah, this situation isn't good. This definitely isn't okay. He just doesn't have a safe place to run to. It's nothing much. He'll just have to do something about it. I showed you a path to the rescue squad. You will be running on the battlefield with no safe place to run to anyways. It was a situation where it wouldn't be strange for you to get attacked by magic or a sharp weapon from every direction. It was standard for healers in the rescue squad to be in such unfavorable conditions. Nak, I wonder what you are thinking right now as you desperately avoid Mina's attacks. Avoiding her attacks because you have no choice? Looking for an opening? Waiting for your opponent to wear herself out? At the very least, I'm well aware of how much ambition you have based on the surprise attack you unleashed on Mina. Don't joke around with me, Nak. Eh. It wasn't only Senpai and the others who were worried. The people in the audience were in disorder as well. I got irritated because I didn't like that. I didn't train you just so you could run away. I trained you for the sake of victory. It wasn't some temporary measure. If you're just running, you won't be able to enter the rescue squad. You have a mission to save people no matter what the situation is. It doesn't really suit me but maybe I should give some words of encouragement. I inhaled a breath of air. Amako looked surprised and let out a haya. She then covered her ears. Senpai, Kazuki and Hafasan were staring at me in wonder. They probably didn't know what I was going to do. Without being concerned, I... The air is hot. Even breathing is painful. Gah. Even so, I didn't stop running. No, I couldn't stop running. If I stopped, I would take another direct hit and lose consciousness. There's no way I could stop now. Even if it's Mina, she couldn't continuously fire her magic like this forever. I'll endure it. I'll endure, 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 and bear with it patiently. Then I'll win with one move. That appearance sure suits you. Dogwa. Ah. An explosion occurred near my feet and the resulting debris hit my shoulder. I quickly retreated from the attack on my right but I couldn't escape the hot wind scorching me. I tumbled onto the ground and let out a groan. It's because you're like that. Because I was on the ground from the blast, I couldn't make out what Mina was muttering. When I could hear what she was saying again, her voice was different from usual. Mina spoke without any emotion. You always, always have such a miserable appearance like this. That's why you're no good. I couldn't keep rolling on the ground like this. I used the momentum from my tumble to get up. In the next moment, several orbs appeared before my eyes once more. I reflexively covered my face with my arms and started to run. I didn't have the leeway to heal all my injuries. I concentrated on healing the bare minimum while avoiding Mina's attacks. That's why, don't get up anymore. Just give up. Don't think about such foolish thoughts like leaving here just give it all up. Ugh. No, I can't look at Mina. 
I need to look at her attacks. If I don't. If I take another hit, it'll all be over. I gritted my teeth and ran. Need to run. Can't lose. I can still go on. I still haven't lost yet. All you're doing is defending. Just thinking that you can win against me is already strange. Why can't you understand that? Why are you just taking these attacks and not fighting back? Why? Shut up. I put all my concentration on evading. I couldn't hear where her attacks were coming due to her high-pitched screams. No, trying to evade like this was too dangerous. I need to run. Nay-a-a-a-a-a-a-a-a-a-a-a-a-a-a-a-a-a-a-a-a-a-a-a-a-a-a-a-a-a-a-a-a-a-a-a-a-a-a-a-a-a-a-a-a-a-a-a-a-
It was so painful that I couldn't even scream but I was still conscious. That was close. My fist was covered in burns but I managed to drown out Mina's explosion magic. I shook my hand. Mina was holding her shield and staring at me with her eyes wide open. We are now finally facing each other. We were finally able to face each other. I realized I was really facing Mina head on. As expected, I really was afraid of Mina. What I wrote in my diary about you, it was something I did to deceive myself. All those words were a bluff to hide my own nervousness. I'm cowardly and timid. On top of all that, I'm just a big idiot who was unconsciously running away. Ah, 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 ah. I frantically stabilized my trembling legs and took a step forward. I couldn't lift my legs to kick. I couldn't lift my right hand either. But it's not like I couldn't do anything. Even without those, I still have my body. I could still run with my legs. I let out a roar and dashed towards Mina with heavy and powerful steps. What can you do with that body of yours? Just stop it already. You're going to die at this rate, you know. I felt like I would collapse but I used all my strength to move forward. Anyone who was watching expected that there was nothing I could do. But Yusato san would probably overcome the situation with his body no matter what. And for me to enter the rescue squad just like him, this is a big step for me. I'll use everything and ram it right into Mina's shield. Ramming with your body ga. Instead of relying on my kick, I leapt and hurled myself at Mina. I launched myself with all my power and crashed into Mina's shield with my left shoulder. I heard something snap but I ignored it and pushed myself forward with my legs. The shield was planted firmly in the ground and didn't move. However, I didn't stop and continued to advance. I... I was scared of you. I didn't want to see your face. When I look at you. I end up remembering the time I was still a noble. When I was still loved by my parents. That's why. My eyes were still overflowing with tears. Mina was looking at my face from behind the shield. She let out only a small voice but she suppressed it. But I'm going to end it today. Today. Today, I will. Enter the rescue squad. I don't mind even if this becomes a monologue. It's just absolutely necessary for me to declare this to separate from you and bid farewell to my past. And become a healing magician. I shouted and pushed with even more force. The crack at the shield's center started to widen and the shield itself was lifted off the ground then it broke right in half. The shield was split in two. There was nothing obstructing my path anymore. I rammed my entire body at Mina. Ha. Ha. Mina was blown away by my ramming attack and hit the ground. I checked her condition while out of breath, and then I fell to my knees. I have almost no magic left and my entire body is in pain. I'm really tired. I did it. Did I win? My vision was somewhat hazy but I could make out my surroundings. The spectating students stared, dumbfounded, with their mouths open. Yusato san let out a sigh of relief. I see. I, won. Due to my strange victory, I felt joy. Apart from that, I felt a great sense of relief. Not yet. It's not over yet. Mina had fallen and was spitting blood out of her mouth. Even so, her eyes looked odd and were focused on me. She started gathering magic in her hand and aimed it towards me. Just as I was about to stand up, strength wouldn't enter my body. Consequently, my legs grew weaker and I ended up sitting down. There's no way I would lose to you. You're the only one I can't let go. Why? Why go so far, that I'm the only one you won't let go? Why me? Aren't there other people besides me? I don't understand the reason. Why are you so fixated on me? I was paralyzed by an unknown fear. Nakun. Get away. Hafa. San. Hafa San shouted, looking flustered. We never really talked. Why are you looking at me like that and shouting in panic? While I dazedly thought this, I looked towards Mina. She was gathering her magic again and attempting something. But something is different. It's not like orbs of magic were being converged in one place. The magic in her hand it was like Yusato San's. Knack. It's reinforcement. Wait right there, I'm coming. At. Reinforcement. If I recall, Carla Sensei mentioned it was a difficult technique that only skilled magicians could use. But Mina was trying to do that right now. Hafa San and Yusato San called out to me. Their expressions clearly didn't look calm. Isn't this fairly dangerous? What's more, it's Mina's explosion magic. She was born with explosion magic and if she uses reinforcement on that if her magic is strengthened recklessly, I might not be the only one who will be harmed. It might even injure the other people here. I have to get away. If I don't get away, I'll get caught in the explosion and die. As I thought that and was about to stand up I noticed. Ha! Huh. This isn't the time to be stunned. This isn't the time to think about running away, right? Figuratively speaking. Even if the people who live here were to desert me, that shouldn't be a reason for me to not save them. That would disqualify me from the rescue squad. 
Nak? What are? I looked at Yusato-san for a moment, who was making his way over here, before running towards Mina. My left shoulder was broken and I couldn't use it. Then I had no choice but to use my burned right arm. I focused my remaining magic and put everything into my right arm I recklessly infused my magic. I slapped my trembling legs and forcefully continued to run. Like hell I can bear to part. With you. If I let you go. Her hand was overloaded with an excessive amount of magic power. She was injured and the laceration was overflowing. It was painful enough to make her shed tears, but even so, she was willing to go that far to defeat me. Seeing her like that, I held a feeling inside me that I couldn't express. In spite of that, I kept running towards her. Even if she oppressed me, there was no way I could just let her die. That wouldn't be good. I'll have to include her if I want to save everyone. For that reason, I have to make her faint right now. Yusato-san is still far away I have no choice but to finish this myself. Let's end this. I immediately arrived right in front of her. She looked up at me. Her eyes were filled. With some kind of obsession as she looked at me. It seemed like she was staring at me with those eyes for quite some time. The next moment, her hand started to shine brightly and was about to fire off but I covered my right hand with healing magic, grabbed her hand and brought it down. Ah. There was definitely a response. I could feel it. After a few moments, a burst of light spread out around us. I didn't know whether it was my magic or Mina's that produced it. But. It was very nostalgic. That was what I thought about that light. I had exhausted all my strength and magic. I brought out everything that I could possibly muster. My body felt unsteady and it violently shook. Before long, I collapsed while my view was hazy from the light. Just as I was about to fall to the ground, someone supported me. My vision finally cleared, and as I looked at the person who supported me. Nak, are you okay? Yusato. San. Yusato-san's forehead was dripping with sweat. He looked relieved and exhaled while carrying me. I felt a warm aura from the hand that was supporting me. From that fact, I knew he was in the process of using his healing magic on me. I'm glad, it looks like you're fine. You injuries aren't a big deal. Yeah, they'll recover in no time. Mina is. She's safe. She just fainted thanks to you. The magic she gathered has lost its function and is now being dispersed. Looks like I made it. Although I only intended on making her faint, I was really crossing a dangerous bridge just now. It was a little late now but I couldn't help but feel a sense of chill at the situation I was just in. Thanks to you, a lot of people including me were saved. You can be proud. I. Really. Yeah, you definitely have the qualification to enter the rescue squad. Furthermore. Since I still couldn't move, Yusato-san turned his body until I could see Mina. She was unconscious. But then I noticed something completely different than before. It looks like your healing magic has returned to its original form. At. The injury is gone. In the fight with Mina just now, she inflicted a wound on herself with her own reinforcement. But it was completely gone now. Seeing that she was safe, I couldn't help but look at Yusato-san. It wasn't me, okay? When I arrived next to her, she was already healed. That's why, this is what you did. I don't understand the reason behind it but... Perhaps you can use healing magic on others because you thought about saving other people again. Thought about saving others. As healing magicians, that's the most important thing for us. You were able to regain that at the very last moment. You've severed the ties from your past and on top of that, you personally tried to save the girl that oppressed you. Upon hearing Yusato-san's words, I gathered magic in my right hand. My magic was pretty much exhausted so I could only gather healing magic at the very tip of my finger. However, I could properly see the green light on my finger. I couldn't help but think of just how precious this was. I enclosed that light in my fist and squeezed tightly. It was always here. But I could only think of myself during those hard times. I was suffering so much that I couldn't even worry about others. Before I knew it, I tucked it away inside me. But. It finally came back. I won't ever let go of it again. I will never forget this feeling again. I pressed my fist to my forehead and spoke to Yusato-san with some excitement in my voice. Yusato-san listened in silence. He smiled and started to walk. Now you have the potential to endure even harsher training than yesterday's. Leader should accept you with no complaints. At any rate, you really did your best. Ah. Look, the people who want to congratulate you on your victory before anything else are coming this way. I wiped my tears and looked at where Yusato-san was walking. When I did, I could see the people who had supported me coming this way. In regards to Nak and Mina's battle, Nak was victorious. Mina tried to forcefully use reinforcement but as a result, Nak's healing magic returned back to normal. On top of that, it would appear that he has overcome the problem within himself. In truth, I want to stay here for a bit longer to see his growth. Contrary to my desire, 
however, Gladys-san called for me, Inyakumai-senpai, Kezuki, and Welsi-san the very next day. First, let me give my gratitude. Thank you, Yusato. Eh. After being called to the principal's room, she suddenly bowed her head to me. Feeling flustered, I looked at Kezuki and Inyakumai-senpai for help. But it seemed that Welsi-san knew what was going on as she lightly chuckled and started to speak. Principal Gladys wanted to change the student's way of thinking. Ha! Huh. Your accomplishments in life are already decided by what magic you are born with. In other words, talent. A lot of children here have started to adopt this thought. They give up on trying to improve their own magic and blame everything on their lack of talent. But you. No, both you and Nak have proved that this ideology is false. Even if your methods were different, students had seen Nak stand up and directly oppose the wall known as talent. Witnessing this changed the mental state of many students. I wasn't really aware of it but did my actions really influence the students here? Furthermore, even the teachers have been affected. They no longer doubt your ability. Seeing strong individuals like you request for help because you are having a tough fight with the Demon King's army. Who would dare say the demons are weak? Then, Gladys-san. The letter is. Yes. Kazuki spoke his excitement and Gladys-san nodded in agreement. She took a look at each of us before talking again. Luquis has decided to cooperate and ally with the Kingdom of Lingal. The moment those words were spoken, I was both happy and a little sad. I wasn't sad that Luquis decided to cooperate with us. It was because I would have to leave this place and say goodbye to Kiriha and the others that I have gotten along with. Principal, I give my thanks. Well then, today we'll. Since we received a reply to the letter, our next objective is to deliver letters to the next country. That's why, we couldn't stay here. After leaving the principal's room, I spotted Carlisan and Hafasan near the door. I decided to separate from Senpai and the others for the time being. I had something else to do and Amako was waiting for me. I started walking to Kiriha's place. Kiriha and the others didn't have school today because of the mock battles yesterday. Nak was also sleeping at Kiriha's place after collapsing from fatigue. Because of that, I haven't told them I would be leaving but I wasn't really worried. Even so, it didn't change the fact that I was somewhat uneasy. After I reached my destination, I started to explain what happened today. Fortunately, Nak was already awake and listened to me silently. I see, you are leaving today. While feeling a little sorry, I faced everyone who was at the front door before replying. Yet. Yeah. Sorry to inform you this so suddenly. It's fine. It's an important mission, right? That's why it can't be helped. Kiriha shrugged her shoulders in disappointment as she said so. Seeing her like that, I took a cloth bag that Welsi-san had given me earlier from my uniform and presented it to her. Here, this is my thanks for letting me stay here. I'm not the one who prepared this though. Eh? No, I would feel bad. It's not that big of a deal. I'm the one saying this but you've helped me a lot. You gave Nak a place to stay, but more importantly, I personally enjoyed being with you all during this one week. It wasn't an exaggeration or flattery. It was a somewhat busy one week but it was fun. Ha, I know just how stubborn you can be. That's why I'll give up and just accept it. That would save me a lot of trouble. I ate food here for free. As expected, I could not bring myself to just leave like this without compensating Kiriha. You really are a weird human. Of course. After all, this is someone who is willing to come along with me. Amako, I think that statement is a little cruel. That's not something you should speak proudly of, right? Fu fu. That is certainly true. At least deny it. Deny it? Isn't it the truth? Thanks to that, I was able to meet you. If you think about it like that, it's not that bad. Compared to the time when I first met Kiriha, she gave a somewhat tender smile after speaking. A lot really has happened. This one week felt very long. It truly felt like I existed here. At first I really didn't know what was going to happen. How should I put it? After meeting you. It feels like I can trust humans again. It's not a bad feeling. Q. You. While that may be true, I won't open up that easily. It'll only apply to the humans who can treat us normally, like you. While giving a sour look, Q turned his head away. I couldn't help but let a chuckle escape when I heard his words. His face became beet red and he turned back to shout. Didonti laugh. Even I know it sounds disgusting. Still, Q really gets embarrassed easily. Shut up Amako. I won't say this ever again. Shit, why did I say something so embarrassing? Damn it. Are you perhaps crying? Who would cry? Q turned his back to them and started sulking. As I was about to apologize, Satsuki approached this time and showed me an innocent smile. To match her line of sight, I bent my knees. She clenched both her hands into fists and looked at me with sparkling eyes. With great difficulty, she began to speak. Yusato. 
After your journey is over, come visit here again. Then tell me even more amazing and weird stories. Afterwards, tell Suzun and Kazuki that we'll meet again. Yeah, I'll be sure to tell them. But you shouldn't make too much trouble for Kiriha and Q, okay? Yeah. While jumping up and down in excitement, Satsuki nodded. You really have a terrific amount of spirit. In the beginning, I thought you were more of a quiet girl. After exchanging my farewells with the three beast kin, I felt that even if I didn't come here to deliver that letter, it was worth coming here. Nak. And lastly, I called out to Nak who had his head down. He was facing the ground without moving but once I called out his name, he slowly lifted his head. Yusato san I honestly felt like your training was tough. It was so harsh that I couldn't think of anything else. Yet. At first, I even thought that there was something wrong with you and you had a screw loose in your head. Why yet? I thought that you weren't actually using healing magic. I had my doubts and considered the possibility that you were actually a monster using some kind of dreadful magic. Hey, wait a moment. ERM. H huh? This doesn't feel like something you would say to bid farewell to someone. Wasn't he just giving me some small complaints? I understand though, I also complained a bit to Rose. But if possible, I didn't want to experience what Rose experienced. But now I can say that there wasn't even one thing that you told me to do that was useless. Whether it be the harsh training, healing magic, or the things you taught me. All of it was essential for me to obtain my victory over Mina. Nak. I want to become even stronger. I want to become stronger just like you. Yusato-san, I've found it. A way of living without being bound to my family or Mina. Because of yesterday's victory, he was finally liberated from his ties and obtained the chance to walk on a new path. Whether he decides to take it or not is up to him. But I was little embarrassed since he said he wanted to become like me. I'll go to Lingle and enter the rescue squad. I'll withstand training that's even harsher. I'll gladly receive any of kind abusive language. I'm still inexperienced. I'm still not able to reach the ideal physical ability that leader is looking for. My reinforcement is still incomplete. Honestly, I've still got a long way to go compared to leader. Even so, do you still think you want to be like me? My master is you. It's the back I ought to chase after. I see. Then right now, I still wasn't good enough. I'll temper my body even more than before and continue to devote myself to training. I'll become a goal that Nak can proudly chase after. I took out the letter from my uniform's pocket and handed it to Nak. On the rectangular envelope, the characters to leader were sloppily written. I think it'll be fine if you hand over this letter. Leader wears a uniform similar to mine and she feels like a carnivore. Well, you'll recognize who it is with just with one look. Yes. Nak accepted my letter as if it were something precious. I'm worried since he'll be receiving the rescue squad's training. Or more specifically, I'm worried if he'll be able to keep his sanity in front of Rose's unreasonable ways of doing things. Well, Nak as he is should be fine. I should get going soon. Inyakami senpai and the others were waiting. I signaled Amako that we should be going soon. Amako nodded and looked at Kiriha's group. She took a deep breath before opening her mouth. Everyone, I'm glad we could meet again. Thank you for everything up until today. Me too. I'm glad to see an energetic Amako. If you feel lonely, come to our place. We'll warmly welcome you anytime, Amako. Yet. Yeah. Amako looked happy and smiled in front of Kiriha. But when she turned around, I could see that she looked a bit embarrassed as well. Along with Salrasan, you now have another place you could return to and call home. I'm glad. As I thought that on the inside, it was my turn to face everyone. Kiriha, Q, Satsuki, take care of yourselves. Nak. We don't need to say goodbye. Instead, I should say let's meet again. Dot. Yeah, take care of yourself too. Well, you should reach out to us if you drop by in the near future. We won't be leaving here anytime soon. Be sure to save Amako's Ka-chan. See you later, Yusato. I'll be waiting for you at Lingle. After they bid me their various farewells, I left Kiriha's place along with Amako. It was sad to say goodbye but it's not like we won't meet again. Looks like they left. Yeah, they left. Nak and Q exchanged words as we sent Yusato and Amako off. It was just a week but for us, it was very valuable. I was able to remember my feelings of wanting to make human friends. I was also able to make a human friend for the first time. Are you going to head to Lingle right away? I would like to do so very much but I still have things to do. Was there something else? While I had this doubt, Nak placed the letter in his pocket as if it were valuable and gave a somewhat reserved smile. I'll send a letter to my parents to bid farewell. I'll quit school. Afterwards, I guess I'll meet Mina for the last time. I think it'd be best if you didn't. Yeah, you don't know what she'll do. I think so too. I, Q, 
and Satsuki gave our opinions to Neck. Based on yesterday's match, meeting with Mina was far too dangerous. It wouldn't be strange if she fired some magic at him right away. But it seemed like Nak understood and looked troubled as he scratched the back of his head. I certainly don't know what she'll do. I don't think I can easily forgive Mina for what she's done to me. But whether I can forgive her or not is a different matter. I... I... I think... We should talk. During the last moments of the battle, when Mina was being reckless, Nak was the only one who could observe her closely. No one else could see or hear her. But as a beast kin, Mina's voice reached me. She didn't sound like she was full of confidence. It sounded more like she was trying to stop someone who was about to go far away. With that in consideration, I could understand why Nak might be curious. Nak, you should do what you want. Ah, but make sure to stop by here once you've decided to set out. We have to properly send you off. Of course. Rather, it'd be more accurate to say the only ones I'm close with is everyone present here. I'm a beastkin and the one saying this but... I think that's quite weird, you know. That is certainly true. It looks like we were able to talk normally with Nak after he tagged along with Yusato for this past week. At first, Yusato acted as an intermediary. But before we knew it, we were able to converse normally. It really was something that became natural before I even realized it. It can't be helped that I'm weird. I'm Yusato's disciple, after all. Ha. Huh. You sure said it. Q responded to Nak's statement and slapped him on the back while laughing. Satsuki and I naturally laughed upon seeing their exchange. I had doubts and worried if humans and beastkin could truly be friends with each other. But it was actually this easy and simple for the two to get along. I suddenly felt like my heart was being filled up with emotions. I looked towards where. Yusato and Amako had left once more. I don't know when I'll be able to meet them again. Even so, I didn't want to consider that I might never meet them again. Amako had Yusato beside her. Yusato had Amako beside him, there was no need to worry. Fufu, I look forward to our next meeting. But if Amako's mother is saved and Yusato's journey is over the next time we meet. It would be nice if I could become a little more honest with myself by then. Until then, I'll do things at my own pace. I think I'll try and do some things different from usual as well. After bidding farewell to Kiriha and the others, I arrived at the gates with Amako. The ones waiting for us were Inyakamai Senpai, Kazuki, Welsi San, and the other knights. At the time of departure, it was decided we would be splitting into three groups. We came here in order to get our belongings and prepare for our journey. Arksan, who would be traveling along with us, was loading our things onto a horse. Arksan, that horse. It's for our journey. I thought about letting this guy carry the heavy stuff while we're traveling. This one is a little old but it's a good horse. Furthermore, it's quite smart. It won't slow us down. Is that so? Best regards. I gently combed its dark brown mane. It looked like it felt good as the horse neighed. I haven't touched a horse before but this feels really smooth. It was a bit different from Blurin. Well then, I couldn't just let Arxan do the preparation all by himself. I'll help. No, no. I'm fine. Well C-San has something important to say before we depart. You should prioritize that first. Well C-San had something important to say? I wonder what she has to say. I should go and see for the time being. I understand. Amako, could you go fetch Blurin? That guy is probably still sleeping. Yeah, I got it. I left the preparations to Arksan and Amako. I headed to Welsi San and the other's carriage. It didn't look like there was an important discussion going on. Was she waiting for me? Thinking that, I spoke. Excuse me, sorry for being late. We didn't wait that long. Did you properly say goodbye? I nodded to Senpai's words. Then I relayed the message that Satsuki entrusted me with to Senpai and Kazuki. I see. Yeah. Thanks for telling us. Senpai wilted slightly. You'll meet them again. It's just like you Sato said. It's not like we're saying goodbye forever. We'll definitely meet again. Even Satsuki-chan said we'll see each other again. That's right. Once everything is over, we'll meet again. That's why we definitely have to succeed in this journey. Senpai was able to stand back up again once she heard Kazuki's words and mine. Welsi san had been listening in silence and chose an appropriate time before speaking. It looks like everyone has assembled. I think you three have experienced quite a bit in Luquis. However, this is only the very beginning of your journey. From here on out, it will be a long journey. We listened to Welsi san without saying anything. Suzun sama will be heading to the north, Kazuki sama to the west, and Yusato sama to the east. As for me, it's very unfortunate but I'll be heading to Lingle. To overcome this crisis that threatens this continent, I can only depend on everyone else. Even though the three of you aren't related to this at all, you have all decided to lend your power to us. 
She seemed frustrated at the truth that she had to rely on us and hesitated as she spoke. But she took a deep breath and displayed a gentle expression with a smile. Suzun sama, Kazuki sama, Yusato sama, I truly hope you three will be safe. I earnestly pray that everyone will be able to safely return to Lingle. We'll definitely return. That's because Kazuki kun and I are heroes. And Yusato kun is the immortal from the rescue squad. But I'm not immortal. Senpai replied to Welsi san with a cheerful voice. Kazuki took a step forward this time and looked at Welsi san with eyes filled with emotion. In this world, our home is in Lingal. There are a lot of people waiting for our return. That's why, please wait. We'll deliver the letters to the other countries and obtain their cooperation. We'll succeed and come back. Yes. After Kazuki said so, Welsi san's eyes were wet with emotion. She then bowed and left. Senpai, Kazuki. I think it'll be a difficult journey but let's do our best. Hey, hey. That's what I should be saying. Yusato, you're the one who has it the roughest. That's right. You're the one who will be heading to the Beastkin's country. I understand that it's dangerous but I had already made my decision. After interacting with Kiriha and the others, I also had some positive expectations from the Beastkin country. Well, it'll turn out okay somehow. I was able to get along with Kiriha and the rest here. So it's not like I don't have any hope at all of succeeding. It'll turn out okay somehow. Ha. Huh. I really don't know if you're really just being vague or not. You should really be careful, okay? If you become involved in something dangerous, no matter where I am, I'll come running towards you. Come running towards me. It didn't sound like a joke when it came from this person so I don't know how to react. In that case, I'll be running towards you too. K. Kazuki. You too. Of course. If a friend is in a pinch, coming to help is my duty. When we were fighting against the Demon King's army, Yusato saved me and Senpai when we were about to die. It's something similar to that. Dogu, if you mention it like that, I won't be able to deny it. Fu Fu Fu, Kazuki's life and mine were saved by you. Obviously we would want to save you too. Good grief, these two held too much gratitude towards me. But I certainly feel happy by being told that they would come save me. That's why. Let's stop with this tedious farewell. Yet. Yeah. We should send each other off with smiles. The three of us looked at each other, praying that we'll be able to meet again after successfully obtaining cooperation from different countries. I won't say goodbye. That's why. Let the three of us meet again. Yes. I smiled with confidence. Inukami Senpai had a bold smile while Kazuki had a gentle smile. Hearing Inukami Senpai's words that hoped that the three of us will see each other again, Kazuki and I shouted our agreement. Yusato, are you sure? After separating from the two of them, I returned to where Arksan was making the preparations. After returning, Amako questioned me. Yup. We don't need any more words. Arksan, how are the preparations? I've finished. Arksan pulled the reins of the horse with our luggage. Senpai and Kazuki would be accompanied by several knights on their journey. But I only had Amako, Arksan, Blurin, and this dark brown horse. But for traveling, this party size was just about right for me. Since we were done preparing, we moved right in front of the gates. I stood beside Senpai and Kazuki who had arrived earlier. The gate in front of us gradually opened. We're departing. The moment the gate had completely opened, we were signaled to move. I waved my hand towards them as they both went on their respective paths. After turning around to look at Arksan, Amako and Blurin individually, I faced the front once more. The short time, which felt long, that I spent in Luquis was about to come to an end. Kazuki and Senpai each went on their different paths. I would also be going on a journey with a new member in the group. If I said I didn't feel anxious, I would be lying. But I was also honestly thrilled. Countries different from Lingle, monsters, people, and scenery. I'm not Inukami Senpai but there was still fantasy I haven't seen out there yet waiting for me. Well, let's go. As I excitedly said these words, I took one powerful step forward and began to walk down the road. Author, Arc 3 will begin in the next chapter. In Arc 3, an enemy which Yusato's healing punch will be effective against will appear.